Exciting heating stuff is over, and you're really just trying to bleed off energy until you get down to a condition that's safe for the parachute. And so any error in your prediction of how that vehicle slows down, or your prediction of what the atmosphere is going to end up being uh, on the day at Mars, um, can lead to being far uprange or far downrange. You know, your, your landing ellipse and how you target it, you need to account for that. So if we can get better data to characterize the aerodynamics, we can tighten that up and land in even smaller spaces. Which is always the goal, right? Yep. You're trying to find out exactly where, you're, where you need to land. Yep. So Mark, how is the instrumentation different on Medley 2 from Medley 1? So, at least from where I'm, my experience is with the pressure side, Medley 1 was really designed to capture the pressure all the way through entry, so it had this nice high maximum pressure it could measure. What we really wanted to do for Medley 2 was to look for the low pressures right before chute deploy. We're going to be coasting there, slowing down from, say, Mach 4 down to Mach 2 for a you know, minute, 100 seconds, something like that. And that adds to the landing ellipse, you know, any error in the aerodynamics. So the transducers, we put more of them on the heat shield, and they're at a lower range, so they'll have much better resolution at those low speeds. So we can pull out things like winds, and we can get a better estimate of the drag. And we also have a pressure transducer on the back side. As you slow down, get down to supersonic speeds, the, the pressures on the back shell become a big contributor to the total forces acting on the capsule. And it's really hard to predict, actually, what those pressures are. So, so with some truth on the back side, that can really help us nail down the, the total behavior of the capsule as it's flying at those low speeds. It seems like we're getting an awful lot of good data on the things that are happening during EDL and Mars, especially for from Medley and Medley 2. Are we able to, in the future, maybe translate what you're doing here to potential di different atmospheres or different EDL circumstances? Uh, absolutely. So Medley 1 definitely demonstrated, and it was the reason I think we have Medley 2, was it became the model of how you put an instrument package on a heat shield, how to work with the project to do it, so that they're not scared about you know putting holes in their pristine heat shield that's designed to get their rover on the ground. We have a process now to do that. So you'll see missions going to Venus or Jupiter, Titan, those kinds of things. They'll all have instrumentation during entry, and NASA has the confidence to require that because we did, we did so well with Medley 1 and hopefully again with Medley 2. You know, Mark did a really nice job uh, discussing Medley 2, but I have to ask the question, in all my years at NASA, in a, talking to subject meta experts from all 10 centers, what is a reconstruction lead? <laughs> Reconstruction is really important after a flight okay. um, to understand, <laughs> understand exactly how and where the vehicle flew. Oh, okay. And without the um, proper data, it's really hard. You have to make some assumptions. Okay. So for instance, before Medley, when we didn't have an independent pressure measurement, we had to assume something about the aerodynamics of the vehicle in order to figure out how it flew. Okay. Now with that independent pressure measurement, we can nail it and we don't have to make any assumptions. So reconstruction lead is really key to understanding how we did. See, you learn something new every day. I, I, had, I had no clue. Yeah, he comes back up with that flight plan right. that they had and the, where the data is along those flight plans. You know, it's very important. Now, speaking of that flight plan, with Medley 2, can you take the data from Medley 1, Medley 1 and kind of show what the flight plan is going to be for Mars 2020, or is that a completely different flight plan? It's a lot the same um, because it's the same shape, size, Size vehicle, the mass will probably be a little different. They're using the same entry, descent, and landing system, um, but the atmosphere obviously will be a little bit different. The entry velocity will be a little bit different because of the different year. Um, but largely, you know, we're going to use all of our MSO simulations as the basis for where we start on 2020. Now, I, I know, uh, Steve, with, with game changing, you take technologies and, and you take them from a technology readiness level. We always talked about that one through that yeah. nine scale. Yeah. And you're in that middle range. Middle range, about three to five or six. Right, so but with Medley, since you have proven, you have, a, you have a flight underneath you, and then you're working on Melee 2, is that still considered, uh, you know, yes. technology with that level? Yeah, it's, 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 yes. it's still not space ready. Yeah, and space it, was like, it was like what uh, Michelle was telling you was we learned so, so much through Medley 1 that we want to put different kinds of uh, transducers to get the lower pressure range. We want to understand the, the back shell pressures and uh, radiation rates. 
So we learn so much. So it's it's not really just a repeat right. of Medley 1. Yeah, we have totally new sensors. Um, knowing what we know from Medley 1, we've moved a lot of our sensors. So we have kind of the same number of channels of data, right. but we've uh, distributed them differently on the fore body and then moved some to the, the back of the vehicle. Well, speaking of a, of a, of a new uh, mission, we also have now, instead of Medley 2, we also have Hyatt 2. Yep. Absolutely. Which is, which is a hypersonic, aerodynamic, inflatable decelerator. Inflatable aerodynamic, yes. Oh, infl oh let me do that it again. Hypersonic, inflatable, aerodynamic decelerator? Yes. Very cool. Very cool. Bravo. All right, so that's a completely different type of EDL system from Medley 2. It is. And I, Franklin had a chance to sit down with the project manager, Joe Del Corso. Yes. And we're going to learn more about Hyatt 2, so let's check that out. So Joe, we're talking about Hyatt 2. Tell me what has changed since Hyatt 1. So we've had a number of changes. The first one was we upgraded our thermal protection system. In Hyatt 1, we used a generation one thermal protection system, which was somewhat capable. It's uh, low temperature capable, basically something on the order of 1,000 to 1,100 degrees Celsius on the surface. For Hyatt 2, what we've looked at is much higher temperature capable materials, much more flexible and lighter weight. So now we're using custom built silicon carbide materials as an outer fabric. We're using COTS materials and some custom materials for our insulator systems. And then on the back side for the gas barrier, you have woven fabric systems with PTFE film wrapped around it. Our inflatable structure is also being upgraded. And then the other thing that we're doing is we are working on scalability. We're focusing on trying to get to a 12 meter scale. In order to do that, we've got to upgrade a lot of our equipment. We've got to work on something as simple as just picking up one of the gore seams. It takes a lot of development, a lot of careful coordination. So what we're focused on is not just upgrading our materials, but also upgrading our handling techniques, our manufacturing techniques. Tell me about the high ed timeline from the time it was conceived conceived to where we are right now with high ed too. So Hyatt has been in development, uh, previously it wasn't known as Hyatt, but it's been in development now for almost a decade. We still have probably another four years worth of work to do to get us to human access to Mars. We started out in 2006 doing material testing, and really all we were doing is we were doing low level, trying to learn how to test fabric systems so that we could simulate an atmospheric entry condition. We were learning how to learn in the early phases. We had RV-1 happen. Unfortunately, there was a launch vehicle anomaly, so we lost that. But what it did do is enabled us to put in place RV-2 flight tests. People had enough confidence in what we were doing that they allowed us to build a build to print. That went up on a sounding rocket, launched out of Wallops, and it was an incredibly successful proof of concept. We had an inflatable structure, but no real TPS at the time, thermal protection system. Following the success of RV-2, we started up what we currently know as HIA, which is the Hypersonic Inflatable Aerodynamic Decelerator Project. During that project, we were doing all the lab scale development, small scale, little samples. We had learned how to test, do the initial testing. Now we were taking it through a maturation process, getting it ready for flight again. The third flight that we flew out of Wallops again is called Urban 3. That was a much higher heating condition, and it was the first chance for us to actually test a thermal protection system with our inflatable structure. After the success of Irby 3 and the closure of the initial HIAD, we attempted to fly an orbital entry flight test called THOI, Terrestrial HIAD Orbital Reentry Flight Test. Unfortunately, due to the Orb 3 failure, we had to cancel Thor, and we went back to a ground development effort. But unlike the first two ground development efforts, the third one wasn't focused on learning how to test or testing materials or developing t materials. It's focused on scaling. So we did small scale in the early development phases, and now we're scaling to something more applicable for human access to Mars. Now, the cool thing I understand about Hyatt 2, the 
you guys have a partnership with ULA? Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's talk about that. So about a year ago, ULA announced that they wanted to use high-end technology to recover their boosters as part of their new business model, right. you know, affordability. And so we've been working on a flight demonstration with them over the last year and a half. Yeah, and that would be at the six meter scale, which is about halfway to what ULA would need for their full booster recovery, okay. 12 meters that Joe talked about on the video. And um, it's also the right scale for us to do maybe a, a technology demonstration mission leading up to putting humans on Mars. So the idea is that you're using this HIA technology to recover the first stage of a ULA right. rocket. Mm -hmm. And so is, is that going to be recoverable? And is that going to sort of land in the ocean? Is it going to land on dry land? How is that going to work? They actually want to snatch it out of midair with a helicopter um, and to minimize any refurbishment costs. Wait a minute. So you're going to have this booster coming down with the high ed deployable shell. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it, then a helicopter is going to come and just kind of mid grab it mid-air. Mid retrieval. Yes, yeah, it'll come in. It's got a. It'll have a catch hook, and the helicopter will come. It's a modified helicopter, mm -hmm. obviously. But we've that's not, the plan. Yeah, we've not air snatched anything of that mass yet, right. so that's a little bit of technology development as well. well. I seriously hope that you go back to your ESM ESM folks and do some modeling of that of that snatching because I, I reconstruction the, 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 of the booster trajectory. Reconstruction. So the reconstruction will be a part of that too. Absolutely. That's that's perfect. Well, we're looking forward to seeing that in action because. Uh, that would be something to see when that Absolutely. actually happens. Yeah, awesome. And also with Hyatt, which is a win-win not only for ULA, but for NASA, NASA gets a demonstration out of it, but then it also, it kind of matures that technology right. to move on to an eventual test on Mars? Yes. Awesome. I tell you what, we've come to the close of, of just part one of EDL. I mean, we've covered a lot right. of technology today, and on the next show, we're going to be covering even more technologies. Yeah, we should be talking about ADEPT and 3D MAT and HEAT. And now, with regards to 3D mat and heat, that's more of the material side as opposed yeah. to the big system side, isn't it? Right. I'll right. come forward to that, and so stay tuned. We're going to be talking more about EDL. You're watching NASA Edge. Our next Mars rover gets closer to launch. A comet spotted from the space station and we're ready to build a spacecraft to explore a metal-rich asteroid. A few of the stories to tell you about this week at NASA. On Tuesday, July 7th, our Mars 2020 Perseverance rover was lifted onto the top of the Atlas V rocket that will send it towards the Red Planet this summer. Engineers have made physical and electrical connections between the booster and the spacecraft and are conducting the final tests before launch. Perseverance's mission, search for signs of ancient microbial life, study the planet's climate and geology, and collect samples for possible return to Earth. This mission will help pave the way for human exploration of Mars. Meanwhile, on the Martian surface, our Curiosity rover began a summer road trip of roughly a mile of steep terrain to ascend Mount Sharp. Curiosity will look for sulfates that usually form around water as it evaporates. They are a clue to how the climate and prospects for life changed nearly three billion years ago. Our moon exploration technologies are getting a boost from additional investments for small businesses. We've picked four American companies to develop technologies ranging from communications, to improved driving on the lunar surface, to use of lunar resources. These investments are part of our Artemis program, which aims to land the first woman and the next man on the moon in 2024. Kathy Leaders, the new leader of our human spaceflight efforts, got an up-close look at the booster segments for our Space Launch System, or SLS rocket, during a recent visit to our Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The boosters are being prepped for Artemis 1, when SLS will send an uncrewed Orion spacecraft around the moon and back. Astronauts aboard the International Space Station spotted a comet previously discovered by and named after our NEOWISE mission that studies near-Earth objects. Comet NEOWISE will pass harmlessly at 64 million miles from Earth while giving astronomers the opportunity to learn more about its composition and structure. You can catch a glimpse of the glowing comet in the evening sky shortly after sunset on July 11th as it speeds away from the sun. Our Psyche mission to explore a metal-rich asteroid has passed a crucial mission milestone. 
The systems designed to do their job in deep space are now ready to be built. Psyche is planned to launch in 2022 and will fly to its target in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. That's what's up this week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, follow us on the web at nasa.gov forward slash twan. Earth-changing science. And that the challenges ahead will inspire generations. This is our manifest. For all who wondered if we could return. For all who dreamed of pressing beyond. This is your calling. We go for all of America. We go. We go as the Artemis generation. We go. So many things that, that can keep the shuttle on the ground, weather being one of them. It's, it's one of the more visible ones to the public, of course. Weather is often the difference between go and no-go when a space shuttle is ready to lift off from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The task of tracking the weather and determining whether or not it's safe for a shuttle to launch falls to the launch weather officer. It's a service provided by the U.S. Air Force 45th Weather Squadron, based at nearby Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Well, it's a very tropical environment here in Florida. We have the sea breeze that occurs, we have the river breezes that occur. Anytime we get some low-level convergence and we have enough moisture, we can develop showers and thunderstorms, particularly in the summertime. And so working, you know, the weather, you want to really uh, be able to nail it down, but there's a lot of times where there's a lot of iffy situations. And so that's where it's really challenging. 
Space shuttle launches are governed by a complex set of weather rules called launch commit criteria, designed to keep the shuttle and astronauts safe. There are limits for rain, lightning, clouds, and winds. And if any one of the rules is violated, that's a no-go. It may look good out here, but we're actually could be red. And so I know a lot of people think, well, it wasn't that bad, but if it's violating our launch commit criteria, we have a safety issue, so we have to call it. The team can only begin filling the shuttle's 15-story external fuel tank if weather permits. And, of course, conditions must be favorable at the launch pad at liftoff. They also need good conditions for a landing in case the shuttle develops a problem during flight and must come back to land at Kennedy, an unlikely last resort emergency landing option called a return to launch site abort. Winters relies on several forecasting tools, including radars, satellite imagery, weather balloons, and other data sources. The location of the radar is off to the west as opposed to the south, uh, so our new radar being off to the west allows us um, to pick up the sea breeze a lot better, particularly now because we have Doppler capability with this radar. Conditions can change quickly, so the launch team often will go ahead with a countdown despite a gloomy forecast, just to be ready in case the weather changes for the better. I recall one mission where we decided to, to tank and go for launch with only a 5% chance of launching that day. And indeed, we launched. And, and so that's a, that's a case where, where we got lucky, probably. Um, there have been other cases where we've had, uh, you know, about an 80% go for launch, and then we end up scrubbing for, for weather. More often than not, we'll give it a shot. The team has weathered some memorable days, one of which took place in August 2006, when Hurricane Ernesto threatened Kennedy Space Center as Shuttle Atlantis waited on the launch pad. Uh, hurricanes and, and shuttle on the launch pad are, are incompatible, as you might imagine. And so we have very strict criteria to roll the vehicle back to the VAB uh, in, in, the, in the event of a, of a threatening hurricane. Space Shuttle Atlantis began the long, slow roll from the launch pad to the safety of the vehicle assembly building in advance of the storm. But when the shuttle was only a third of the way through the six-hour move, Leinbach learned Ernesto had not strengthened, and he sent the shuttle back to the launch pad. And uh, we went back to the pad. The storm passed about 50 miles offshore. Got a little bit of rain and some wind, but no big deal. And, and we were able to launch about uh, seven or eight days later. It was just so unique. It was very challenging. At the, at the time, I probably wouldn't have called it my favorite. Um, but now, you know, looking back, it's one of our favorite stories to talk about. Winters is part of a team of about 40 people supporting launch at the 45th Weather Squadron. That's in addition to personnel at Johnson Space Center's Space Flight Meteorology Group in Houston, the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, and the Weather Office here at Kennedy. But the working relationship between the launch director and the launch weather officer is critical. We do a daily weather tag-up every day, every Monday through Friday, every day for about 10, 15 minutes. Doing it daily with her is, is really helpful, not only from the, the people processing the vehicle at the pad, but builds that relationship between she and I that uh, is very critical on launch day. Rain weather. Weather has no potential to launch. Thank you, Kathy. There's been times we've been in some tough situations, and I think Mike can tell just by the sound of my voice, you know, which, you know, what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking about a particular situation. And so he knows if I'm getting more concerned about something just by the tone of my voice. NASA will never control the weather, but a talented team and strict safety guidelines will always help protect the nation's spacecraft and crews. There aren't many fire stations in the world with a fleet of armored personnel carriers available. But there aren't many fire stations that have to serve the space shuttle fleet and its astronauts either. NASA's Kennedy Space Center firefighters used four of the tank-like M113s to protect them and the astronauts in case of an emergency. On launch day, two would stand ready with teams of firefighters inside to dash in and rescue the astronauts. Another was based near the launch pad, empty, set up so the crews could drive away from danger themselves. The fourth was a spare. Well, the reason for the M113s is for our rescue team, for the astronauts, we needed an armored vehicle in order for us to go from where we're stationed for launch to the pad and then up to the top of the pad to perform a rescue of the astronauts. An M113 weighs 11 tons, and it's steered with two levers that control the respective track. With its rumbling six-cylinder engine, the 
the vehicle doesn't accelerate so much as lunge, but it can go practically anywhere and offers considerable protection. It's also amphibious, so it can go into the water and swim, although that aspect is rarely employed for Kennedy's vehicles. This just gives us the protection from whatever environment we may be going into and then be evacuating from in an emergency. The driver themselves, they are squeezed in there like a sardine into where the drivers are. Um, it's very difficult to drive the M113 with your full protection on. Um, with a mask on, with a helmet on top of that, with the hatches closed on the M113, the driver's field of vision is very limited. They're looking through about a six inch by two and a half inch prism uh, as they're driving down the road or going to the pad. During a launch, we're stationed about nine tenths of a mile from the pad. We're the closest people, humans, to the pad when the shuttle launches. Right around T minus 10, we will um, don the rest of our gear, put our air packs on, we'll get inside the M113s and we'll call what's button them up. We'll close all the hatches, we'll close all the ramps, we go on our intercom system so we can talk to each other within the M113, but also we have radios that we can um, hear out to the NTDs if they were to call us up for an emergency. They kind of keep us informed of what's going on at the pad because other than the driver and one person that's standing in the commander's hatch to see, no one else can see what's going on. We don't actually know it's launched until you see it light up inside the M113. Every astronaut that has gone into space on a shuttle has learned to drive an M113 during training. Many have driven them several times. The training was a standard part of the Terminal Countdown Demonstration Test, a launch day dress rehearsal known as TCDT. We get them in there, we go through the procedures, we get, go through the capabilities of the M113, and then they each get a chance to actually drive the vehicle in an emergency situation where they're driving it over rough terrain, down roads, and uh, I would say every single crew member absolutely loves it, and we always invite them back another time when they're not um, scheduled for a mission. The M113s were never used in a launch pad emergency, but were based near the launch pad for each launch of the shuttle program's 30 years. Although never called on, the firefighters who stood ready never felt the training or machinery were wasted. We, uh, we are the only country in the world that has a specialized rescue team for the astronauts. Um, so yes, all of us, and I think I can speak for the whole team, are very proud of what we do and what we accomplish here and what we protect. I mean, we're protecting um, you know, the United States space program and their astronauts. One of the most significant updates for NASA's fleet of space shuttles was the installation of the Multifunction Electronic Display System, or MEDS, in the shuttle's cockpits, making the orbiter safer and easier to fly. The glass instruments gave the cockpit a unique appearance which suggested its well-known name, the glass cockpit. The new display system improved the handling of the vehicle using easy-to-see flight information, such as the attitude, altitude, speed, and many indicators the astronauts need to know during liftoff, landing, and for navigation. The electronic system included 11 full-color flat panel display screens in the shuttle's cockpit. The screens replaced 32 gauges and electromechanical displays and four cathode ray tube, or CRT displays. It's 75 pounds lighter and used less power than the older system. NASA research eventually led to the Federal Aviation Administration's certification of electronic flight displays, and MEDS became mainstream equipment on all commercial aircraft. What's important on a commercial airliner also is beneficial to the astronauts flying the shuttle. Space Shuttle Atlantis was chosen as the first orbiter to receive the glass cockpit during its 1998 modification period and lifted off with its new cockpit display on the STS-101 mission in May of 2000. Shuttle Endeavour was the last spacecraft in the fleet to be outfitted with the electronic display and made its first flight with the improved system in August 2007 on the STS-118 mission. The glass cockpit still remains one of the most important modifications in the orbiter fleet to safely fly out the final missions of the program. A space shuttle ready to launch has numerous connections to the launch pad that require careful attention to assure a safe liftoff. 
The ground umbilical carrier plate, called the GUP, is one of those connections. The GUP is at the end of the gaseous hydrogen fit arm on the fixed service structure. It attaches to the shuttle's orange external tank. The plate holds a large diameter pipe that collects excess hydrogen gas from the tank as it's being filled with liquid hydrogen. The venting system funnels it to a larger pipe that takes it down the fixed service structure and out to a flare stack that burns the excess hydrogen off safely. At liftoff, the gup retracts away from the tank, cutting off the connection. The vent arm pulls back to the tower, safely away from the shuttle as it climbs straight up. Because the gup's connection to the tank is so important, it has sensors in place to watch for hydrogen leaking. Launch controllers track the readings from those sensors closely, and when readings are outside the limits, the countdown is halted. After the external tank is drained of its liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen and cleared of excess hydrogen, technicians can go out and make any repairs or modifications necessary to fix the leak. people to rocket ships and accelerating them to five miles a second in eight minutes, that's in, that is inherently exciting. And there will always be people who want to come cover that, uh, both because it's a, it's a significant technology story, it's a political story, it's a human interest story, it's all of those things. Space really wraps all of that up into, a, into one big ball and it's a lot of fun to cover. In my mind, uh, covering the space program is uh, probably the best job in journalism and covering the explorers of our generation is, is just a compelling and wonderful thing to be able to do. Why I want to cover it, it is so necessary for the advancement of the human race. We only advance because we continue to learn. For millions of people in the United States and around the world, the space shuttle experience was seen on television, heard on the radio, or read in a newspaper. Increasingly, it's read about in short updates on internet blogs or in longer discussions on cable news stations. The story they receive is relayed through the senses of reporters, correspondents, and editors who spent decades learning the intricacies of one of the most technical operations humankind has devised. Uh, it was two years down here as a full-time space reporter before I even felt remotely comfortable uh, covering the shuttle. felt like I really understood uh, what was going on to any degree at all. Uh, and I think translating that to the public, being able to convey um, that complexity, translate it into, into simpler terms and do it well, is an enormous challenge and I think it's, uh, and it, and it still is today. Reporters got their first taste of the space shuttle program when Columbia launched in 1981. For the first launch there was more than 2,000 reporters and probably 95% of them had never seen a rocket. So we had a, a real learning uh, experience to try and put them through. Thousands of people lined the beaches and riverfronts around Kennedy Space Center to witness that first launch in person. It was the first time a spacecraft with wings launched, and it came more than six years after the last time astronauts flew into space. But we're also very worried at the time because it was an extremely uh, dangerous flight test mission. There's a lot of questions because, first of all, it was really advanced. Till it's in orbit, really, you don't breathe a lot. I mean, you're you're listening very intently to the uh, information that's coming in and uh, making sure that everything is going well. And of course, it went very, very well. Two days later, on the west coast of America, thousands more came out to Edwards Air Force Base in California to see Columbia return on wings instead of parachutes. I remember when uh, John Young and I were coming in for a landing at Edwards Air Force Base and he was banking left. And we looked down out on the lake bed there and there were thousands of people that we could see. <laughs> we were about 35, 40,000 feet at that particular point. But I said, look at all those folks out there. They come out to see us land. During the next three decades, the news media would transfer the excitement, drama, and tragedy of NASA's space exploration to throngs of viewers and readers. I think the most challenging aspect of the job is the complexity of the hardware and understanding 
uh, how space uh, missions are carried out. I think a large part of our job is translating NASA into English. There's a lot of jargon, there are a lot of acronyms, and uh, we have to figure out a way to explain the highly technical uh, material in a way that your average uh, newspaper reader is going to understand. Four, three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Before Challenger, uh, you, you realized this was a dangerous business, but you didn't really believe it. Reporters have also witnessed two space shuttle accidents firsthand and related to their audience. Challengers launch in January 1986. Columbia, Houston, com check. Columbia, Houston, UHF, com check. And Columbia's breakup during re-entry in February 2003. I'll always remember I saw this little girl in the parking lot of the Cocoa Beach Holiday Inn and she just pointed up at that conflagration in the sky and said the teacher's up there, the teacher's up there, and um, that sticks with you. There's someone watching the space shuttle take off and land and gets to know these people. They were both gut-wrenching. I mean, you know, the first time Challenger, you know when you're looking at that that fireball in the sky, you know you're, you're watching seven people give their lives for something they believe in. That's gut-wrenching. And the same with Columbia. Uh, the loss of life, of course, is the number one thing uh, that sticks with you. I mean, you can't, you never get over that, and you always put yourself in the family's shoes and, and friends, and, and you, you feel the same sympathy anybody in the, uh, in the public would feel. Some crews you get to know very well. When you see the shuttle launch and, you know, you have friends on board and uh, people that you've interacted with were uh, you know, a period of time in the lead up to launch, it, it really makes a difference because uh, you know there are men and women flying on board that uh, have families and have children and uh, it makes it all that much more real. The news media would see its own numbers grow and adjust to new forms of communication, including the advent of news channels and the revolution of the internet with its own specialized brand of reporting. Uh, when I first came down from my college newspaper, I had a manual typewriter, and you'd read the story to an editor, you know, and you're writing for the next day paper. There was this huge delay between, you know, when you did a story and when it actually showed up in print. And as the shuttle program evolved, uh, cable news networks began, and all of a sudden you evolved into this 24-hour news cycle. The days of going out and covering a launch and writing a story for the next day's newspaper are gone. We're finding ourselves being sort of like, uh, I play a TV reporter on the internet. For the space enthusiast, for someone who's already interested in this and would follow it anyway, even if it was by magazine or, or whatever, it's a great thing for them. Uh, because with, with all the blogs that are out there and the, the, the web presence of magazines, uh, newspapers, television, you can get an enormous amount of information that would have been much more difficult to get before. Because they can ask questions, they can participate, they can get into it. NASA also began broadcasting on its own network during the shuttle program, originally called NASA Select, now called NASA TV. Believe me, when I started in the business, radio was the big thing, not TV. TV was trying to catch up with what radio was. So I've seen it all change. People are very curious about what, what, what is going on. And so that's a good thing from a public outreach standpoint. It's really good to have that kind of interest in our launches here. Although they found increasingly advanced ways to cover the shuttle, the shuttle itself remained the center of attention and a touchstone for many societal changes, too. The same shuttle orbiters were used to assemble the International Space Station that is made up totally of international partners who in the last 60 years were at war with each other. Bitter enemies of the United States when our parents grew up now getting together on the space shell and building uh, almost a million pound facility in orbit. Space exploration is expected to remain a focal point for news media just as it has in the past. Again, I think all coverage will get more personal to the audience. I think people will demand that they get the freshest and the latest and that they will be able to participate. And you can do that on the internet. And I think it's going to get more and more and more that way. My name is 
Dr. Emily Schaller, and I'm here at NASA's Wallops Flight Facility on the eastern shore of Virginia. We're here because NASA is using airplanes to study hurricanes. The mission is called HS3, which stands for the Hurricane and Severe Storm Sentinel. What's a Severe Storm Sentinel? It's actually a remotely controlled airplane called the Global Hawk Unmanned Aerial Vehicle, or UAV. Pilots fly the plane from a cockpit on the ground. NASA is using these Global Hawks to study hurricanes in the Atlantic Ocean by flying over and around them. The Global Hawk can fly for very long periods of time at very high altitudes. It can fly almost twice as high as a commercial jet, and it can fly for over 24 hours without stopping. That's why scientists are using the Global Hawk for the HS3 mission, so they can continuously study storms as they develop. Forecasters have a pretty good idea of where these storms go, but what they want to know is, will they grow? We spoke with NASA mission scientists about how the Global Hawk will help improve their understanding of hurricane formation and growth and why it's so important for us to learn more about hurricanes. Uh, the Hurricane and Severe Storm Sentinel has a goal to uh, try to better understand the processes that control uh, the intensity of storms. The ability to predict the intensity is very important because it impacts people in the coastal zones who, uh, if they're anticipating, a, a, say, a, a tropical storm, a Category 1 storm, and they end up getting a Category 3 storm, and it makes a big difference in terms of their ability to prepare and, and deal with the storm consequences. And this is really important because a category of a hurricane is the intensity of the winds associated with a hurricane. So a category five hurricane is much more destructive than a category one. So being able to predict the difference between just a tropical storm, a category one, up to a category five is really, really crucial to, to saving lives and, and lessening damage and so forth, particularly saving lives. The benefit of HS3 compared to any other hurricane mission is the fact that we have these planes able to fly upwards of 24 hours and being able to monitor a storm for that long period of time and getting constant data, we can actually catch changes in the storm. We will use two Global Hawks. Um, one Global Hawk flies over vast areas around a hurricane. It measures the environment that a hurricane is embedded in. And then the second Global Hawk, instead of sampling the vast area, it goes right in to look at the eye and the eye wall and the inner core processes of a hurricane. Unmanned aerial vehicles flown by NASA were originally built for the military and used for flight testing at Edwards Air Force Base in California. When the Air Force was done testing these models, they were transferred to NASA, which turned the planes into airborne laboratories to study the Earth. NASA flew its first science mission with the Global Hawk in 2010. The Global Hawks are really a, a, a new aircraft for doing hurricane studies. Uh, manned aircraft typically fly for, say, 8 to 10 hours when they do a research flight. Uh, of that 8 to 10 hours, you may have four hours or more just getting to and from the storm, so that in a typical flight, you only get four to six hours actually sampling within the storm. With the Global Hawk, we can get three times, sometimes even four times as much as you can get with manned aircraft. Now, this plane, can fly to 65,000 feet. It can fly 13 miles up. It can also fly for nearly 30 hours. So this plane can take off here from Virginia, on the coastline of Virginia, close to where hurricanes form. It can fly all the way to Africa. It can spend about 10 hours on the coastline of Africa and then fly all the way back. There is no plane that can do that in the NASA vehicles that we have. Because the Global Hawk can fly so high for so long, scientists can study larger areas of the Earth for longer periods of time, in places where planes with pilots on board may not be able to reach. We spoke with pilot Phil Hall about the Global Hawk and what it's like to fly the plane without actually being inside it. 
So the, the two Global Hawks that we're flying for HS3, Air Vehicle 6 and Air Vehicle 1, from a pilot perspective, it's a very different aircraft. We, uh, we don't have any rudder pedals or a control yoke. We actually use a mouse and keyboard. We actually have a control room on the ground. We have two of them now. We have one at Edwards Air Force Base in California, and we have one here at Walt's Flight Facility in Virginia. So it's basically like a trailer. Uh, it's been specially designed for Global Hawk. It's full of computer systems that can talk to the aircraft. So we can connect to the internet, and all these satellite products of lightning, the, uh, the storm from satellite images, we're able to download that almost real time and use that to actually navigate the storm. For the first part of the, uh, the mission, we actually fly the aircraft from Wallops. And once we get about two or three hours into our flight, we actually transfer control of the airplane back to uh, Edwards Air Force Base, uh, NASA Dryden Flight Research Center. It's very different from any, kind of, any other kind of aviation operation in that we have pilots on both coasts and we can actually transfer control of the aircraft during the flight to the other pilots. And when you have these long missions, like 26 or 27 hours, uh, one person can't sit there for the entire flight. So we actually have three or four shifts of people that come and go uh, to man this aircraft. Now, pilots know how to fly planes and they can tell the plane where to go, but how does a pilot actually know where to go? You have to have scientific information. Now, the scientists sit in a separate trailer. We have computers sitting in front of us. We bring in satellite information. We bring in forecast information. And because weather can change so fast, they can collect that information, interpret it, and then relay it to the pilots and say, well, instead of going over to this point, why don't you go over to this point over here, which is where we think the eye has relocated. So it's a great team between the scientists and the pilots to actually get the most information you can out of a flight. How can you become involved in our mission? You can follow the plane too, just like the pilots and scientists do, by participating in live chats where you can get live updates on where the plane is flying right from your own classroom. You can definitely be a part of our mission by actually being able to look at the same screen we're looking at. I'm looking at where the plane is flying with respect to the storm and you have access to the same data I get to look at. You have access to see the plane's altitude, you can see the wind speeds, you can see the wind direction and you can chat live with the pilots, with forecasters, mission scientists and we're looking at the same thing you are and that's just really exciting to know that you can ask us any question at any time and we are right there looking at the same thing. To learn more about our mission, visit nasa.gov slash hs3. See you next time on NASA Airborne.
to be able to put in instrumentation ahead of a real wildfire is almost impossible to do. There we go. basic tenets of NASA was to study the Earth, study the home planet. So fire is an important role player, whether it be with the atmosphere or the environment and its effects on vegetation. So fire just becomes a, a natural subject for the study of Earth processes. NASA data and NASA modeling efforts and NASA science capabilities, which derive from our satellite orbital assets and allow us to basically cover the full spectrum of fire from predictive analysis, active fire monitoring, to post-fire rehabilitation and recovery. It's a normal night and then my phone rang at 12.30 and it woke me up. You could hear the wind howling. And I started getting texts in the middle of the night, people asking me if my parents were okay. About 2 a.m. I get a text from my boyfriend who was out of town and he said, are you okay? basically started late evening between 8.30 and 10 p.m. on a ridge between Napa and Sonoma County, the wine country of Northern California. High winds were blowing from northeast to southwest. We call those Diablo winds. Some of the modeling that was derived from our Landsat data and micro-terrain relief modeling indicated that the winds at the summit were blowing over the ridge at almost 90 miles per hour with sustained gusts uh, above 70 miles per hour. The fire started from the downed power line or transformer that was affected. And then with these 90 mile an hour winds, there was no way anybody was going to control that fire. When it got into some of the more developed urban communities, such as the Coffee Park area, 
because of the configuration of the winds blowing through that cityscape and the angular momentum created by the building structures, we created these fire whirls or fire tornadoes, which therefore burn or, or have speeds of up to 200, 250 miles per hour burning through the community. So that's even pushing fire even hotter and into this urban environment that's composed of building materials, chemical agents in people's garages. So it wasn't just being sustained by vegetation burning at that point, it was being sustained by structures burning in progression down the fire line. Our intelligence for the Tubbs fire it was all based on the 911 reports we were receiving and the radio reports that we were getting from our fire resources and our law enforcement officers out in the field. But we had no visual of which fires were burning where, or the magnitude of the incident. When we started getting reports of houses on fire in Santa Rosa, we couldn't comprehend that that could be the same fire that was burning in Calistoga because of how quickly that fire burned. And if we had had a bird's eye view, some kind of imagery so that we could get a picture of exactly what we had, that would have been a game changer. guards, manned and unmanned aerial assets so that we can practice the surveillance of our fires. Testing that aircraft and gimbal. One of the major things that we have them help us with is some of the perimeter mapping and determining the exact location of our fires. You ask almost anybody what California is known for and it's either California burritos or wildfires, one or the other. A system we heavily rely on is the MODIS satellite system that is provided by NASA that does hotspot detection on the Earth's surface. And we use that to see in near real time where those hotspots are, that fire that we're fighting. And then we bring in track data and other layers to basically build that combined picture. That's it? Yeah. Okay. First responders, they want to know which houses have been damaged as quickly as possible. And the smoke may or may not have been cleared. But using radar, we can see where those houses are and where we maybe need to focus our efforts based on how a wavelength might bounce off of the surface. We can actually see through smoke and clouds. We can see things like vegetation structure or building structures. We're gonna support the North Ops, South Ops for fire season, which we're now pretty much defining like April to New Year's Day of next year. We'll have a pretty a much better picture. And so I have NASA MODIS and VIRS stuff, which we always use on Google Earth. So you can kind of see the streets here. This is a neighborhood totally burned down. And CAL FIRE, they weren't used to being able to see through the smoke. The perimeter was right here. And they see right here there's a raging fire. They know the fire is now way out there.
remote sensing is really important for the mapping of those incidents and then also to help us figure out where those hot spots are. Prior to having the capability, we would draw by hand basically where, where the fire perimeter approximately was. Now, with the MODIS data being pulled in, we're able to see irrefutably where that fire was last known to be. Remote sensing application has been a game changer in allowing us to see real time where our fire is. So our operations folks are able to make tactical decisions real time based on where our fire truly is. Objective is structure protection and just trying to stop the spread of the fire into the adjacent houses. It looks like hundreds of homes, possibly. Hundreds of homes. We just got here this morning. I can't even give you a number. There was a second phase where when the winds died down, we continued to have a more typical fire event, which was driven largely by the fuel loading in the landscape. As a result of the work that we did in collaboration with NASA, we were able to really separate those two events because we had really good data about wind levels and the time. Our plants have been affected by years of drought. It means that we have years of dead fuel buildup in the state. It's called fuel load, and it's basically how much plant material there is within a specific area. And as that continues and continues to increase the amount of fuel loading, our fires burn hotter and more intense and quicker. It's in the relationship between topography fuels and climate that drive a fire across the landscape. The heat generated from the fire, especially in steep terrain, is what's propelling these fires forward. And then you add to it a growing wildland urban interface, we are seeing just more impactful fire events and hence the increase in megafires. The key factor now is how can we make use of our NASA data in the recovery operations. understand why some people lost their homes and other people didn't, why some watersheds burned. We need to understand the intensity and the damage done by the fire. Seeing now, so this is the post-fire imagery. Matching up with what we're seeing now, a lot of this area within our view was, was burned. So what was the fire direction that we're looking at in here? I mean, kind of from this direction, burned down in it. The fire started down in the canyon. Okay. And it actually burned to the east. Right, okay. And then the wind shifted and, and this part of the canyon burned in the topography driven fire okay. later on. Okay. Yeah. After the fire burned, we needed imagery right away to understand the damage. Because now, you know, several years after the fire, a year and a half, there's a lot of regeneration. If you have ladder 
fuels. That's the fuels from the ground up to the canopy. If the ladder fuels are dense, the fire's gonna burn hotter, you're gonna have more damage. And with LiDAR imagery, now we understand that. So the way that LiDAR works is it will tell you the distance from the sensor of each point return. So when you send out a pulse and you get it back, you know exactly the distance that it traveled. And if we did that with billions of points, we can actually recreate three-dimensionally all of the structures in a space. We can construct the vegetation. We can even construct to the leaves on the trees. fire that burns through an ecosystem will start out as a ground-based fire primarily, burn up through vegetation communities and get into the crowns of trees. That's called ladder fuel development, which leads to a greater chance of very high, severe wildfire. We can now map the ladder fuels and where they occur across the landscape. Then we can compare where they occur next to homes or hospitals or roads. And with those things together, we can prioritize treatments for fuels. So we're going out of this study really well armed to be able to manage fire risk across the landscape. through the Coffee Park neighborhood, which was a half a mile from uh, my house, the thing that struck me was how much it looked like images of Hiroshima and Nagasaki during World War II. All that were left were uh, standing chimneys, brick chimneys. Everything else was totally consumed, burned to the ground. wildfire as a tool for millennia. We've been using it for cooking to grow crops and nutrient cycling. So we've had this relationship where fire is a tool, but at the same time it's also a natural disaster, right? We don't think of hurricanes as tools. I had a um, revelation that prescribed fire was an important part of restoring ecosystem management over about the last 10 or so years, and we need to make it a consistent part of our management of our resources. Introducing prescribed fire into that ecosystem allows us to remove some of those underlying ladder fuel components and allows that forest floor to kind of open up and not have the propensity to burn in dramatic wildfire style. This is part of a very large project that's called the Fire and Smoke Model Evaluation Experiment, and it's as close to a wildfire as you can get. The objective is to collect a suite of data to both evaluate and advance our fire and smoke models. To be able to put in instrumentation ahead of a real wildfire is very dangerous and almost impossible to do. NASA founded our previous project that actually allowed us to build you know, this prototype with the fire model. It focused not just on the prescribed burns, but also on wildland fire. Yeah, yeah. We were able to get you know, the new forecast run just you know, before the briefing, and just right after the briefing we get the first results. So we had an idea about the wind speed, uh, the rain. Winds aloft are going to be starting to crank this afternoon, so there's going to be a, a sweet spot early this afternoon. So 
what time are they thinking of igniting? So, right now? this part of the unit over here, we're looking at around 1300, 1400, yep. letting the sun get on it. This is our one concern area where we have continuous fuel. We're going to send the hot shots that are rolling out of here right now. all the valley over there. I mean we should be in a good spot to set up our truck in the lighter. That's gonna be a, a really intense burn but also in the flow should be going like in you know, this direction so we will be able to really have a good angle. Right here at this transition is gonna be the I think we have so much better a chance you know, for the fire to take off and kind of you know, start to moving you know, freely after the ignition. So from that standpoint, I mean, it's gonna be you know, really interesting. Attention on the crew net, attention on the crew net. Helicopter is airborne and they are igniting test fires at this time. Topographically of where they're going to go push and drop another barrel of gel is in a slot canyon right back over there And so it should follow this maybe be over it, but we'll be underneath and be able to watch it just go right over us so something out of it. folded over on our, our location there. So I'm super happy. I kind of you know, believe that you know our forecast it was really you know spot on in terms of uh, you know how strong the winds are you know over this region the same you know in terms of the plume location I mean you see that we are actually you know, really close you know, to the plume and that's you know what we wanted five years ago when we were talking about like the you know, real-time couple fire atmosphere forecasting uh -huh. and people were saying that well that's impossible five years later I mean we have completely different computational power you know to execute you know, those forecasts I mean we can really do that and that's really the takeaway message for this whole program is that he was able to initiate his model today and yesterday and get a forecast that matches what we're seeing. 
So I'm super happy that NASA had a faith, you know, in this whole idea. It's great, you know, to see that, you know, running, working, and, and I hope that, you know, pretty soon, uh, you know, other people will be using that, and it will be very helpful in designing prescribed burns, but also, you know, in terms of uh, uh, fighting uh, wildland fires. This is the home site right here. This is the garage right here. And then you can see the patio in the back. The fire is coming from the northeast. What's wow. it that stand of Douglas fir? Up on that ridge out there. Yeah. 500 yards out. Yeah. Or then it was all, all over. We started seeing the first MODIS fire detects from our MODIS satellite um, and VIRS satellite, but primarily MODIS at, uh, you know, that the nighttime overpass a little bit after that, yeah. It'd be great if we can get some of that information to earlier detection capabilities to mobilize resources to yeah. evacuate people. In a widespread disaster like this, people appreciate each other in a different way. They chose to come together to help each other instead of trying to everybody solo it. And doing so made us all stronger as a community. With climate changes, fuel loading changes, we are seeing an earlier start to fire season, and we are definitely seeing a longer length of fire season. We have to learn from this. We can't tolerate this level of damage, this many deaths. Our small study we did with NASA is turning into really important tools for other communities throughout Northern California. of this Falcon 9 rocket at launch pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center is NASA's latest instrument that will be sent to the International Space Station. It's called SAGE-3, and it will be used to monitor and measure something that is important to the entire human race, 
and every other living thing on the planet. Earth's precious atmosphere. For many of us in the general public, this looks like just another one of the hundreds of launches that we've seen NASA perform over its 50-year history. But for the scientists, engineers, and support staff who have spent years of their lives preparing for this moment, this launch represents the culmination of all their efforts. It is impossible to calculate how much planning, execution, and sacrifice this team has made to get this instrument to this point. But suffice it to say, there have been many sleepless nights and long hours getting everything just right. So it's easy to understand why so many of these engineers and scientists are holding their breath at this moment. Although this is not the first SAGE instrument to go to space, it is the latest and most complex since scientists first realized that Earth's fragile atmosphere was thinning further and in need of monitoring. Because this mission is so important, the tension is high for the SAGE team. Have they checked everything? Will the rocket work? Will this mission be successful? They will know in just a few minutes. On this episode of NASA X, we will go back and look at why the SAGE-3 instrument was developed and get a better understanding of what it will be monitoring. We will also follow some of the team as they prepare the instrument from the beginning to shipping, to the clean room, and eventually into space. And we will be there for the launch to see if everything went as planned or if it reaches its final destination attached to the International Space Station. building at NASA Langley. Some very important cargo is being loaded aboard this truck for a special delivery. Inside this container is the SAGE-3 instrument that has been designed to study aerosol distribution in our atmosphere and to study ozone, which is a gas found in the upper atmosphere that acts as Earth's sunscreen. This cargo's first stop is NASA Kennedy Space Center, but its ultimate destination will be 250 miles above Earth, attached to the International Space Station. More than 25 years ago, scientists realized there was a problem with Earth's protective coat of ozone. It was thinning. So NASA and the world community worked together to send instruments to space that could help us better understand what was happening in the atmosphere. Beginning in the 1970s with the Stratospheric Aerosol Measurement, SAM instrument, then SAM-2, SAGE, SAGE-2, SAGE-3, Meteor 3M, and now SAGE-3, ISS, have all been invaluable in helping understand Earth's aerosols and Earth's thinning atmosphere. The SAGE family of instruments was pivotal in making accurate measurements of the amount of ozone loss in Earth's atmosphere and also played a key role in measuring the onset of ozone recovery resulting from the Montreal Protocol, which was passed in 1987. Even after 25 years, the SAGE instrument is still the best instrument for the job. And now, with updated hardware, NASA is preparing to send the third generation of the instrument into space, this time attached to the International Space Station. But before it can be placed on a rocket bound for the ISS, SAGE-3 will have to be retested, making sure any components were not damaged during its journey from Virginia to Florida. That work is being performed in a clean room here at NASA Kennedy's Space Station Processing Facility. The team will go through procedures to make sure that SAGE-3 is in perfect working condition. This week the team is working to complete the full functional test of the instrument payload. And what that does is it verifies the instrument's, um, the subsystem's functions and also the test the interfaces between the subsystems. And it's in the clean room because we have, a, have to meet contamination control requirements. And those requirements are really important because we do not want any of these, uh, the optical or the radiator surfaces could degrade over time if their uh, surfaces are contaminated. 
To fulfill its scientific goals, SAGE-3 is equipped with a set of tools with a total mass of about 1,162 pounds. Its most important payload is the sensor assembly instrument, a grading spectrometer that measures ultraviolet and visible light and has a two-axis pointing system. The sensor assembly instrument contains the charge-coupled device array detector that enhances measurement capability and may allow for new experimental data products like methane, bromine monoxide, and iodine monoxide, as well as measure larger aerosols. SAGE-3 is also fitted with the interface adapter module, which is characterized as the brain of the instrument payload. The disturbance monitoring package, the hexapod pointing system, and the instrument control electronics box. While the hexapod pointing system will act as the legs of the payload, keeping the instrument level in orbit. Basically we're exercising all the parts of the payload. We'll do all the things that we were expected to do on orbit. We'll take uh, science data. We have a, a, a light source simulator that we use to, to simulate the sun and it allows us to take science events. We'll move the hexapod, we'll move the, the upper platform to different locations. Um, we'll do, we do a range of motion tests just to make sure that um, they can cover all the extremes of its envelope. You know, we have um, some redundancy, so we'll check the main side and the redundant side and make sure we can do things like upload software and, um, and run certain commands. Pretty much putting, you know, putting the payload through its paces. And, you know, we've done this several times along the way and then we'll take the data and compare it to the previous tests we've run and make sure that everything is in line, all the, all the data is consistent and we're getting the results that we expect. When final power testing was completed, the instrument payload and the Nader viewing platform were handed over to SpaceX for installation into the Dragon trunk of the Falcon 9 rocket, leaving the SAGE-3 team waiting for a launch. Even with SAGE-3 in the hands of SpaceX, the team continued to go through scenarios preparing for an eventual home on board the ISS. When we first um, get mounted to the space station, we actually will be running out of here 24-7 for approximately the first two weeks as we power on each subsystem. We've got five subsystems, so we power each one up about once a day just to make sure it powers up correctly, check the status of it and uh, then we'll be doing calibrations, make sure you know the, the CCD, which is kind of a fancy digital camera, the main part of the instrument, um, is calibrated correctly, it points correctly. So we'll be doing that all out of here, about 24-7, with a crew of about eight of us. And then once we um, you know, finish the commissioning phase, then we'll go more into the routine operations where on a daily basis, uh, we'll have someone come in here, they'll check the health and status of the payload, uh, send the commands up that we need to to make sure it's executing correctly. Uh, and then we'll be based in the building here at Langley. We'll be down at Kennedy, I'm very excited, so we're going to have the, our whole mission ops team down there and we'll watch it launch and then we'll hightail it back here very quickly. It'll take about two to three days for it to dock to the space station and then once it's docked there, um, the space station has about up to 30 days to actually pull us out of the um, Dragon trunk of the SpaceX launch vehicle and install us um, on the outside of the space station. at the ISS, SAGE-3 will be robotically mounted externally on the station without the need for astronauts to perform a spacewalk. The instrument will orbit between 239 and 257 miles above Earth's surface at a 51.6 degree inclination with nearly a three-day repeat cycle. This is important because the station's orbit is expected to help maximize the scientific value of SAGE-3 observations. 
the main scientific objective of the SAGE-3 mission will be obtaining high-quality global measurements of key components of Earth's atmosphere. In particular, the instrument will assess the state of recovery in the distribution of ozone and will re-establish the aerosol measurements needed by both climate and ozone models. The view from the space station will give researchers a new perspective of atmospheric composition and will allow scientists to monitor the health of the ozone layer and track recovery of stratospheric ozone since ratification of the Montreal Protocol. Researchers are hopeful that if the predicted models are true, that by the mid-2020s, ozone will have recovered about half of the amount lost from the pre-1980 levels. Other than ozone, SAGE-3 will also help to reinstitute aerosol measurements, crucial for more accurate long-term climate and ozone models. Ozone's really easy to explain because it's a chemical. Aer aerosols are, are different uh, in many ways. Uh, the clouds are aerosols, dust is an aerosol, volcanic eruption produces ash, that's an aerosol, but it also puts gases that convert to sulfuric acid. Aerosols are anything but predictable. Um, so what you measure with, when you look at aerosols depends upon how you look at them. You do it with a, a LIDAR system, you measure one parameter. We use occultation, we also use limb scatters, two different ways. And, and those two things combined allow us to look at composition a little bit, phase a little bit, um, uh, we're looking at the overall the size distribution of the aerosols, and so we're, we're, what we're really, really trying to get at is how much mass there is in the aerosol and how much what the surface area density. Those are two important properties for modelers to use. So the aerosols that we're looking at are in the stratosphere. And the, the primary effect there is when, when, when the, say, a volcanic eruption goes off and you see these beautiful sunsets. Um, that's that's one thing that people can immediately connect with, but. It's like adding an extra blanket at night on a cold night. It, it's, uh, it will prevent some of the radiation from leaving. The aerosol layer itself heats up a little bit. But it's also like uh, putting on a bit of sunglasses as well. On, on the surface, you get a little bit of a cooling. Very subtle effects, but if you're looking at the long history of temperature change, say, on the surface, you're going to see a lot of variability in there. And that's often highly correlated with the amount of aerosol. The sulfur dioxide, once it gets into the stratosphere, all the big rocks and everything, that's regional, it gets washed out, pushed out, whatever, it, it gravitates out locally. The stuff that we're looking at is the SO2 that gets in the stratosphere, changes the sulfate particles, condenses and forms micron size or less uh, uh, sulfuric acid droplets. As the sunlight's coming in, it, those particles absorb some, some of the radiation and scatter back some of the radiation these little micron-sized particles or less. So the scientists are going to be happy about the getting uh, the aerosol data in case we do have another volcanic eruption. But then ozone, it makes the gold standard ozone profiling, and they're all waiting for that because we want to see if it's recovering. You know, it's all tied together, so we're not only going to check the trends of ozone, but we're going to be able to be up there for the aerosol and study an aerosol. Moreover, if there are any new changes to the ozone layer, the data will help the scientific community identify the cause and assess the impact of the changes. Understanding the stratospheric ozone changes is crucial to determine whether the recovery of the ozone layer is progressing as expected since the Montreal Protocol was enacted. hard work, the day the team has been waiting for has finally arrived. Launch day. T minus one hour, 15 minutes. Although most are confident, launches can be stress inducing. Thousands of hours and millions of dollars have gone into this effort. And for now, everything is out of their hands while Sage 3 attempts to make a perilous journey from Earth into space. So today is kind of like the, the ending of one chapter and, and the beginning of another chapter. So all the work that we put in to go ahead and prepare the payload for launch and for on-orbit operations and for processing the science data, uh, those have been complete. And so we've successfully integrated our payload to the 
Red Dragon trunk. And so we're here at Launch Pad 39A. It's a Chamber of Commerce Day, historic 39A. And we're looking forward to launch at 10.01 this morning. And I'll be honest with you, it doesn't get much better than this. And the reason I'm so happy, and hopefully it's coming through, is that our team has just been so exceptional and that they've gone ahead and taken care of every detail. And when I go ahead and go to bed at night, I don't lose any sleep thinking, did we miss something? I think the payload we've, we've designed and, and built and tested is about as perfect as we could make it. And I think it's worthy to go ahead and continue the SAGE data record. And that's what we've worked so hard to do. Because if you really look at it, the, the Montreal protocol appears to be working, the decline of the ozone has stopped. And so, if the models are correct, the ozone layer should recover by mid-century. And so what we'll do is, with SAGE on the space station today, we'll make measurements of the ozone layer that will help scientists go ahead and assess the state of the recovery. And I think that's, uh, that's worth working pretty hard to do because I think that's important to every, every person on the planet. The other thing that we do is we measure uh, aerosols and some other gases. And so uh, the aerosol measurements are, continue a long-term trend you know, developed with uh, the SAM experiments in, in SAGE-1 in 1979, SAGE-2 in 1984, uh, the SAGE-3 we flew on a Russian Meteor 3M satellite. Uh, in 2001. And, and so that data is a good long-term stable trend baseline that can be used by the science community. So, man, it's we're, we're ready to go, um, ready to go ahead and, and, and complete the installation, which is done robotically. I, I kind of look at that and I go, you know, when I was a kid, the idea of uh, orbiting a laboratory and then a rocket without a human driver and then robots basically taking care of the assembly on orbit. That's all science fiction, and that's like a complete fact today. And so we're kind of on the cusp but ready to go off and do that. And it's like, wow, okay, this is cool. Our team is ready, the hardware is ready, SpaceX is ready, the weather, I don't think it can get any better than this. Um, so I think we're ready to go. As crowds gathered and the SAGE 3 team anxiously watched the countdown clock, an event typical in many launches occurs. A delay. Hold, hold, hold. It just had a hold in the countdown. Fortunately, the problem was addressed quickly, Seven, and early the six, next morning, SAGE 3 was on its way. Three, two, one, ignition and liftoff of the Falcon 9 to the space station. station, the instrument made its way to its final position, and the team began receiving valuable data so important for the entire human race. The instrument continues to work perfectly, with data streaming in, adding to the global database of information about our atmosphere. This data is not just being studied at NASA, but is being made available to researchers around the world as well, helping us keep an eye on our fragile atmosphere. After years of hard work by so many dedicated people, this mission is a success. From humble beginnings in 1979, the SAGE saga has evolved into a state-of-the-art instrument capable of providing data that will be useful 50 years from now. NASA will continue to build on the success of SAGE-3 and share the journey of scientific exploration with the world.
My land cover career really started in 2002 with biggest wildfire in Oregon's history. And that was the Biscuit Wildfire. I, at the time, was doing botany surveys and looking for rare plants or rare mushrooms. And so I was spending a lot of time out on the, on the forest looking at and taking photos and doing the documentation that a scientist or a land manager does. When that fire happened, it changed everything because we all had to react to this fire that was burning up some of the places that I'd literally been the day before. And it was mapping what was there and what was under threat, but it was also mapping the effects of the fire. We needed to find a way to look across 500,000 acres. And the only way that we could really do that was satellite data. If we can't get out and actually measure every single thing, what are we missing? And that's where citizen scientists can actually come in and really help traditional scientists uh, to better understand what is happening around them, but also fill in these gaps. The Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment program is an international science and education program. It provides students and the public with the opportunity to participate in data collection and the scientific process. The Globe Observer app is one of these opportunities, allowing citizen scientists and students to take land cover observations around the world and submit them to a larger database. But what exactly is land cover? Dr. Eric Brown de Colston of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center explains. Land cover is really the basic form of the landscape that we have around us. So whether it's a forest or a, a desert, but it's really one of the components of the landscape that we can study from space. Dr. Peter Nelson is a scientist who uses land cover imagery in his research. I am a remote sensing scientist who studies land cover across the globe. I use satellite imagery to make maps of land cover and uh, try to quantify what covers the Earth. Sometimes a satellite can't see what's happening underneath a tree canopy or what's happening underneath cloud cover. And so we really need people to go out there and to take these photos, to do these observations, to help fill in where a satellite can't actually make some observations. Just like any digital photograph, land cover images are made up of a series of pixels to show what covers the Earth. A pixel, or picture elements, is the smallest unit of a digital image. When combined with thousands of other pixels, a picture is formed. Each pixel color shown represents a land cover type. It's from these pixels where ground verification or ground truthing come into play. You see, depending on what satellite is taking images, a pixel can cover roughly an area of 30 to 500 meters squared. For imagery captured by Landsat, a pixel is 30 meters squared, or about the size of a baseball diamond. However, part of the pixel showing forest might actually be water, or shrubs. By taking land cover observations, citizen scientists can help answer these questions when it comes to land cover maps. So, why are these land cover observations so important? Why are they taken in the first place? We also are looking at how these components are changing over time. So deforestation in the Amazon or across the world, how are cities expanding? A lot of different things to study and, and really the view from space is the way that we do it here at NASA. We have big supercomputers that simulate the physics of the atmosphere and the land, the interaction between the Earth's systems. It's important to have that, you know, the, that land cover map it sets certain parameters. Those models can actually be used to look at current day conditions and weather. So based on these current conditions, what might the Earth look like 50 or 100 years from now? There's an element of understanding, but then also being able to predict into the future, you know, what that might be like, what, what these changes may mean for us. Each point shown here represents a real-world measurement of environmental conditions. Scientists use computer models to fill in information where measurements may not exist. By verifying the satellite imagery and using the data for these models, scientists can predict changes in our environment more accurately. 
One of these scientists using land cover maps to track urbanization as part of her work is Dr. Amita Mehta of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. So urbanization changes terrain as well as characteristics of the surface itself. And so impervious surface is what we uh, look at when we are monitoring flooding. When there are, say, parking lots or cement and concrete surfaces, they increase. So previously, if it was a farmland or uh, something which was not built, and if that is built now, that water previously that could go or percolate in the soil and in the, in the ground now cannot go in and it stays there. Monitoring helps you to plan for it. If you see land cover changing, even then you know that you know, how water is going to flow in that region might change. If you have to send rescue out or you have to plan for relief uh, activities, then if you know land cover, then you know where there might be help needed. By using land cover maps and models that reflect changes over time, scientists can predict where flooding and other events may occur. With a changing climate, these predictions from models and land cover maps can help scientists better understand these changes and help communities prepare for them. But perhaps a more important reason as to why I take land cover observations is you get to participate in a community of scientists, citizen scientists, and students. So it's a very important component uh, that the citizen science and students of the GLOBE program and GLOBE Observer can contribute to is by really giving us the information on the ground of what they're seeing around them and in front of them. And we hope over time as well how maybe some of these things are changing because those would be very valuable for science. I saw the value of having information before a hazard happens. Because once that fire went through an area, we can never recreate that data. This is all important for us to share and put together because that's how we understand Earth as a system. All of these things end up affecting where we live, why we live where we do, and why we make some of the choices that we do. To learn more about Globe Observer, check out the website at observer.globe.gov and download the app to start taking your own observations today. In recent years, our country has faced adversity on many fronts. Some have even said that America no longer produces heroes. We disagree. From the dawn of space exploration through today, the one organization that has consistently inspired, motivated, and moved our country forward has been NASA. past, but that heroic DNA lives on in the scientists and researchers of today as well. Cutting edge research in space technology, aeronautics, material science, and so much more continues to change the way we all live for the better. Yes, America, we still have heroes, the proud men and women of NASA. Let's celebrate NASA's past, while also looking forward to the work that is yet to come.
Welcome aboard NASA Tours. My name is George Herman. We'd like to bid you a warm welcome to the John F. Kennedy Space Center. And during our tour today, we'll have recorded commentary, and at times I'll stop the tape to answer any questions you might have. For those of you with a camera, anything you see, you may photograph. Now, smoking is not permitted on our bus, so let's just settle back and relax, and we'll begin our trip with the Western world's first spaceport. Cape Kennedy, formerly called Cape Canaveral, was selected as a site for testing ballistic missiles and later is our nation's first spaceport. As our space program grew, the site was extended to include Merritt Island. One of the reasons this was an ideal site is that the first stage of a rocket doesn't go high enough to go into orbit. And when it falls back to Earth, we'd rather it fall back in the ocean than over inhabited areas. Another reason is, from this point, we can take advantage of the Earth's rotation in achieving orbit, and also the islands stretching southeastward from the Cape are a ready-made chain of stations for our tracking network. Here at Merritt Island, there are more than 88,000 acres of land, of which 3,000 acres are orange groves, and 39,000 acres have been left as wildlife preserves. We have wild boar, armadillos, alligators, 13 bald eagles nests, and more than 200 separate species of birds, and even one reporting of a panther. And the long white building on the right is a manned spacecraft operations building. Here is where we receive and check out the Apollo spacecraft and the lunar modules. And if you ladies think you keep your house clean, <laughs> well, you should see the inside of this building. The walls, the ceiling, and even the floor is painted white. And they never stop vacuum sweeping. If you're just entering the room, you can wear regular clothes. But before you can go near one of the spacecraft, you have to put on white gloves and a special lint-free gown, like a surgeon would wear in an operating room. They even wash the air that goes inside the spacecraft. 97.2 microns. Okay, good. In other buildings, they assemble the scientific communication and weather satellites and the surveyor spacecraft. For you folks who don't know what a surveyor is, that's an unmanned vehicle. And we've already soft landed five on the moon. You've seen the pictures they send back. The last two even had claws which dug at the surface, scooped up the soil, and then sent a message back to Earth to tell what kind of soil it was. One reason for all of this is to make sure when our astronauts get to the moon, they got a pretty good idea of what to expect. While all of this is going on, the astronauts are practicing every detail of the flight. To help them do this, they have a trainer that is just like a real spacecraft, where they can simulate everything from the actual blast off, complete with sound effects, to a docking in space. Uh, you get the started, and uh, no, no P-11. think that building is? Anyone like to take a guess? One mile. Anybody else? Closer to two miles. A mile and a half. 
That's the uh, vehicle assembly building, and from here it's five miles away. Now we're going inside and have a brief rundown on what takes place inside the building. The size of this structure, folks, is again deceptive because we don't have much on our flat terrain to which we can compare it. The best way I know to get the full impression of its height is once you get off of this bus, get your feet firmly planted on the ground, just lean your head back and look straight up. Every once in a while we'll have someone from New York to remind us that the Empire State Building is just a little bit taller than this. This we have no quarrel with. The Empire State Building about two times as high. However, if we cut the Empire State Building up, we could get nearly four and a half Empire State Buildings in the walls of this one. How much did it cost? $160 million, ma'am. The Saturn V rockets you see in this building are not manufactured here. They're made in many different parts of the country. California, Louisiana, Alabama. And brought... California, Louisiana, Alabama. And brought here by barge in some of the biggest cargo airplanes in the world. Now that you've seen the size of some of our rockets, you can understand why we must have a big building to put them together. Four rockets, each 36 stories tall, can be assembled here at one time. When this building was under construction, clouds actually formed under the roof and it rained inside. The giant fans have been installed that keep the air moving so this can't happen. Once all the individual stages are checked out, they're moved into place with an overhead crane. The Apollo Saturn rocket consists of five sections, each stacked on top of the other. The main booster, the intermediate stages, and finally the payload that contains the spacecraft that will orbit the moon and the lunar module. It will take two men down to the surface and then bring them back again. rocket is assembled and all the system checked out again. They open the doors at the side of the building. The doors are made up of sliding panels, each panel weighing 30 tons and it takes 45 minutes to get them open. Then a large crawler transporter, which is like a giant tractor, is driven into the building and lifts the rocket, platform and all, to take it out to the launch pad. And they usually start early in the morning because it takes all day to get there. First three miles of that trip is made right here on the road out to the launch pad. The road out to the pad isn't a divided highway, but two road beds filled with loose rock to help cushion the weight. Crawler transporter is carrying the mobile platform with the Saturn rocket. There is a total of 18 million pounds moving along at a top speed of one mile an hour. When the crawler is empty, it can really scratch off. It can double its speed and go two miles an hour. We had two gentlemen from Texas out here the other day and one of them looked at those crawler transporters and said, Hey, Tall, we get back to the Big D. For you folks who don't know what the Big D is, that's Dallas. Remind me to buy one of those things. And the other said, 
What in the world would you do with one of those? And he said, I'd put a blade on it and mow my lawn. Our Saturn V rocket, when it's completely assembled, stands 364 feet tall, weighs 6.2 million pounds, and most of that weight is fuel. When this rocket leaves here, it will lift off at the thrust of more than 7.5 million pounds. This is about 180 million horsepower. That's more horsepower than a string of cars lined bumper to bumper from here to Seattle, Washington. Now from here, you can get a good view of the roadway going up the top of the launch bed. Remember, that crawler transporter must traverse this grade with the Saturn V rocket. There are automatic leveling devices to keep the rocket level, so it doesn't become top-heavy and fall over. We're test launching these rockets right now in preparation for a launch to the moon. But it's more than a moon rocket, folks do that job and whatever else this country needs to do in space for a long time to come. Okay, uh, are there any changes to the schedule, Arnie? Line item seven, which is shown for all day, all of first shift Tuesday, the tank pressurization test will not start until 1300. When do you want to run the leak check? Uh, first shift Tuesday. Honey, you're going to extend that time out for five hours by cutting it off in the front end of that uh, LH2 uh, storage tank pressurization. Negative. The hazardous portion of that test should last only about four hours. Time check coming up okay. on Apollo Saturn count. T minus eight hours.
Now beginning to pressurize the tanks within the Saturn V vehicle. We'll pressurize all of the uh, tanks in all three stages with gaseous helium. As the pressurization builds up, it's being monitored here in the control center now at one minute and 40 seconds and counting. Our status board still indicating all is well. Our status board shows instrument units, spacecraft, and all the launch support operations well at this time at 90 seconds and counting. Houston flight now confirms that they are that they are go for the flight as are all other aspects of the mission. T minus one minute, 16 seconds and counting. The pressurization continuing within the vehicle at this time. We also have a hydraulic commit that will permit the hydraulics to drive the engines in the first stage. Liquid hydrogen tank in the second stage now pressurizing. T minus 60 seconds and counting. Our status board still shows we're go at this time. T minus 50 seconds and counting. We have transferred to internal power. The transfer is satisfactory. A 6.2 million pound Saturn V launch vehicle now on its own power at 38 seconds and counting. To repeat, the ignition sequence will start at 8.9 seconds with the engine to lift off at zero. T minus 30 seconds and counting. The countdown will start at 25. Stages are still ready for launch. T minus 20. 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start, 5, 4, we have ignition, all engines are running.
we are designing an easy and rapidly mass manufacturable ventilator device and it is a crazy project. This crisis is unprecedented in our lives and, uh, and requires precedented action. I'm so amped up. I mean, it really, the adrenaline rush, it's exciting, but it's exhausting. And I think we all just want to do everything we can to try to help. I would say the biggest personal challenge that I have myself is uh, I don't have time to sleep. I think what JPL brings to the table is extraordinary talent. It also brings to the table tremendous innovation. The third thing it brings to the table is tremendous focus. The other thing that I felt I see it in our team, and that is a call to duty. I have this talent. I'm an engineer or a scientist. I can do something. We have the potential to save human lives, people that we might know, our neighbors, our families, and that intensity, um, it's amazing. It's amazing. And as stressful as this has been for everybody in the last couple of weeks, um, not one of us can stop. Iceland, a harsh Nordic landscape where fire meets ice, a country of volcanoes, glaciers, waterfalls, and expansive tundra, and for some, the perfect analog environment for informing NASA's search for life on Mars. Meet Dr. Amanda Stockton, the principal investigator of Feldspar, the field exploration and life detection sampling for planetary and astrobiology research. Dr. Stockton and her team have been traveling to Iceland to conduct sampling missions at a volcanic environment with striking similarities to the Red Planet. If you were thinking about Mars, you've got uh, CRISM and other orbiter uh, instruments that can look down on the surface. And when it looks down on the surface, it can basically see one pixel. And that pixel is all the same color. But that pixel can be a kilometer by a kilometer across. And so we go out to field sites in Iceland where we've got that kilometer by kilometer. And we go and we see how many samples do we need in order to actually represent the whole area, how far away do they need to be spaced. This year what was really cool is that we went out and we looked at different colors of pixels. We want to go in and see how life varies as we go across the different colors. And then that helps us figure out what pixel do we want to land in whenever we go looking for signatures of life. Traveling to the field site is quite challenging. The expedition begins in Akiheri, Iceland, where the team has set up their field laboratory at the local university. 
Dr. Stockton and her team will drive six hours over sand, rock, and road, completing three river crossings before they arrive at their campsite. Operationally, it's quite challenging to get to this field site. The logistics involved are uh, a little intense. That involves lots of river crossings and uh, dirt roads and sometimes sandstorms and dust devils and all kinds of fun weather. They're not nearly as bad as Antarctica, but it's uh, challenging for your ordinary tourists, which makes it particularly um, wonderful because we don't have all of this anthropogenic, human-caused contamination of the site. But eventually, we get the samples that can give us the science that we want. At 4 a.m. the following day, the expedition team rises and heads to the field site. Our whole work started because of the NASA Nordic Astrobiology Summer School. It was an incredible experience, and as part of that school, some of us got a taste of field sampling. Those of us who realized how important this area was to places like Mars started thinking, boy, this would be nice if it wasn't just part of a school for education, but if we could actually get some real data to publish some papers. And since that time now, we've got some new members of our team, and we've sort of kept it kind of young, early career people though, which I think is really neat because it's sort of sprung from kind of a grassroots educational outreach thing that has now become a real scientific endeavor. And it's so fun. I feel so lucky to be a part of this. Right now we're trying to get mapping so we can get a uh, three-dimensional uh, digital model of the entire area on this side. The quadcopter is going to fly up and it will take pictures in a line, uh, not directly down but kind of off at a little bit of an angle that offset plus multiple uh, images is what can give us a three-dimensional model of the entire terrain. We've already got a decent model for the other side of the volcano, and that's where they're sampling today. We're Team Feldspar. We're a group of astrobiologists from Georgia Tech and NASA and a couple of different institutions. We're here at Holohrun, which is a 2014 eruption site in Iceland. Because of the geochemistry of the place, it's a pretty decent analog for certain regions of Mars. And more importantly for our purposes, there's almost nothing alive here, even down to the microbial level. And it's actually surprisingly difficult to find places like that on Earth because life is everywhere. So that makes this a really good place to test certain ways of looking for very small amounts of life. One of the big questions that NASA wants to answer at Mars is whether or not it is inhabited, whether it had life at one time or has life today. Now, one of the things that we can do here in Iceland is help to test that theory. Iceland is one of the most volcanically active places on Earth, and a lot of the properties of the basalt and the other volcanic rocks are really similar to what we see on Mars. And so what we're doing here is trying to see how life colonizes a fresh lava field. What moves in first? What comes after it? How does that process happen? And we're hoping that this can help us find those places on Mars where we're most likely to find life. Our team has a sort of a two-pronged approach to sampling. We collect some samples here that we will then analyze in a field lab or in a lab back at one of our respective universities. But we also try to do some in-situ science too. In-situ means doing it right there, right now. Of course, the biology samples are the most important not to contaminate, so we collect those first. Today we took samples in nested sampling grids. One of the key things we want to look at is how much variation there is point to point at different spatial scales in the types of signs of life that we might look for on other worlds. There are a couple of different biomarkers that we look for, and biomarkers are traces of past or present life. One of the key ones that we look for is ATP, which is 
a molecule, adenosine triphosphate. It's a very convenient store of energy molecularly inside a cell, and so it's involved in almost every metabolic reaction that every cell on Earth does. Is that correlated in any way with the types of geochemical measurements that you can make either on the ground or through remote sensing before you get there? Because what it all comes down to is, so you're a rover, you've landed, you look around, what's the first test you should run? If you don't see anything, should you move? What's the second test you should run? And it's all down to trying to get the most science that you can out of a mission to Mars. Once the biologists have collected the samples that we'll be doing to look for life, then the geologists and the chemists can go in with our instruments and get the composition. We will have the team that's looking, uh, that's doing biological analysis go first, and then we will come through and use the ASD to look at the mineralogy of the rocks that they're sampling. MRO, uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uses instruments to look at the particularly what I'm interested in is the composition of the surface of, uh, surface of Mars. So when we look at the composition of uh, Mars, we use CRISM, which is a compact reconnaissance imaging spectrometer for Mars. It looks in a certain wavelength range, which is the visible near infrared, or VNIR, to determine the composition of rocks that we see on the surface. So we are using a visible near infrared spectrometer that is handheld that gives you similar information as we get from CRISM, but obviously closer up, which allows you to see different absorptions within the visible and near-infrared spectrum to understand the mineralogy or the chemistry of the rock that we're looking at. A lot of the field instruments that we brought with us, we brought because they're very similar to some of the instruments aboard some of the Mars rovers. For example, Mars Curiosity. Um, I'm basically the, the human rover. I have all of the instruments that um, the rovers have. Not all of them, but the ro instruments that I have mimic the instruments that are on the rovers. So we have the ASD, which you've already checked out a little bit. Um, we also have the XRF, which is an X-ray fluorescence um, spectrometer. So we can get compositional data about the rocks. The combination of these tools tells us more about the geology. That's what this project is really trying to do, is link what biosignature would you expect based on the geology and all of the other various environmental things that we're going to try to measure as well. So we now have our samples back in the lab and everyone who comes in this room has to wear a face mask so that we do not spray all of our bugs on the samples when we talk and it's very easy to forget that when you're walking around the lab so even though I'm not currently working with the samples I still get the face mask. So we brought our samples back to the lab and we laid them all out on the table so that we could get an overview of the physical characteristics of the samples and uh, see all of them laid out together. The thing that we need to do that's very time sensitive is to look for ATP because the ATP profile of what you get out of the cells changes very rapidly once they're pulled out of the field environment. So we've brought the samples back, they've been stored in the fridge overnight, and we're now preparing to do extraction. We take small amounts of those samples, drop them into small baggies, and double bag those. That goes over to the Thor station, where the geologists bang on them with hammers to break the big chunks up into little chunks. After that, we've got a fine-grained powder that results from all of this processing. That goes over to another station where 500 microliters of powder is put into little microcentrifuge tubes. And that's where we'll end today. That's a lot of samples. Tomorrow, we'll come back. We'll add uh, one milliliter of buffer to each one of our little tubes that has our powder in it. Um, we'll do a process where we vortex, we shake up the sample really good, we'll boil it so that any cells in there will break open and release their ATP, that's the energy currency of life, that's what we're looking for with our assay here. Once the cells have broken open in the boiling water, released all of their ATP, we'll spin the samples so that the sediment from our rock drops to the bottom, leaving only the liquid with the ATP in it at the top. We'll take that, add a, another reagent. It's actually uh, luciferase from fireflies. And it basically has two different forms and one inert form, and it is able to be converted to another form that glows. And very conveniently, it takes exactly one molecule of ATP to do that. So if you put in a very precisely measured amount of this protein, you will see that it 
glows, which you can measure, and you can do some math, and you can figure out how much it glowed over what period of time, and you can figure out very precisely how much ATP was in your sample. So fireflies use that to light up their bombs. We're using it to find out how much ATP is in the sample. There's three important things to know about ATP that makes it useful for understanding um, what it means in context. Um, the first is there's no known way of making it without life. Uh, in other words, if you find it on Earth, you can be pretty darn sure that something was alive there that made it. Um, the second is, it's universal. Every form of life that we know of on Earth uses it. But the third thing you have to bear in mind is, that's very specific to Earth biochemistry. Yes, it's a very good biosignature on Earth, but there's a lot of debate about whether or not it would be a useful thing to look for in other planetary environments. Ultimately, the goal of this work is to inform Mars sample return. Now, some of the techniques that we're using here are very Earth life specific. For example, the ATP assay. Now, if I were designing a Mars rover, I might use some other techniques that are more agnostic to types of life that perhaps have evolved separately from life here on Earth. However, it's a really powerful tool by looking at the amount and the distribution of ATP in our sample sites, we can map that to the amounts and distributions of life. And then we can use that to help uh, figure out what patterns we should be searching for with other life detection instruments. Ideally, we would like to be able to be a real Mars rover and do everything in the field right there. But then there's still some tests that we need instruments back home in the States to do. Now that we're home, we want to get more of the physical parameters of the sample, like the percent moisture content, the uh, relative grain size distributions of the different uh, little particulates in the sample. We also want to get more geochemical data, and with this, we can do X-ray diffraction, which gives us um, better uh, understanding of the connectivity and the elements at the same time. XRD stands for X-ray diffraction and it shoots an X-ray beam at your powder sample and based on the angles and the intensities at which the X-ray beam diffracts you can tell what elements are in your sample. And we can start to uh, firm up the XRF data with laboratory confirmation of that. And we can also do uh, Raman spectroscopy, which is kind of the other side of the hand from the IR reflectance spectroscopy. We can also get more into the biological analyses, and this would be similar to like a Mars sample return type of, of uh, depth of analysis. These are the sorts of analyses that are very challenging to do with an in-situ mission. There are a couple analyses that we would do on these samples. Um, we would extract the DNAs and we try to see how much DNA we can find in it and we would um, sequence them to basically look at sequences where we are able to identify what sort of microbes are in there and, and in what abundances. One of the ways we get DNA from our samples is by mixing them with different uh, solutions and then these solutions will let us break open our cells to get to our DNA and then once we have the DNA in our solution we can put it in a machine that will spin really fast and that will separate our DNA out so we can get to it. Now that we have our DNA, because these samples come from an Icelandic lava field, there's not going to be much of it. We have a technique that will let us act like a photocopier for DNA. We're going to be able to copy our DNA over and over and over and get a bunch of it so that we can then look at it with other instruments that aren't as sensitive. So now that we have a bunch of our DNA, we have another machine that will read it. Uh, it will literally look through each part of the DNA and tell us what it is, and then we can relate that to microorganisms that live out in the world, and we can figure out what exactly is in our sample. So now that we know what each one of our DNA strands corresponds to, and we have an idea of what's living in our samples, we can then do some fancy statistics to determine if uh, each of our samples has different things living in it. And this will give us an idea if things are changing as we go from sample site to sample site. So with the ATP that we got in the field, we know how active they were. And with the DNA, we know how many there are within reason. And then we can also start to figure out who they are and who's in the sample and how the different communities that we've selected at different places, how they vary and may interact with each other. 
all of these scientists are working together across space to figure out what the data means and everybody's an expert in their own area. What we're able to do is go in with each data set and plot it against another data set and try to figure out what are the correlations, where do we get lines or groupings of different types of measurements. And that tells us that that's what a good spot to look for life. And we can start to get these correlations and uh, groupings, which help inform future sample selection, not just for feldspar, but for other geochemical and planetary science studies. For example, Mars 2020 and Mars Sample Return, they're planning on uh, caching, collecting some samples, and then ultimately sending them back here to Earth for analysis. Now, we hope to collect the right number of samples because we can only collect a few, and we're hoping that we can help inform that decision. Even on you know, a few centimeter scale or a meter scale, the types of life and the amount of life you see are very different. And so we're trying to figure out how we can use other instruments, some of our field instruments, to say, okay, you want to collect that one, not this one, because the chances of finding life are better. That's what we're hoping to achieve, that we can use to help give Mars 2020 the tools it needs to collect just the right samples. Space to ground, I'm Isidro Reyna. This week, a Russian cargo craft departed the International Space Station. The Progress 74 resupply ship was packed with trash and obsolete gear before it undocked from the station on July the 8th. The vehicle had been attached to the orbiting laboratory since December 9, 2019, bringing nearly three tons of food, fuel, and supplies for the station's residents. After separating from the station, the Progress fired its deorbit engines over the South Pacific and burned up safely in the Earth's atmosphere. Progress 76, the next cargo ship to replenish the crew, is scheduled to launch on July the 23rd and dock to the station just two orbits later. The Expedition 63 crew stayed busy this week conducting a habitability test of the Crew Dragon Endeavor. Doug Hurley and Bob Bankin performed a series of tests to verify Crew Dragon's features and functions while in orbit around Earth, including opening and closing the hatch, operating Dragon's waste system, donning their spacesuits, and moving cargo back into the vehicle. They were also joined by two more crew members to test Dragon's sleeping configuration to assess the spacecraft and determine what improvements could be made for future crews. The Demo-2 mission is the final major step before NASA's commercial crew program certifies Crew Dragon for operational, long-duration missions to the space station. This certification and regular operation of Crew Dragon will enable NASA to continue the important research and technology investigations taking place on board the station, which benefits people on Earth and lays the groundwork for future exploration of the Moon and Mars. This week's question comes from Chris. He wants to know how many people the International Space Station can hold at any given time. The space station has been continuously occupied since November 2000. International crews up to six people have lived and worked on the station, but with the dawn of the commercial crew program, that total will likely increase. The living and working space in the station is larger than a six-bedroom house and for now has six sleeping quarters, two bathrooms, a gym, and a 360-degree view bay window. The record for the largest population on station was set in 2009, when 13 astronauts and cosmonauts were on board. Keep sending in your questions using the hashtag AskNASA. We'll see you next week. Max 
Schneider, executive intern of the Senate Director, and I'm outside KSC taking you inside KSC. NASA's Mars 2020 mission is another step closer to launch. This week, the payload fairing containing the Mars Perseverance rover was lifted up into the Vertical Integration Facility at Space Launch Complex 41 on Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Then, it was lowered down and attached to the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket. The rover is scheduled to lift off aboard the Atlas V rocket in late July from Pad 41. The spacecraft will reach Mars on February 18, 2021. NASA's Launch Services Program, based at Kennedy, is managing the launch. Kennedy Space Center's Honor Awards Ceremony recognized NASA and contractor individuals and teams who have made significant contributions to the NASA mission. Due to social distancing concerns, this year's ceremony was pre-recorded and was available for viewing by the workforce on KSC TV. On-demand viewing of the event also is available. Center Director Bob Cabana and senior staff were on hand to virtually congratulate this year's awardees. Thanks to all of you. Congratulations on your awards. Let's go. For more Inside KSC, catch us on social media and at nasa.gov forward slash Kennedy. STEM in 30 is the National Air and Space Museum's live 30-minute television show that engages students in STEM topics. STEM in 30 is broadcast from the road and the museum, giving kids a chance to experience Smithsonian exhibits and artifacts firsthand. Join us for a hot air balloon ride, catapult off the deck of an aircraft carrier, or talk to an astronaut live from the International Space Station. Our in-studio audience participates in demonstrations, while students watching online can ask questions and we answer them live. STEM in 30 is a unique opportunity for students to see that science is everywhere and it's fun. We hope you can join us for STEM in 30. Okay, three, two, one. Well, I've been lucky enough to spend uh, uh, exactly one leap year on the space station, 366 days. So you can imagine that in 366 days you get to see the Earth quite a bit. Even though we are so busy on the space station, we do manage, we do try to look outside and glimpse what's flying below us any chance we get. part of me, the, the dreamer, the, the, the little kid that started dreaming about this whole experience uh, now, basically 40 years ago, that part of me was still there, unchanged for 30 or 40 years and just marveling incredulously at the beauty of it all. And I would see clouds and green and rivers and it would just completely filled my eyes. The difference in observing the world or the universe from inside the space station, looking through the windows or being outside is what I describe as the same level of interaction that you can have looking at a beautiful aquarium from the safety of a room. When you're outside and all you have is a helmet and maybe one and a half inch of plexiglass in front of your eyes. You can see details and colors and shades, the level of detail that you can capture and the way you experience that universe is going to be very, very different. You want and you feel that you have become part of it and you can develop that sense of belonging. I think that the first impact of the first flight was that I did, I did see and I did sense how fragile, how, how small the Earth is. We, we are used to think of the Earth as something so vast and big and we don't, we don't think that what we do, our, our daily life, can affect some, such a vast system. But from space, 
you get a sense that every every individual, every living organism is somehow connected. Seeing the city lights at night where a place like Europe or the United States or Asia densely populated, everything is so interconnected and all those lights and all those lives are apparent. They, they are right in front of you all together and you think that you know, all, all we are doing somehow has, a, has an effect on everybody else. You come back from, a, from an experience like that thinking that that's what, what's happening and then you can see the effects, both the positive ones but mostly the negative ones, in a second flight and I think you, you have to acknowledge and grow an awareness and with that awareness comes the desire to, to share, share the experience and, and share that awareness. It's understanding that uh, the science that's telling us how we are changing and influencing the world has solid mathematical and, and solid mathematical base. And then you see the effects of it and you just interiorize it. You make it your own experience. And I think that that's what happened. Is that, that's why astronauts um, develop that awareness of and the desire to help the environment somehow in any way they can. Houston, this is the International Space Station. We are ready for the event. Houston ACR, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? Houston ACR, station has you loud and clear. Hi, I'm Charlie Precourt, former Space Shuttle Commander and the Vice Chairman of the Experimental Aircraft Association. Today, the crew aboard the International Space Station will be answering questions from EAA Young Eagles discovering flight through our Ray Aviation Scholarships. This should be a lot of fun. Let's hear what questions our next generation of aviators has for Bob and Doug. Hi, my name is Andrew Lelliot with EAA Chapter 468 out of Williamson, Georgia. How does the workload during launch and flight of the new SpaceX crew capsule compare to the same stages of flight aboard the space shuttle with the incorporation of newer technologies such as touchscreens? That's a great question, Andrew. And really the big benefit of a new vehicle like the Dragon SpaceX capsule is the amount of automation that's been put on board. Many of the systems that we monitored manually with the space shuttle or previous spacecraft have been replaced with automation to allow us to have a much bigger picture view as we operate the spacecraft on its way to the International Space Station. Hi, my name 
name is Shannon Daly from EAA Chapter 279 in Hanson, Massachusetts. Since you have a lot of experience in space and curious to know, is it difficult to adjust back and forth between 1G and 0G? Now that's an interesting question. Um, we've each gotten to fly twice on space shuttle missions and those missions were approximately two weeks long and I think we both felt that uh, adjusting to and from zero G our, our bodies adapted fairly quickly. This mission uh, for both of us is going to be a little bit different as uh, we've been aboard space station for over a month and a half now so our body has probably completely adjusted to zero G so the thinking is, is that we were we will likely have a longer process to readapt to uh, 1G back on Earth, and typical of a longer duration cruise, we'll have a, a rehabilitation program uh, with our strength and conditioning specialists when we get back, and uh, that's a 30 to 45 day process, and hopefully gets us right back in shape where we were before we left. Great question. Ryan Harris from EAA Chapter 485 in Pensacola, Florida. On behalf of my local EAA chapter and Civil Air Patrol Squadron, we would like to know what roadblocks you have faced during your career and how you have pushed through them while staying motivated. That's a great question. I think uh, one of the things that both Doug and I faced from a challenges perspective was uh, figuring out a way to even pay for college. And so luckily enough for us, we were able to uh, pursue ROTC scholarships and, and find a way to take that initial step in our education. And so uh, I would, you know, there are, there are challenges out there, but there are ways to overcome them. Reagan Buzzard from EAA Chapter 524 in Frederick, Maryland. I'm an incoming freshman and ROTC cadet at Emory Riddle Aeronautical University, Daytona Beach, where I am majoring in aerospace engineering. I recently obtained my pilot pod certificate and am interested in becoming an astronaut. What recommendations do you have for a student at the beginning of their college career to help guide them towards our ultimate goal of doing what you currently do for a living? Wow, that's a great question and I'm sure uh, there are a bunch of different answers, but I, but I think what I would uh, recommend is that, you know, the first thing is just excellence in everything that you do. So starting off your college career, probably your biggest goal should be to uh, Learn a lot about your field. Aeronautical engineering sounds like a great place uh, to, to, to start out with if you're pursuing a career as an astronaut and then do very well at it. And hopefully uh, you, you have a passion for it as well. I think that goes so far in uh, achieving excellence in a field is if you're passionate about it and, and you enjoy it uh, almost beyond anything else, that just makes that work so much easier to do. And so I would just say, uh, study hard, work hard, and uh, best of luck to you. Hi, my name is Jerdal Leroy Bruce from EAA Chapter 1027 in Willits, California. We all know that this is a tremendous step forward in space exploration. Where do you see yourselves in the future of U.S. space exploration? It's a really interesting question for both Doug and I as to what we would see ourselves doing in the future. I think if you had asked us when we were students at the military test pilot schools that uh, we went through what our dream job would have been, it would have been developing a, a new spacecraft that we were eventually going to fly on. And we, luckily enough, got to follow that dream and uh, achieve it. And I think our goal next is to do the same thing again. So hopefully the opportunity will present itself for us to continue to develop new spacecraft that will you know, make their way into low Earth orbit and beyond. Hi, my name is Alexander Strickland from EA Chapter 1254 in Camington, Missouri. Within the past year, I suffered a major knee injury and throughout the recovery process, my quad and calf muscles experienced muscle atrophy due to not using them. So my question is, in space, how do you keep the same thing from happening to you and your muscle systems? Wow, awesome question. We exercise every day in space. So we do aerobic exercise either with a uh, 
similar to an exercise bicycle or we have a treadmill and then we do uh, resistance exercise with what we call ARED which is Advanced uh, Resistive Exercise Device, a NASA acronym. But essentially it allows us to lift weights in space and provides resistance and so we can uh, keep our muscles uh, developed as we work through uh, several weeks and months in space. Uh, as you said, it's very easy to atrophy because you have no uh, gravity pulling on your body. You don't use your legs pretty much at all uh, during the day. Uh, you use your arms to translate. And uh, so it's a great way to, to keep yourself in a good shape. And we've seen over the years, uh, especially on the space station program, the last 20 years where astronauts have come back and in some cases in better physical shape than when they left the planet because you're exercising every day. So that's what we do. Uh, they're, they're, uh, the machines that we, that we have uh, take a fair amount of maintenance and they're fairly large. So as we uh, develop new technologies, we're gonna have to figure out ways to uh, make these uh, devices smaller as we venture out into the solar system. Hi, my name is Sophia Haig from EAA Chapter 179 in Albuquerque, NM. After going to space multiple times, is there any advice you would give your younger self prior to your first flight? You know, the kind of advice that we would give ourselves is, is much the same advice that we would give uh, any other folks who are pursuing uh, their first flight. And, and it's usually along the lines of make sure that you take a few minutes to, to enjoy it. While uh, there are plenty of things to do while you're in space, there are plenty of things to focus on to make sure that you get them exactly perfect so that you can get a future mission. Uh, it's important to, to enjoy yourself and it's important to take some mental mental images so that you can share that experience with students or coworkers or you know the rest of the country and the world when you come back and if you don't take those moments to do it the space flight will go by in a blink of an eye and uh, in some sense you'll have missed a, a big part of the mission which is sharing it with everyone else hi my name is matthew shaw from eaa chapter 770 in springfield illinois Glass cockpits and automation have been a major improvement in aviation as well as spaceflight. In your opinion, how big of an improvement is the Crew Dragon's displays over the space shuttle systems as well as the jets you flew during your military and NASA careers? Yeah, great question, and uh, I talk about it a lot. Uh, the shuttle, developed in the 1970s, it was uh, 2,000 switches and circuit breakers with uh, steam gauge upgrades over the years but it essentially didn't change too much uh, in the big scheme of things as far as situational awareness for the crew and it was very intensive for the crew to fly and operate so there was multiple people on the flight deck in order to successfully execute the mission with uh, some of the fifth generation fighters that both Bob and I have worked worked on and flown the uh, F-18 the F-22 it was more of a glass cockpit, heads-up display, very much intuitive for the uh, operator or the pilot, and uh, was much easier to uh, fly, essentially, because of all the situational awareness that the displays uh, brought to you. Crew Dragon is very similar, very intuitive displays, they're touchscreen displays, everything you need to know is on those displays, or either the display right in front of you or the display in between uh, Bob and I. So it's, uh, it's a tremendous leap in, in situational awareness, and what that allows you to do is monitor the vehicle much better than you would during our, our time in shuttle where it, it took just too much uh, brain power to fly sometimes and you needed uh, backup capability with another crew member. Hi, my name is Carter Allen from EAA Chapter 186 in Manassas, Virginia. How do you anticipate re-entry varying from your prior missions, and do you think that in the future there will be support for a direct landing like the booster rockets instead of a splashdown? Well, thanks, Carter. Uh, one of the things that we expect to see, of course, uh, coming back in a capsule versus the space shuttle is a lot higher G-loading as we come back through the atmosphere. 
So Space Shuttle was a relatively gentle, gentle return to Earth, um, specifically designed partially because the vehicle really couldn't handle uh, substantial loads with the wings and the size of the structure. The capsule is uh, quite a bit smaller and of course requires a quite a bit heavier loading in order to come back through the atmosphere and, and remain you know, landing at the appropriate location. I certainly believe that we'll have the capability in the future to do a very pinpoint and precise uh, landing uh, back on the ground, uh, maybe right back at the more like a helicopter pad landing with the spacecraft. The challenge is coming up with the am right amount of redundancy for a system like that and having it in place and so that uh, one of the things that the, a parachute system really provides is that al altitude, as the drogue chutes come out, as the main chutes come out, you have a, a little bit more time to anticipate what the down modes need to be from a redundancy perspective uh, if you're trying to put all of your all of your eggs in that final fraction of a second before touchdown to get those uh, thrusters on and get stopped uh, it, it's really challenging to manage that problem uh, someday folks will solve it we're just uh, not quite there yet with the level of redundancy we'd like to have in place for human spaceflight hi my name is Addison gear from EAA chapter 897 in Juneau Wisconsin what is something you wish someone had told you when you were just beginning your aviation and space career? Wow, great question. Um, I, I think for me, I, I wish uh, maybe I had had a little bit more advice on just what it was going to be like uh, going into the military. I came from a family that uh, had really no experience in the military before, and so it was uh, it, it was kind of one of those things where I just had to jump in uh, head first and uh, hope for the best and, and it ended up being uh, just a great fit for me but uh, going from a idyllic civilian life uh, and jumping right into the military uh, is a little bit of a transition and, and it was a it was a challenge at first but uh, I think frankly uh, everything else is, is just it turned out uh, great and I really enjoyed my time uh, in the Marine Corps uh, and in aviation. Just a tremendous, tremendous uh, enjoyable experience. Hi, my name is Brandon Slater from EAA Chapter 902 in Milano, Oregon. What kind of systems do you have to monitor on the Crew Dragon while in orbit? And what checklist did you go through before docking with the ISS? You know, we, we often get talk to uh, ask questions about the automation or the improvements that are out there and, and really we have to step back and, and think some about uh, what our primary role is which is monitoring for things to go right just in case they don't and so primarily the review that Doug and I performed as we approached the International Space Station was focused on problems maybe with that automation which would cause us to not continue with the with the docking maybe back away from the International Space Station or in some cases actually choose to, to fly all the way out of that uh, approach uh, corridor and, and come back in either a different orbit or even a different day later. And so we reviewed those procedures in case we needed to, uh, to follow them. Hi, my name is Tyler Pearson from Vintage Chapter 25 in Sacramento, California. Many young people, including myself, have been inspired by your recent launch, which made history. What advice would you give to anyone pursuing a similar career path? It's a great question, Tyler. I think the, the first thing is find something that you love to do. Uh, obviously, if it's a career uh, like Bob and I have pursued, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math is a great field. You know, some of those choices. And, and then do it well. The other thing to, to remember is uh, an education, uh, a long education, four-year degree. And then typically most astronauts uh, go to some sort of a postgraduate education as well. Do very well at what you, what you uh, pick for majors. And then understand that most astronauts, this is at least our second or third career by the time we get here. So building that experience in your field uh, is a great thing in order to be uh, selected as an astronaut and, and usually is a must. So those kinds of things are the things to think about, but uh, just remember, just do well at everything you do and, and be passionate about what you do. 
Hi, my name is William McCarthy from EAA Chapter 534 in Leesburg, Florida. What's your favorite place in time to look out the window at an International Space Station? I think there's kind of two answers to that question. Uh, for those of us who've had a chance to do a spacewalk, I think the favorite place for us on the International Space Station uh, to spend time is, is outside uh, looking at the Earth below us, and uh, that's a wonderful place to do it. Of course, we don't do spacewalks uh, every day, and, and not everybody is uh, lucky enough to have that opportunity. Uh, we do have a windowed section on the bottom of the International Space Station called the Cupola. Uh, it was actually delivered to the station by a, a shuttle flight that I was on, STS-130, and then we were able to go outside and do a spacewalk to open up those windows for the first time, which was, which was really cool. That's definitely our, our favorite place, of course, if you can't be outside. On behalf of EAA, a big thank you to my colleagues at NASA for providing this wonderful opportunity to our Ray Aviation Scholars. If you'd like to learn more about our EAA and our programs for young people, come visit us at eaa.org. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes our event. Thank you to all the participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.
Mission Control Human Space Flight is made possible through the generous support of Alabama Bicentennial Commission, the Daniel Foundation of Alabama, Wells Fargo, the Malone Family Foundation, the Robert R. Meyer Foundation. Mission Control is a production of the IQ Learning Network, a division of Alabama Public Television. You're looking good here. Roger. Hi, I'm Dorian. Carmen here. This is Luke, standing by. Here's Chandel. And I'm Kaylee. We're interrupting your regularly scheduled programming for a very important reason. As members of the STEM Brigade, our mission is clear. Learn science, earn badges, and help others to learn too along the way. Right now, we're working on earning our cadet rank in space exploration. And our squad has a very important mission. To learn all about the history and the science behind human spaceflight. And as we sprint through this learning marathon, we'll try and earn six different merit badges. The space race, rocket boosters, shuttle, life systems, future exploration, and space computer controls. We'll be reviewing the badges we earn throughout the program, so pay attention and follow along. And you too can be honorary virtual members of the STEM Brigade. We're ready to blast off. Mission Control, do you copy? Since the dawn of humankind, the stars have been there waiting for us. But for the majority of human existence, leaving Earth was nothing more than the desire of an overactive imagination. If only they'd known, the stars have always been reachable. They were just waiting on us to find the right path. Last century, following the birth of the airplane, scientists like Robert H. Goddard, perhaps the first great rocket scientist, started getting close. Rocket technology advanced quickly, especially during the Second World War when rocket technology was used, regrettably, as a new kind of weapon. But from the dust of that terrible war came something better, the space race. The space race was between two of the most powerful countries to emerge from the rubble of World War II, the Soviet Union and the United States. The space race ultimately amounted to a series of one-ups, as the Soviets and the Americans raced to see who could accomplish what amazing feat first. The Soviets struck first, putting the first satellite in space, the first human, the first spacewalk. But the Americans were right behind them, step for step, thanks to early space programs like Mercury, which, among its many accomplishments, sent American John Glenn orbiting around the world. The two powers were both on a chase for the same finish line. Who would be the first to get to the moon? We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. On July 20th, 1969, the Americans did the impossible. That's one small step for man. One giant thing for man. Neil Armstrong, along with Buzz Aldrin, became the first human beings to ever walk on the moon as part of the Apollo 11 mission. It was a day that changed the world. Two men walked on the moon that day, but the support of thousands of men and women back on Earth put them there, and they all deserve credit for this landmark accomplishment of the human spirit. When astronauts say Houston into their radio, they're referring to Mission Control at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Mission Control has been the center of communication between Earth and human spaceflight from the early days of Gemini and Apollo to communication with the International Space Station today. I'm joined today by legendary flight director Gene Kranz, who was flight director of the Apollo 11 mission that first landed on the moon, and Apollo 13, where an explosion on board the spacecraft put Mission Control to the ultimate test. Thank you so much for being here with us today. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for the opportunity. What is the role of Mission Control? Mission Control is a center where you pull all the people together, where you've got communications to the launch site, you've got communications to the tracking station. So it's basically the overall hub for communications. In addition to that, the controllers here are prepared to take any actions necessary for crew safety and mission success. Could you tell me a little bit about your job as a flight director? 
As flight director, I have the ultimate responsibility for performance in this room here. During the course of a mission, I am the final person to make decisions. There is no higher authority than me. And as mission time approaches, I look at the decisions I got to make and I see if I got a set of notes to fit that and I write it down as sort of a timeline. Because the one thing I have to do in this room is to manage the clock. So it's up to me to know how to use every second that we've got in the decision process. Most of our decisions are ours. Frequently I'll get one that's down in the minutes. Ones that we do in seconds, I have to know instantly and tell the guy what I want done. July 20th, 1969, moon landing. As the world watched, Houston waited for the call. What was the feeling like in this room? That moment, that time in history, we knew that we had two minutes, 120 seconds of fuel in that tank at a 30% moderate throttle setting. So I had one controller in this room who had a stopwatch. He was counting out seconds of fuel remaining. Now at the time he's doing this, the crew is trying to go around and find their landing site. As he got down close to the surface, the dust of the surface was moving with him. So it was really hard to figure out where can I land and where's the right place to land, etc. And we kept calling out 60 seconds of fuel remaining. 60 seconds. At about the time we said 30 seconds, we saw the crew going through engine shutdown. 30 seconds. Over. Okay, engine stop. And that's when we heard the word Houston Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. And boy, all through this thing I had a, I had a hold of one of these handles on, on the, because in those last seconds, it was totally up to the crew. My job was over. I got him down close and he had to land. But I was holding on to that guy and I don't think I took a breath. And that was true of everybody in this room. Roger, Twin Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, Apollo 13, the infamous. Houston, we've had a problem. What was going on in your head at that moment? You have to think your way through problems. So as soon as I heard that call, okay, we've had a problem here. Earlier in my shift, I had had three minor electrical problems. And my immediate thought is, uh, it's a minor electrical problem, we'll sort it out, we'll put the crew to sleep, and then we'll work the problem. Stand by, Verdine, we're looking at it. Then about a couple minutes later, one of my controllers said there was a pretty bang, big bang associated with that. The crew reported a bang, and I said, okay, something I don't understand is happening right here. I better proceed more carefully. And then about 10 minutes later, Jim Lovell's looking outside the hatch window, and he sees a jet pluming, plume going out there. And he says, Houston, I think we're venting our oxygen. We are, uh, we are venting something out uh, into the uh, into space. Roger, we copy your venting. And that was when I went into survival mode. Say, OK, I'll flight controller, settle down, quit your guessing, let's start working this problem. And that was really the key to getting this room now focused on the problem at hand. We had to make several tough decisions. We had to make the decision, how are we going to come home? Because we're right in the area where the gravity of the moon is balanced to the gravity of an Earth. So we're right in between those two. And if I use my big engine, I can be home in a day and a half. If I go around the moon, that's my other option. It's going to take four to five days to get back home. So which way am I going to come home? I don't know what happened to that spacecraft, so I better be careful. So I'm going to go around the moon. Here in mission control, we're looking uh, now looking towards an alternate mission. Swinging around the moon and using the uh, lunar module power system. If I go around the moon, I got a two-day spacecraft. It's going to take four days to five days to get back home. So now I got to figure out how to take that two-day spacecraft, water, oxygen, electrical power, and stretch it out. And we have a procedure for getting power from the lamp. We'd like you to copy down. Because the key thing is, once the crew's up in space, you don't want to make a mistake because you're too conservative. You got to wait until you got enough data to make the right decision. Another chair in the control room as we had splashed out. What advice do you have for a young person who's interested in a career in mission control? Dream, aim high, never surrender. Dream is your goal. What do you think you're best at 
and start going after that goal. And what you have to do is you have to have that goal, that dream, so strong that you'll pick up and carry on. It's what I call tenacity, staying tough, working tough, being tough when it relates to going after your goal. So dream, aim high, never surrender. That's great advice. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. It was really nice meeting you. Will you give me five? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I enjoyed it too. Dream, aim high, never surrender. That's exactly what the Apollo astronauts did. And so did the many men and women who built the incredible machine that got us to the moon, the mighty Saturn V rocket. Among its many contributions, Huntsville is where the Saturn V was dreamt up and designed by German rocket scientist Werner von Braun. It's also where the Saturn V's mighty F1 engines were initially tested and continues to be a major force in the exploration of space to this day. During my visit to the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, I headed out to Rocket Park to learn more. I'm joined now by Ed Stewart, head archivist at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, to talk about rocket development in Huntsville. Thanks for being with me today. My pleasure. So can you tell me a little bit about the early days of rocket design in the U.S.? So a lot of American rocket technology is really based on or evolved out of the V-2s that were developed in Germany during World War II. The V-2 was a liquid-propelled rocket that really was a, a terrifying uh, invention. And the masterminds of the V-2 program was a gentleman named Werner von Braun, who actually came over to the United States after the end of World War II and became the head of the guided missile development program for the U.S. Army. And then eventually NASA was formed in 1958. He started working on civilian space exploration based projects. And so when Brown and most of his team transferred over to Marshall Space Flight Center when it was opened in 1960. And that's kind of where you see the beginning of the development of these big space exploring rockets. If you look, for instance, at the Saturn I behind us, the tanks, the skinny tanks that are kind of clustered together around the outside of the first stage, are all stretched out redstone rocket propellant tanks. And so they took those kind of pre-existing elements, combined them together to produce a one and a half million pound capable first stage. And that is the first sort of heavy lift or really big rocket developed for the United States. And it was also the first vehicle developed specifically for space exploration as, a, as far as like kind of a ground up design. Building off the successes of the Saturn I, Dr. Von Braun's team went to work building the biggest, most powerful rocket the world had ever seen to take us all the way to the moon, the Saturn V. The Saturn V was comprised of three stages. The first had five massive F1 engines that generated over seven and a half million pounds of thrust at sea level. The second stage, designed to push the rocket through the upper atmosphere, had five smaller but even more efficient J2 engines, creating 1.1 million pounds of thrust. Finally, the third stage of single J2 put the Saturn in a temporary parking orbit before firing up again for something called translunar injection, the astronauts' trip to the moon at more than 24,000 miles an hour. While on the way, the crew unpacked the Apollo Command and lunar modules through a delicate series of docking maneuvers to prepare for lunar orbit and landing, and finally jettisoned the last stage of the mighty Saturn rocket. Over. While the Saturn V was a beast of a machine, you might be surprised to learn that today, there's thousands times more computer memory in the smartphone in your pocket than the Saturn V had in its entire enormous structure. But that's not to suggest the Saturn V was dumb. It was anything but, especially for 1960s computer technology. While still at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, I discovered all about how it worked with the help of docent and former Apollo computer programmer, Luke Talley. So can you tell me a little bit about how the computers on the Saturn V worked? In the 1960s, what we could put together with a digital machine really couldn't do all the job we needed to, to guide a, a missile of Saturn V. So what we have is a combination of a digital computer and an analog computer. So this is a 26-bit machine. And each of these blocks now has 4,000 words of memory. All right? So there's 16,000 and another 16,000. So when the rocket's flying, both of these are executing the same flight program. They're comparing the outputs to make sure they're getting the same results. 
during the flights, we only had a few miscompares ever. Even though it looks kind of old and antique like it, it worked quite well. So the redundancy is, is strictly for reliability. And the logic itself, we have these circuit boards. Each circuit board has 35 chips on one side, 35 on the other. Give you a feel for yesterday and today. The processor that we built up here with this technology, we would execute about 8,000 calculations a second while it's flying, okay? Your cell phone's doing probably two and a half million or so calculations a second. So, in order to make this thing fly, you have to do navigation, guidance, and control. The digital computer could do these times functions. And it did navigation and guidance, but the control function was actually transferred over to this thing, looked like a barrel over here, an analog computer. The analog computer, it flows in, you're multiplying or dividing or whatever you're doing, comparing the data as it comes through, and it just keeps flowing, all right? And it goes right on out. And in real time, whereas the digital computer, it'll get an interrupt, and it'll go do something, and then it'll go back to doing what it was doing previously. Okay, the computer itself does not have an operating system. So we have a series of signals coming in. When the signal pops up, we go do something. The next signal pops up, we go do something else, all right? And then we also have time functions, in other words, with the clock. When this clock comes up, that says to start navigation, guidance, and control. Start it, navigation, guidance, and control. So we have clock signals and we have interrupts from the rocket itself. Thanks for meeting me today and thanks for telling me all about computers. You're welcome. All aircraft rely on a force called thrust to work, which is generally created through applying Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. What does that mean? A good example is rowing a canoe. To move the canoe forward, you push back against the water. This action, pushing back, creates the opposite reaction of moving the canoe forward. In a propulsion system for a rocket, Newton's third law is applied by exploding fuel and a source of oxygen, or oxidizer, in a combustion chamber, which, as every action creates an equal and opposite reaction, this combustion creates a reaction of exhaust, which works as a thrusting force on the system. It's amazing it works. It's more amazing we figured it out. But perhaps the most amazing part of it all? Leaving the Earth was always physically possible, even when humankind believed it was just a fantasy. We just needed the right technology to take advantage of the physics that were already a part of our world. Who knows what other seemingly impossible tasks humankind will make possible in the future. Speaking of rocket engines, meet the RS-25, formerly the main engine of NASA's space shuttle and, with some amazing new upgrades, rocket engine of the future. Prime to give the Saturn V's F1s a run for their money. These Super RS-25 engines will power NASA's space launch system, the vehicle that will one day take us back to the moon and even beyond to other planets like Mars. I headed down to NASA's Stennis Space Center in Mississippi to get a first-hand look. So this is an RS-25 flight engine. So when, when was this originally designed and how has it been updated since then? It actually flew during the space shuttle program on several space shuttle missions. And so what we're doing now for, with this engine is we're actually repurposing it from the space shuttle program and actually taking it to making it a little bit smarter and a lot more powerful for the uh, space launch system. How exactly does a rocket engine work? So really, what's best for us to do is just go upstairs, we'll get real close to the parts of the engine, I can point out and talk about how we use liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen to uh, produce the thrust that we need on these engines. So these, these, these areas here, this, this thing is a high pressure pump. And so there's one just like it on the other side of the engine. This pump is pumping liquid oxygen. On the other side of the engine, the pump is pumping liquid hydrogen. So liquid hydrogen is our fuel. Liquid oxygen is our oxidizer. Liquid hydrogen is the second coldest element on Earth. It's minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit. And then liquid oxygen on this side, when we're talking about, it's around minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So normally when we think about liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, coming together we think about water and we say okay we have hydrogen and oxygen and it comes together and we make water so how do we make rocket fuel out of water is, is really the, 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 the cool question right so what we do is 
we actually take these two elements and we put them under extreme pressure, somewhere between 9,000 and 11,000 pounds of pressure inside the engine. When they come together at that high pressure, they actually hit each other and explode. And that explosion is what we're controlling in the main combustion chamber that comes out of the nozzle. And that ex explosion coming out of the nozzle is the thrust of this engine and it's making that thrust. So coming out of the nozzle at the bottom is 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So you think about instantaneously it goes from these cold, cold elements to plus 6,000 degrees. And that's what's making this, how this engine works as far as producing thrust. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. It, uh, it's so awesome. Very interesting. I learned so much today. Over. All right, let's check in and see what badges we've earned. So for now, we've only got the Space Race and Rocket Boosters. Two down, four to go. After reaching the moon, which many consider to be the end of the space race, NASA's human spaceflight program began to change directions and focus on humans staying in space as long as possible. Following the Skylab program of the 1970s, NASA began its longest running program to date, the Space Shuttle Program. The Space Shuttle was a bold new reimagining of manned space exploration. Low Earth orbit, an orbit around Earth some 1,200 miles above the planet's surface, was now the goal. And instead of rockets and capsules that were one and done, now reusable winged orbiters would be used. First launched in 1981, NASA's fleet was comprised of five orbiters. All in all, America's space fleet flew 133 successful voyages beyond the Earth, leading to countless scientific advancements. Without the shuttle, we'd also be without one of the most important scientific devices of the 20th century, the Hubble Space Telescope, a window to the cosmos that's given humankind some incredible first-time peeks into some of the universe's most amazing sights. While at Kennedy, I had an amazing opportunity to learn more about the shuttle program firsthand from one of the brave astronauts who flew as part of the program. I'm joined now by astronaut Charlie Walker, who actually served as a payload specialist on this shuttle right here behind me, the Space Shuttle Atlantis. So Charlie, tell me a little bit about your experience on this shuttle. Were there any moments that really stood out to you? Well, launch is always a very memorable experience. Atlantis, during the entire flight, had virtually no electrical or mechanical problems, which was a joy for the crew because we could spend more time getting the useful things done and looking out the window. So what were some of the most innovative things on the space shuttle? Innovative wings to start with. The earliest manned or piloted uh, spacecraft was uh, a capsule. So wings was a very innovative uh, approach to, uh, to space travel, uh, not only launching to space, but uh, also returning to Earth. And the wings were only useful uh, on the return to Earth. Another innovation was uh, this Canadian-provided robotic arm. Uh, it was an international project, very useful, including on my flight on Atlantis, in which two of our crew members did a, uh, a unique spacewalk to demonstrate construction uh, in space. So, what would you say the training was like to become an astronaut? To work inside a spacecraft in orbit uh, takes certain necessary skills and personal characteristics. For instance, you had to uh, go through a, a screening process before you even went into training to, uh, for the managers to determine that you weren't claustrophobic. Uh, you can't be afraid of small spaces in a spacecraft because you can't open the door and get out. And uh, the training then included a lot of, uh, of course, systems training. Now, I didn't need to learn every system in there. The mission specialists uh, knew how to operate every orbital system with the spacecraft while it's in orbit. The pilots fly it up and fly it back home. And they didn't teach me to do that. That was fine. I was a payload specialist. And then, of course, I had to uh, be very uh, uh, trained up on my particular research, as well as learning to work with my fellow crew members. That took uh, well over a year. What lessons did we learn from the shuttle program that we're applying to the future of space flight? The space shuttle was the first to utilize in that capacity solid propellant first stage booster rockets. We learned lots of lessons from uh, using those booster rockets to launch shuttles into space and solid rocket boosters are planned uh, and are in development and testing right now for use in the next big uh, NASA launch vehicle, the Space Launch System. And the engines on the space shuttle are being modified for use on that next big launch 
uh, system as well. But also learning to, uh, to train efficiently and effectively crews to work together, that was an important lesson that's being used in the future. The overall efficient technology that uh, was used to control, to do life support uh, on board space shuttle, so all of those things, those are what comes immediately to mind as uh, lessons learned from uh, space shuttle for future space activities. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. My pleasure. Thanks to the shuttle program, NASA was able to set its sights, with the help of the rest of the world's space community, on an even greater goal, the world's first long-term home in outer space, the International Space Station. NASA, along with Russia, Japan, the European Space Agency, and Canada slowly constructed the International Space Station for nearly a decade and a half, from 1998 to 2011, the same year NASA finally ended the shuttle program. The ISS is a major achievement of human ingenuity and science, and as of today, has housed more than 236 people from 18 countries. Truly, a space station serving all of humankind. Thanks to the countless experiments that can only be studied in low Earth orbit, amazing advancements have been made. But none of those experiments could ever have gotten off the ground without the help of an amazing support team in the Rocket City. We're standing outside the Payload Operations Integration Center at the Marshall Space Flight Center. This is the primary space station science command post, and it is here that all of the International Space Station science experiments are coordinated. I am joined now by Payload Operations Director Christy Robertson. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's good to be here. So why is this called the Payload Operations Integration Center? What exactly is a payload? A payload is the experiment itself. So each uh, experiment that a scientist launches to station is called a, a payload. What happens on a typical day in the Payload Operations Integration Center? Seven days a week, 24 hours a day. A typical day uh, begins with a crew wake. Throughout the day, our job here at the POIC is to interface with the crew for their science experiments to ensure that those experiments are executed and be kind of liaison uh, between them and the payload developer that actually developed the science experiment. So what do you guys do to help the astronauts in space doing these experiments? Uh, when they have questions or issues, anomalies, they'll call down to POIC and then we work to get them an answer and a resolution so that they can proceed through their experiment. What sorts of scientific fields are researched up there? So we have everything from combustion to rodent research. Uh, we also have various life sciences, human research sciences that are done. So many of the astronauts participate in what we call human research experiments, which are those things that evaluate essentially the toll that space takes on a human body. How does the payload operation team prepare for a scientific expedition? So we start about a year and a half out preparing for each expedition. And part of what we do is actually some on-hands training. So we have a center downstairs that I can take you and show you, and we can kind of see some of the on-hands training that we get. Okay, cool. One of the things we have for our controllers here uh, to be able to utilize when they're developing procedures as well as getting ready for operations or our hands-on environment. This is the lab that we're currently in. It is a a true to life size mock-up of the lab that is on space stations in the U.S. laboratory. So one of the racks that we have there is this one, which is the MSG, which is a micro uh, gravity science glove box. So as you can see, the work volume will extend. Uh, that just allows the crew members more functionality. So if you want to, you can go ahead and stick your hands in there, see what it would feel like to have a glove on, and see what adjustments you can make. Create a pressure right here for you. You should feel, see these other gloves kind of fill up around you. Thank you so much for teaching me all this stuff. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, and thank you for your time. Providing for the day-to-day -day needs and resources of the men and women living and working on the ISS presents constant technical challenges, like recycling precious onboard resources with its water recovery system. The ISS's water recovery system provides clean water to the astronauts by recycling and purifying water waste on board. It does this with the help of the Water Processor Assembly, and something called the UPA, or, well, 
the urine processor assembly because it recycles, yep, urine. On the ISS, the number one priority of a number one is to recycle it. Urine is turned to water with the help of a low pressure vacuum distillation process. Distillation is the process of heating a mixture of liquids until they become a gas, then condensing the gas back into separate liquids, which successfully removes the clean water from the urine. The water is then moved into the WPA's purification system. The ISS maintains extremely strict purity standards before any recycled water can be consumed by the crew especially recycled urine. I am here with Jennifer Pruitt, who is the project manager for the International Space Station Urine Processing Assembly. Why do we recycle urine and sweat for astronauts in space? When we go somewhere where there isn't water available, like in space, we need to have those systems. It's crucial for humans to survive. It's very expensive to ship up all the water that we need, so what we have to do is recycle it, which is a much more cost-effective way of giving the astronauts water. What percentage of the water on the ISS is recycled? Of all the water that's on Space Station, we have a couple different sources. We have our urine, and that's where a lot of the water comes out of our bodies. There's also some that comes out in our breath and in our sweat when we work out. So if we take all of that together, overall we recycle about 92% of the water, maybe a little bit higher, and we're trying to get as close as we can to that 100%. We have developed our hardware here uh, that we now use on the space station. So I'm going to show you our urine processor that we have right here. This is the same as what is on ISS now with a few tweaks, but we have these clear containers that we use on the ground only. The ones on station are big metal tanks. In, in space, people would pee, it would fill up, and when it got to a certain point, that would start the process, so it runs in a batch. We have a couple pumps that move the fluid through. These two here, one moves all of our fluid and it's a peristaltic pump. So it's kind of like your esophagus where it pushes everything through, trying to not use gravity. So it, it's just that push. We have a purge pump, which is reducing the pressure in the system so that we don't have to boil the water at high a temperature. So to try to save power, we instead bring the pressure down so we're lowering the pressure so we can boil the water at a lower temperature as well. And we do that in this guy here. This is the distillation assembly where we actually boil the water. He's kind of like a washing machine. He's a big drum. The urine goes in, it's boiled, and the steam comes out, and then they're separated from that point on. So the good clean water is what goes on to the water processing, the next cycle, and all of the brine We'll come back to the beginning and that will be concentrated until we get enough water out and then that brine is what's thrown away at the end. Thank you so much for showing me all of this stuff and explaining to me all these awesome processes. You are so welcome and if you ever want to come back and help donate to our Mars mission, you are more than welcome. <laughs> While the ISS is an unprecedented, literally out-of-this-world creation, it sometimes requires maintenance and repairs. When something needs to be altered or fixed by an astronaut on the outside of the station, they perform what is known as an extravehicular activity, or EVA, and a very special tool is required. A spacesuit. Spacesuits are more than just an astronaut's Sunday best. They're highly engineered life support systems in their own right allowing astronauts to survive and work in the cold vacuum of space. While in Huntsville, I was able to make a stop at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center to learn more about them. Hello, I'm here with Joseph Vick, who is the manager of museum education here at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville. What can you tell me about the history of space suits? Space suits originated here on Earth for exploration of the Earth. When we had the need to go and dive, so think of really old school diving suit. Post that, we went from exploring the oceans to exploring the skies. So as astronauts, we begin to explore past our atmospheres, we need even more protection from those lack of pressures. The first of those were used during our Mercury mission, so it was the first manned mission. The suit they had was a very early elementary spacesuit. The second manned mission of NASA was the Gemini suit. They needed to develop a new suit so that they could exit out of the capsule. The first American to do that was Ed White. And then for Apollo, they needed a very much substantial suit 
that would enable them to not only get out of their vehicle, but walk on a surface that was foreign to us. What it would be like to go into space without a spacesuit. So I need your help. If you could put a little bit of pressure on top, that'll provide our earth pressure, which is 14.7 pounds per square inch. That's what helps us maintain our shape and function, just like Astro Duck here. I'm gonna remove the pressure from this chamber. So it's just as if we're going to have Astro Duck in outer space. So as I remove the pressure, the air pressure within, notice what's happening to our Astro Duck. There's no more pressure to keep Astro Duck as he was shaped here on Earth. So he would expand and expand until eventually pop. So from Astro Duck's perspective, you need a spacesuit. Spacesuits have multi-layers, so each layer has its own importance for protection of the astronaut. So notice the first on the outside piece, it's mostly for protection from flying debris when you're in space. Micrometeorite garment. So if anything were to hit this, it would bounce off and not cause any harm to the astronaut. You have layers, multiple layers, of a mylar-like material that provides a thermal protection. Other layers are what are called pressure bladders, which allow the pressure inside of the suit to maintain that pressure. And then you have at the very closest to the skin, this ventilation garment, which is the movement of the water over the pipe so that water would flow over the astronaut's skin and body, creating a cooling sensation for the astronaut. Thank you for all this knowledge. Next time I see you, I'll have my own personal space suit. Oh, great, and I'll catch you on Mars. Over. The place where all of NASA's iconic launches began is Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida, America's spaceport. I was lucky enough to get special access to the newly renovated Launch Pad 39B, where Apollo and shuttle missions were once launched and where they'll soon be joined by the Space Launch System. I'm here with Tim McDaniel, who is the Launchpad 39 Facility Manager. So Tim, can you talk us through getting ready for a launch? What kind of things happen on the pad? They have to have the electricity hooked up to it, they have to have water hooked up to it, and just like your car, it has to have fuel. On each side of the launch pad, there's liquid hydrogen on one side, and there's liquid oxygen on the other side. They bring the fuels together and they fill the rocket. Then once it's fueled, they do all their preparations and getting ready for it. They do all their checkouts, they do all the electrical checkouts, the man checkouts, the systems checkouts. This water tower over here, it has several thousand gallons of water in that tank. This tank actually drops every bit of water out of that tank in one minute. It flows from that tower and it goes up through the mobile launcher and it has some big heads that spray water in the direction of the flames where it comes out the bottom of the rocket. And that helps for sound suppression because as you can imagine, it'd be very, very loud. What modifications are currently being made to the launch pad for SLS? They redone the flame trench. They put all new bricks in the flame trench. They also, currently, they're underway. They're making a new liquid hydrogen tank. This liquid hydrogen tank will be the largest in the world. It will be approximately three times the size of the current one we have. Well, thank you so much for meeting with me today. Thank you. Time for another badge review. We're adding shuttle and life systems to our collection. Home stretch now, guys. Just two more to go. And to keep us moving, let's kick it back to Kaylee and Shandell, who are learning about the future of the United States Manned Space Exploration Program. Ever since the shuttle program ended in 2011, NASA has had no fleet to send astronauts to the International Space Station, while private companies like SpaceX, Boeing, and Northrop Grumman have learned to launch satellites and ISS supplies at launch sites around the country, and NASA has launched rovers like Curiosity to Mars, the agency has relied on the Russian space program and its Soyuz rockets to deliver astronauts to the space station. But NASA won't be without a space vehicle for much longer. The Space Launch System, NASA's super heavy lift expendable launch vehicle that's ushering in a new direction for NASA's space fleet in the tradition of the Saturn V, will be the most powerful rocket in existence. 
with thrust capacities even greater than its moon-delivering ancestor, and with crew on board the Orion capsule up top, NASA will once again be able to send astronauts distances beyond low Earth orbit. I'm here with Scott Wilson, NASA Orion Productions Operation Manager, and Jules Schneider, Lockheed Martin Orion Productions Operation Manager. Thank you so much for joining with me today. Well, thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Can you give me a brief history of the Orion program? After the shuttle program, uh, we were looking to decide uh, where do we go? 250 miles above the planet and that's where the ISS is, and we really wanted to begin exploring deep space, which is getting us back to the moon and Mars and beyond. So we, we did a lot of studies trying to figure out uh, what would our spacecraft look like, and eventually that led to Orion, and uh, that's what we're building today. And why did we go with the capsule design again? Well, in the early studies, we looked at should it have wings like a shuttle, should it be a capsule or variants of those, and uh, the winged idea is really good for shuttle when you go to low Earth orbit and you're returning to the planet. Uh, you use those wings in the last uh, parts of entry when you're back in the atmosphere but from a deep space exploration it's a lot of weight that you take that you don't really use for your whole mission uh, another piece was safety driven so a capsule by its design uh, if you lose the ability to control the spaceship it's still going to land it lands like a badminton birdie it might not land where you want it to but it but it lands and the crew is safe and so it has some safety aspects to it that that's important to us so those are the two reasons it looks like it does today Jules, can you describe some of the big advances that set Orion apart from its predecessors? So uh, let's go all the way back to the Apollo program because that was the last capsule program we had. Um, as you can imagine, from the 1960s to now, advances in just technology on many different fronts from computers or computing uh, capabilities and speeds to materials to advanced uh, manufacturing processes like 3D printing. So almost in every category that it takes to design and build uh, a spacecraft like Orion, there have been huge advances. You'll notice the solar arrays here, right? So, so shuttle and Apollo used commodities on board to generate electricity, and that me meant you could only generate it for a limited amount of time until you run out of those commodities. With the solar arrays, now we can generate electricity indefinitely when you're in space. That's kind of one simple example. What are the biggest challenges of a long space trip, and how is Orion meeting them? If you're in low Earth orbit at the space station, for instance, you can return home in, in 90 minutes or so. You may not come down exactly where you want to, but you can get home pretty quickly. If you're going to the moon, it could be days until you return, and, and if you're going to Mars, it could be years. So the further you move away from the planet, the more redundancy and things you build into your spacecraft. Jules, what are the launch plans for Orion and SLS? When will we be aiming for Mars? Well, the next orbital test flight is called Exploration Mission 1. Uh, we actually are building the Orion for Exploration Mission 1 right now. It's almost finished. Uh, and the plan for it is to launch uh, late next year, uh, maybe early the following year. Beyond that, we have Exploration Mission 2, which we're also building uh, here at the Kennedy Space Center as we speak. Uh, I believe that's in the 2022-23 time frame, and that'll be the first crewed mission. So we will have people, astronauts, on board EM2. And then Mars uh, is probably the mid-2030s. And prior to Mars, NASA's plans are to put a, uh, a, the Gateway, uh, which is a, uh, uh, a spacecraft, orbiting the moon. And so uh, before we go to Mars, our plan will be to go to the moon multiple times and then use that as a launching pad for a Mars mission. Wow, well thank you both very much for meeting with me today. No, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. It was nice talking to you. Thanks. Very nice. While Kaylee was learning about the mission of the Orion program at Kennedy, Shandell was at Johnson Space Center in Houston to learn even more about the Orion capsule. We are in Building 9 at Johnson Space Center. Building 9 is home to NASA astronaut training and space vehicle mock-up facilities. Behind me is a full-scale mock-up of the Orion Crew Exploration Vehicle, and I'm joined here by Orion engineer Nujud Maranci. Thank you for being here with us today. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. So I understand that the Orion will sit on top of the SLS rocket. What can you tell me about its design? So one of the key parts of the design of Orion, we can abort it anytime during ascent, and once we get out in space, Orion can always turn around and come home as well. So that's a really a fundamental part of our design, was making sure the crew is safe throughout the whole mission. And how do you keep the astronauts safe in here? 
So there's a lot of ways we do it. So first off, there's redundancy. So everything has a backup to it. There's multiple tanks of water, there's extra computers. So no matter what happens, we can always actually come home on the backup system that's on board. One of the fundamental parts of spaceflight is keeping the crew safe by having redundancy and then having lots of our contingencies planned out ahead of time to be able to respond to those emergencies. What will it be like for astronauts to live in Orion while in space? So it's a uh, kind of like a camping trip. Uh, they'll be inside, we can have four of them in there, and they'll have to bring all of their food and clothing, and they've got a shower and a waste management system. Uh, it's actually in the floor in there, um, and they bring sleeping bags. Um, so they'll be doing experiments throughout the day, they'll be monitoring the ship's uh, progress, but then they have to do lots of exercise so we can keep their uh, musculoskeletal system from degrading. They'll be eating meals, they'll be having leisure time, and what are your responsibilities as an Orion engineer? So uh, I'm actually the mission analysis lead for the uh, program, and my team are actually designing the missions to the moon and home again. So we have to make sure that when we're done building Orion, we can actually accomplish the missions, and the mission designs are something Orion can fly. Can we take a closer look? You bet. Let's go inside. Awesome. So inside here, this is the Orion medium fidelity mock-up, and this is here to train the astronauts as well as allow the engineers to figure out what the design looks like on the inside so we can make sure everything's going in and will fit when the space vehicle actually flies. Well, I see the controls in there, so can you tell me how they control this vehicle? So the crew will actually fly it, but most of the vehicle flight is automated. So we all have software that's on board controlling it. There's uh, thrusters and engines that are in the service module that would be beneath where we are right now. And that actually flies the spaceship with the ground control monitoring and then the astronauts providing oversight over what's going on. Thank you so much for talking with me today. You're welcome. Thanks for I really coming. enjoyed it. <laughs> in order for the SLS to make it to Mars and beyond, we're going to need a lot of power. The RS-25 engines are more than up to the task. But before the engines are ready to be used in any real-life situations, they have to be tested rigorously and for years to ensure that they'll perform as required. To learn more about this all-important testing process, I got an opportunity to speak to one of the engineers working tirelessly to get these engines ready for launch. We are standing near test stands at Stennis Space Center in Hancock County, Mississippi. I'm now joined by Tommy Carroll, a NASA engineer. So why don't we test the physical engine instead of just using a computer? We use computer modeling for a lot of different things. We use it in design. We use it to check out clearances of hardware. We also use them to model what should be happening inside of the engine. And when we run that engine, the physical engine, and actually see it, we're baselining our models. But we're also looking at some of the variables that we're going to see. And that's why we test. What is the engine test today going to tell us about? We're going to be looking at a green run controller. That means a brand new controller, the computer that tells the engine what it needs to do. So what's the next step from here and how many more steps are there going to be until the engine's ready for launch? So this engine that we're testing today is a development engine and that just means that we use it for testing parts, not for testing the whole rocket engine. But the very next engine that we're going to test is a flight engine that will fly in space. So we'll take that engine after we test it, we'll ship it from here to another facility called the Michoud Assembly Facility. We'll install it on the rocket along with three other engines, so have a total of four rocket engines on that. We'll take that, that's called the stage, we'll bring that here, we'll mount it on that test stand, and from there we'll test it again. Once we've done that test, we'll put it on a barge again called the Pegasus, and we'll ship that barge from here down to Florida. And they'll put the whole rocket together there, and then roll it out to the launch pad. Awesome, great information. I can't wait to see this test. It's gonna be good. Oh yeah. Yeah. engines like the RS-25, you need a lot of fuel and a pretty big gas tank. We're at the liquid hydrogen test stand at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center with NASA's structural engineers Robert Bobo and Sam Stevens. Thank you for talking to me guys. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Robert, can you give me an overview of the systems and the components of the SLS? Sure, and I'll set it with reference to the test article that's behind us here. 
test article that you see behind us is the liquid hydrogen tank for our new SLS launch vehicle. The hydrogen tank is our fuel tank, if you will, for the entire vehicle. The liquid engines on this vehicle run on liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Those are the propellants that we use to produce the thrust. In addition to that, we have a solid rocket booster attached to each side of this liquid hydrogen tank for added thrust to get through the Earth's atmosphere. As we go up the stack, if you will, there's an inner tank that sits on top of this. Above the inner tank is where the LOX tank or the liquid oxygen tank rides. Then we adapt to our second stage. Then we adapt to the Orion, which includes a service module, a crew module, and a launch abort system. Sam, what are structural tests and why do you do them? Well, the structural tests are very important to us. We've got these engines underneath and beside that are pulling, winds pushing, all sorts of different forces that it has to be able to withstand. So we do structural testing. We put all these forces into the rocket to make sure that it can withstand those and the vehicle safe to fly. I know that this rocket is designed to take us back to the moon. What are the similarities between the SLS and the Saturn V? Some of the primary similarities are the fact that we use liquid propellants through the rocket engines to generate the thrust to, to get to the moon and complete the mission. We also have to do it in stages. One stage or one set of engines doesn't get us all the way there. And a little difference with SLS is we have the solid strap to each side for the first phase of the mission. So why does America need this rocket to go to the moon? There are other uh, nations, other private companies who are building rockets, but none of them have the payload capacity that we need to launch an Orion carrying multiple astronauts or very large payloads. We need an SLS with all of its launch capability to get all those things to the moon. Once we get to the moon, we can learn how to work with these large components, and from there, we can eventually move on to Mars. I know that you guys said that the rocket was going to be big, but how much bigger will it be compared to what's behind us right now? So what you're looking at behind me, the test article here, is about 150 feet tall. The space launch system itself, add another 100 feet to that, about 320 feet tall. Wow. Well, thank you guys for talking to me today. I really appreciated it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. If you're going to get something the size of NASA's Future Space Launch System, or SLS, off the ground, you need more than just brawn. You need brains. Computer brains, the best science has to offer. The SLS's computers work using the same basic principles as the computer or smartphone you interact with in your daily life. In order to function, computers need programming. Programming is built by humans by writing lines of computer code, a language spoken by computers which is then input directly into the computer. With this code, computers can be programmed to do actions automatically, like turn on and off certain circuits or valves on a rocket at specific times. This allows human controllers the ability to manage hundreds of delicate operations on the SLS that would be impossible without a computer. The Space Launch System has both brawn and brains. And as NASA's future vehicle for sending humans into space and beyond, it will be one of the smartest rockets ever when it takes flight. I wanted to see how engineers are testing the computer hardware that's responsible for operating SLS launch systems. And now we're here at the SLS Systems Integration Lab. Here engineers install different components into this system unit mock-up to try to see how different things work together. I am here with Hannah Hopkins, SLS software engineer, and Alex Matris, aerospace engineer. Can you explain to me the systems on this SLS? Well, there's a lot of avionics systems on board, and avionics are just the computers which operate all of the systems that fly the rocket. One of the systems is the fly computer. It's what's doing all the controls, it's the autopilot system, and it's checking all of the sensors and everything else to make sure that everything's still working well for the flight. There's three flight computers, and they're basically the brain of the operations. And if one of them fails, it's okay. They vote it off the island, and we keep going. But if two of them fails, things get a little risky. So we definitely need these. These are crucial to flight. There's other instruments, such as the redundant inertial navigation unit, which is a fancy term, but all it's doing is figuring out where we are when we're in space. There's other systems for like hydraulics and steering the vehicle so that you can steer it to get it to wherever you 
you need it to go to. We also have the engine controller over here. The engine controller basically controls the mixture ratio between the liquid oxygen and the liquid hydrogen tanks. And so it controls the thrust of where it goes. Um, and it also takes all of the sensors from the engines and it can look at, is this engine failing us or is this engine okay? Is it doing what it's supposed to do? So you can kind of think of the systems of the SLS as kind of the central nervous system of the rocket, especially the avionics components in here. How do you test SLS systems and software in here? We test all of the hardware and software in here with a simulation called Artemis. And so basically what we do is we write code to simulate all of the different models on SLS and all of the different components. And something cool with that that we can do is we can say, what if one of the engines fail? Or what if all the engines fail? Or what if the flight computer quits on us? Or something like that. And we can see how the rocket is going to react so we can better prepare to how to handle that on launch day. And in fact, we've actually run about 15,000 simulations in here. And so we've launched the rocket 15,000 times. We've presented the flight computer any number of scenarios to make sure that it can detect all the kinds of different faults and still keep flying safely. You can't do all of these with a real test flight. Yeah, and so that's one of the big differences between now and the Apollo days is that they didn't have that software to be able to test it as much as we have. What are some of the things that you've learned from the testing that you've done here? Well, our job is to bring a lot of different pieces together all in one place. There's a lot of different people making a lot of different parts of this vehicle. So we'll find issues where two things may not talk together the way we thought they would. We can figure that out, fix it, and test the solution to it right here in our lab and then go make that happen in the real hardware. Thank you guys so much for telling me about all the awesome stuff you have going on here. Yeah, of course. No problem. It was our pleasure. Over. Is that it? I think we got them all. Let's check. And that's future exploration and space computer controls. We did it. Great work, team. Yes! But we really couldn't have done it without your help. That's right. Every single one of you viewers out there should now consider yourselves members of the STEM Brigade. Just like us. Exactly. Together, we all learned about the science and history behind human spaceflight. And the endless possibilities in the future of our travels away from the big blue marble we call Earth. Thanks for joining us on our Out of This World journey. And now... Steady in, over and out. The Space Launch System is the next generation heavy lift rocket for NASA that's going to take humans and cargo missions farther into deep space than ever before. SLS is massive. It's the size or larger than most buildings. We're talking about flying a skyscraper, essentially. So we need a lot of propulsion. A big portion of it is really just the propellant that we need to get that heavy weight off the ground. These rockets need to go five times the speed of sound to get out of the atmosphere. And what happens is that the air acts as a can crusher, and it's trying to crush that vehicle. So what we have to do as aerodynamicists is quantify what those forces are doing to your rocket. As we're testing in the wind tunnel, we're looking at the pressures that the body sees all the way up. That really just determines how strong that shell needs to be. We need it to be nice and strong, but not too strong, because if we make it too strong, then the rocket is too heavy, and that takes away from some of the payload that we can fly into space. Every time we design a new launch vehicle, the airflow is different, so we have to test. Our first test launch for SLS will be going around the moon and back again. We are building 
that vehicle right now. What's being stacked up as we speak and will be ready to fly in 2020. When the Space Launch System flies, no other rocket will be able to take such heavy payloads into space. Our ability to carry all that heavy equipment up there is incredibly important, and this is the way that we're going to do that. We're going to be able to take humans to Mars, but the international community is going to have to come together and collaborate in a unique fashion. It's not just governments, it's all of the commercial industry that is really blooming right now, and even private citizens. We're going to rely on all of that in order to get to humans to Mars. NASA, while we've developed a lot of the technology that's going into a lot of these rockets, and our government is funding most, if not all, of this work, either directly or indirectly, we need those partners so that we can keep pushing the frontier. Mission Control Human Space Flight is made possible through the generous support of Alabama Bicentennial Commission, the Daniel Foundation of Alabama, Wells Fargo, the Malone Family Foundation, the Robert R. Meyer Foundation. Mission Control is a production of the IQ Learning Network, a division of Alabama Public Television. You're looking good here. Roger. Hi, I'm Dorian. Carmen here. This is Luke, standing by. Here's Chandel. And I'm Kaylee. We're interrupting your regularly scheduled programming for a very important reason. As members of the STEM Brigade, our mission is clear. Learn science, earn badges, and help others to learn too along the way. Right now, we're working on earning our cadet rank in space exploration. And our squad has a very important mission to learn all about the history and the science behind human spaceflight. And as we sprint through this learning marathon, we'll try and earn six different merit badges. The space race, rocket boosters, shuttle, life systems, future exploration, and space computer controls. We'll be reviewing the badges we earn throughout the program, so pay attention and follow along, and you too can be honorary virtual members of the STEM Brigade. We're ready to blast off. Mission Control, do you copy? Since the dawn of humankind, the stars have been there waiting for us. But for the majority of human existence, leaving Earth was nothing more than the desire of an overactive imagination. If only they'd known, the stars had always been reachable. They were just waiting on us to find the right path. Last century, following the birth of the airplane, scientists like Robert H. Goddard, perhaps the first great rocket scientist, started getting close. Rocket technology advanced quickly, especially during the Second World War, when rocket technology was used, regrettably, as a new kind of weapon. But from the dust of that terrible war came something better, the space race. The space race was between two of the most powerful countries to emerge from the rubble of World War II, the Soviet Union and the United States. The space race ultimately amounted to a series of one-ups, as the Soviets and the Americans raced to see who could accomplish what amazing feat first. The Soviets struck first, putting the first satellite in space, the first human, the first spacewalk. But the Americans were right behind them, step for step, thanks to early space programs like Mercury, which, among its many accomplishments, sent American John Glenn orbiting around the world. The two powers were both on a chase for the same finish line. Who would be the first to get to the moon? We choose to go to the moon in this decade. 
entertain and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. On July 20th, 1969, the Americans did the impossible. That's one small step for man. One Neil Armstrong, along with Buzz Aldrin, became the first human beings to ever walk on the moon as part of the Apollo 11 mission. It was a day that changed the world. Two men walked on the moon that day, but the support of thousands of men and women back on Earth put them there, and they all deserve credit for this landmark accomplishment of the human spirit. When astronauts say Houston into their radio, they're referring to Mission Control at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Mission Control has been the center of communication between Earth and human spaceflight from the early days of Gemini and Apollo to communication with the International Space Station today. I'm joined today by legendary flight director Gene Kranz, who was flight director of the Apollo 11 mission that first landed on the moon, and Apollo 13, where an explosion on board the spacecraft put Mission Control to the ultimate test. Thank you so much for being here with us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. What is the role of Mission Control? Mission Control is a center where you pull all the people together, where you've got communications to the launch site, you've got communications to the tracking station, so it's basically the overall hub for communications. In addition to that, the controllers here are prepared to take any actions necessary for crew safety and mission success. Could you tell me a little bit about your job as a flight director? Uh, as flight director, I have the ultimate responsibility for performance of this room here. During the course of a mission, I am the final person to make decisions. There is no higher authority than me. And as mission time approaches, I look at the decisions I got to make and I see if I got to set notes to fit that and I write it down as sort of a timeline. Because the one thing I have to do in this room is to manage the clock. So it's up to me to know how to use every second that we've got in the decision process. Most of our decisions are hours. Frequently I'll get one that's down in the minutes. Once that we do in seconds, I have to know instantly and tell the guy what I want done. July 20th, 1969, moon landing. As the world watched, Houston waited for the call. What was the feeling like in this room? That moment, that time in history, we knew that we had two minutes, 120 seconds, a fuel in that tank at a 30% moderate throttle setting. So I had one controller in this room who had a stopwatch. He was counting at seconds of fuel remaining. Now at the time he's doing this, the crew is trying to go around and find their landing site. As he got down close to the surface, the dust on the surface was moving with him. So it was really hard to figure out where can I land and where's the right place to land, etc. So we kept calling out 60 seconds of fuel remaining. 60 seconds. At about the time we said 30 seconds, we saw the crew going through engine shutdown. 30 seconds. Okay, engine stop. And that's when we heard the word Houston Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. And boy, all through this thing, I had a, I had a hold of one of these handles on, on the, because in those last seconds, it was totally up to the crew. My job was over. I got him down close and he had to land. But I was holding on to that guy and I don't think I took a breath. And that was true of everybody in this room. Roger, Twink, Tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, Apollo 13, the infamous. Houston, we've had a problem. What was going on in your head at that moment? You have to think your way through problems. So as soon as I heard that call, we've had a problem here. Earlier in my shift, I had had three minor electrical problems. And my immediate thought is, uh, it's a minor electrical problem. We'll sort it out. We'll put the crew to sleep, and then we'll work the problem. Stand by, 13. We're looking at it. Then about a couple minutes later, one of my controllers said there was a pretty bang, big bang associated with that. The crew reported bang, and I said, okay, something I don't understand is happening right here. I better proceed more carefully. And then about 10 minutes later, Jim Lovell's looking outside the hatchwood, and he sees a jet pluming, plume going out there. And he says, Houston, I think we're venting our oxygen. We are, uh, we are venting something out uh, into the uh, into space. Roger, we copy your venting. And that was when I went into survival mode. Say, okay, I'll flight controller, settle down, 
quit your guessing, let's start working this problem. And that was really the key to getting this room now focused on the problem at hand. We had to make several tough decisions. We had to make the decision, how are we going to come home? Because we're right in the area where the gravity of the moon is balanced to the gravity of an Earth. So we're right in between those two. And if I use my big engine, I can be home in a day and a half. If I go around the moon, that's my other option. It's going to take four to five days to get back home. So which way am I going to come home? I don't know what happened to that spacecraft, so I better be careful. So I'm going to go around the moon. Here in Mission Control, we're looking uh, now looking towards an alternate mission. Swinging around the moon and using the uh, lunar module power system. And if I go around the moon, I got a two-day spacecraft. It's going to take four days to five days to get back home. So now I got to figure out how to take that two-day spacecraft, water, oxygen, electrical power, and stretch it out. And we have a procedure for getting power from the lamp. We'd like to copy down. Because the key thing is, once a crew's up in space, you don't want to make a mistake because you're too conservative. You got to wait until you got enough data to make the right decision. Another chair in the control room as we had flashed out. What advice do you have for a young person who's interested in a career in mission control? Dream, aim high, never surrender. Dream is your goal. What do you think you're best at? And start going after that goal. And what you have to do is you have to have that goal, that dream, so strong that you'll pick up and carry on. It's what I call tenacity. Staying tough, working tough. Being tough when it relates to going after your goal. So dream, aim high, never surrender. That's great advice. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. It was really nice meeting you. Will you give me five? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I enjoyed it too. Dream, aim high, never surrender. That's exactly what the Apollo astronauts did. And so did the many men and women who built the incredible machine that got us to the moon the mighty Saturn V rocket. Among its many contributions, Huntsville is where the Saturn V was dreamt up and designed by German rocket scientist Werner von Braun. It's also where the Saturn V's mighty F1 engines were initially tested and continues to be a major force in the exploration of space to this day. During my visit to the US Space and Rocket Center, I headed out to Rocket Park to learn more. I'm joined now by Ed Stewart, head archivist at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, to talk about rocket development in Huntsville. Thanks for being with me today. My pleasure. So can you tell me a little bit about the early days of rocket design in the U.S.? So a lot of American rocket technology is really based on or evolved out of the V-2s that were developed in Germany during World War II. The V-2 was a liquid-propelled rocket that really was a, a terrifying uh, invention, and the masterminds of the V2 program uh, was a gentleman named Werner von Braun who actually came over to the United States after the end of World War II and became the head of the guided missile development program for the US Army and then eventually NASA was formed in 1958 he started working on civilian space exploration based projects and so von Braun and most of his team transferred over to Marshall Space Flight Center when it was opened in 1960. And that's kind of where you see the beginning of the development of these big space exploring rockets. If you look, for instance, at the Saturn I behind us, the tanks, the skinny tanks that are kind of clustered together around the outside of the first stage, are all stretched out redstone rocket propellant tanks. And so they took those kind of pre-existing elements combine them together to produce a one and a half million pound capable first stage. And that is the first sort of heavy lift or really big rocket developed for the United States. And it was also the first vehicle developed specifically for space exploration as, a, as far as like kind of a ground up design. Building off the successes of the Saturn I, Dr. Von Braun's team went to work building the biggest, most powerful rocket the world had ever seen to take us all the way to the moon, the Saturn V. The Saturn V was comprised of three stages, 
The first had five massive F1 engines that generated over seven and a half million pounds of thrust at sea level. The second stage, designed to push the rocket through the upper atmosphere, had five smaller but even more efficient J2 engines, creating 1.1 million pounds of thrust. Finally, the third stage's single J2 put the Saturn in a temporary parking orbit before firing up again for something called translunar injection. The astronauts tripped to the moon at more than 24,000 miles an hour. While on the way, the crew unpacked the Apollo Command and lunar modules through a delicate series of docking maneuvers to prepare for lunar orbit and landing, and finally jettisoned the last stage of the mighty Saturn rocket. While the Saturn V was a beast of a machine, you might be surprised to learn that today, there's thousands times more computer memory in the smartphone in your pocket than the Saturn V had in its entire enormous structure. But that's not to suggest the Saturn V was dumb. It was anything but, especially for 1960s computer technology. While still at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, I discovered all about how it worked with the help of docent and former Apollo computer programmer, Luke Talley. So can you tell me a little bit about how the computers on the Saturn V worked? In the 1960s, what we could put together with a digital machine really couldn't do all the job we needed to, to guide a, a missile of the Saturn V. And so what we have is a combination of a digital computer and an analog computer. So this is a 26-bit machine, and each of these blocks now has 4,000 words of memory, all right? So there's 16,000 and another 16,000. So when the rocket's flying, both of these are executing the same flight program. And they're comparing the outputs to make sure they're getting the same results. During the flights, we only had a few miscompares ever. Even though it looks kind of old and antique like it, it worked quite well. So the redundancy is, is strictly for reliability. And the logic itself, we have these circuit boards. Each circuit board has 35 chips on one side, 35 on the other. Give you a feel for yesterday and today. The processor that we built up here with this technology, we would execute about 8,000 calculations a second while it's flying, okay? Your cell phone's doing probably two and a half million or so calculations a second. So, in order to make this thing fly, you have to do navigation, guidance, and control. The digital computer could do these times functions. And it did navigation and guidance, but the control function was actually transferred over to this thing, looked like a barrel over here, an analog computer. The analog computer, it flows in, you're multiplying or dividing or whatever you're doing, comparing the data as it comes through, and it just keeps flowing, all right? And it goes right on out and in real time. Whereas the digital computer, it'll get an interrupt, it'll go do something, and then it'll go back to doing what it was doing previously. Okay, the computer itself does not have an operating system. So we have a series of signals coming in. When the signal pops up, we go do something. The next signal pops up, we go do something else, all right? And then we also have time functions, in other words, with the clock. And this clock comes up, that says to start navigation guidance and control. Start it, navigation guidance control. So we have clock signals and we have interrupts from the rocket itself. Thanks for meeting me today and thanks for telling me all about computers. You're all aircraft rely on a force called thrust to work, which is generally created through applying Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. What does that mean? A good example is rowing a canoe. To move the canoe forward, you push back against the water. This action, pushing back, creates the opposite reaction of moving the canoe forward. In a propulsion system for a rocket, Newton's third law is applied by exploding fuel and a source of oxygen, or oxidizer, in a combustion chamber, which, as every action creates an equal and opposite reaction, this combustion creates a reaction of exhaust, which works as a thrusting force on the system. It's amazing it works. It's more amazing we figured it out. But perhaps the most amazing part of it all? Leaving the Earth was always physically possible, even when humankind believed it was just a fantasy. We just needed the right technology to take advantage of the physics that were already a part of our world. Who knows what other seemingly impossible tasks humankind will make possible in the future? 
Speaking of rocket engines, meet the RS-25, formerly the main engine of NASA's space shuttle and, with some amazing new upgrades, rocket engine of the future, primed to give the Saturn V's F1s a run for their money. These Super RS-25 engines will power NASA's space launch system, the vehicle that will one day take us back to the moon and even beyond to other planets like Mars. I headed down to NASA's Stennis Space Center in Mississippi to get a first-hand look. So this is an RS-25 flight engine. So when, when was this originally designed and how has it been updated since then? It actually flew during the space shuttle program on several space shuttle missions. And so what we're doing now for, with this engine is we're actually repurposing it from the space shuttle program and actually taking it to making it a little bit smarter and a lot more powerful for the uh, space launch system. How exactly does a rocket engine work? So really, what's best for us to do, let's just go upstairs, we'll get real close to the parts of the engine. I can point out and talk about how we use liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen to uh, produce the thrust that we need on these engines. So these, these, these areas here, this, this thing is a high pressure pump. And so there's one just like it on the other side of the engine. This pump is pumping liquid oxygen. On the other side of the engine, the pump is pumping liquid hydrogen. So liquid hydrogen is our fuel. Liquid oxygen is our oxidizer. Liquid hydrogen is the second coldest element on Earth. It's minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit. And then liquid oxygen on this side of what we're talking about, it's around minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So normally when we think about liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen coming together, we think about water. And we say, okay, we have hydrogen and oxygen and it comes together and we make water. So how do we make rocket fuel out of water is, is really the, 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 the cool question, right? So what we do is we actually take these two elements and we put them under extreme pressure, somewhere between 9,000 and 11,000 pounds of pressure inside the engine. When they come together at that high pressure, they actually hit each other and explode. And that explosion is what we're controlling in the main combustion chamber that comes out of the nozzle. And that ex explosion coming out of the nozzle is the thrust of this engine and it's making that thrust. So coming out of the nozzle at the bottom is 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So you think about instantaneously it goes from these cold Cold, cold elements to plus 6,000 degrees, and that's what's making this how this engine works as far as producing thrust. Awesome, thank you so much for your time. It, ah, it's so awesome, very interesting. I, I learned so much today. All right, let's check in and see what badges we've earned. So, for now, we've only got the space race and rocket boosters two down, four to go. After reaching the moon, which many consider to be the end of the space race, NASA's human spaceflight program began to change directions and focus on humans staying in space as long as possible. Following the Skylab program of the 1970s, NASA began its longest running program to date, the Space Shuttle Program. The Space Shuttle was a bold new reimagining of manned space exploration. Low Earth orbit, an orbit around Earth some 1,200 miles above the planet's surface, was now the goal. And instead of rockets and capsules that were one and done, now reusable winged orbiters would be used. First launched in 1981, NASA's fleet was comprised of five orbiters. All in all, America's space fleet flew 133 successful voyages beyond the Earth, leading to countless scientific advancements. Without the shuttle, we'd also be without one of the most important scientific devices of the 20th century, the Hubble Space Telescope a window to the cosmos that's given humankind some incredible first-time peeks into some of the universe's most amazing sights. While at Kennedy, I had an amazing opportunity to learn more about the shuttle program firsthand from one of the brave astronauts who flew as part of the program. I'm joined now by astronaut Charlie Walker, who actually served as a payload specialist on this shuttle right here behind me, the Space Shuttle Atlantis. So Charlie, tell me a little bit about your experience on the shuttle. Were there any moments that really stood out to you? Well, launch is always a very memorable experience. Atlantis, during the entire flight, had virtually no electrical or mechanical problems, which was a joy for the crew because we could spend more time getting the useful things done and looking out the window. So what were some of the most innovative things on the space shuttle? Innovative. 
wings to start with. The earliest manned or piloted uh, spacecraft was uh, a capsule. So wings was a very innovative uh, approach to, uh, to space travel, uh, not only launching to space, but uh, also returning to Earth. And the wings were only useful uh, on the return to Earth. Another innovation was uh, this Canadian provided robotic arm. Uh, it was an international project, very useful, including on my flight on Atlantis, in which two of our crew members did a, a, a unique spacewalk to demonstrate construction uh, in space. So what would you say the training was like to become an astronaut? To work inside a spacecraft in orbit uh, takes certain necessary skills and personal characteristics. For instance, you had to uh, go through a, a screening process before you even went into training to, uh, for the managers to determine that you weren't claustrophobic. Uh, you can't be afraid of small spaces in a spacecraft because you can't open the door and get out. And uh, the training then included a lot of, uh, of course, systems training. Now, I didn't need to learn every system in there. The mission specialists uh, knew how to operate every orbital system of the spacecraft while it's in orbit. The pilots fly it up and fly it back home. And they didn't teach me to do that. That was fine. I was a payload specialist. And then, of course, I had to uh, be very uh, uh, trained up on my particular research, as well as learning to work with my fellow crew members. That took uh, well over a year. What lessons did we learn from the shuttle program that we're applying to the future of space flight? The space shuttle was the first to utilize in that capacity solid propellant first stage booster rockets. We learned lots of lessons from uh, using those booster rockets to launch shuttles into space and solid rocket boosters are planned uh, and are in development and testing right now for use in the next big uh, NASA launch vehicle, the Space Launch System. And the engines on the space shuttle are being modified for use on that next big launch uh, system as well. But also learning to, uh, to train efficiently and effectively crews to work together, that was an important lesson that's being used in the future. The overall efficient technology that uh, was used to control, to do life support uh, on board space shuttle. So all of those things, those are what comes immediately to mind as uh, lessons learned from uh, space shuttle for future space activities. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. My pleasure. Thanks to the shuttle program, NASA was able to set its sights, with the help of the rest of the world space community, on an even greater goal, the world's first long-term home in outer space, the International Space Station. NASA, along with Russia, Japan, the European Space Agency, and Canada slowly constructed the International Space Station for nearly a decade and a half, from 1998 to 2011, the same year NASA finally ended the shuttle program. The ISS is a major achievement of human ingenuity and science, and as of today, has housed more than 236 people from 18 countries. Truly a space station serving all of humankind. Thanks to the countless experiments that can only be studied in low Earth orbit, amazing advancements have been made. But none of those experiments could ever have gotten off the ground without the help of an amazing support team in the Rocket City. We're standing outside the Payload Operations Integration Center at the Marshall Space Flight Center. This is the primary space station science command post, and it is here that all of the International Space Station science experiments are coordinated. I am joined now by Payload Operations Director Christy Robertson. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's good to be here. So why is this called the Payload Operations Integration Center? What exactly is a payload? A payload is the experiment itself. So each uh, experiment that a scientist launches to station is called a, a payload. What happens on a typical day in the Payload Operations Integration Center? Seven days a week, 24 hours a day. A typical day uh, begins with a crew wake. Throughout the day, our job here at the POIC is to interface with the crew for their science experiments to ensure that those experiments are executed and be kind of liaison uh, between them and the payload developer that actually developed the science experiment. So what do you guys do to help the astronauts in space during these experiments? Uh, when they have questions or issues, anomalies, they'll call down to POIC and then we work to get them an answer and a resolution so that they can proceed through their experiment. What sorts of scientific fields are researched up there? 
So we have everything from combustion to rodent research. Uh, we also have various life sciences, human research sciences that are done. So many of the astronauts participate in what we call human research experiments, which are those things that evaluate essentially the tool that space takes on a human body. How does the payload operation team prepare for a scientific expedition? So we start about a year and a half out preparing for each expedition and part of what we do is actually some on-hand training. So we have a center downstairs that I can take you and show you and we can kind of see some of the on-hand training that we get. Okay, cool. One of the things we have for our controllers here uh, to be able to utilize when they're developing procedures as well as getting ready for operations or our hands-on environment. This is the lab that we're currently in. It is a, a true to life size mock-up of the lab that is on space stations in the U.S. laboratory. So one of the racks that we have there is this one, which is the MSG, which is a micro uh, gravity science glove box. So as you can see, the work volume will extend. Uh, that just allows the crew members more functionality. So if you want to, you can go ahead and stick your hands in there, see what it would feel like to have a glove on, and see what adjustments you can make. I'll create a pressure right here for you. So you should feel, see these other gloves kind of fill up around you. Thank you so much for teaching me all this stuff. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, and thank you for your time. Providing for the day-to-day -day needs and resources of the men and women living and working on the ISS presents constant technical challenges, like recycling precious onboard resources with its water recovery system. The ISS's water recovery system provides clean water to the astronauts by recycling and purifying water waste on board. It does this with the help of the Water Processor Assembly and something called the UPA, or, well, the Urine Processor Assembly, because it recycles, yep, urine. On the ISS, the number one priority of a number one is to recycle it. Urine is turned to water with the help of a low pressure vacuum distillation process. Distillation is the process of heating a mixture of liquids until they become a gas, then condensing the gas back into separate liquids, which successfully removes the clean water from the urine. The water is then moved into the WPA's purification system. The ISS maintains extremely strict purity standards before any recycled water can be consumed by the crew especially recycled urine. I am here with Jennifer Pruitt, who is the project manager for the International Space Station Urine Processing Assembly. Why do we recycle urine and sweat for astronauts in space? When we go somewhere where there isn't water available, like in space, we need to have those systems. It's crucial for humans to survive. It's very expensive to ship up all the water that we need, so what we have to do is recycle it, which is a much more cost-effective way of giving the astronauts water. What percentage of the water on the ISS is recycled? Of all the water that's on Space Station, we have a couple different sources. We have our urine, and that's where a lot of the water comes out of our bodies. There's also some that comes out in our breath and in our sweat when we work out. So if we take all of that together, overall we recycle about 92% of the water, maybe a little bit higher, and we're trying to get as close as we can to that 100%. We have developed our hardware here uh, that we now use on the space station. So I'm gonna show you our your processor that we have right here. This is the same as what is on ISS now with a few tweaks, but we have these clear containers that we use on the ground only. The ones on station are big metal tanks. In, in space, people would pee, it would fill up, and when it got to a certain point, that would start the process, so it runs in a batch. We have a couple pumps that move the fluid through. These two here, one moves all of our fluid, and it's a peristaltic pump, so it's kind of like your esophagus where it pushes everything through, trying to not use gravity, so it, it's just that push. We have a purge pump, which is reducing the pressure in the system so that we don't have to boil the water at high a temperature. So to try to save power, we instead bring the pressure down. So we're lowering the pressure so we can boil the water at a lower temperature as well. And we do that in this guy here. This is the distillation assembly where we actually boil the water. He's kind of like a washing machine. He's a big drum. The urine goes in, it's boiled, 
and the steam comes out, then they're separated from that point on. So the good clean water is what goes on to the water processing the next cycle, and all of the brine will come back to the beginning, and that will be concentrated until we get enough water out, and then that brine is what's thrown away at the end. Thank you so much for showing me all of this stuff and explaining to me all these awesome processes. You are so welcome, and if you ever want to come back and help donate to our Mars mission, <laughs> you are more than welcome. <laughs> While the ISS is an unprecedented, literally out-of-this-world creation, it sometimes requires maintenance and repairs. When something needs to be altered or fixed by an astronaut on the outside of the station, they perform what is known as an extravehicular activity, or EVA, and a very special tool is required. A spacesuit. Spacesuits are more than just an astronaut's Sunday best. They're highly engineered life support systems in their own right, allowing astronauts to survive and work in the cold vacuum of space. While in Huntsville, I was able to make a stop at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center to learn more about them. Hello, I'm here with Joseph Vick, who is the manager of museum education here at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville. What can you tell me about the history of spacesuits? Spacesuits originated here on Earth for exploration of the Earth. When we had the need to go and dive, so think of really old school diving suit. Post that, we went from exploring the oceans to exploring the skies. So as astronauts, we begin to explore past our atmospheres, we need even more protection from those lack of pressures. The first of those were used during our Mercury mission, so it was the first manned mission. The suit they had was a very early elementary spacesuit. The second manned mission of NASA was the Gemini suit. They needed to develop a new suit so that they could exit out of the capsule. The first American to do that was Ed White. And then for Apollo, they needed a very much substantial suit that would enable them to not only get out of their vehicle, but walk on a surface that was foreign to us. What it would be like to go into space without a spacesuit. So I need your help. If you could put a little bit of pressure on top, that'll provide our Earth pressure, which is 14.7 pounds per square inch. That's what helps us maintain our shape and function, just like Astro Duck here. I'm going to remove the pressure from this chamber. So it's just as if we're going to have astroduct in outer space. So as I remove the pressure, the air pressure within, notice what's happening to our astroduct. There's no more pressure to keep astroduct as he was shaped here on Earth. So he would expand and expand until eventually pop. So from astroduct's perspective, you need a spacesuit. Spacesuits have multi layers, so each layer has its own importance for protection of the astronaut. So, notice the first on the outside piece, it's mostly for protection from flying debris when you're in space. Micrometeorite garment. So, if anything were to hit this, it would bounce off and not cause any harm to the astronaut. You have layers, multiple layers of a mylar like material that provides a thermal protection. Other layers are what are called pressure bladders, which allow the pressure inside of the suit to maintain that pressure. And then you have at the very closest to the skin, this ventilation garment, which is the movement of the water over the pipe so that water would flow over the astronaut's skin and body, creating a cooling sensation for the astronaut. Thank you for all this knowledge. Next time I see you, I'll have my own personal space suit. Oh, great, and I'll catch you on Mars. Welcome good. Over. The place where all of NASA's iconic launches began is Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida, America's spaceport. I was lucky enough to get special access to the newly renovated Launch Pad 39B, where Apollo and shuttle missions were once launched and where they'll soon be joined by the Space Launch System. I'm here with Tim McDaniel, who is the Launchpad 39 Facility Manager. So Tim, can you talk us through getting ready for a launch? What kind of things happen on the pad? They have to have the electricity hooked up to it, they have to have water hooked up to it, and just like your car, it has to have fuel. On each side of the launch pad, there's liquid hydrogen on one side, and there's liquid oxygen on the other side. They bring the fuels together and they fill the rocket. Then once it's fueled, 
they do all their preparations and getting ready for it. They do all their checkouts, they do all the electrical checkouts, the man checkouts, the systems checkouts. This water tower over here, it has several thousand gallons of water in that tank. This tank actually drops every bit of water out of that tank in one minute. It flows from that tower and it goes up through the mobile launcher and it has some big heads that spray water in the direction of the flames where it comes out the bottom of the rocket. And that helps for sound suppression because as you can imagine, it'd be very, very loud. What modifications are currently being made to the launch pad for SLS? They redone the flame trench. They put all new bricks in the flame trench. They also, currently, they're underway. They're making a new liquid hydrogen tank. This liquid hydrogen tank will be the largest in the world. It will be approximately three times the size of the current one we have. Well, thank you so much for meeting with me today. Thank you. Time for another badge review. We're adding Shuttle and Life Systems to our collection. Home stretch now, guys. Just two more to go. And to keep us moving, let's kick it back to Kaylee and Shandell, who are learning about the future of the United States Manned Space Exploration Program. Ever since the shuttle program ended in 2011, NASA has had no fleet to send astronauts to the International Space Station, while private companies like SpaceX, Boeing, and Northrop Grumman have learned to launch satellites and ISS supplies at launch sites around the country, and NASA has launched rovers like Curiosity to Mars. The agency has relied on the Russian space program and its Soyuz rockets to deliver astronauts to the space station. But NASA won't be without a space vehicle for much longer. The Space Launch System, NASA's super heavy lift expendable launch vehicle that's ushering in a new direction for NASA's space fleet in the tradition of the Saturn V, will be the most powerful rocket in existence, with thrust capacities even greater than its moon-delivering ancestor, and with crew on board the Orion capsule up top, NASA will once again be able to send astronauts distances beyond low Earth orbit. I'm here with Scott Wilson, NASA Orion Productions Operation Manager, and Jules Schneider, Lockheed Martin Orion Productions Operation Manager. Thank you so much for joining with me today. Well, thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Can you give me a brief history of the Orion program? After the shuttle program, uh, we were looking to decide uh, where do we go next, right? So for many years, we've gone to what we call low Earth orbit. We miles above the planet and that's where the ISS is and we really wanted to begin exploring deep space which is getting us back to the moon and Mars and beyond so we we did a lot of studies trying to figure out uh, what would our spacecraft look like and eventually that led to Orion and uh, that's what we're building today. And why did we go with the capsule design again? Well in the early studies we looked at should it have wings like a shuttle, should it be a capsule or variants of those and uh, the winged idea is really good for shuttle when you go to low earth orbit and you're returning to the planet uh, you use those wings in the last uh, parts of re-entry when you're back in the atmosphere. But from a deep space exploration, it's a lot of weight that you take that you don't really use for your whole mission. Uh, another piece was safety driven. So a capsule by its design, uh, if you lose the ability to control the spaceship, it's still going to land. It lands like a badminton birdie. It might not land where you want it to, but it but it lands and the crew is safe. And so it has some safety aspects to it that, that's important to us. So those are the two reasons it looks like it does today. Jules, can you describe some of the big advances that set Orion apart from its predecessors? So uh, let's go all the way back to the Apollo program because that was the last capsule program we had. Um, as you can imagine, from the 1960s to now, advances in just technology on many different fronts from computers or computing uh, capabilities and speeds to materials to advanced uh, manufacturing processes like 3D printing. So almost in every category that it takes to design and build uh, a spacecraft like Orion, there have been huge advances. You'll notice the solar arrays here, right? So, so Shuttle and Apollo used commodities on board to generate electricity, and that me meant you could only generate it for a limited amount of time until you run out of those commodities. With the solar arrays, now we can generate electricity indefinitely when you're in space. That's kind of one simple example. What are the biggest challenges of a long space trip, and how is Orion meeting them? If you're in low Earth orbit at the space station, for instance, you can return home in, in 90 minutes or so. You may not come down exactly where you want to, but you can get home pretty quick. If you're going to the moon, it could be days until you return, and if you're going to Mars, it could be years. So the further you move away from the planet, the more redundancy of things you build into your spacecraft. Jules, what are the launch plans for Orion and SLS? When will we be aiming for Mars? Well, the next orbital test flight is called Exploration Mission 1. 
we actually are building the Orion 4 exploration mission one right now it's almost finished uh, and the plan for it is to launch uh, late next year uh, maybe early the following year beyond that we have exploration mission 2 which we're also building uh, here at the Kennedy Space Center as we speak I believe that's in the 2022 23 time frame and that'll be the first crewed mission so we will have people astronauts on board EM2 and then Mars uh, is probably the mid 2030s and prior to Mars NASA's plans are to put a uh, the gateway uh, which is a uh, uh, a spacecraft orbiting the moon and so uh, before we go to Mars, our plan will be to go to the moon multiple times and then use that as a launching pad for a Mars mission. Wow, well thank you both very much for meeting with me today. No, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. It was nice talking to you. Thanks. Very nice. While Kaylee was learning about the mission of the Orion program at Kennedy, Shandell was at Johnson Space Center in Houston to learn even more about the Orion capsule. We are in Building 9 at Johnson Space Center. Building 9 is home to NASA astronaut training and space vehicle mock-up facilities. Behind me is a full-scale mock-up of the Orion Crew Exploration Vehicle, and I am joined here by Orion engineer Nijud Maranci. Thank you for being here with us today. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. So I understand that the Orion will sit on top of the SLS rocket. What can you tell me about its design? So one of the key parts of the design of Orion, we can abort it anytime during ascent, and once we get out in space, Orion can always turn around and come home as well. So that's a really a fundamental part of our design, was making sure the crew is safe throughout the whole mission. And how do you keep the astronauts safe in here? So there's a lot of ways we do it. So first off, there's redundancy. So everything has a backup to it. There's multiple tanks of water, there's extra computers. So no matter what happens, we can always actually come home on the backup system that's on board. One of the fundamental parts of spaceflight is keeping the crew safe by having redundancy and then having lots of our contingencies planned out ahead of time to be able to respond to those emergencies. What will it be like for astronauts to live in Orion while in space? So it's a, kind of like a camping trip. Uh, they'll be inside, we can have four of them in there, and they'll have to bring all of their food and clothing, and they've got a shower and a waste management system. Uh, it's actually in the floor in there, um, and they bring sleeping bags. Um, so they'll be doing experiments throughout the day, they'll be monitoring the ship's uh, progress, but then they have to do lots of exercise so we can keep their uh, musculoskeletal system from degrading. They'll be eating meals, they'll be having leisure time. And what are your responsibilities as an Orion engineer? So uh, I'm actually the mission analysis lead for the uh, program, and my team are actually designing the missions to the moon and home again. So we have to make sure that when we're done building Orion, we can actually accomplish the missions, and the mission designs are something Orion can fly. Can we take a closer look? You bet, let's go inside. Awesome. So inside here, this is the Orion medium fidelity mock-up, and this is here to train the astronauts as well as allow the engineers to figure out what the design looks like on the inside so we can make sure everything's going in and will fit when the space vehicle actually flies. Well, I see the controls in there. So can you tell me how they control this vehicle? So the crew will actually fly it, but most of the vehicle flight is automated. So we will have software that's on board controlling it. There's uh, thrusters and engines that are in the service module that would be beneath where we are right now. And that actually flies the spaceship with the ground control monitoring and then the astronauts providing oversight over what's going on. Thank you so much for talking with me today. You're welcome. Thanks for I really coming. I it. <laughs> in order for the SLS to make it to Mars and beyond, we're going to need a lot of power. The RS-25 engines are more than up to the task. But before the engines are ready to be used in any real-life situations, they have to be tested rigorously and for years to ensure that they'll perform as required. To learn more about this all-important testing process, I got an opportunity to speak to one of the engineers working tirelessly to get these engines ready for launch. We are standing near test stands at Stennis Space Center in Hancock County, Mississippi. I'm now joined by Tommy Carroll, a NASA engineer. So why don't we test the physical engine instead of just using a computer? We use computer modeling for a lot of different things. We use it in design, we use it to check out clearances of hardware. We also use them to model what should be happening inside of the engine. And when we run that engine, the physical engine, and actually see it, we're baselining our models, but we're also looking at some of the variables that we're gonna see, and that's why we test. What is the engine test today gonna to tell us about? We're gonna be looking at a green run controller. That means a brand new controller, the computer that tells the engine what it needs to do. So what's the next step from here and how many more steps are there gonna be until the engine's ready for launch? 
So this engine that we're testing today is a development engine, and that just means that we use it for testing parts, not for testing the whole rocket engine. But the very next engine that we're going to test is a flight engine that will fly in space. So we'll take that engine after we test it, we'll ship it from here to another facility called the Michoud Assembly Facility. We'll install it on the rocket along with three other engines, so have a total of four rocket engines on that. We'll take that, that's called the stage, we'll bring that here, we'll mount it on that test stand, and from there we'll test it again. Once we've done that test, we'll put it on a barge again called the Pegasus, and we'll ship that barge from here down to Florida. They'll put the whole rocket together there, and then roll it out to the launch pad. Awesome, great information. I can't wait to see this test. It's gonna be good. Oh yeah. Yeah. To operate engines like the RS-25, you need a lot of fuel and a pretty big gas tank. We're at the liquid hydrogen test stand at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center with NASA structural engineers Robert Bobo and Sam Stevens. Thank you for talking to me, guys. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Robert, can you give me an overview of the systems and the components of the SLS? Sure, and I'll set it with reference to the test article that's behind us here. The test article that you see behind us is the liquid hydrogen tank for our new SLS launch vehicle. The hydrogen tank is our fuel tank, if you will, for the entire vehicle. The liquid engines on this vehicle run on liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Those are the propellants that we use to produce the thrust. In addition to that, we have a solid rocket booster attached to each side of this liquid hydrogen tank for added thrust to get through the Earth's atmosphere. As we go up the stack, if you will, there's an inner tank that sits on top of this. Above the inner tank is where the LOX tank, or the liquid oxygen tank, rides. Then we adapt to our second stage. Then we adapt to the Orion, which includes a service module, a crew module, and a launch abort system. Sam, what are structural tests and why do you do them? Well, the structural tests are very important to us. You've got these engines underneath and beside that are blowing, winds pushing, all sorts of different forces that it has to be able to withstand. So we do structural testing. We put all these forces into the rocket to make sure that it can withstand those and the vehicle's safe to fly. I know that this rocket is designed to take us back to the moon. What are the similarities between the SLS and the Saturn V? Some of the primary similarities are the fact that we use liquid propellants through the rocket engines to generate the thrust to, to get to the moon and complete the mission. We also have to do it in stages. One stage or one set of engines doesn't get us all the way there. And a little difference with SLS is we have the solid strap to each side for the first phase of the mission. So why does America need this rocket to go to the moon? There are other uh, nations, other private companies who are building rockets, but none of them have the payload capacity that we need to launch an Orion carrying multiple astronauts or very large payloads. We need an SLS with all of its launch capability to get all those things to the moon. Once we get to the moon, we can learn how to work with these large components, and from there, we can eventually move on to Mars. I know that you guys said that the rocket was going to be big, but how much bigger will it be compared to what's behind us right now? So what you're looking at behind me, the test article here, is about 150 feet tall. The space launch system itself, add another 100 feet to that, about 320 feet tall. Wow. Well, thank you guys for talking to me today. I really appreciated it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. If you're going to get something the size of NASA's Future Space Launch System, or SLS, off the ground, you need more than just brawn. You need brains. Computer brains, the best science has to offer. The SLS's computers work using the same basic principles as the computer or smartphone you interact with in your daily life. In order to function, computers need programming. Programming is built by humans by writing lines of computer code, a language spoken by computers which is then input directly into the computer. With this code, computers can be programmed to do actions automatically, like turn on and off certain circuits or valves on a rocket at specific times. This allows human controllers the ability to manage hundreds of delicate operations on the SLS that would be impossible without a computer. The Space Launch System has both brawn and brains, and as NASA's future vehicle for sending humans into space and beyond, it will be one of the smartest rockets ever when it takes flight.
really wanted to see how engineers are testing the computer hardware that's responsible for operating SLS launch systems. And now we're here at the SLS Systems Integration Lab. Here, engineers install different components into this system unit mock-up to try to see how different things work together. I am here with Hannah Hopkins, SLS software engineer, and Alex Matris, aerospace engineer. Can you explain to me the systems on this SLS? Well, there's a lot of avionics systems on board, and avionics are just the computers which operate all of the systems that fly the rocket. One of the systems is the fly computer. It's what's doing all the controls. It's the autopilot system, and it's checking all of the sensors and everything else to make sure that everything's still working well for flight. There's three flight computers, and they're basically the brain of the operations, and if one of them fails, it's okay. They vote it off the island, and we keep going, but if two of them fails, things get a little risky, so we definitely need these. These are crucial to flight. There's other instruments such as a redundant inertial navigation unit, which is a fancy term, but all it's doing is figuring out where we are when we're in space. There's other systems for like hydraulics and steering the vehicle so that you can steer it to get it to wherever you need it to go to. We also have the engine controller over here. The engine controller basically controls the mixture ratio between the liquid oxygen and the liquid hydrogen tanks, and so it controls the thrust of where it goes. Um, and it also takes all of the sensors from the engine and it can look at, is this engine failing us or is this engine okay? Is it doing what it's supposed to do? So you can kind of think of the systems of the SLS as kind of the central nervous system of the rocket, especially the avionics components in here. How do you test SLS systems and software in here? We test all of the hardware and software in here with a simulation called Artemis. And so basically what we do is we write code to simulate all of the different models on SLS and all of the different components. And something cool with that that we can do is we can say, what if one of the engines fail? Or what if all the engines fail? Or what if the flight computer quits on us? Or something like that. And we can see how the rocket is going to react so we can better prepare to how to handle that on launch day. In fact, we've actually run about 15,000 simulations in here, and so we've launched the rocket 15,000 times. We present the flight computer any number of scenarios to make sure that it can detect all the kinds of different faults and still keep flying safely. You can't do all of these in the real test flight. Yeah, and so that's one of the big differences between now and the Apollo days is that they didn't have that software to be able to test it as much as we have. What are some of the things that you've learned from the testing that you've done here? Well, our job is to bring a lot of different pieces together all in one place. There's a lot of different people making a lot of different parts of this vehicle. So we'll find issues where two things may not talk together the way we thought they would. We can figure that out, fix it, and test the solution to it right here in our lab and then go make that happen in the real hardware. Thank you guys so much for telling me about all the awesome stuff you have going on here. Yeah, of course. No problem. It was our pleasure. Is that it? I think we got them all. Let's check. And that's future exploration and space computer controls. We did it. Great work, team. Yes, but we really couldn't have done it without your help. That's right. Every single one of you viewers out there should now consider yourselves members of the STEM Brigade, just like us. Exactly. Together, we all learned about the science and history behind human spaceflight and the endless possibilities in the future of our travels away from the big blue marble we call Earth. Thanks for joining us on our Out of This World journey. And now... Steady over, over and out. out. The Space Launch System is the next generation heavy lift rocket for NASA that's going to take humans and cargo missions farther into deep space than ever before. SLS is massive. 
It's the size or larger than most buildings. We're talking about flying a skyscraper, essentially. So we need a lot of propulsion. A big portion of it is really just the propellant that we need to get that heavy weight off the ground. And these rockets need to go five times the speed of sound to get out of the atmosphere. And what happens is that the air acts as a can crusher, and it's trying to crush that vehicle. So what we have to do as aerodynamicists is quantify what those forces are doing to your rocket. As we're testing in the wind tunnel, we're looking at the pressures that the body sees all the way up. That really just determines how strong that shell needs to be. We need it to be nice and strong, but not too strong, because if we make it too strong, then the rocket is too heavy, and that takes away from some of the payload that we can fly into space. Every time we design a new launch vehicle, the airflow is different, so we have to test. Our first test launch for SLS will be going around the moon and back again. We are building that vehicle right now. What's being stacked up as we speak and will be ready to fly in 2020. When the space launch system flies, no other rocket will be able to take such heavy payloads into space. Our ability to carry all that heavy equipment up there is incredibly important, and this is the way that we're going to do that. We're going to be able to take humans to Mars, but the international community is going to have to come together and collaborate in a unique fashion. It's not just governments, it's all of the commercial industry that is really blooming right now, and even private citizens. We're going to rely on all of that in order to get to humans to Mars. NASA, while we've developed a lot of the technology that's going into a lot of these rockets, and our government is funding most, if not all, of this work, either directly or indirectly, we need those partners so that we can keep pushing the frontier. several major milestones. The service module was completely finished in January at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The service module is the part of the spacecraft that contains all of the structural elements, spacecraft adapter, payload fairings, and crew module separation systems the EFT-1 capsule needs to conduct its high-altitude orbital testing. In February, the completed service module was stress tested for the final time. The structural loads test proved that the vehicle will endure the physical stresses of its upcoming flight. After the test, the service module was ready to attach to the crew module. A test of the forward bay cover and parachute system was successfully passed in January at the Yuma Proving Ground in Arizona. After the Orion mock-up was dropped from a plane, the forward bay cover separated from the capsule, allowing the parachutes to release as the crew module descended safely to the desert floor. The capsule, parachutes, and forward bay cover were recovered and subjected to additional testing in the following months. In February, the Delta Mariner delivered two of the core and starboard boosters for the Delta IV Heavy rocket. After the boosters go through stringent testing and processing in the horizontal integration facility, they will roll out to Launch Complex 37 for EFT-1's launch later this year. A full-scale mock-up of the Orion capsule was delivered to Langley Research Center in March. The mock-up will be used to perform a variety of static and impact tests to evaluate various water landing scenarios in a wide array of different conditions. Kennedy Space
Space Center in Florida. Upgrades and modernization of the multi-payload processing facility continue as the building is ready for Orion processing support. By April of next year, the MPPF will have updated structural elements like environmental control systems, high bay doors, and emergency systems. The facility is also upgrading spacecraft preparation elements such as fuel and breathable gas systems, time-critical installation equipment, and ground support equipment storage. In January, the Crawler Transporter 2 completed a test drive on new traction roller bearings in two of its truck sections. The new roller bearings are one of several upgrades to the Crawler Transporter, which will carry the significantly heavier Space Launch System out to Launch Pad 39B. The other two truck sections of the Crawler Transporter will also receive new roller bearings and complete a follow-up test drive in November. In February, NASA and the Navy tested procedures to be used during Orion recovery operations. After launch and re-entry simulations, the forward bay cover and parachutes were successfully retrieved from rough waters off the California coast. The ocean turbulence in the well deck of the recovery ship made it difficult to secure the Orion test article. The challenges experienced during this test reinforced the necessity of practicing spacecraft recovery. The circumferential dome weld tube produced a second liquid oxygen tank confidence article at the Mashu assembly facility. The confidence tank verified that the weld tool is capable of producing the core stage tank up to the exacting standards the space launch system will require. A composite cryo tank for liquid hydrogen was also produced and delivered to Marshall Space Flight Center aboard NASA's Super Guppy cargo plane in March. The advanced composite cryo tank, which could benefit many of NASA's deep space exploration spacecraft, will undergo a series of structural pressure tests later this year. A scale model of the SLS was used in acoustic testing to see what effects high and low frequency sound waves will have during launch. The model's core stage fired for five seconds while an array of microphones collected the acoustic data. A full assembly test with the scale rocket motors will be conducted later this year. In March, NASA Administrator Charles Bolden visited Marshall after the software integration team powered up the flight avionics, which includes hardware, software, and operating systems for space launch system. Known as First Light, the flight computers of the SLS simulated the flight path the vehicle will experience during launch. NASA's Exploration Systems Development Division is flying through production, testing, and launch, as 2014 promises to be one of the most productive and exciting years in recent space history. Halfway through one of the most productive years in recent space history, NASA's Exploration Systems Development Division is moving humans ever closer to deep space exploration. Space Launch System, NASA's next generation deep space launch vehicle, had an intense spring full of development and testing. Testing on the avionics system, responsible for controlling the Space Launch System's solid rocket boosters, began in April. The avionics system will ignite, steer, and jettison the two solid rocket boosters and will continue to undergo an extensive series of tests this summer. In May, structural tests on the SLS booster forward skirt proved it could withstand millions of pounds of launch stress during a series of ground tests. The SLS core stage will be powered by four RS-25 engines that are now undergoing preparation for test firing at the Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. Following initial testing, the engines will be integrated with the core stage and the entire assembly will be tested on the B-2 test stand. Because the SLS core stage is 50% longer than the Saturn moon rocket stages, 
the mothballed B-2 test stand and the main derrick crane are currently being modified and upgraded to accommodate this enormous structural element and powerful main engines. Production of the core stage structure and propellant tanks continues at the Michoud Assembly Facility in Louisiana. 34 primary structure components and 20 rings have been welded to build the core stage propellant tanks, including nine barrels and all the rings needed for SLS's first flight. A 5% scale model of the SLS was ignited to test how both low and high frequency sound waves will affect the rocket as it fires its solid rocket boosters and main engines on the launch pad prior to liftoff. These ongoing tests are collecting data from over 200 sensors to study the acoustic impact on the spacecraft and verify the design of its water-based sound suppression system. A major milestone in the effort to transform Kennedy Space Center into a multi-user spaceport was met when ground systems development and operations completed the initial design and technology phase of the preliminary design review. GSDO is modifying the spaceport's infrastructure to support several different spacecraft and rocket launch needs. Firing Room 4 at the Launch Control Center at Kennedy Space Center in Florida is being renovated into four separate launch areas to serve NASA and commercial users' needs. Designed to accommodate a multi-user spaceport, the new adaptable rooms can open up to give more space as needed by a customer's launch room parameters. Upgrades to the mobile launcher at Launch Complex 39 are underway, with significant progress toward advanced usability. GSDO is systematically modernizing the launcher to meet the increased needs of the more substantial space launch system. Upgrades include structural work, an improved sound suppression water system, a redesigned exhaust opening, new data connectivity to the launch control center, and updates to the power, air condition, and fire alarm systems. After the Exploration Flight Test 1 mission is complete and the capsule lands in the Pacific Ocean, the ground systems development and operations and Orion programs and the U.S. Navy will retrieve the capsule and ship it back to Florida for reuse. The return process requires a series of pre-transportation operations which were successfully tested in May. Workers practiced assembling a transportation fixture that will be used to move future Orion crew modules across the country. The newly renovated flight control room at the Johnson Space Center in Houston played host to members of the media and top NASA officials in April. The white flight control room will support the Orion spacecraft during NASA's deep space exploration missions. In May, the room was used in a joint integration simulation along with the team at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The two teams simulated the pre-launch and in-orbit phases of Orion's mission and solved real-time problems acting as the eyes and ears of the uncrewed spacecraft. The rigorous testing on Orion's parachute system continued in April and June, proving the parachutes are capable of surviving potential failures during both re-entry and launch abort scenarios. The first test simulated an abort scenario by dropping the capsule from a height of 13,000 feet and releasing the main parachutes before the drogue parachute could deploy or the vehicle could straighten itself out. The second test pulled the capsule from the C-17 airplane at an altitude of 35,000 feet with one of the main parachutes intentionally rigged to skip a crucial phase in the unfurling process. Both tests demonstrated the parachute system can tolerate unexpected failures and still carry the capsule safely to the ground. After two years of intense production and testing, Orion's massive heat shield was successfully attached to the crew module in Kennedy Space Center's operations and checkout facility. The 16 and a half foot wide ablative shield will protect the capsule from re-entry temperatures of up to 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. 
A center of gravity test confirmed that all of the ballast was properly installed in the crew module. The test validated the Orion team's computer models used to calculate the amount and location of ballast needed to properly balance the crew module. With the heat shield securely attached to the capsule, the crew module was then stacked on top of the service module in June. The stacked modules will undergo electrical, avionic, and radio frequency tests to prepare for the Exploration Flight Test 1 in December. In May, astronauts at the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory in Houston trained underwater in newly modified spacesuits to work through simulated operations for NASA's asteroid retrieval mission. A month later, a naval team worked with Orion recovery specialists to train for a set of procedures to safely retrieve the capsule and forward bay cover. As Exploration Systems Development closes in on December's launch of Exploration Flight Test 1, NASA centers nationwide stride toward the Moon, Mars,
next eight minutes, you'll experience a 25 and a half day mission from rollout to recovery. The first integrated flight test of the Orion spacecraft and the Space Launch System rocket launching from the Kennedy Space Center is about to unfold. This is the first of many missions to come that will use the Deep Space Exploration System to prepare our team, our ship, and our astronauts for human operations in deep space. Rollout from the Vehicle Assembly Building signals that launch is near. Sitting atop the mobile launcher, the crawler transporter moves along the crawler way towards historic launch pad 39B at the Kennedy Space Center at a top speed of one mile an hour. After traveling over four miles, the rocket and the spacecraft climb up a ramp and are positioned over a flame trench. Once in position, the mobile launcher is lowered onto support post and the crawler is rolled away to a safe distance. Final checks are performed at the pad, including crew cabin closeout via the access arm sitting over 300 feet above the surface of the launch pad. The launch date is set and the teams are prepared for the mission that is about to occur. At sunrise on launch day, engineers in the Launch Control Center have already powered up the spacecraft and the rocket and loaded the core stage and upper stage with cryogenic fuel. As launch window open approaches, final checks are performed and when all systems are go, terminal countdown is initiated. The big physics of launch are about to be put on full demonstration. Umbilical plates weighing hundreds of pounds await their cue to retract to clear the path of the rocket at liftoff, some mounted on arms the size of tractor trailers. The mighty core stage engines are prepared for engine start as they are thermally conditioned for an onrush of cryogenic fuel and the heat of ignition. At T minus 15 seconds, sound suppression is activated, cascading water into the flame trench to dampen the acoustic shock. And as the core stage engines achieve full throttle, shock diamonds appear. At booster ignition, the flame trench is flooded with fire. At first motion, all umbilical arms are retracted and the rocket clears the tower in just seconds. At liftoff, the vehicle produces 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust and lofts the vehicle weighing nearly 6 million pounds and standing 32 stories tall to orbit. Propelled by a pair of five-segment boosters and four liquid engines, the rocket achieves maximum dynamic pressure only 90 seconds into the mission, the period of greatest atmospheric force on the structure of the rocket. Thousands will gather in Florida to watch our ship get smaller and smaller and leave the Space Coast behind. Approximately two minutes into the mission, the boosters will have consumed all of their solid propellant and are safely jettisoned. The rocket will continue on, guiding itself to orbit with magnificent precision. Just three minutes into the mission, the service module fairings are jettisoned to lighten the vehicle and expose Orion's solar arrays. Just 40 seconds later, the launch abort system is also jettisoned. It is no longer needed. Orion could safely abort at any time. Once at the desired velocity target, the core stage engines are shut down and the core stage separates. The interim cryo propulsion stage with Orion will continue to orbit the Earth. Along the way, they will pass through the altitude of the International Space Station at 250 statute miles. During this first orbit, the solar rays are deployed so that Orion no longer needs battery power it can now produce its own power. Following solar array deployment, the arrays are positioned into a load-bearing configuration to prepare for the perigee rays maneuver. The rays maneuver will ensure an Earth orbit and use the thrust provided by the interim cryopropulsion stage. Once the perigee rays maneuver is complete, Orion systems are checked prior to committing to the translunar injection, or TLI maneuver. The TLI maneuver must be successfully completed to depart Earth orbit. The TLI burn is approximately 20 minutes in duration and increases the spacecraft's velocity over 9,000 feet per second, a speed change faster than a high-powered rifle bullet travels. Following TLI, Orion is committed to a lunar trajectory just one and a half hours after launch. Once complete, the spacecraft adapter will remain with the interim crowd propulsion stage and they will separate from Orion. As Orion departs low Earth orbit, it will fly through the orbital debris field encircling the Earth, past the Global Positioning Navigation Satellites, past the Communication Satellites in geostationary orbit, and through the Van Allen radiation belts, on into the deep space radiation environment. Orion is now entering an outbound coast phase. The spacecraft is uniquely designed to navigate, communicate, and operate in this deep space environment. 
The outbound coast to the moon will take approximately four days. As Orion approaches the moon, the service module will be used to perform a critical lunar gravity assist maneuver, allowing the ship to enter a distant retrograde orbit about the moon. The moon will get larger and larger in the window, and at closest approach, Orion will be just 62 miles from the surface of the moon. As the spacecraft flies around the far side of the moon, we will lose all communication back on Earth, and for a period of time, Orion will be on its own. Mission Control will await acquisition of signal, and as we lock on, a new generation will see their first Earth rise. The spacecraft is now in the distant retrograde orbit, where its systems will be tested in the deep space environment for over a week. Along the way, our ship will travel farther from Earth than any human-capable spacecraft has ever gone. At the farthest point, Orion will be some 1,000 times farther from Earth than the International Space Station at over 270,000 miles away. Teams in Mission Control Houston and at Naval Base San Diego will prepare for Orion's return home, and the recovery ship will set sail for the recovery zone in the Pacific Ocean. Orion will exit the distant retrograde orbit with another Lunar Gravity Assist and Service Module engine firing. Along the way, the trajectory will be adjusted to target the Earth's thin atmosphere at over a quarter million miles away and ensure precision landing in the Pacific Ocean following a direct entry. During the coast home, Orion will maintain the desired tail-to-sun attitude to optimize spacecraft cooling and maximize power production in the deep space environment. Another four days return coast home to Earth. As our home planet fills the windows of Orion, an important contribution from our European partners called the Service Module has done its job. The Service Module is jettisoned and separates. Following separation, the world's largest heat shield will be oriented into the direction of travel to prepare for entry interface at an altitude of 400,000 feet. At entry interface, Orion will hit the Earth's atmosphere traveling at a speed of 24,500 miles an hour and decelerate it up to nine times the force of gravity. The heat shield will protect the spacecraft from temperatures half as hot as the surface of the sun, approaching 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Orion will continue to decelerate, pass through the sound barrier, and announce its arrival to the waiting recovery team with a sonic boom. Following peak heating, a protective thermal cover that sits over the parachutes will be jettisoned. This begins a series of parachute deployments. The drogue chute deployment series is designed to stabilize and slow the spacecraft, and in a period of less than 20 minutes, Orion will slow from a speed of Mach 32 to zero at splashdown. The three main parachutes will deploy and slowly unfurl and suspend the 22,000 pound capsule and allow it to gently descend to the surface of the ocean. After 25 and a half days, in a total distance traveled exceeding 1.3 million miles, a precision landing within eyesight of the recovery ship. Following splashdown, Orion will remain powered for a period of time as Navy divers approach in small boats from the waiting recovery ship. After a brief inspection for hazards, the divers will hook up tending lines and a tow line. The capsule will be then towed into the well deck of the recovery ship, and once the capsule clears the stern gate, the gate will be closed, the well deck will be drained, and we will bring our ship home. We invite you to follow along at www.nasa.gov slash exploration. Hi, I'm Jim Green, better known as Lunac, and this is Ask NASA. Are we ready for the first question? Let's see. I'm getting a sense of it. Yes, we're going to the moon, and we're doing it for many important reasons. It's because we want to practice on going to Mars. Things that we want to do is to learn to live and work on a planetary surface. Of course, it's got to be about the water. How are we going to use it? We're going to drink it. That's the first thing. The second thing is we can take those two elements apart and use them for rocket fuel. Or we can just simply use the oxygen to breathe. We want to be able to look at this water, tease it out through cores, and understand the water history of the moon. Just that will be fantastic. Ah, uh, 
yes. The South Pole. It's fascinating. Let's see what it looks like. Here's some LRO data. And it shows us all the areas that have sunlight and all those areas that never receive any sunlight. These are the areas that have the water. What equipment are we going to take to the moon? Well, this is going to be done with the commercial groups that are planning to have landers and rovers, and we're going to ride along. We're going to take scientific instruments with us and tease out the impact history of the moon. That will tell us how the Earth and the moon evolved together. Let's find out what else is going on at Mars. Ah, oh, yes. Marnak knows the answer to that, and it's right here. This is one of our fantastic rovers. It's called Curiosity, and it's currently roving on Mars today. We need to know what that is, because it will tell us if Mars is like Earth. All right, sack it to me. Why is Mars red? Mars is red because it's been oxidized. That means it has material on the surface that grabs that oxygen and turns it red. How are the moon and Mars similar? Well, that's our plan. We're going to go to both. How are the moon and Mars different? Well, one's bigger than the other. Do you know Bruno Mars? <laughs> <laughs> Plays real well. He's the one that wants to go to Mars, too. We ought to take him. Do sound waves travel on Mars? Sound waves do travel on Mars, but not on the moon. Oh, cool. What's your favorite planet? I love all my children equally. Have you ever named a NASA science mission? Well, a couple. I was involved in the image mission, so I helped name that. But Curiosity was the one I helped name. I didn't put in the essay, but I knew it when I saw it. That was the name it needed to be. Can you describe the solar system in one word? Massive. <laughs> Do you have a question for NASA? Send your questions to our experts on Twitter using hashtag AskNASA. We're excited to see what kind of data that we collect from this first project. Any sort of data that we get is going to be brand new information for us. And for... <laughs> Three, two, one, and zero and a liftoff of the Falcon 9 rocket and the Dragon spacecraft, packed with science and supplies for the International Space Station, humanity's home in low Earth orbit. So we were originally scheduled to be on SpaceX 14, but about a week before launch, um, our project got uh, canceled from that launch because of some issues with the con controlled environment. Science in space can be complex, and no matter how meticulously things are planned and executed, sometimes those complexities get in the way of launching on time. When equipment used to house the experiment didn't look perfect for a final pre-flight test, there was no choice but to push it to a later flight to ensure mission success. As a first-time investigator, that was, um, what, it wasn't devastating, it was just sad that we weren't going to be able to launch because we, it, up to that point it had taken us about two years to get there. Ultimately, it gives about six months more time to reevaluate that controlled system and do some more groundwork to prepare for the launch in December of 2018 on SpaceX 16. After the setback of being moved to a later launch, our team of scientists now has only days left before their experiment will be loaded into a SpaceX Dragon capsule that will carry it to the International Space Station. Elaine and Peristu, the co-founders of a biomedical startup, are at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, readying their research for microgravity. Since this is our first project that's launching to station, this is our also our first time working at the Kennedy Space Center. So it's been an exciting moment to, you know, not just see the visitor center, go look at the touristy things, but also get to get past the security gate and into the actual laboratories. 
While some experiments are loaded into Dragon in the weeks leading up to launch, others have more time-sensitive components. These require precise preparation and loading in the days before liftoff. For those scientists, laboratories at the Kennedy Space Center that are a part of the Space Station Processing Facility, or SSPF, become a home away from home. Here, they can carry out the critical last steps of preparing their experiments for delivery to the space station. So we got here on a Thursday, and it's currently Sunday. It's been a big day yesterday filling up these wells with gel solution and getting ready for handover at 7.30 a.m. on Monday, ahead of launch on Tuesday afternoon. Once you arrive here, you kind of get into this other time. It's, it's this weird like little time bubble where everything is now L-based and L being launched and it's L minus 72, L minus 48, L minus 24 and, it, and it's just building up to the actual launch time. With those precious remaining hours, the team is prepping their microplates for microgravity. Microplates are also used in labs on Earth, but these were specially designed to be self-contained. My role on the project was to design the actual microplate themselves. The challenge on orbit, though, is that uh, generally fluid experiments have to be conducted in the glove box, and the glove box is, is very time limited. Uh, it's very crew intensive. So we've designed this self-contained microplate that uh, can be operated outside of the glove box. It has all of the containment to keep the fluids inside. So we have loaded these uh, wells with uh, hydrogel, so they were carrying drugs. And we, wanted, we want to actually look at the effect of microgravity and how the release of the drug is affected when we send that to the space station. So the concern that we have is that if we have bubbles that are in the wells, it may be difficult for the plate reader to be able to read the amount correctly. So we are being very careful with uh, how we are loading the waters. Uh, so what's left to do today, once Parasu here finishes filling the, the microplates, I'm going to take over and seal them up completely. Once that's done, we'll add all the labels onto the microplates and put them in a, a self-contained box that uh, is what they'll actually travel to the space station on. <laughs> Three years in the making just to get here. Once we do that, we'll turn it over to Cold Stow. Cold Stow will take it from there, and uh, the next time we'll see them, we'll be on, their, on orbit, and the crew's opening them up. Cold Stow, short for cold stowage, is the team responsible for making sure that the research stays at the right temperature on its journey from the lab on Earth to the lab in space. This handoff is one of the last steps before being loaded onto the rocket. The cold stowage team will take Elaine and Peristu's experiment and keep it safe and sound before it's loaded for launch. Does it feel like a relief? Well, it'll feel like a relief when we actually see it take off. And then it'll be finally... It's a huge step though. Yeah. It's done. It's out of our hands at this point. <laughs> yeah. But it'll be officially out of our hands when it leaves the Earth's surface. So that'll be, that'll be the moment that we're finally, finally done. Until we get data. And then we get to process it. <laughs> Just the beginning, actually. <laughs> so what will happen now is now that we've handed them over to NASA, NASA will deliver, they're on their way right now out to, to Dragon to be loaded. And the launch hopefully will happen tomorrow at uh, 1338. I've been involved since the very beginning, which is approximately about three years ago. Uh, it's been a long road, <laughs> but uh, like everything, it's, it's a lot of work. It's worth it. And uh, we're excited to, to, to help to manage and get some data for this project. Overall, we're going to get a lot of data from just this one project and those two experiments that are going to inform a lot of different things for us. <laughs> All right. It's a little windy out here today. Beautiful day. Uh, it's a little windy. It's got me concerned. My, my launch intuition is uh, tingling a bit. It's always an awesome and amazing and special thing to see. the uh, launch day. It's a little windy out here today. It's a beautiful day. Uh, it's a little windy. It's got me concerned. My, my launch intuition is uh, tingling a bit. 
I grew up here in Florida. I came to this very spot out here in the Causeway as a kid. My dad would take us to launches all the time. So personally, oh, it's like I, the kid in me comes out when I come here. <laughs> it's really cool. I've been on both sides of it. I've been a researcher, and then I've been a, a now helping researchers. And I gotta say, it's it's nervous on both sides. You have a lot of worry, I guess, as a scientist, you, you have a lot of work involved. As a payload provider, you, you hope you've checked all the boxes and you've done all that you can do to make everything work for the researchers so that they get good data. It's, it's not easy to put it, even the most simplest payloads uh, in, on the space station, but it's worth it. It's worth all the work. I think some of the biggest discoveries we have, uh, we've made and are going to find are up on the space station. It's incredibly important. Well, we've been really nervous all the way up until right this moment. Nervous that our, our dreams aren't actually going to happen. <laughs> but now that the um, you know larger countdown is happening and the rocket's all fueled up and everything looks like it's going to happen on time, it's, it's getting really exciting. The last you know, 15 minute window before it takes off. You know, thanks to Cases for funding this, thanks to Nanorax for helping us coordinate and making the hardware and coordinating all the data collection too. Thank you for the astronauts who are going to be working on this project on station. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of people worked on this. It's not just the two of us. It's, it's been a lot of people. So uh, we really appreciate all their support. Yeah. Dragon take flight, bound for the International Space Station with fresh supplies and research, hoping to maintain our human presence in space as the station celebrates its 20th anniversary. Yeah. It'd be incredible just to watch it no matter what, but knowing that we have a personal yeah. investment in it, it makes it a it makes a big difference. Yeah, so it's just knowing that something that we've been working on is on it and and then watching the whole like the whole experience makes it just different. It's it, it really I can't find the right words to, to explain it. Really. Definitely feel like the work leading up to it was worthwhile. Yeah, absolutely. And watching it with your best friend. Yeah. And like someone that you've been working with for such a long time and it's just, oh, it's, yeah, I think it couldn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't want to do it with anyone else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is the exact same sentiment that I have. So it was really, it was really special that we could both be here. Yeah. Watch it together. Our scientist experiment is officially on its way to the International Space Station. The SpaceX Dragon capsule that gives the research its ride to low Earth orbit now must make the last leg of its journey to the hands of the astronauts in microgravity. What's neat for us is we've got cargo vehicles coming and going to the ISS all the time. It is really like a busy parking lot. Vehicles come in, they stay for a few months, we do a whole bunch of science, and then they leave again. And before you know it, the next one's coming up. Now, what's important to remember is that these vehicles cannot dock themselves to the space station. We have to bring them into the space station utilizing robotics. And what I like to tell people is performing robotics, going out and capturing that vehicle is like a really difficult video game. And so we practice over and over and over again using computer simulations on how to actually capture that cargo vehicle to bring it into station. Once that cargo vehicle docks to station, we do a series of pressure checks and equalize that pressure with the International Space Station, and finally we get to open the hatch. Very quickly the crew starts to move because we've got some experiments that are actually kept at certain temperatures, and we have to transfer them quickly out and keep them at the same temperature there on board the space station. Elaine and Peristu's research is one of the experiments that requires quick unloading. Stored at a constant temperature to ensure the hydrogels stay intact, it's one of the first items that astronauts must remove from Dragon. Then, with the experiment finally aboard the space station, it's time to conduct science in microgravity. 
this was fantastic for me. This is what I do. This means a lot to me as a clinician. And so it was really neat to be able to perform that sort of science on station. Still station, one zero zero two is loaded. experiment is aboard the space station, it's time for the astronauts to get to work. Elaine and Paris Stu are back in Virginia, and the Nanorax team is back in Texas, where they will perform a ground control version of the experiment being conducted by the crew in space. The crew members are using the Nanorax plate reader to read uh, the plates. They're analyzing the, what's in the plate and the migration of, of fluids between the two chambers that are on the plates. And so we have our ground uh, samples here. Uh, these are identical to the ones that are on the, on the space station. And what we're going to do is, as the crew members insert the plates into the plate reader on the space station, we're also going to insert the plates onto the, the ground unit we have behind me. And that's just to confirm that what we're seeing, any effects that we do end up seeing, is effective of uh, the space environment um, compared to the ground unit. In summary, what the plate reader does is, it's called, uh, the big fancy word is a spectrophotometer. And it's got a big lamp in it that uh, shines white light, and then it's got a prism or a grating. And the white light shines on the grating, and then it moves to orientate which, to, to kind of separate the light into a wavelength. And you get to select which wavelength you want to shine through your sample. We have six plates. Uh, each plate takes about four minutes, so it's about 30 minutes each. And every time in between, we'll be listening for the crew member to say that they inserted the plate. Uh, then we'll hit the command here. Once the run is done, the crew member will come over and take the plate out, put the new plate in, and it'll repeat for uh, five more times. Still station on three. Plate 1003 is in the tray. Oh, uh, yeah, it's reading in the plate. It's got a little you know, plate that's in there. It moves the plate this way, and then the read hit moves this way. And a little here, that's kind of the lamp that's in there that turns the lamp on. Sounds like bad techno music. My crewmate actually was the first one to start this experiment. And I took over for him and said, hey, what, what experiment is this? What are we doing? And he looks at me and he says, I'm not sure. So we called down um, to the ground to mission control. And I know that part of this is we're looking at a, a gel that can release the antibiotics, kind of slow release to a wound site. Um, but I don't know what happened to that plate in the nanorax we hear this morning and then kind of what's going on this afternoon. Um, what we're looking for is how the drug migrates through the gel over time, which is why we're scanning the plates two times a day for this two-week run. I like that answer. That's very cool. Thank you for finding that out. No problem. So this is 15 days. Uh, it's twice a day, and they're typically in the middle of the night, which is the morning for, for the crew on space station, and then usually sometime in the in the late morning, early afternoon here. But Kyle's been running the show. He's been getting up every six hours, eight hours, seven hours to do this. It's kind of fun in a way. I get to play astronaut on the ground, so that's always fun. After 15 days of running the experiment, the researchers have a lot of valuable data about how hydrogels behave in microgravity. To learn even more, the samples will come back to Earth for further analysis. For the last leg of their journey, the samples will return to Earth in the same Dragon capsule that gave them a ride to microgravity. After Dragon splashes down in the Pacific Ocean, it's taken to the port of Long Beach, where NASA will be ready to retrieve the precious cargo. Splashdown for Dragon was on uh, 
Sunday, I believe. And so NASA has a group called Cold Stowage and uh, Cargo Manifest, and they go out and pick up the payloads from Dragon. And then they distribute it to people at LA or uh, whoever needs them there, and then they bring them also here to J Johnson Space Center. Um, and so now I'm in, out front at the Cold Stow office, and I just picked up uh, Module 74, which is our Tim Panagen project. And they hand it to me, and I put it in my cooler, and then I drive it over to uh, our office where it's going to sit until we fly up to uh, the Tim Panagen office in uh, Richmond, Virginia to uh, do the final phase of the experiment, uh, which is removing the samples out of the, the reactor microplates. We're really proud to take part in this really, uh, a really interesting experiment. When we first got our gels back, it was already exciting because space never loses its cool. And so we had these places where, oh my God, these are what the astronauts touched. And so we opened up and they've been to space and back and now they're in our lab. Whenever a NASA aircraft leaves the ground, an entire team of people ensure that it executes its mission safely and successfully. The pilot and mission controller sit at the ends of a complex stream of data, along which dozens of IT specialists, engineers, and technicians work to ensure that each in-flight decision is informed by accurate information, and that all test or science data is successfully gathered and processed. At the Armstrong Flight Research Center, this team makes up the Mission Information and Test Systems Directorate, known simply as Code M, a critical behind-the-scenes force that helps Armstrong keep its reputation as one of the world's finest flight research centers. In most cases, new flight projects first approach the Mission Integration Office, or MIO. The MIO is responsible for the development of partnerships with key researchers, mission directorates, and external stakeholders. They help create value for our partners by providing an initial interface and a cross-functional integration of processes, capabilities, and operations. Flights of new aircraft or systems are first simulated to ensure that any novel concepts are working as designed, or to conduct trade studies, or to iterate a design towards optimum performance. Later, when an actual flight is scheduled, before the aircraft even revs its engines, simulation familiarizes the pilot and mission control team with the procedures and test points, and prepares them for unexpected situations. Engineers and technicians in Code ME, the simulation engineering branch of Code M, create one-of-a-kind simulation programs and hardware subsystem interfaces that enable NASA's pilots and their industry partners to understand how a new aircraft or system will handle or discover the most efficient ways to hit their data points. Paul, I'm going to uh, light the burners just for a second here to see the difference in the uh, thrust. All right. So the uh, cable tension go up the middle there, since yeah. red. Alright, coming out of the afterburners, back to full power. Yep, got some slack. And some slack on the road there. Oh yeah, it's, it's amazing now that I'm getting kind of used to the sim, I can really feel you back there and the effects.
ready to send checks. Sending check command now. Send arm. Arming now. Ready to send terminate. And terminating now. And we have a good arm term cycle. Well before the research flight phase, the range engineering branch, code MC, engineers and software developers build, integrate, and verify range assets. This is how they ensure the aircraft telemetry can be received and processed for control room display monitoring. That aircraft position can be tracked for situational awareness. All right, this is a TD on data two. I'll go ahead and check everybody's their control room display status now that we have both engines up. Turn you loud and clear. And that control room voice communications are working. For unmanned aircraft, Code MC verifies uplinks for command and control and flight termination systems. We got our arm and terminate. responsibility of MR at the Range Operations Branch. From working with the U.S. Air Force, which controls Edwards airspace, to scheduling flights, to keeping radar dishes locked on a supersonic airplane, to tracking that airplane with long-range optics, Code MR is responsible for getting the data from the airplane to the ground. This branch operates the telemetry tracking systems, space positioning systems, audio communication systems, video systems, mission control center, and mobile systems. After a flight, the data arrives at the Information Services Branch, or Code MI, which provides information technology solutions for NASA's workforce, everything from desktops to internet connections. Code MI also manages Armstrong's data center and network infrastructure, ensuring the right data is available to the appropriate users, from routine email to specialized mission-specific flight data. Finally, MI provides multimedia services, from graphic artists, photographers, and videographers, to web and repro. These skilled individuals ensure effective communication of the many activities and accomplishments of the center. These services include airborne photography and videography, specialty services driven by the demands of flight research. The multimedia products help make this information accessible to engineers, researchers, partners, and stakeholders around the center, around the agency, and out in the public. unknown you're headed out into this alien landscape that's just completely hostile to you and you know if you didn't have a nice ship and extremely warm clothes you probably wouldn't be able to survive and so Mosaic as a whole it's a year-long drifting expedition so it involves people from 20 different nations about 600 scientists it's a huge massive effort meant to study the 
Arctic as a system, not just the ice, but things like the atmosphere, the ocean, biogeochemistry, all kinds of things in a way that allows us to look at what's happening throughout the course of the year. So we left Tromso on September 20th, took us 10 days or so between leaving port, sailing out, picking up some instrumentation, uh, and then starting to sail into the ice pack uh, and starting to search for the flow. It was really difficult to find the flow uh, because we needed ice that was thick enough to support all our equipment. Some, some of it's very heavy and to do this safely. And actually one of the big surprises to me and a lot of people on board was just how thin the ice was. You'd get out on the ice, but it's dangerous. It's an alien landscape. It's cold, there's bears. The polar bear situation was really interesting. Uh, yeah, and, and kind of terrifying. <laughs> when we were out on the ice and we were setting things up, taking measurements, the bears did come back two times when I was there. And there, there they came to our camp and they were doing things like messing with the equipment and, and going through our site. So there it was different because they're, they're, they're more on the turf that we had set up. You know, this is our turf now and now they're, they're coming in and I could see them in places that I had been. So we were very isolated on the, the polar stern and we had very limited connectivity. We had a, an email account we could send 50 kilobytes a message. It was a big change for me and a lot of people. A lot of people said, you know, after a week or so, I didn't miss it anymore. And I was one of those people. I really appreciated being a bit more isolated for a while and experiencing life in a different way. Doing field work like this brought me right there to the ice. When I do my research, I use data like this from the, the data that's taken up close on the ice. Sometimes that's the only way to get information on the ice. Things like how dense is the ice or how dense is the snow, you can't do this remotely. But we can use this to do calibration and validation of ice at two over the course of the year. So this is valuable for improving the, the retrieval techniques that we use for ice at two. For me to be on the ground and get that different look at the, the ice and the surface, it just helps me as a scientist come up with new ideas and to inspire me to use the data that I have and then think about this in a, a totally new way, in a different way. is no ordinary aircraft, and on board is no ordinary spacecraft. This C-5 Super Galaxy is hauling something special. It can carry what no other airplane can carry in the Air Force. Width, length, weight, you name it, it can get on that thing. This jet can do it like no other jet. After two years of construction at Lockheed Martin in Denver, and a few hours in the air, Noah's goes ass has finally made it to Kennedy Space Center where the countdown to T0 begins. It's always exciting to bring a satellite down to the down to Kennedy Space Center and participate in that whole activity of getting a satellite ready for launch. Getting it out here, rolling it into the launch processing facility, that is a very big deal for us. It's one of the hugest milestones in any spacecraft programming ship. It's not easy to transport something like this across the country. And this is where the rubber meets the road. Uh, this is where all these people that have worked on this program for a couple of years, it culminates into the excitement of getting ready for uh, what we call launch fever. And so now you know, we get to kind of do some of the fun stuff, like put it on a giant airplane and take it to Kennedy Space Center, where uh, we get to prepare to go onto a, an Atlas V launch vehicle and, and launch. It's the job of NASA's Launch Services Program to get GOES-S into orbit and they have just a few months to do the final launch preps and inspections before T-0 arrives. This is no easy task with a spacecraft of this size and complexity. 
In spaceflight, there are no second chances. A successful launch is resting on their shoulders. It has to be perfect the first time. It's very exciting. I love being a part of this, and I love being able to contribute to the spacecraft and to its success. Go Zess is the second part of a weather satellite upgrade project NOAA is undertaking, destined to save lives by modernizing our weather forecasting ability. We have a very young team, and this is some of them. This will be their first campaign, so we're trying to. Uh, put the excitement into that, let them feel what it's like to touch the spacecraft for the last time. Launch operations is time we all get together for one goal, which is launch. But achieving that goal will not be easy. The road to T-Zero has just begun. There's only one cargo ship designed to transport rockets for United Launch Alliance. And tonight, it's pulling into Port Canaveral with the robust flight hardware of an Atlas V. We're a high-tech vessel, high maneuverability. We have to be because uh, we get into some tight areas on shallow rivers. The Delta Mariner is unique. It has uh, two aft Z drives coupled by computer with the uh, bow thrusters. It turns 360 degrees on demand. This crew has work to do. In less than four weeks, the rocket must be safely delivered, inspected, and assembled in order to successfully launch NOAA's highly advanced GOES-S weather satellite. I sense from the crew the pride being part of this mission. And when I put this vessel alongside the dock, it, it is a, a very accomplished feeling that we all have. The arrival of the Mariner is the start of operations for uh, the flow of a rocket. Teams from ULA and NASA's Launch Services Program start by unchaining the Atlas V booster and Centaur components, wasting no time in developing a plan and getting organized for transport. We're going to take the booster over to the ASOC. It's going to be Convoy 1 to be the leader, followed by the booster. It's a very exciting day for the vehicle system engineers as we're offloading the um, launch vehicle that will carry the GOES-S satellite. Here comes the Centaur's second stage, with its pressurized stainless steel tank as thin as a dime. Unable to support its own weight until fully fueled, it's carried off the ship by a specialized trailer. Next comes the Atlas V booster, all 106 feet of it. This booster and four solid rocket motors have one job, provide enough energy at liftoff for the entire launch vehicle and payload to overcome the pull of Earth's gravity. I never get tired of seeing the rockets come in. It's very exciting, especially on the Mariner. Now on land, a challenging cross-space transport lies ahead to the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center. Inside this multifunctional facility, crews will remove the protective coverings, inspect the hardware, and install the final flight components. For now, this mission remains a go, but the highly complex job of stacking the rocket is still to come. Dark 30, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. With a full week of intense rocket assembly activities ahead, the teams from Launch Services Program and United Launch Alliance are getting an early start. It all begins with the booster. The booster is the backbone of the Atlas V, and literally everything is riding on it. It's the largest component and first to be lifted. The Launch Services Program partnered with United Launch Alliance to select the Atlas 541 vehicle because it is one awesome rocket and we need that thrust to get GOES-S to its geostationary orbit to meet its mission requirement. It will take more than just the booster to get all the way to geostationary orbit. That's why we're adding four solid rocket boosters. When you start with the Atlas booster, it's like 860,000 pounds of thrust with just the RD-180. So we need the solids for extra performance. We need it to get heavy payloads off the pad and for additional performance going to geosynchronous orbit or geotransfer. Mating the solids to the booster is a very hazardous operation. We have safety with us at all times. You have 100,000 pounds going up into the air and hanging on a crane. And oh, by the way, it's explosive. Once the solids are mounted, it's time to meet the Centaur. The Centaur is the upper stage, and it's um, 
It's tuned. It's a. It's like a highly tuned race car. It's light. It's efficient. It performs well for us. Here to Brock, good job. Get it done right. You see something else done right? Bring it up to us. Let's get us a chance to fix it. Okay. All right. Girl, get, get, get to do this thing. Assembling a rocket can make or break any mission. It takes tremendous coordination and skill to get this job done. The team makes it look easy, but rocket science never is. The coolest part of my job is coming down here and seeing the hardware and knowing what it's capable of. We all get to work with rockets and it's really exciting and fun and everybody has their part in all of that. And yeah, when you're out with friends, you can say you're a rocket scientist. I do. <laughs> so there's really nothing quite like all, all the work and all the setup that we do to get ready to do this and get built up the rocket and tested to get to launch day. And when we get the teaser and the rocket lifts off and the control room rattles and shakes a little bit, it's an awesome feeling. That is the ultimate reward and that's really what makes us happy, what makes our customer happy is putting our customer where they want to go in the right spot in the exact right orbit and that is a lot of pride in that. This rocket is almost ready to roll. Of course, the only thing missing is its goes S payload. Two weeks to T zero. Today is another huge milestone for NOAA's goes S mission. So today we start something called encapsulation. Uh, by encapsulation, we, we actually put a container around the satellite. It's called a payload fairing. That payload fairing will protect the satellite for the first three and a half minutes of its mission. It sounds like a very short period of time, but in fact, you know, that's when we would have the maximum aerodynamic and acoustic loads on the satellite. So we're trying to protect the satellite. Right now, we really have tested everything we need to do to make sure this satellite is ready for launch. The next time we'll see this satellite is on orbit. Shooting off the launch pad like a bullet, this vehicle will rocket past the speed of sound in just over 30 seconds. If not protected, the Earth's atmosphere will rip GOES-S to pieces. But for a satellite designed only to live in the vacuum of space, life on Earth can be just as dangerous. Any exposure to dust or moisture could contaminate the satellite and destroy the mission. That's why this fairing is more than just a suit of armor. It's also a portable clean room. With encapsulation complete, it's time to call in the KMAG. This 72-wheel transport vehicle is what it takes to get this massive payload to the pad. Spacecraft hoist and mate to the launch vehicle today is a huge milestone for the whole operation. And this is the biggest integrated operation that we've had so far. And it goes all day, it goes all night from transport and then hoist and mate, and it'll go into the evening tonight as they finish closeouts. After working through the night, LSP and ULA are almost there. Just 150 feet to go, straight up. Obstacles, we do have obstacles on the decks, on the K-Mag, so watch your step, walking area, trip hazards, and then uh, remember about your hard hats, chin straps. Any other questions? All right, let's go do this. There's a lot of moving parts involved with processing a spacecraft, processing a rocket, and then bring them together for a launch. There's, there are a lot of people involved and there are a lot of moving parts. We have a lot of hard timelines that we have to meet and deadlines that we have to meet, and everybody works as hard as they can to meet those deadlines, and sometimes we have to work around the clock to meet those. We've reached a critical point on the road to T-Zero. GOES-S is now mated to the Atlas V. We've been working for several years integrating this thing. We've completed that now. We've got the satellite on top and we're ready to go. With all major milestones complete, this rocket is ready to roll. San Engineer, proceed with the MLP transport to pad. Roger. It's go time. The GOES-S launch window opens tomorrow. ULA and LSP have one last critical procedure to complete. Get the entire Atlas V stack and its mobile launch platform to the pad. It is a fairly challenging activity if you think about moving a one and a half million pound uh, mobile launch platform and vehicle out to the pad. Once it gets there, it will be loaded with rocket fuel 
and be ready to start the terminal count to T0. Years of intense planning and coordination are finally rolling to the pad, and the majesty of the Atlas V is on display as it inches its way to liftoff. The thrill of seeing that Atlas vehicle, all 197 feet of it, rolling up to the pad, it, it's just really exciting because I know that means tomorrow is launched. GOES-S is particularly important because of how it's transforming our capability to predict weather and protect lives and property. And I can't wait for it to launch tomorrow and become operational. It's so great to be here after a number of years of seeing the spacecraft come together and all the instruments integrated onto the spacecraft. Our baby is tucked in and ready for launch tomorrow. This is the LC on one performing pretest briefing. This operation is classified hazardous. Cryogenics will be loaded. ALC verified count to start at 1947 Zulu. Verified. Proceed with the count. We're launching today and the ULA team got on console a few hours ago turn power on the rocket and we are counting down to T0 right now. I'm on my way over to the uh, ASOC, the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center, where the Mission Director Center and the Launch Control Center are located. And if the range is clear and the rocket is good, we're go for today. I love launch day. I'm so fortunate to work with a great team. Our team gets so incredibly excited to do missions, and it all culminates today. Range coordinator, clear to proceed. Launch director, you have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count, ALC verified T0 is set for 2202 Zulu. Verified, rock report range status. Range green. Status check, go Atlas, go Centaur. Range operations controller reports range green, everything is go. Seven, six, five, four, three, Two, one, and liftoff of Atlas V and Noah's Gozes, a highly sophisticated weather launching eye in the sky, to join its twin in providing better forecasts and saving lives. especially when it all ends in launch success and mission success for GOES-S and this cutting edge weather capability that our nation will now have. There's one thing that stands between us and the harsh environment of space, our atmosphere, the part of Earth that sustains all life. But here, in the closest town to the North Pole, it's slowly leaking away. A team headed there to launch rockets into the leak, but it's not the lack of atmosphere that they're concerned about. The leak is a natural process that will take billions of years, so we're not gonna run out anytime soon. It's part of the larger story of how a planet's atmosphere changes over time, a key factor in the search for life on other planets. We have 35 residents and 60 of our team together in a town that is completely isolated. There's a plane twice a week and there's a thousand polar bears nearby. This is Doug Rowland, a NASA scientist who's taken his team to Nialison on the island of Svalbard. The island lies beneath one of two regions near Earth's poles called the cusps. It's where we can access space directly and where a hundred tons of atmosphere escapes into space each day. This escape gives clues to how long an atmosphere will last, and ultimately, whether it stays around long enough to sustain life. What we're trying to understand is how did Earth's atmosphere evolve over time? And how do other planets that might be like Earth or, or more dissimilar to Earth, how did their atmospheres evolve? So Doug joined forces with Yaran Moen, a professor at the University of Oslo, who started the Grand Challenge Initiative, CUSP. It's an international mission to launch 12 rockets into the Earth's northern cusp. And Doug, he's the mission leader for the first two rockets of the campaign. We don't want to waste our rocket. It takes us three years to make the rocket, only 15 minutes to use it, and I don't want to waste my shot here. 
He's using a sounding rocket, which is different from the bigger rockets that carry satellites and humans into space. It's a small suborbital rocket that flies briefly into space, collects real-time data for around 15 minutes, then falls back to Earth. It's affordable, quick to build, and can launch towards a precise point. The major advantage is that you can launch uh, into a target of the sky. But there's a limited launch window and only one chance to get the launch right. We have these unguided rockets. They go where you point them unless the wind is blowing because the wind literally just blows them over. We don't launch when there's high wind. Though to measure the winds, they launch balloons with GPS trackers. They're released every 15 to 30 minutes, and then they're monitored to see how fast the winds are carrying them. The ground winds were 12, 13 meters per second, gusting 17, which is uh, way off. You're filled with trepidation. Oh my gosh, this thing that I built, is it going to work after all this? So I think we're going to scrub for today. I'd like to thank everyone. I think it was a great performance. Thanks a lot. This means that we are scrubbing this operation for today and try again tomorrow. The mission is named Visualizing Ion Outflow via Neutral Atom Sensing 2, or Visions 2. In short, they're looking at how oxygen is getting enough energy to escape. It's a good test of how atmospheric escape works. Earth's gravity should hold onto the oxygen, and yet we see this gas shooting off into space. We're trying to figure out how that works. That is a science question that has been uh, hanging around for four decades. Fortunately, anyone can see atmospheric escape at the right place and time. In Svalbard, we have the so-called polar night. It's dark all 24 hours. Its continual darkness is key for witnessing this. This is the cusp aurora. It's a type of northern lights that appears between 8 a.m. and noon, and you can only see it when it's dark during the day. It looks similar to the aurora that occurs at night, but when these iridescent colors dance at this hour each day, a hundred tons of oxygen escapes from Earth's atmosphere into space. This is our sport now to, to, to chase the aurora. Working with them is the ISCAT radar and Chell Henriksen Observatory. They have additional instruments to find the aurora. Sometimes it's cloudy, so we use uh, radars to track the cusp. We can give advice that this is the right type of aurora. This is the Wall of Science, a collection of data from satellites and ground instruments that helps them predict where the cusp aurora will be. So the cusp actually isn't a fixed point in space, it kind of moves around. What's controlling the cusp's movement is the sun interacting with Earth. Our planet is surrounded by a magnetic field that helps us hold on to our atmosphere. But at the north and south poles, the magnetic field bends inwards, creating a corridor between Earth and space. When energy is released from the sun via a solar flare or a coronal mass ejection, all of that energy in the form of radiation rides down the magnetic field lines of the Earth and is transferred and dumped into the Earth's atmosphere. Electrons cascade into Earth's atmosphere. They accelerate and collide with oxygen particles, giving them energy to release light and sometimes enough energy to escape. Collectively, this forms the cusp aurora and streams of escaping oxygen. This cusp is in constant motion. And we've got a fixed trajectory. We really can't aim at where the cusp is. We have to wait for the cusp to come across our line of sight. Can you guys hear Jelmar? We'd like you, as soon as you see an indication the cusp is moving close, to move the radar dish if we can. This is IceCat. It's been very quiet, very difficult to launch. Probably about a 60% chance of launching. When we started seeing this really good data, this clock started counting down, and that's when everyone realized, this is going to happen. We're going to launch. We're doing everything we can to, to get that launch off before the aurora goes away. It is really, really challenging and nerve-wracking at that point. Uh, you can see the tension just rise. <laughs> and everybody when that, when that happens. And so everyone's watching their instruments, getting really excited, and then at T minus one minute, all of us ran out to go see the launch happen. And 
then we immediately turned around and ran right back in to look at all the data that was coming back from the instruments. You know how much time and effort went into it because we all worked on it and there's just nothing that compares to that feeling. Everybody in every one of those little places, you know, really just so happy to contribute to, uh, to getting this science. Uh, it's really an incredible experience. This is a story about what it takes to launch science instruments into space. But the real adventure will be in the data they sent back. Hidden within the numbers will be answers that reach far beyond Earth, shedding light on how atmospheres throughout the universe change, evolve, and perhaps support life. getting ready to launch. My name is Kelly Smith, and I work on navigation and guidance for Orion. Orion is NASA's next generation spacecraft. Built with versatility in mind, it can take astronauts deeper into space than we've ever gone before, to an asteroid, or even onto Mars. For these missions, Orion has to be one tough spacecraft, withstanding high speeds, searing temperatures, and extreme radiation. Before we can send astronauts into space on Orion, we have to test all of its systems. And there's only one way to know if we got it right. Fly it in space. For Orion's first flight, no astronauts will be aboard. The spacecraft is loaded with sensors to record and measure all aspects of the flight in every detail. It all begins with launch aboard a Delta IV heavy rocket. jettison its launch abort system. The abort system is a safety feature designed to pull Orion and its crew out of danger if there were a problem with the rocket during ascent. Orion's journey is just beginning. As the spacecraft and the upper stage begin their first lap around Earth, Mission Control in Houston is monitoring the progress of the flight. Orion's over 100 miles up and going about 17,000 miles per hour. Just as it passes over the Indian Ocean, we lose communication. This is expected. The communications link we have through satellites to Orion is momentarily lost. But Orion continues to receive and process data. Its computers can handle 480 million instructions per second. Imagine you are traveling with Orion as the flight test continues. One orbit completed. Time to go. The upper stage of the rocket fires again. Like the setup for a roller coaster ride, this is the big climb we've been waiting for. We are headed 3,600 miles above Earth. 15 times higher from the planet than the International Space Station. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice, once up and once back. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. For this flight, it's time to head home. The upper stage of the rocket triggers separation. Orion's jets fire to turn it into the proper position to re-enter Earth's atmosphere. No matter what happens now, we're coming in. 
75 miles above Earth, the spacecraft enters the atmosphere. Things happen quickly. We're now traveling more than 20,000 miles per hour. Air particles pushed out of the way heat up. An envelope of hot plasma surrounds the vehicle as it plummets towards Earth. The plasma reaches temperatures of 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, almost twice as hot as molten lava. This may be the most dangerous part of the flight. Mission Control is monitoring all the data from the spacecraft, and then we lose communication again. No data can penetrate the plasma. Orion is on its own. Orion is inside a fireball. Onboard systems ignite jets to keep the ship pointed correctly, so the specially constructed heat shield takes the full brunt of the inferno. This is the largest heat shield of its kind ever made. Orion's computers command the spacecraft to bank like an airplane, keeping a precise path to the landing site. Even though we've slowed from 20,000 miles per hour to about 300 miles per hour, we're still traveling amazingly fast. We must slow down to safely land in the ocean. Luckily, we have parachutes. Specially designed for Orion, the parachutes help us hit the brakes, but not too quickly. One day people will be aboard, so deceleration must happen in stages to keep things comfortable for the crew. The forward bay cover jettisons. Two drogue chutes deploy and slow the returning spacecraft down to 175 miles per hour. Then, the three main parachutes open. Once fully engaged, this canopy would cover an American football field. It takes parachutes this size and strength to slow our descent to 20 miles per hour. And then, splashdown. For this first flight, we won't have astronauts inside, but we still have some very precious cargo. The flight data from this mission is stored inside the Orion spacecraft. While our flight might be over, there is still a lot of work to do. Onboard sensors recorded every detail from launch to flying in space to re-entry to landing. Flight tests are difficult and complex, but they give us confidence that the systems we have designed work under real flight conditions. It's great to be a part of this first space flight for Orion, and we're looking forward to beginning a new chapter in human space exploration. Welcome to NASA EDGE, an inside and outside look at all things NASA. We're joined by Michelle Monk and Steve Gaddis. How are you guys doing? Great. And we have a, a very important topic today, and that's going to be EDL, or Entry, Descent, and Landing. Now, Michelle, you're the principal technologist for EDL. Yes. What is Entry, Descent, and Landing? Entry, Descent, and Landing is how we get a spacecraft from the top of an atmosphere to a planetary surface. So the entry part refers to you know the atmospheric flight, most of it, and then we have descent and landing, which is usually propulsive and get us down on the surface safely. We do D and L um, at places that don't have atmospheres like the moon or you know asteroids, but usually we talk about EDL when we talk about atmospheres. So Michelle, what is your role as principal technologist for EDL? I look across all the missions that NASA has coming up that will use entry, descent, and landing on any planet, and I look at the technologies we're going to need for those missions, and I bring them forward to the mission 
Mission Directorate uh, for starting funding. So you have a, a need in the EDL world, in the community. You're, you're coming up with the technologies that are needed for, for future missions. Right. Uh, so you take some of those technologies that maybe are less mature, hand them off to you, right. and then you mature those technologies. Design, develop, test, and evaluate. Is that, is that a pretty easy task, trying to figure out not at all. <laughs> Not at all. I have to look at both the uh, human missions that are coming up, so you know, sending humans to Mars. Right. I have to look at the scientific missions that are coming up and all the destinations the scientists want to go to, and I have to kind of rank those and prioritize them, and figure out you know where they are in terms of maturity and what the best infusion point will be. When is the first mission that can use that technology? And then I have to figure out what is the best program within STMD for the investment. Is it better to have a university work on it or a small business or is it better for a game-changing program element? And, and your job is really hard because we're going to be talking about a suite of EDL projects over the next two shows because there's so much content in EDL. We can't, content. we can't do this in the one show. Absolutely. So this will be part one of, uh, of two parts. So how do you manage all that? Well, uh, one is it's hard but it's also fun. Okay. And we've got excellent technologists leading every one of these activities so we all work together and we all know that we need these technologies so we're motivated to see them be successful. We're a very passionate community. Yes. Oh, I, I've seen it in all the, all the interviews that we've done. There's, you guys are definitely passionate. Now the first one that we're going to be talking about is ESM or Entry Systems Modeling. What is that about? So that's the first part of it where they're, they're, they develop these models and simulations to understand how the technology works and how it will be beneficial at a system level. It's very cross cutting against all the projects and the plan is to take that data and then infuse it into the projects. You know, Blair had a chance to go out to NASA Ames Research Center to talk to Mike Barnhart who is the integrated EDL systems lead. Let's check it out. Mike, tell me a little bit about Entry Systems Modeling Project. What is it? So the Entry Systems Modeling Project is tasked with developing a lot of these technologies that are coming from lower technology readiness level, things like academia, and trying to bring them up to a level so that we're ready to help them. So in this particular situation, we're talking about EDL projects, and so you're actually helping them raise their technology readiness level? That's right, so any of these things, you know, Orion, Mars 2020, Mars Insight, Anybody that's flying anywhere in the solar system and they need to enter an atmosphere, you have to go through an entry, descent, and landing phase. And we don't have all those problems solved. We don't have all those technologies built. And so we're continually trying to improve on our existing technologies and also renew with new ideas. And that's the real purpose of the Entry Systems Modeling Project. How do we get the data we need to improve the EDL process across these missions? Right, so there's a lot of different things that we can do. We have ground facilities, which we rely on a lot. So we have arc jets that we do for material characterization and developing models for material response. We have our shock tubes, which we use to develop radiation models. We have wind tunnels that we use to build aerodynamic models, the dynamic motion of a body as it's flying, that sort of thing. We need to know all that in order to have a successful entry into a planetary atmosphere. So that's the simplest thing that we have access to every day. And then we also have, you know, some amount of flight data. So there was the Orion EFT-1 flight last year which was very successful and we can use that to take our models and look at our predictions and then try and back out you know exactly how well are we doing quantify you know how well are we predicting them you used a lot of data from the Apollo era. Are you able to use data from things like MSL and more recent missions to help? Because I know we have limited data on entry. Yeah, so you know, MSL is a really great example because we flew Medley on MSL, and that allowed us to get some of the only data that we've had on entry at Mars. So heating data, pressure data, which we use to reconstruct the aerodynamics, is fantastic tool for us, but there's a lot of challenges there as well. So it's really, you know, it takes a village. <laughs> you need to have your computational models because they're the only thing that's going to access the true flight space that we have here on the ground. We have ground facilities that simulate parts of the flight space. And then ultimately you have a little bit of flight data. And your goal is ground to flight traceability. Let's predict what we do on the ground 
let's predict what we do in the air, and let's see, you know, how far apart are we so that we can quantify when we're designing the next mission exactly where we think we'll be. Are you sharing that data with all the different EDL potential systems that are being developed? To, to Absolutely. Absolutely. Everything that we do in the InterSystems Modeling Project is, you know, for the greater good. It's, we work very closely with academia. So we've got university partners that we are sharing this data with to help improve our models. We share it with other projects. So with radiation modeling, we were working very closely with the INSIGHT project and OSIRIS-REx projects because they had issues with radiative heating on their back shell. So they call us because we're the radiation modeling experts and they say, here's our problem. Tell us, you know, how, how worried do we need to be? Okay. Be yeah, worried, we're, we're be always, very worried. <laughs> yeah, we're always looking to help everyone else around the agency. And that's really what Space Technology Mission Director is all about, right? Is trying to help the other directorates with the technology that they're gonna need. Tell you what, great interview with Mike Barnhart. I mean, it really kind of gives you the flavor of how difficult EDL really is. Right. I mean, if you can't characterize it and, and model it here on on the ground, yeah. I mean, you'll, you'll never be able to land. That's right. And you can't test an entry system on the ground and get the flight-like data that you need to design. And, that, <laughs> and, and, and that's the challenge because, but with Medley, on MSL, that was a game changer, wasn't it? Absolutely. I mean, you actually, for the first time, were, were able to actually see the health of the spacecraft as it was entering the atmosphere. Yeah. Right. As engineers, you know, it's great that we succeeded, but I want to know if I got an A plus or a C minus right. on the design. So <laughs> the Medley data allowed us to actually know how we designed the vehicle. And, and based on that Medley data, what, what were the results? They were pretty good, weren't they? They were Excellent. fantastic. But we found some things that we didn't know. Radio of heating is important at Mars and at, at the scale of MSL. We didn't recognize that before. And now, since it was it was such an important mission for you guys, now you're going to take it to the next level for Medley 2 Medley for Mars two. 2020. For Mars 2020, yeah, we've got that going, and they're right in the middle of their preliminary design phase. Um, they're all excited. They're going to put some new measurements on the back shell. Yeah, they were actually at Aberdeen Proving Ground last week doing some testing to see where to put the pressure measurement on the back of the vehicle. Right. So, yeah, it's really exciting to get this new data in the back shell and using new sensors. We know uh, Blair had a chance to sit down with Mark Schoenenberger, uh, who's the reconstruction lead, which uh, i got to ask you about that when we come back, because i never heard of a reconstruction lead. But we're going to learn more about Medley, too. Let's check it out. So, Mark, when we think about the differences between Medley 1 and Medley 2, it's interesting because Medley 1, the M stood for uh, MSL, Mars Science Laboratory. Now it's Mars 2020. You guys caught a break. You get to use the same letter. We still get to use the same letter. I think it'll just be shortened to Mars, EDL instrumentation, and it'll hopefully continue um, for a bunch more medleys, medley 3, 4. We can always call it Mars. Uh, um, perfect. <laughs> it's a nice little series you got going. It's, yep, and These, we're, getting, yep, we're getting great data. So. Now, successful mission as far as the data we got back. Mm -hmm. What are we expecting for Medley 2? For Medley 2, uh, it's really to dig in and look at the pieces that we couldn't quite get for um, Medley 1. Um, the instrumentation there was to really, it was the first time we had flown instrumentation since Viking to get pressure and heating data. So we really tried to capture the whole event. And to do that, especially for pressures, we had these transducers that could see the peak high pressure as you went through the hypersonic phase and you're really slowing down around Mach 18. And then as you slow down, you really start getting in the noise there with the kind of information you can get. The signal is just really weak. It's sort of like using your bathroom scale to measure the ingredients for a cake. It's mm -hmm. just, you know, it's, there's not a lot of resolution there. So you're, it's tough. You, you don't really trust those measurements. That's about how my cakes turn that's, out. That's as right. If I measured ingredients. Yeah. Yeah. So what we did here now is to use more of a postal scale uh, for pressure. So we're, we're measuring down at the low range when we're flying supersonically. Right as we get near parachute deploy, we're spending a lot of time just kind of slowing down, flying at the same altitude. But you're really at terminal velocity. You're not slowing down real well. Now, um, is, is that pretty much in the part of the descent, if you will, that where, where you've burned away most of the heat shield that you're going to in the process? Yeah, all the heating's over. Um, I mean, it's still a little warm, and things are kind of winding down. But yeah, all the exciting heating stuff is over. And you're really just trying to bleed off energy until you get down to a condition that's safe for the parachute. 
And so any error in your prediction of how that vehicle slows down or your prediction of what the atmosphere is going to end up being uh, on the day at Mars um, can lead to being far uprange or far downrange. You know, your, your landing ellipse and how you target it, you need to account for that. So if we can get better data to characterize the aerodynamics, we can tighten that up and land in even smaller spaces. Which is always the goal, right? Yep. You're trying to find out exactly where, you're, where you need to land. Yep. So Mark, how is the instrumentation different on Medley 2 from Medley 1? So, at least from more of my experiences with the pressure side, Medley 1 was really designed to capture the pressure all the way through entry, so it had this nice high maximum pressure it could measure. What we really wanted to do for Medley 2 was to look for the low pressures right before chute deploy. We're going to be coasting there, slowing down from say Mach 4 down to Mach 2 for a you know, minute, 100 seconds, something like that. And that adds to the landing ellipse, you know, any error in aerodynamics. So with the transducers, we put more of them on the feed shield and they're at a lower range so they'll have much better resolution at those low speeds so we can pull out things like winds and we can get a better estimate of the drag. And we also have a pressure transducer on the back side. As you slow down, get down to supersonic speeds, the, the pressures on the back shell become a big contributor to the total forces acting on the capsule. And it's really hard to predict, actually, what those pressures are. So, so with some truth on the back side, that can really help us nail down the, the total behavior of the capsule as it's flying at those low speeds. It seems like we're getting an awful lot of good data on the things that are happening during EDL and Mars, especially for from Medley and Medley 2. Are we able to, in the future, maybe translate what you're doing here to potential dip, different atmospheres or different EDL circumstances? Uh, absolutely. So Medley 1 definitely demonstrated, and it was the reason I think we have Medley 2, was it became the model of how you put an instrument package on a heat shield, how to work with the project to do it, so they're not scared about you know putting holes in their pristine heat shield that's designed to keep their rover on the ground. We have a process now to do that. So you'll see missions going to Venus or Jupiter, Titan, those kinds of things. They'll all have instrumentation during entry, and NASA has the confidence to require that because we did we did so well with Medley One, and hopefully again with Medley Two. You know, Mark did a really nice job uh, discussing Medley Two, but I have to ask the question: you know, in all my years at NASA. In a, talking to subject matter experts from all 10 centers, what is a reconstruction lead? <laughs> reconstruction is really important after a flight okay. uh, to understand, <laughs> understand exactly how and where the vehicle flew. Oh, okay. And without the um, proper data, it's really hard. You have to make some assumptions. Okay. So for instance, before Medley, when we didn't have an independent pressure measurement, we had to assume something about the aerodynamics of the vehicle in order to figure out how it flew. Okay. Now with that independent pressure measurement, we can nail it and we don't have to make any assumptions. So reconstruction lead is really key to understanding how we did. See, you learn something new every day. I, I, had, I had no clue. Yeah, he comes back up with that flight plan right. that they had and the, where the data is along those flight plans. You know, it's very important. Now, speaking of that flight plan with Medley 2, can you take the data from Medley 1, Medley 1 and kind of show what the flight plan is going to be for Mars 2020, or is that a completely different flight plan? It's a lot the same, um, because it's the same shape, size, vehicle. The mass will probably be a little different. They're using the same entry, descent, and landing system, um, but the atmosphere obviously will be a little bit different. The entry velocity will be a little bit different because of the different year, right. um, but largely, you know, we're going to use all of our MSO simulations as the basis for where we start on 2020. Now, I, I know, uh, Steve, with, with game changing, you take technologies and, and you take them from a technology readiness level. We always talked about that one through that yeah. nine scale, yeah. and you're in that middle range. Middle range, about three to five or six. Right. So, but with Medley, since you have proven, you have a you have a flight underneath you. And then you're working on Medley 2. Is that still considered, uh, you know, yes. technology at that level? Yeah, it's, it, it's, yes. it's still not space ready. Yeah, and space it's like yet. it was like what um, Michelle was telling you was we learned so, so much through Medley 1 that we want to put different kinds of, of transducers to get the lower pressure range. We want to understand the, the back shell pressures and uh, radiation rates. So we learned so much. So it's it's not really just a repeat right. of Medley 1. Yeah, we have totally new sensors. Um, 
Knowing what we know from Medley 1, we've moved a lot of our sensors, so we have kind of the same number of channels of data, but we've uh, distributed them differently on the fore body and then moved some to the, the back of the vehicle. Well, speaking of a, of a, of a new uh, mission, we also have now, instead of Medley 2, we also have Hyatt 2. Yep. Absolutely. Which, which is a hypersonic, aerodynamic, inflatable decelerator. Inflatable aerodynamic, yes. Oh, infla oh, let me do that again. It's hypersonic, inflatable, aerodynamic decelerator? Yes. Very cool. Bravo. Very cool. Bravo. All right, so that's a completely different type of EDL system from Medley 2. It is. And I, Franklin had a chance to sit down with the project manager, Joe Del Corso. Yes. And we're going to learn more about Hyatt 2, so let's check that out. So Joe, we're talking about Hyatt 2. Tell me what has changed since Hyatt 1. So we've had a number of changes. The first one was we upgraded our thermal protection system. In Hyatt 1, we used a Generation 1 thermal protection system, which was somewhat capable. It's uh, low temperature capable, basically something on the order of 1,000 to 1,100 degrees Celsius on the surface. For Hyatt 2, what we've looked at is much higher temperature capable materials, much more flexible and lighter weight. So now we're using custom built silicon carbide materials as an outer fabric. We're using COTS materials and some custom materials for our insulator systems. And then on the back side for the gas barrier, you have woven fabric systems with PTFE film wrapped around it. Our inflatable structure is also being upgraded. And then the other thing that we're doing is we are working on scalability. We're focusing on trying to get to a 12 meter scale. In order to do that, we've got to upgrade a lot of our equipment. We've got to work on something as simple as just picking up one of the gore seams. It takes a lot of development, a lot of careful coordination. So what we're focused on is not just upgrading our materials, but also upgrading our handling techniques, our manufacturing techniques. Tell me about the Hyatt timeline from the time it was conceived conceived to where we are right now with Hyatt 2. So Hyatt has been in development, uh, previously it wasn't known as Hyatt, but it's been in development now for almost a decade. And we still have probably another four years worth of work to do to get us to human access to Mars. We started out in 2006 doing material testing and really all we were doing is we were doing low level, trying to learn how to test fabric systems so that we could simulate an atmospheric entry condition. We were learning how to learn in the early phases. We had RV-1 happen, unfortunately there was a launch vehicle anomaly so we lost that. But what it did do is enabled us to put in place RV-2 flight tests. People had enough confidence in what we were doing that they allowed us to build a build to print. That went up on a sounding rocket, launched out of Wallops, and it was an incredibly successful proof of concept. We had an inflatable structure, but no real TPS at the time, thermal protection system. Following the success of RV-2, we started up what we currently know as Hyatt, which is the hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator project. During that project, we were doing all the lab scale developments, small scale, little samples. We had learned how to test, do the initial testing. Now we were taking it through a maturation process, getting it ready for flight again. The third flight that we flew out of Wallops again is called Irby 3. That was a much higher heating condition, and it was the first chance for us to actually test a thermal protection system with our inflatable structure. After the success of Irby 3 and the closure of the initial HIAD, we attempted to fly an orbital entry flight test called THOR, the Terrestrial HIAD Orbital Reentry Flight Test. Unfortunately, due to the Orb 3 failure, we had to cancel THOR and we went back to a ground development effort. But unlike the first two ground development efforts, the third one wasn't focused on learning how to test or testing materials or developing t materials. It's focused on scaling. So we did small scale in the early development phases, and now we're scaling to something more applicable for human access to Mars. Now the cool thing I understand about Hyatt 2, that you guys have a partnership with ULA. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that. So about a year ago, ULA announced that they wanted to use Hyatt technology to recover their boosters as part of their new business model, right. you know, affordability. And so we've been working on a flight demonstration with them over the last year and a half. 
Yeah, and that would be at the 6 meter scale, which is about halfway to what ULA would need for their full booster recovery, okay. 12 meters that Joe talked about on the video. And um, it's also the right scale for us to do maybe a, a technology demonstration mission leading up to putting humans on Mars. So the idea is that you're using this Haya technology to recover the first stage of a ULA right. rocket. Mm -hmm. And so is, is that going to be recoverable? And is that going to sort of land in the ocean? Is it going to land on dry land? How is that going to work? They actually want to snatch it out of midair with a helicopter um, and to minimize any refurbishment costs. Wait a minute. So you're going to have this booster coming down with the Hyatt deployable shell. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it, then the helicopter's going to come and just kind of mid grab it mid air, air. retrieval. Yeah, it's go, it'll come in. It's got a. It'll have a catch hook, and the helicopter will come. It's a modified helicopter, mm -hmm. obviously, but we've that's not, the plan. Yeah, we've not air snatched anything of that mass yet, right. so that's a little bit of technology development as well. well I seriously hope that you go back to your ESM ESM folks and do some modeling of that of that snatching because I, I reconstruction the, 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 of the well, booster trajectory. Reconstruction. So the reconstruction league will be a part of that too. Absolutely. That's <laughs> that's perfect. Well, we're looking forward to seeing that in action because. Uh, that would be something to see when that Absolutely. actually happens. Yeah, awesome. And also with Hyatt, which is a win-win not only for ULA, but for NASA, NASA gets a demonstration out of it, but then it also it kind of matures that technology right. to move on to an eventual test on Mars? Yes. Awesome. I tell you what, we've come to the close of just part one of EDL. I mean, we've covered a lot right. of technology today, and on the next show, we're going to be covering even more technologies. Yeah, we should be talking about ADEPT and 3D man and heat. And now, with regards to 3D mat and heat, that's more of the material side as opposed yep. to the big system side, isn't it? Right. I'm right. looking forward to that, and so stay tuned. We're going to be talking more about EDL. You're watching NASA Edge. Our next Mars rover gets closer to launch. A comet spotted from the space station and we're ready to build a spacecraft to explore a metal-rich asteroid. A few of the stories to tell you about this week at NASA. On Tuesday, July 7th, our Mars 2020 Perseverance rover was lifted onto the top of the Atlas V rocket that will send it towards the red planet this summer. Engineers have made physical and electrical connections between the booster and the spacecraft and are conducting the final tests before launch. Perseverance's mission, search for signs of ancient microbial life, study the planet's climate and geology, and collect samples for possible return to Earth. This mission will help pave the way for human exploration of Mars. Meanwhile, on the Martian surface, our Curiosity rover began a summer road trip of roughly a mile of steep terrain to ascend Mount Sharp. Curiosity will look for sulfates that usually form around water as it evaporates. They are a clue to how the climate and prospects for life changed nearly three billion years ago. Our moon exploration technologies are getting a boost from additional investments for small businesses. We've picked four American companies to develop technologies ranging from communications, to improved driving on the lunar surface, to use of lunar resources. These investments are part of our Artemis program, which aims to land the first woman and the next man on the moon in 2024. Kathy Leaders, the new leader of our human spaceflight efforts, got an up-close look at the booster segments for our space launch system, or SLS rocket, during a recent visit to our Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The boosters are being prepped for Artemis 1, when SLS will send an uncrewed Orion spacecraft around the moon and back. Astronauts aboard the International Space Station spotted a comet previously discovered by and named after our NEOWISE mission that studies near-Earth objects. Comet NEOWISE will pass harmlessly at 64 million miles from Earth while giving astronomers the opportunity to learn more about its composition and structure. You can catch a glimpse of the glowing comet in the evening sky shortly after sunset on July 11th as it speeds away from the sun. Our Psyche mission to explore a metal-rich asteroid has passed a crucial mission milestone. The systems designed to do their job in deep space are now ready to be built. Psyche is planned to launch in 2022 and will fly to its target in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. That's what's up this week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, 
follow us on the web at nasa.gov forward slash twan. ago we went to the moon we called it apollo what many people don't know is that apollo had a twin she was a woman named artemis goddess of the moon we are returning to the moon as a new generation of explorers this time to stay and to prepare to achieve humanity's next giant leap of sending the first human missions to Mars. We believe our course will redefine what is possible. That we will discover life-saving, earth-changing science, and that the challenges ahead will inspire generations. This is our manifest. For all who wondered if we could return. For all who dreamed of pressing beyond. This is your calling. We go for all of America. We go, we go as the Artemis generation. We go. are sounds of our times. Called telemetry, it is the way satellites orbiting in space report to controllers on Earth. Each spacecraft has its own signature, a unique tone. Engineers call it data. You may see it later as a weather report or a television picture from around the world. Down to Earth with application satellites. What they are, what they're doing for you now, and what will be happening in the decade of the 70s. Weather, communications, Earth resources, 
These will be among the main topics for dialogue in the 1970s. Each has its own type of impact on our lifestyles. At times, we will be more concerned about one than the other, but always they will be there. Case in point, weather. Spacecraft, like Tyros, Nimbus, and the application technology satellites. Satellites that return daily weather information over the entire world. What do they report? A continuous watch of the Earth's moving cloud cover, tracking storms, measuring winds, recording temperatures at different heights, and testing the moisture content of the atmosphere. As a result, computer systems are built that can receive and analyze vast amounts of global information from many sources, making forecasting more accurate. Hurricanes with their devastating winds and flood-causing rains, a perennial threat. In 1969, Hurricane Camille was first observed and then tracked by satellite. Because the storm's arrival was predicted accurately enough in advance, it was possible to evacuate people from the Gulf Coast. Without this early warning, the Weather Bureau estimated that 50,000 people might have been killed. In contrast, during Hurricane Laurie in November 1969, observations and tracking by satellite enabled the weather forecasters to predict that Laurie would not strike the coast. It is estimated that $3 million was saved from this satellite-prompted decision not to evacuate and not to protect property. Tyros, television infrared operational satellite. Over the past 10 years, 20 of these hatbox-shaped satellites have been successfully launched for use by NASA and the Weather Bureau. The television eyes of Tyro scan the entire globe daily, reporting on cloud cover and warning of major storms. Since the first operational weather satellite started clicking off pictures, roughly 600 severe storms have been detected, followed, and predictions made about their course. They have sent back more than a million pictures of weather conditions around the globe. Cameras on board the Applications Technology Satellite scan the Earth and return color images as often as every 20 minutes. Here's a view showing six hurricanes on one picture. This near continuous surveillance of 40% of the Earth's surface has proven so useful that the reports have been incorporated into routine weather forecasts and have pointed the way for even more sophisticated meteorological satellites. Major airlines make use of satellite data in planning their flights. Pilots routinely receive weather photos of their transoceanic routes. Before satellite tracking of hurricanes, U.S. Navy hurricane hunters had to search out the killer storms. Weather satellites now locate the storms and the Navy flies directly to them to make their measurements. The Navy also uses weather satellite pictures for ice patrols. Remote stations in the Antarctic benefit too. Giant resupply ski planes can be safely scheduled for landings in the icy outposts without worrying about being trapped by snowstorms. Supply ships benefit from improved scheduling as well. A recent satellite in the Tyro series does the work of two spacecraft. Carrying twice as many cameras, it's capable of discerning cloud formations as small as two miles across. The improved Tyros operational satellite carries a proton monitoring instrument that helps spot solar flares. The same instrument can measure the amount of heat reflected from and absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. This is very important in weather forecasting. In addition, radio frequencies affected by solar storms can be changed in advance and manned flights to the moon better planned.
Nimbus, research and development craft studying advanced techniques and concepts for meteorological Earth observations. Nimbus is measuring the atmosphere's temperature and moisture at various altitudes, as well as making day and nighttime cloud photographs. These measurements are considered the key to accurate long-range weather forecasts. By the end of this decade, forecasts made one week in advance will be as accurate as those now made 24 or 48 hours ahead. Satellites and weather are global in nature. Every nation in the world can benefit from the automatic picture transmissions of U.S. weather satellites. Over 50 countries are now using inexpensive automatic picture readout equipment to view daily weather patterns over their own territory. These same countries also benefit from cloud picture mosaics, routinely made available by the Weather Bureau to Europe, Asia, Australia, and North and South America. The weather mosaic is built up from individual weather photos and processed by computer. It is then retransmitted by a satellite. There are three main objectives for an effective meteorological program. The first, global cloud cover photography, enabling us to identify and track storms and to observe their formation and dissipation. This is valuable in the analysis of current weather and the prediction of 24 to 36 hour changes. The second objective, continuous viewing of the atmosphere, needed to keep significant portions of the Earth's cloud cover under constant surveillance and providing essential early warning on rapidly developing weather phenomena, such as thunderstorms and the formation, growth, and death of tornadoes. This information is valuable for short period forecasts of less than 12 hours. The third objective, a global atmospheric research program. Its goal, long-range weather prediction on a worldwide basis. In 1976, scientists from governments, industries, and universities in many countries will meet to work out the problems of international weather forecasting. The global research program will use computers to design and test theoretical models of atmospheric behavior. When the mathematical models are combined with information returned from already operating satellites, it may be possible to make forecasts two to three weeks in advance. Communications. Some of the greatest strides in putting space to work have taken place in this field. In 1960, Americans made 100 billion telephone calls. In 1969, nearly 200 billion were made. New uses are continually being found for telecommunications. Banks. Stock exchanges. Hotel reservations. Cable TV. Hospitals computer centers and other new customers are appearing at an increasing rate. We are in the midst of a global communications explosion. Helping meet this demand are communications satellites. This is President Eisenhower speaking. It is a great personal satisfaction to participate in this first experiment in communications involving the use of the satellite balloon known as ECHO. This is August 12, 1960. President Eisenhower took part in the historic first transmission via ECHO satellite. By bouncing radio waves off its shiny surface, it made possible long-distance telephone conversations and the transmission of photographs and music. Other communication satellites followed. Telstar, Relay, Syncom, each a research step leading to commercial spacecraft capable of handling satellite communications. In 1964, television viewers around the world were able to watch the Olympics from Tokyo. 
A visit to Mexico City by the Pope was also viewed globally. Over half a billion people, one-sixth of the world's population, saw man's first steps on the moon. Color coverage of space recovery operations from mid-ocean is now routine. At the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, doctors discussed space medicine and early cancer detection. The proceedings were telecast live via communication satellite and provided two-way voice circuits between the United States and three European countries. The closed circuit telecast enabled 30,000 European doctors to hear the three-hour transatlantic conference. One of the best ways to check out new concepts and techniques in communications, navigation, and meteorology is with research and development spacecraft. The application's technology satellites are just that, serving as platforms for testing out new concepts in all these disciplines. The ATS program consists of seven flight missions. Five of these have already been flown. Probably the most unique characteristic of the ATS is their ability to receive and transmit from a number of widely separated ground stations simultaneously. They can handle telephone calls, transmit television, teletype, radio voice, and weather data all at the same time. Keeping in contact with the SS Santa Lucia as it steamed between New Jersey and Chile, ATS demonstrated the feasibility of using satellites for high-quality, reliable, ship-to-shore communications over long distances. A similar test was made with a U.S. Coast Guard ship. ATS has been used to relay information from remote instruments and buoys, a step toward future data relay satellite systems. A successful experiment to transmit television by satellite from the east to the west coast took place with the help of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. These current tests are enabling NASA and the broadcasting community to iron out technical problems that are involved in this form of transmission and to determine the costs of such future operations. If these tests are successful, and we have every reason to believe that they will be, the American people will reap a major domestic dividend from the national space effort. The program was relayed from a ground station in Rosman, North Carolina, through the ATS, to KCET-TV, the educational station in Los Angeles. As soon as the receiving equipment is operating, Alaskans will have educational radio and television programs beamed to their state. Through an agreement signed with India, an application's technology satellite, similar to the one shown in this artist's concept, will begin telecasting instructional television into 5,000 Indian villages by 1974. India will provide the TV programs. The results of this cooperative experiment are expected to provide an understanding of the effectiveness of satellite systems in meeting the needs of other developing countries. A satellite-to-satellite -satellite laser communications experiment is also planned on future ATS spacecraft. Beams emitted by a laser can carry immense quantities of information. Communication satellites hold great promise for navigation and traffic control. Today, airplanes flying over wide open areas of the oceans are out of radio range for periods of an hour or more. The problem is compounded by the fact that most airlines going to Europe from New York, for instance, want to depart at 6 p.m. to serve dinner and show movies. They also want to go to the same altitude to take advantage of favorable tailwinds. The problem then of keeping international air traffic sufficiently spaced becomes more and more serious. NASA has been experimenting with a system to determine the position of planes and ships. The system makes it possible for a ground-based station to automatically locate aircraft and ships equipped with receiving and transmitting equipment. Uh, Gunner Mobile number 2, Pan Am, number 271. Position here from uh, INF readout is 31 degrees. 
recent tests, position accuracies of less than one mile error have been achieved. Results of this work could lead to advanced techniques for satellite position fixing and traffic control, an aid in the solution of some of the world's transportation problems. Space geodesy has taught us the true shape of our planet, where it flattens, how much it bulges. With these results, we are better able to map the Earth and to navigate. The orbital path of a satellite is not a perfect circle. The satellite weaves sideways and up and down as it travels its course around the Earth. These deviations are measured only in feet, but they can be detected by Earth-based tracking stations and reveal new facts about the Earth's structure. Satellites have been tracked by laser. After predicting where spacecraft will be at any given time, Telescope-mounted lasers swing into position, and aided by computers, their pulses of light lock on and track the orbiting craft. Three of NASA's Explorer satellites carried special reflectors that mirrored the laser light flashes. The positions of the satellites were precisely determined, and the distance calculated simply by measuring the time it takes the beam to go to the satellite and return. Precision in satellite tracking leads to precision in terrestrial mapmaking. The Department of Interior estimates that the value of up-to-date topographic maps is worth nearly $700 million annually to our national economy. On the North American continent, surveyors have laid out a grid enabling them to locate any point with respect to another within 30 feet. There are similar grids in other well-developed countries, but they are not tied together. A surveyor cannot see over the ocean with his transit to make the connections. But a satellite can. It is a valuable tool because of its altitude. Observers several thousands of miles apart can see a high-flying satellite at the same time. By making simultaneous measurements with optical and radio tracking instruments, they can determine just how far apart they really are. The current goal of satellite geodesy is to tie all geodetic grids together to within an accuracy of 30 feet. Using high-flying satellites as geodetic markers, the world's continents will eventually be tied together to one common reference system. Geodesists also hope to use their new techniques to keep track of polar ice caps and glaciers, monitor the geometry of the ocean surfaces, increase knowledge of how earthquakes occur, and make direct measurements of the rates of continental drift. As the world's population continues to grow, our need to develop, protect, replenish, and use our natural resources wisely becomes more apparent and urgent. The air and atmosphere are resources of the Earth, as are the oceans, fresh water, ice packs, forests, minerals, and usable land. Efficient utilization of these resources not only includes their discovery and management, but also detection and control of pollution. In many areas, this need is reaching crisis proportions. Concerned citizens, private industry, state and federal agencies, all are seeking solutions to the problem. New techniques are being discovered to help. NASA has been exploring the use of both manned and automated spacecraft to develop the potential of flying instruments in space that will permit unique observations of the condition of our agricultural, water, forest, mineral, land, and marine resources. Much research has been done with aircraft, with information from existing satellites, and of course from the valuable photographs taken by the astronauts of the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs. Based on this experience, it appears that the vantage point of space offers a number of unique possibilities for surveying Earth resources. 
The first two unmanned Earth Resources satellites are planned for launch. One in 1972 and one in 73. They will provide a regular timber inventory of the Earth. Identify crops, their vigor and yield. Make automatic soil classifications. Take photographs of the sedimentation flow patterns of the world's waterways and help in locating mineral deposits. Here are some views recorded from planes and from Earth orbit by spacecraft. Better surveys of food and forest areas can be made from space, with computers distinguishing the conditions of the various types of crops and soils. Infrared photographs can show the onset of insect disease in forests. The damaged trees show up blue-green in color. The healthy trees, red or pink. An Apollo spacecraft orbiting 150 miles over northern Australia spotted forest fires. Here are two others, as seen from space southwest of Tallahassee, Florida. By viewing fresh water from space, lake colors can be correlated with the biological, chemical, sediment, and pollutant content. Glaciers are another important source of fresh water, and their growth and decline are very sensitive indicators of the available supply. The Bureau of Commercial Fisheries says there is a close relation between fishery production and the temperature of the ocean and they're very interested in having more accurate spaceborne instruments developed for monitoring these thermal conditions. This could significantly improve the efficiency of fishing fleets. Space photography can assist in mapping navigation routes in coastal and shoal water areas and help control silting in major harbors and navigable rivers. Ultimately, spaceborne instrumentation may permit observations of the wave heights of our oceans. Although it will not be possible to acquire all of the needed Earth resources data by sensors located directly in the satellites, it is possible to supplement the information by placing surface instruments, such as buoys, water gauges, and strain gauges, at strategically located positions on the surface of the Earth. These surface instruments could transmit the data to satellites, which would then relay it to central data handling stations. The Nimbus weather satellite is playing a role in ecology right now. A recording system on Nimbus was developed for an animal tracking experiment. Scientists attached a specially instrumented collar on an elk in western Wyoming. As Nimbus flies over, it receives information about the elk's condition and location and reports back to Earth. Accurate tracking of free-roaming animals in their natural environment will increase scientific knowledge of animal migration habits and may show ways to help protect our wildlife population. This is Skylab, America's first manned experimental space station. It will be launched into orbit around the Earth in 1972. There are several Earth observation experiments planned for the orbiting space station. One of the men who hopes to be flying in Skylab is scientist astronaut Dr. William Lenore. He too is interested in Earth resources. One of the more interesting aspects of what we can learn from space, I think, is the Earth resources area, which generally is tied up in the kind of things that I can learn from space by being in Earth orbit, looking back at the Earth from a remote sensing point of view. Meteorologically, we've seen many things already. We can learn about the Earth's surface from a crop survey standpoint, where the surface water is and the immediately subsurface water for the water management for the world. Pollution control and studies as to where the pollution is being emitted from and where it goes to. Uh, fish industries for the ocean and sea states for ocean-going vessels, icebergs. I think these are just uh, actually very few of the types of things that we can monitor and study from space on Earth resources. The Skylab program is going to be stepping off in this direction. Bringing space down to Earth continues to make a substantial impact on our way of life. 
Communications satellites routinely provide reliable telephone service on a global basis. And important events are brought into our living rooms through intercontinental television. Coming close to reality, satellites that broadcast news, educational and cultural programs to populations of entire nations. Meteorological spacecraft aid in daily weather predictions. Satellites for navigation and traffic control will help make better economic and safer use of air corridors and oceans. Earth surveys from space should offer another means of preserving natural resources. We are sharing many benefits from space right now. As we develop this potential in the future, applications from space will have continued, profound and direct effects on our everyday lives here on Earth. our astronauts up in the space station on YouTube, how they function in zero-g to try to, to mirror some of them in Peter Pan production, where you're hanging from wires. So basically what they did with me was just uh, strap me up to the ceiling and then have me spin until I got nauseous to find out where that threshold was. So we wouldn't be doing that on set in a giant space suit. Well, it's hard to beat Armstrong's message, so <laughs> good luck. <laughs> I don't have any, I, I can't, I can't top that. Huh, I'll settle with the moon right now. I'm older, you know, I don't want to be gone that long. Um, I like my comforts. I'm going moon. If I was going to the moon, I got one item to take with me, I'm taking my music. Period. I think space is so fascinating for, certainly for cinema, um, because it's so unknown. There's so much we don't know. Um, it's, it's, for one, um, our universe is ever expanding. It's infinite. I mean, these are concepts already that are beyond our understanding. It's wide open for invention. It's the great unknown, and how will it define us, and how will we define ourselves with it that makes it uh, so ripe for storytelling. Hey, I've got a few questions for NASA, if I may. First question I was wondering, when are we going back to the moon? Uh, there's not water on the moon, is it? Really? Okay, I heard this rumor. There's something about water being on the moon. Could that possibly be true? Thanks, Brad. We'll answer these questions and more in our new series, Ask NASA. If you have questions like Brad, use the hashtag AskNASA. It's a bittersweet privilege to be taking Endeavor on its last flight, delivering the uh, last major piece to the ISS. I was there before they put the wings on it. It was just, so it was almost like it was my baby. That space station assembly mission was perfect from start to finish, and uh, a lot of that was Endeavor. It just, phenomenal vehicle. Uh, the Eagle represent, you know, the United States of America. It's something that we're proud of, you know, that's, that's our bird. That's the Eagle. After nearly two decades of achievements in space, Endeavour makes one last reach for the stars on its 25th and final mission. Endeavour is traveling to the International Space Station with six veteran space flyers, Commander Mark Kelly, Pilot Greg H. Johnson, and Mission Specialist Mike Fink, Drew Feustel, Greg Shamatov, and Roberto Vittori from Italy, representing the European Space Agency.
I'm the commander of STS-134. We've got a whole list of mission objectives, probably 30 things on the list. But the big objectives is to get the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer installed on the outside of the space station. The 15,000-pound AMS is a massive particle physics detector that will attach to the International Space Station. Its job, to search through cosmic rays, looking for proof of dark matter and antimatter. In my mind, this is like the Hubble Space Telescope. I mean, it has the same type of potential for revolutionizing our understanding of the, of the universe. They're also delivering critical spare parts to help keep the station up and running for years to come, along with the shuttle's orbiter boom sensor system. Feustel, Fink, and Shamatov will rotate through four spacewalks, the last performed by shuttle crew members for the remainder of the space shuttle program. And when Endeavour makes its final touchdown on the runway, it will end a storied flying career for the youngest of NASA's shuttle orbiters. Even Endeavour's beginnings were unique. It was built as a replacement for Space Shuttle Challenger, a name for the first ship commanded by explorer James Cook. At the time of the Challenger accident, astronaut Barbara Morgan was part of the Teacher in Space program, serving as backup to teacher Krista McAuliffe, who launched aboard Challenger on that fateful day in 1986. I think Endeavour in particular because she was named by school children all over, all over the country that uh, really shows a carrying on and a moving forward and, and uh, how uh, open-ended and never-ending that future can be. Like all shuttle orbiters before it, Endeavour was built by Rockwell in Palmdale, California. That's where astronaut Bruce Melnick's bond with Endeavour began. My first job as an astronaut, even before I was a qualified astronaut, was to represent the astronaut office out in uh, Palmdale where Endeavour was being built. So I got to see her being built from scratch to finish, got to see the wings put on, and it's amazing. The nation's brand new space shuttle was delivered to Kennedy Space Center on May 7, 1991, exactly one year before its maiden flight. It was, it was great to see Endeavour come in, you know, we knew why it was coming, because it was replacing Challenger, so it was going to be the, the new fleet leader and the, the new kid in the block. Melnick was on Endeavour's first flight, STS-49. The seven-person crew faced an ambitious eight-day mission to repair the stranded Intelsat-6 satellite. You know, I'll never forget when Dan Brandenstein, who was the chief astronaut at the time, asked me if I wanted to be on the first flight of Endeavour. I mean, you could hear me hooting and hollering because that was going to be the premier mission at the time. Endeavour made history again during the last shuttle mission of 1993 when seven astronauts upgraded the Hubble Space Telescope and improved its vision. It was an extremely complex flight involving five back-to-back -back spacewalks. And in the end, all the hard work paid off. The telescope's new second-generation wide field and planetary camera being back grand images taken with dazzling clarity. And Endeavour helped to carry the load in the construction of the International Space Station, including the very first shuttle flight to the fledgling outpost, STS-88. Endeavour delivered the American Unity module, and astronauts connected it to the Russian Zarya module already in place, and the station was born. Kennedy Space Center Director Bob Cabana commanded that cornerstone flight. I have to admit, you know, because uh, I got to command Endeavour on that first space station assembly mission, I'm a little partial to Endeavour. But less than three years later, the nation was stunned by the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. On December 5th, all eyes turned to Kennedy Space Center, where Endeavour waited to make the first flight after the tragedy. Flight first, we'd like to say thank you to the entire uh, KSC team for getting Endeavour in great shape. And secondly, from the entire crew, we're all well aware that for over 200 years and certainly over the last two months, uh, freedom rings loud and clear across this country. But right here and right now, it's time to let freedom roar. Let's light them up. One, we have booster ignition and liftoff of the space shuttle Endeavour, pushing our goals skyward using our station in space. Endeavour lifted the nation's spirits with a spectacular launch at the twilight's last gleaming. After two more flights, Endeavour entered an extended downtime for planned maintenance and upgrades, including the new glass cockpit and a global positioning system for landing. 
I think the, the missions you remember the most are the missions that uh, were the toughest to get there, but we met our goals on, on the way. You know, we powered up in time after coming out of a major power down period and major upgrades with a glass cockpit. The newly upgraded orbiter returned to service in August 2007 on the STS-118 mission. Morgan flew as a mission specialist and recalls watching an orbital sunrise. So I looked back up the horizon again and there was a crescent moon. And, I, and it literally seemed, even though you can't, it's not this easy to do, but it literally seemed all we had to do was yank on the tiller, take a right turn and sail straight to the moon. And that's when I really understood how natural and how right space exploration, human space exploration is. And Endeavour played a big part of that. STS-134 will be Endeavour's 12th flight to the International Space Station. One of the most memorable deliveries was its most recent, the cupola with seven windows offering astronauts a room with a captivating view of their home. After 30 years, the shuttle program is coming to a close. When you look up and you see that vehicle take off the launch pad, I mean, it's just such a sense of pride and you feel the uh, shock waves hitting you in the chest and it just vibrates you. It just, it just brings a tear to your eye that, you know, we're a part of that program. And then to see Endeavour go up, the last ship that I flew, and I was on her maiden voyage and she, you know, treated us so well. To see her go into space for the last time, knowing that she's going to be retired after this flight, is going to be a real sad day. The vehicles we see, you know, every one of the vehicles, including Endeavour and Discovery and Atlantis, they're all part of us and they all are, you know, they're, they're alive and they represent uh, each and one of every, every one of us that have worked on them. The close-knit shuttle processing team is adjusting to the shuttle's end while still maintaining laser-sharp focus on the job. You know, personally, we do have to think about putting our emotions aside. Um, we have our job number one, which is to uh, get this vehicle prepared safely for the, um, for the mission at, at hand with um, STS-134 launch. But the toughest moment will be that final wheel stop when Endeavour returns to Earth for good. Houston Endeavour, wheel stop. Roger, wheel stop, Endeavour, welcome home. I didn't want to get out of the seat. I mean, this was my spaceship. You know, it, it really, that, that was hard getting out. Of, in fact, of all the things I've done, it was hard. Getting out of that seat and giving Endeavour back to the, to the team was, uh, that was tough. When Endeavour flies the last time, it'll be, uh, it'll be a good, res it'll be show respect for everything that we've done for many, many years. We love the shuttle program, and we love this vehicle. Any vehicle that flies has to, you know, prove that it's flight worthy, and Endeavour did that. So it's been a great vehicle. Space Shuttle Endeavour, the youngest vehicle in NASA's shuttle fleet, has symbolically carried the torch for Challenger, the orbiter it replaced.
NASA is preparing for the final flight of Endeavour, a trip to the International Space Station during a time frame in which astronauts and cosmonauts are celebrating the 50th anniversaries of the first human space flight by Yuri Gagarin and the first American space flight by Alan Shepard, as well as the 30th anniversary of the first space shuttle flight, STS-1 Columbia. This historic 25th flight of Endeavour will include delivery of the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, a unique instrument that is hoped to unveil clues to the origin of our universe as it searches for antimatter, dark matter, and exotic cosmic particles from the space station. When Endeavour launches on NASA's 36th mission to the ISS, the STS-134 crew of six astronauts will begin a mission to stock the station with spare parts and a world-class stellar research instrument just months before the shuttle program comes to an end. Endeavour will deliver the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer 2 and the Express Logistics Carrier 3 to the station. This will also be the first shuttle flight to conduct a re-rendezvous, but not docked to the space station to test the performance of new navigation sensors designed for the Orion spacecraft. During four scheduled spacewalks, Endeavour's crew will conduct the last spacewalks by shuttle crew members to prepare the ISS for its next decade of service. I've flown on Endeavour before, so I'm excited to fly on it again. And my brother's flown on Endeavour. Navy Captain Mark Kelly is the commander of Endeavour's crew of six astronauts. He flew on Endeavour as the pilot of his first space flight, STS-108, in 2001. In January 2011, Kelly's wife, Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, was critically wounded during a community outreach event in Tucson, Arizona. Kelly took a brief leave from the agency, but returned to mission training a few weeks later. The pilot of Endeavour is retired Air Force Colonel Greg H. Johnson, making his second space flight. He will be at the controls as Endeavour undocks from the station. He flew on Endeavour as the pilot of STS-123 in 2008. Air Force Colonel Mike Fink is Mission Specialist 1. A veteran of two long-duration missions on the International Space Station, he commanded the station complex on Expedition 18. During this mission, his first aboard the shuttle, he will conduct three spacewalks. Mission Specialist 2 is Italian Air Force Colonel Roberto Vittori, twice flown aboard a Russian Soyuz as an ISS visitor and part of the crew that delivered fresh Soyuz spacecraft to the outpost. As the last non-American astronaut scheduled to fly on the shuttle, Vittori will meet up with Paolo Nespoli on the ISS for two Italian astronauts on orbit at the same time. Dr. Drew Feustel, Mission Specialist 3, is making his first voyage to the ISS after performing three spacewalks during STS-125, the final Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission. On this flight, he will serve as lead spacewalker for three additional EVAs. Mission Specialist 4 is Dr. Greg Shamatov. He served as an ISS flight engineer for six months during Expedition 17 and 18, returning to Earth on Endeavour. He will perform two spacewalks. We've got a whole list of mission objectives, probably 30 things on the list. But the big objective is to get the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer installed on the outside of the space station. The Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer 1, a simplified cosmic ray detector, flew on STS-91 in June 1998. The AMS-2 is a first-of-its-kind instrument designed to study the fundamental nature of the universe and will allow us for the first time to search for antimatter and dark matter theorized to exist. Nobel physicist Dr. Samuel Ting leads the team of over 500 scientists from 16 countries. I started uh, studying physics. Soon after I achieved my degree as a test pilot, I went back and completed my uh, degree. And ironically, uh, my teacher was uh, a Professor Battiston, that is uh, the deputy chief of the AMS experiment. So it may appear 
as a, a very strange coincidence that today I will be the one to take this unique piece of artwork, take it from the Bay of the Shadow and uh, give it to install on the, on, on the station. On flight day four, Vittori and Foistel, operating the shuttle arm, will grapple the AMS-2 and hand it off to the Greggs, Johnson and Shamatov, operating the station arm for robotic installation onto the station's S3 truss. The second of two components that Endeavour's crew will attach to the ISS is the ELC-3 pallet, the Express Logistics Carrier 3. ELC-3, similar to ELCs 1 and 2 delivered on STS-129, includes a full ATA, ammonia tank assembly, two SASs, S-band antenna support assemblies, and a spare arm for Dexter, the special purpose Dextrous manipulator. On flight day three, Vittori and Fink will unberth the ELC-3 with the shuttle arm and hand it off to station arm operators Shamatov and Johnson for installation on the station's P-3 truss. STS-134 will be the first shuttle flight to re-rendezvous with the ISS and to fly a rendezvous trajectory to mimic Orion's trajectory. The purpose of STORM, sensor test for Orion RELNAV risk mitigation, is to evaluate the performance of Orion relative navigation sensors for future spacecraft. While Kelly is flying Endeavour, Poistel will monitor STORM sensors from a laptop on the flight deck during rendezvous, undocking, and the re-rendezvous after the traditional ISS fly-around. Endeavour will pull away from station and execute several maneuvers before approaching on a different trajectory to allow the storm vision navigation sensors to gather data. Although Endeavour will not actually redock with ISS, it will fly to a close approach of 1,044 feet below and 300 feet behind the station before executing a third separation burn and departing station for the final time. Then when we come up back in front of the space station again, we're then going to do these series of burns where we're going to fall behind the space station, you know, a couple hundred thousand feet. And then we're going to come back in doing a profile that's actually quite similar to what Apollo used for rendezvous. During STS-134, Foistel, Fink, and Shamatov will take turns stepping outside the hatch for four scheduled spacewalks. EVA-1 on flight day five focuses on MISSIES, Materials International Space Station experiments. Foistel and Shamatov will return the MISSI 7A and 7B pallets from the ELC-2 and transfer MISSI-8 to the same location. The idea is to expose these things to the the harsh environment of space for a long period and see what happens. For EVA-2 on flight day 7, Fink and Foistel will refill one of the station's port radiators with ammonia. They will also clean and lubricate the station's port sarge, the solar array rotary joint. Prior to EVA-3, Foistel and Fink will test a new protocol combining the airlock campout pre-breathe, the exercise pre-breathe, and the spacesuit itself. We were introduced to uh, a pre-breathe option uh, by Mike Gernhardt, uh, uh, an astronaut in the core, and it's called the In-Suit Light Exercise Pre-Breathe Protocol. We call it ISLE, I-S-L-E. For EVA-3 on flight day nine, Foistel and Fink will install a power and data grapple fixture for the station arm on the Zarya module. They will also run two Y cables for redundant power supply to the Russian portion of the station. During EVA-4, Shamatov and Fink will transfer and install the OBSS, the shuttle arm's extension boom, to the station's S-1 truss for potential future use aboard the ISS. We have come very far in the last 50 years from not being able to fly in space to landing on the moon and building this incredible facility in orbit, routinely flying you know, people up and down into low Earth orbit. It is amazing how much we've accomplished in 50 years, and it took so many people to make all that possible. It's an unbelievable honor to kind of be the representative of, of that generation of dreamers for, for me. We have a, a huge honor and responsibility to make this the best mission that we can, to honor all of the engineers all the way from the pre-STS-1 uh, at the, the very beginning 
the 1970s when we started to design the space shuttle, all the effort, the blood, the sweat, the tears that have gone into making the space shuttle program as wonderful as it has to, to fly on the penultimate mission, but to do it well and to do it with, uh, with the honor of, of those that came before us. Whenever a NASA aircraft leaves the ground, an entire team of people ensure that it executes its mission safely and successfully. The pilot and mission controller sit at the ends of a complex stream of data, along which dozens of IT specialists, engineers, and technicians work to ensure that each in-flight decision is informed by accurate information, and that all test or science data is successfully gathered and processed. At the Armstrong Flight Research Center, this team makes up the Mission Information and Test Systems Directorate, known simply as Code M, a critical behind-the-scenes force that helps Armstrong keep its reputation as one of the world's finest flight research centers. In most cases, new flight projects first approach the Mission Integration Office, or MIO. The MIO is responsible for the development of partnerships with key researchers, mission directorates, and external stakeholders. They help create value for our partners by providing an initial interface and a cross-functional integration of processes, capabilities, and operations. Flights of new aircraft or systems are first simulated to ensure that any novel concepts are working as designed, or to conduct trade studies, or to iterate a design towards optimum performance. Later, when an actual flight is scheduled, before the aircraft even revs its engines, simulation familiarizes the pilot and mission control team with the procedures and test points, and prepares them for unexpected situations. Engineers and technicians in Code ME the simulation engineering branch of Code M create one-of-a-kind simulation programs and hardware subsystem interfaces that enable NASA's pilots and their industry partners to understand how a new aircraft or system will handle or discover the most efficient ways to hit their data points. Paul, I'm going to uh, light the burners just for a second here to see the difference in the uh, thrust. All right. And, uh, so the uh, cable tension go up a little less into the yeah. red. Alright, coming out of the afterburners, back to the little power. Got yep, some slack. And some slack on the road now. Oh yeah, it's, it's amazing now that I'm getting kind of used to the sim, I can really feel you back there and the effects. That would make sense. Ready to send check. Sending check command now. Send arm. Arming now. Ready to send terminate. Terminating now. 
And we have a good arm term cycle. Well before the research flight phase, the range engineering branch, Code MC, engineers and software developers build, integrate, and verify range assets. This is how they ensure the aircraft telemetry can be received and processed for control room display monitoring. That aircraft position can be tracked for situational awareness. All right, this is a TD on data two. I'll go ahead and check everybody's in their control room display status now that we have both engines up. Heard you loud and clear. And that control room voice communications are working. For unmanned aircraft, Code MC verifies uplinks for command and control and flight termination systems. We're gonna arm and terminate. by about five degrees. Don't know. Tracking the aircraft while it's in flight is the responsibility of MR, the Range Operations Branch. From working with the U.S. Air Force, which controls Edwards airspace, to scheduling flights, to keeping radar dishes locked on a supersonic airplane, to tracking that airplane with long-range optics, Code MR is responsible for getting the data from the airplane to the ground. This branch operates the telemetry tracking systems, space positioning systems, audio communication systems, video systems, mission control center, and mobile systems. After a flight, the data arrives at the Information Services Branch, or Code MI, which provides information technology solutions for NASA's workforce, everything from desktops to internet connections. Code MI also manages Armstrong's data center and network infrastructure, ensuring the right data is available to the appropriate users, from routine email to specialized mission-specific flight data. Finally, MI provides multimedia services, from graphic artists, photographers, and videographers, to web and repro. These skilled individuals ensure effective communication of the many activities and accomplishments of the center. These services include airborne photography and videography, specialty services driven by the demands of flight research. The multimedia products help make this information accessible to engineers, researchers, partners, and stakeholders around the center around the agency and out in the public. A strong team with an important role. The Mission Information and Test Systems Directorate helps separate the real from the imagined through flight. physiologist, I study the ways in which people adapt 
adjust to stressful environments. And uh, working within the uh, space agency really affords a rather unique opportunity for a psychophysiologist to see people working at the, the limits of human capability. Um, if it's possible to understand the ways in which people adapt to the unusual environment of zero gravity, sustained weightlessness, uh, sustained uh, long duration manned space flight, then it's possible to understand really how people adapt to unusual environments on the Earth. There are many lessons to be learned from nature and from the universe through which our world spins. Chief among these is the fact that the world is changing rapidly and at a rate faster than our most sophisticated technological inventions can perceive or record. As we humans strive to keep pace with these changes, the development of the human mind becomes increasingly crucial to our survival. What I began to study in graduate school was psychosomatic health. If the mind can make you sick, the mind can make you well. And that's essentially the basis of the research that I and several hundreds of researchers now are working on within an area called behavioral medicine. What are you measuring here? Well, well you know, we're measuring EKG here. But you remember that major symptoms that you showed in the first and second test were heart rate changes and you showed significant constriction of the blood vessels in your hand. So if you just remember those two exercises and keep your breathing pace, it should be okay with this test. Okay. But, you know, you just do the Dr. Patricia Cowens is a psychophysiologist whose specialty is behavioral medicine. She's one of a growing number of women working at the highest levels of responsibility in the scientific community of NASA. Her research will help to unravel some of the mysteries of survival in outer space. Long before astronomy became a science, people gazed into the flat... I write and produce the NASA space stories, the special reports and the space notes, which are uh, radio programs that go out to about 2,000 stations throughout the nation. And I find that it's very important to disseminate the information about what NASA does through these radio programs. Project manager there are many, many different things that are going on at NASA every day that uh, the press just does not cover. NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration presents a look back at Voyager 2's encounter with Saturn. Well, one of the aspects that I enjoy the most is the actual interviews with the scientists. Uh, I find that sometimes it's difficult because uh, they tend to speak in very scientific terms. So uh, I use a narrator, I use Willard Scott. Are we gonna do this first, the fives that are the just... And I write his part sometimes in such a way that he is sort of explaining what the scientist says in layman's terms so that everybody can understand it. See, this is something right. that changed in right. science. Yeah. I do not have a scientific background. As a matter of fact, uh, my major was art history, but I did get into the production area in Puerto Rico doing programs for the university. I have about 10 seconds there. So uh, we use a lot of sound effects in our programs just to make the, the programs more interesting. You are listening to the sounds of thousands of tiny particles. I was the first woman to ever do this job. And I find that uh, a woman as well as a man can do a job which is so exciting, so challenging. So we're also doing a very important thing in terms of disseminating information, not just about NASA, but about space itself. And I think it is important because it is really documenting the space age through radio. It's beautiful, Lord. SCA pilot pistol is called out proper separation altitude. Five, four, three, two, one. We do have separation. 
Chase planes are calling. Clear. The orbiter has nosed over and is now on its way to the final descent to the runway. It was in the early days of the space shuttle, when it was first testing its wings, that women and minorities began entering the professional ranks of NASA. Trudy Phillips was one of those women. Pilots in the orbiter are Joey, Noah, and Dick Trulli. The orbiter crew has pitched the nose of the orbiter down. They should be making their final descent any minute. The orbiter is coming in over the runway at Edwards. We should have touched down momentarily. The more you think about it, the more apparent it becomes that human intelligence will be of increasing importance in the future survival of the human race. On this spaceship called Earth, we are learning to respect that intelligence in whatever form or color it appears. When the first space shuttle was tested in the mid-1970s, the director of the space shuttle operations at Triton was an ex-Air Force test pilot named Ike Gillam. Since that time, Gillam has been promoted to the position of director of Triton Space Center in California. It was from him that the first female and minority group astronauts received their introduction to the Enterprise, NASA's first space shuttle. From wingtip to wingtip is baseline to baseline on a tennis court. That's capable of standing about 700 degrees of temperature. And the highest temperature resistant portion that we have is the leading edge of the wing that's reinforced carbon carbon. And you'll notice when we get around front the tip of the nose. In the 21st century, the ranks of our space travelers must be filled with people of not only high intelligence, but great stamina. Because the challenges of outer space will be many, each one of those challenges will represent a seed of opportunity for human growth. Space Lab will fly on board the space shuttle. When shuttle launches, all the people flying in it, the astronaut crew, the mission specialist, and the payload specialist will be on this end of the shuttle. Now once it's in orbit, the payload specialist and the mission specialist who will be working with experiments will move from this end of the shuttle into the space lab compartment. This uh, features a pressurized module where the scientists will be able to work in a shirt sleeve environment. This truly allows for them to do experimentation in space that's never been done before. I'm part of a team uh, which is called the Space Lab Data Processing Office here. And the purpose of our office is to put together a data processing facility that will capture and record and process all the data coming from the experiments on board Space Lab. I'm originally from the Philippines. Um, I have a degree in uh, mathematics and physics from the University of Santa Tomas in Manila, Philippines. With my background in mathematics and physics, it was easy enough to pick up the kind of knowledge and experience needed to work in the data processing field, which is what we do here. When I first started, I think the opportunities for women were not as well publicized then. And now I see more and more women working in these areas that I'm working in. In fact, we have a contractor that now works for us uh, that's developing the software. And a lot of the workforce, a good majority of it, consists of women. So I think since I first joined NASA to this point, there has been a tremendous improvement in the hiring of women in the scientific and technical areas. The ZIPS digital data release to ESA. To achieve this goal, 
all prejudices, taboos, habits of human thought must be cast aside. For the safety and survival of a spacecraft depend on the excellence, both mental and physical, of all on board. How do these newer space travelers feel about being astronauts? When you were first made uh, aware of the fact that you had been selected, how did you react to that? Well, you have to appreciate I was in the middle of writing a PhD thesis. And uh, that tends to swamp out a lot of other things. And I was obviously very excited. Um, and I remember the morning and the whole day, in fact, quite well. And I was just very happy and very excited. But then all the press activity took off at such a tremendous rate, too, that um, that sort of masked over personal celebrations and personal reactions. It was an incredibly busy and exciting day, but it was just a great big blur, too. I happened to go to a school for my bachelor's degree where grades were not actually given. You were given a pass or a fail, and you were, a critique was written by the professor of how well you had done in the class. You didn't get just a letter grade. By the authority vested in me, by the Senate of Dalhousie University, I admit you to the degree of Doctor of Philosophy with all the rights and privileges thereto attained. And I congratulate you. But still, I always found that my performance in the class was best. My re results from the professors were best when my only motive was to learn the most I could. And as I say, I never aimed for the space program as such. All I really thought about was that nothing was worth doing unless you were willing to do what was needed to do the job well. Self-discipline, I think, is the top, the most important factor. And I think it's also important to realize the responsibility that each person has towards all the other people around them. Waxing philosophical, I think we show each other many, many lessons just in day-to-day -day life. And we can learn a lot from each other. We can give a lot to each other. And that will only be, that will only reach its highest point if each of us individually tries to do the best we can. That's true for a uh, high school exam or a PhD or being an astronaut. You can't, you can't just do it for yourself. It does count. Reaching, reaching the highest point. This is the dream that has sailed across the skies of the human mind for a very long time. That highest point is the point at which we achieve excellence in whatever we do. But that excellence must start here on Earth, in the objects and structures we build and in the many jobs we perform. At NASA, there are numerous jobs, each crucial to the space program as a whole. making sure that they are following OSHA standards, the Occupational Safety and Health Act. We're mostly concerned with investigating potentially hazardous situations on the job for both contractor and NASA personnel. Um, most anything that's potentially hazardous. I became a safety specialist through a specialty training for entry professionals. And we go through the process of just applying for the job, then we'll evaluate it and select it. Brenda Willis is one of a growing number of women who are deeply involved in the various programs and projects of NASA. Is it necessary for a person to have a PhD to advance in the workforce of NASA? Not at all. There are so many different ways in which a person can pursue a new career within this organization. How did you get your start, Ms. Willis? In high school, they had the program, you know, where they would go around and recruit students that were interested in the secretarial field who had had some experience in typing and shorthand, 
and things of that nature. And I started out in the clerical field with NASA. And by taking the civil service exam, you know, I became, came into NASA as a clerk typist and just worked myself, you know, right up through the ranks by going to college in the evening. I've worked on the shuttle program since I've been working here at NASA over the five and a half, if you count the contract time, six and a half years that I've worked here. And uh, it's very fascinating, especially when you watch the shuttle and that uh, orbiter just glides in and land on target. It, you, get, you get goosebumps knowing that you were an active part in making history happen. Well, the space program has always held a fascination to me. I can remember that when they first landed on the moon, we sat up all night. Uh, my mother was making hot chocolate and she was sitting there and we were, all of us kids were sitting around the television set waiting for the purple people to come out and eat up the astronaut. So <laughs> I have to admit that I never believed that I would actually be here taking a part in all of uh, this technology and, and all of this going to the moon and, and uh, unique happening. Shirley Chevalier is an electrical engineer or on the space shuttle. Shirley Chevalier, how did you become an engineer? Uh, I graduated from a high school that had a senior class of about 38 people, and it's a, a central Texas town of about 2,000 people. So if you were considering a profession, you either had the doctor who was a role model or you had the school teachers who were role models. And I was afraid of the sight of blood, and teachers didn't make enough money. So uh, my oldest brother was in his sophomore year in college, majoring in civil engineering when I graduated from high school. So I, um, about that time, he asked me, well, what are you, what are you going to do? I said, well, I imagine I'll go to college. He said, well, what are you going to major in? I said, I don't know, maybe engineering. He said, well, forget it, that I'm a felon and engineering is rough for me, but I don't think you could make it in engineering. And I said, well, I think I can. He said, anyway, what, which one are you going to major in? And I said, well, how many kinds do they have? And he says, well, that's civil engineering, architectural, uh, mechanical, and electrical. And I said, which one's the hardest? And he said, electrical engineering. So I said, okay, I'm majoring in electrical engineering. And uh, I graduated in May of 1971 with a degree in electrical engineering. Today, women are pursuing a wide variety of careers in space and science. Take Sue Norman, for example. She first came to NASA as a research scientist. Since that time, she has worked in several other fields. Her current job involves work in aerial and satellite photography. But we use both aerial photography and satellite imagery to help in analysis, vegetation analysis. There are two U2 pictures which were taken from a side looking angle at 65,000 feet. They're color infrared pictures and we use color infrared because it tells us um, more about the vegetation on the ground, whether it's healthy or whether it's diseased or it's state. And uh, these pictures are of Northern California, the Eureka Humboldt Bay Area. And you can see the mountains in the background that have snow on them. And if you look closely, you can also see a uh, little bit of the curvature of the earth. Okay, well I think let's see. we have two maps. This one is a map of the state of California that shows the places where as the satellite passes over it takes sort of one picture. What uh, made you think uh, initially of a career in space? Well, there were quite a few. Number one, when I was going to school, I didn't, I didn't <laughs> belong to a very wealthy family. And uh, so I really wanted to get a job and go to college and, you know, have something where I could, could make some money, so to speak. And they had the Space Act 
Do you remember where they would give students loans if you would go into science? And I didn't really have enough money to go to school and my family didn't have enough money either. So by taking science classes and well, just the whole impetus of the space program in the early 60s, I was able to get loans to go to school. So that was part of it because they would uh, give me loans as long as I was in science. But I also wanted science. You know, I felt a natural inclination toward that as opposed to English. I'm, I'm not a very good speller and I can't write very well, so it seemed like my, what was me was really science. I kept flunking English and the other types of things like that. Well, what about the business of your being a woman here? Do you feel you have encountered any kind of, well, special problems working here because you are a woman? Any special problems? I think the answer is yes. I mean, if you're if you're going to be honest, you have to say yes. There are just not that many women in the professional or scientific field. So you find yourself being a minority in the midst of, uh, in a sense, not a minority. Women are half the population. But when I first came to Ames, uh, there was one other woman in my group of about 30 men and no minorities. Um, the present group I'm in, as you can see, there are a lot of women, and just having the, the opportunity to talk with other women and share experiences, at least for me, has been really helpful and um, kind of fun, too. And I think in that sense, it is changing. The world is changing, changing rapidly, and so are our thoughts about ourselves and those around us. This is Sharon Orkansky. She's a computer specialist at NASA. How did she begin her career? When I went out looking for a job, I had sent out 85 applications, and I went to a lot of different companies in the area. And a lot of the companies were production-oriented, and you do one thing to fit the needs of the company. And when I came here, I mean, I'm seeing simulators and wind tunnels and animal centrifuges and all kinds of um, neat planes, Lear jets. I mean, that's, that's just really exciting for me to work on it. And every job is different. I can't say that I've ever had a job that repeats a second job. I mean, they're, they're also very different and I enter a new field every time. What happened was when I applied here, there was a, a, a person in front of me I couldn't get in. There's like the veteran points, and I have no veteran points or any kind of points. So they were going to bring me in on a special 5x5 five five program. That's where you work half time and go to school half time and get paid full. And so I applied for that, and I applied to Stanford University, got accepted, but then NASA had a regular position for me, so I just came in as a regular NASA employee, NASA Ames employee. Do you find that you have encountered any problems working at NASA? I mean, because you are a woman. Um, I would say maybe not having the background that a lot of the men have had as, as, um, as children. You know, you grow up and your dad shows you how to fix a car or to fix the stereo. I never had that kind of training as a child, and I feel, I mean, I never, I never did anything with circuits until I got into engineering. I mean, I just never, you know, toyed around with it, and that really holds me back. I mean, just getting out there and getting your hands dirty, I am a little slow at. Uh, I see that maybe as being a woman holding me back. Um, as far as dealing with people, I'd almost say they're more willing to deal with me because I'm, I'm a little bit different, you know, they want to see, oh, what's a woman engineer really like? Since you have been a part of the NASA team, have you found that um, you encounter any problems being a woman? I think I have more problems by virtue of the fact that I'm short. I'm the shortest person in my lab. Um, most of the people who work here are older than I am. Uh, the majority of them are men. I really don't have that much of a problem working with people who are older than I am and who are men because uh, as it turns out, they realize that I'm the principal investigator and I'm the one that's directing this program. And you can get people to work with you without being pushy and telling them what to do. You simply explain to them that it's the best idea, you know, or that uh, it's for all of our mutual benefit. 
Uh, being short is a little difficult, though. You know, do this, do that. Everybody seems to be taller than me. But what are you going to do? I'll wear heels a lot. As we approach the 21st century, there is much to learn about our world and ourselves. This learning occurs best in a climate of equal opportunity. In that sunny climate, human intelligence, trust, and total commitment can prosper. We become the winning team. For uh, purposes of testing equipment, and we no longer had a need for that, we gave that up about three years ago. But that is where the water immersion facility will be built and will be. I would like to go into space for a couple of reasons. Uh, the space program meets my particular academic needs, gives me something that's intellectually challenging, also physically challenging, but much more important, I think, that man needs something to dream about. Uh, we've explored our world far fairly thoroughly. I realize that the ocean's remaining, that there's the net three quarters of our world, but there's really just two frontiers left, the ocean and space, and I'd like to be part of that effort. I certainly feel that women are, are here to stay as part of the space program. Um, you know, this time all the women selected were selected as mission specialists. Uh, I certainly feel that in future selections with women training as pilots that there will be uh, women selected as pilots. Um, I think we're here to stay. Who is to say who will succeed or fail in any task we Earthlings undertake? For is there really any difference between the minds of males and females? The women of NASA don't think so, and neither does NASA. For it is generally agreed that differences in performance occur when there is a difference in opportunity to learn and to gain experience. When I was picked about a year or so ago to be um, a backup payload specialist on a, on a dress rehearsal of a space shuttle flight, I was, I was afraid at that time because I thought, well, maybe Maybe I really can't do it. But as it turned out, uh, I was picked because of the investigators who had submitted experiments, just that, as it'll be for an actual flight. Um, the, the payload specialists, the scientists, astronauts, are chosen because maybe there's some particular characteristic of their own experiments that would make them themselves be the, the best person to conduct that experiment, and also because their background, their educational background, is varied enough to be able to adequately uh, carry out other people's experiments on board. And as we went through the uh, simulation, I found out that I, I could learn what I had to learn, and that I was doing just fine. Fire. research aboard the International Space Station. Hi, I'm NASA astronaut Tracy Dyson. Welcome to Station Life. Okay, Tracy, we copy and that's good information. We'll pass it along. Welcome back. 
This month on Station Life, we're going to look at how the unique environment on board the International Space Station enables physical science research. Our space station is a laboratory unlike any on Earth. As we orbit in free fall around the planet, we have the opportunity to control gravity as a variable in our research. The pristine microgravity environment allows us to observe aspects of fundamental physics that aren't possible here on Earth. You see, gravity often masks or distorts subtle effects such as surface tension and diffusion. On ISS, these forces can be harnessed for a wide variety of physical science applications. So on today's program, we're going to look at how the lack of gravity affects the physical sciences of flames, fluids, and materials. The International Space Station is the largest, most complex object ever assembled in space and is clearly visible from Earth with nothing more than the naked eye. From end to end, the station is slightly longer than an American football field. The, uh, the biggest shock, I would say, the biggest impact that I had uh, during my flight is the first time I looked out the, the window of the orbiter and saw the space station. It was huge. It was huge and shiny and beautiful. Uh, looking at it and knowing that a man-made structure that big is actually up there. The interior of this incredible structure is larger than a five-bedroom house with two baths, a gym, and a 360-degree bay window. The station's mass is almost one million pounds and it contains about 32,000 cubic feet of living space. The space station functions as a microgravity and life sciences laboratory, a test bed for new technologies, and as a platform for both Earth and celestial observations. The complex is made up of multiple interconnected modules grouped together at the center point of a 357 foot long integrated truss structure. Power is generated through four giant solar arrays attached to the ends of the truss. The pressurized components include three laboratories, the U.S. Laboratory Module Destiny, the European Research Laboratory Columbus, and the Japanese Experiment Module Kibo. The Russian Service Module is the structural and functional center of the Russian segment of the station. It provides living quarters, communication systems, an exercise facility, and flight propulsion systems. Other Russian segments include the functional cargo block, two mini research modules, and a docking compartment. The Italian Space Agency provided a permanent multi-purpose module, which can host up to 16 additional racks containing equipment, experiments, and supplies. There are three modules called nodes that connect the elements of the station and provide berthing ports. The primary residential areas include the Russian service module and node three tranquility, which contains a bathroom for crew hygiene and exercise equipment, a treadmill and a zero G weightlifting device. The Quest airlock provides the capability for extravehicular activity or EVAs. This is the module that provides the exit for spacewalking astronauts to go outside the station to work. The cupola is a small module designed for the observation of operations outside the space station. Similar to a bay window in a home on Earth, but with a 360 degree view, the cupola allows crew members to observe the approach of vehicles, as well as all robotic arm operations and spacewalks. The Canadian-built space station robotic arm is a larger version of the arm on the space shuttle and is used to move equipment and hardware around outside the station. The space station is the home of six full-time crew members and is made up of astronauts and cosmonauts from nations around the world. More than 200 people have visited so far and at least another 120 will live there over the next decade.
when you're up there for six months or in Scott Kelly's case, an entire year, it's really the working in space part that becomes kind of the thing you love the most. It's the thing that gets you through the days. You're working with these professionals on the ground and a lot of them have spent their entire lives working on these science experiments. And here we are up there and we get to operate them. And it's really an honor to get to do that. And, and in many ways, those are some of my fondest memories of being in space. Um, you get, to, you get to work these experiments and they're usually watching over your shoulder from the ground. And there was a lot of times where I would do something, whether it was fluids or with flame research, it really didn't matter. Um, the investigator would just say, whoa, 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 wait, do, do that again. That was incredible and totally unexpected. And that was what just made you smile big up there when, when hey, we've been flying in space a long, long time, but we are still doing research that has unexpected results every single day on the space station. And I really love that about being up there. In microgravity, something as simple as a candle flame looks and behaves completely different than here on Earth. Scientists are studying combustion on the space station with the hopes to improve efficiency of fuels and reduce pollution. Isn't that cool? Fire, it is often said, is mankind's oldest chemistry experiment. For thousands of years, people have been mixing the oxygen-rich air of the Earth with an almost endless variety of fuels to produce a hot, luminous flame. There's an arc of learning about combustion that stretches from the earliest campfires of primitive humans to the most advanced automobiles racing down the superhighways of the 21st century. Engineers studying burning to produce better internal combustion engines. Chemists peer into flames looking for exotic reactions. Chefs experiment with fire to cook better food. You would think there's not much more to learn. When it comes to fire, flames are hard to understand because they're complicated. In an ordinary candle flame, thousands of chemical reactions take place. Hydrocarbon molecules from the wick are vaporized and cracked apart by heat. They combine with oxygen to produce light, heat, carbon dioxide, and water. Some of the hydrocarbon fragments form ring-shaped molecules called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and eventually soot. Soot particles can themselves burn or simply drift away as smoke. The familiar teardrop shape of the flame is an effect caused by gravity. Hot air rises and draws fresh, cool air behind it. This is called buoyancy and is what makes the flame shoot up and flicker. But what happens when you light a candle, say, on the International Space Station? In microgravity, flames burn differently. They form little spheres. Space Station flame balls turn out to be wonderful mini-labs for combustion research. Unlike flames on Earth, which expand greedily when they need more fuel, flame balls let the oxygen come to them. Oxygen and fuel combine in a narrow zone at the surface of the sphere, not here and there throughout the flame. It's a much simpler system. Recently, on a space station experiment called FLEX, where scientists learn how to put out fires in microgravity, they noticed small droplets of heptane were burning inside the FLEX combustion chamber. As planned, the flames went out, but unexpectedly, the droplets of fuel continued burning. The flames are there, just too faint to see. These are cool flames. Ordinarily, visible fires burn at a high temperature between 2200 and 3100 degrees Fahrenheit. Heptane flame balls on the space station started out in this hot fire regime, but as the flame balls cooled and began to go out, a different kind of burning took over. Cool flames burn at the relatively low temperature of 400 to 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, and their chemistry is completely different. Normal flames produce soot, carbon dioxide, and water. Cool flames produce carbon monoxide and formaldehyde. Similar cool flames have been produced on Earth, but they flicker out almost immediately. On the space station, however, cool flames can burn for nearly a minute. There are practical implications of these results. For instance, they could lead to cleaner ideas that auto companies have worked on for years is HCCI, short for Homogeneous Charge Compression Ignition. In the automobile cylinder, instead of a spark, there would be a gentler, less polluting combustion process throughout the entire chamber. The chemistry of HCCI involves cool flame chemistry. The extra control we get from the steady state burning on the space station will give us more accurate chemistry values for this type of research. Real 
I'm just getting my safety cutter on the other side of my IDE back here. Copy, Terry. Well, he's without the, without the pool uh, stanchion. Absolutely, yeah. And it's just like in the pool instead of that, uh, with the exception of that big planet yeah. down there. <laughs> exactly. As the International Space Station flies 257 statute miles over the coast of Chile, Terry Verts, in the initial moments of uh, his first spacewalk. As you can see, combustion research on ISS can have tremendous benefits back here on Earth. We also want to better understand the behavior of flames in spacecraft to guide strategies for extinguishing accidental fires. The new Sapphire experiment is going to be hot. Sapphire is contained inside a two foot by three foot by four foot box that consists of an avionics bay containing the computer and instrumentation and a flow duct which holds the material to be burned. This will be carried aboard Orbital's Cygnus spacecraft during a scheduled cargo resupply mission to the International Space Station. Once at the station, Sapphire will remain on Cygnus until all the supplies are offloaded by the crew of astronauts. Once supplies are offloaded and replaced with trash from the ISS, Cygnus will depart. Once reaching a safe distance from the station, NASA Glenn engineers working from Orbital's Mission Control Center in Dulles, Virginia, will remotely turn on the experiment. Cygnus will then be put into free drift while the Sapphire experiment is conducted up to two and one half hours. The experiments, sensors, and video cameras are designed to capture valuable data and imagery documenting large-scale flame spread and material flammability limits. At the conclusion of the Sapphire experiment, the Cygnus vehicle will remain in orbit while the data captured is downlinked to several ground stations around the globe and transferred to NASA Glenn's scientists and engineers in Cleveland. When downlink is complete, Cygnus will then begin its re-entry through the Earth's atmosphere where it will burn up over the Pacific Ocean. someone who needs no introduction because you've all seen him before he's the guy we love dr don pettit welcome to station life ah uh, it's it's good to be back on station i guess we're really not back on station but it's good to be here on station life thank you yes and um i am just beyond excited today because don is not only one of the most fantastic astronauts ever he's like one of my favorite people so this is a, a landmark event in station life history that we have with us. And we both studied chemistry yes. at college. And look at right. what he's wearing. Let's see, I've got my periodic table shirt on. Yes. Okay. Okay. Coffee cup. Coffee cups. So, Space cup. so we have the first generation, the second generation, and both of these have been on station. This is uh, a food grade plastic, so it meets flight safety and all of that. Here is a variant of the second generation. What's that for? Well, this this is for Earth because this is slip cast out of porcelain and it has this really cool, smooth look that shows off the form and the beauty of the, the design of this. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but, but porcelain is breakable. You can make these sharp shards and in a weightless environment they could float around, they could get in your eye or even worse, you could inhale one of these aids and get them in your lungs. So, so we can't take the porcelain ones on orbit, but they're really cool looking and we can use them here on Earth. Awesome. Shall we? Shall we. Mm. Notice your nose goes right in the cup, right in and you here. get this oh. burst of, of uh, uh, Java. Java, yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's a good mix of cream. You and, like that? Yeah, yeah. 
and oh, let me read what it says. It says Space Cup, and that's the official name of this. That's the op nom for the space station, the official sanctioned space station experiment. It's a, the name of the experiment is Capillary Beverage. Capillary Beverage. <laughs> and the name of the cup is Space Cup. And, and then uh, there are the words on it. It says Capillary Experiments International Space Station. That is so Skeletonized awesome. NASA meeple. This would be a collector's item for sure. I was thinking, Trace, want to that, go back up there. <laughs> that if you look at everything that I will have accomplished in my life, in 400 years, nobody will even remember that I was even walked the surface of Earth or floated around in space. However, I predict that in 400 years, people living and working in space will be drinking, sipping, and toasting out of cups based on my design. Yes. And, and you will, there will be, you'll be legend. You are legend. They, what they am I talking about? They, they won't, won't remember the anything. Like, 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 do you remember who invented fire? Uh, Let's see, and, and who invented the wheel? No. You see, nobody needs to remember who did these things. The important thing is you got to know how to build a wheel. you got to know how to control fire. And then your civilization can take off. And in space, you don't need to remember who messed with the surface chemistry to make these. But you need to know that uh, you know how to make them and that you can use them. And it will help uh, build the civil civilized nature of human beings interacting with each other when you're in a weightless environment. Well, Don, I, I've just had so much fun having you on Station Life and sharing your invention and your passion for science and, and coffee and bringing people together, and I think you've done that in a number of ways, but uh, none so um, illustrative as the space cup. Co I call this so. a wrap, huh? Me too. <laughs> A normal coffee cup or a normal open container just simply won't work in a weightless environment because the liquid will be in the bottom of the cup and you tip it up and it still stays in the bottom of the cup. If you move it around too violently, it'll all splash out and make a big mess. So we end up having to drink our beverages through a straw from a bag. It makes you feel like you're a big insect sucking the juices from another insect. I wanted to see if I could figure out a way to have an open container cup in a weightless environment which would allow you to drink your tea and your coffee in a manner that's commensurate with how people drink their beverages on Earth. Taking some of my surface chemistry that I learned in college, I devised a cup with a special shape. The cross section looks kind of like an airplane wing where it has a cusp and the cusp will allow channel flow so the liquid from the bottom of the cup will float up and just park itself right next to the rim and then you can drink it and it allows a crew to share a communal beverage you can share tea uh, maybe you just come in from doing a spacewalk or something and you want to celebrate a little bit if you have a real cup an open container it's so ingrained in human beings it's so ingrained in culture it adds back the dimension of what it's like to be a human being in a civilized way. magnetic fluids, and smart materials. If you have a smartphone, take it out and run your fingers along the glass surface. It's cool to the touch, incredibly thin and strong, and almost impervious to scratching. You're now in contact with a smart material. Smart materials don't occur naturally. Instead, they're designed by engineers working at the molecular level to produce substances made to order for futuristic applications. The 
Corning Gorilla Glass that overlays the displays of many smartphones is a great example. It gets its toughness in part from fat potassium ions stuffed into the empty spaces between old-fashioned glass molecules. When the molten glass cools during manufacturing, dense pack molecules solidify into a transparent armor that gives Gorilla Glass its extraordinary properties. Around the world, designers are working on other smart materials, such as alloys that can change shape on demand, plastics that heal themselves when ruptured, and fluids that obey magnetic commands to flow or stiffen under computer control. One of the greatest challenges in creating a smart material is arranging the molecules. They're so small. We want to create a new class of materials beyond smart. We need genius materials, materials that arrange themselves. The research to accomplish this is already underway on the International Space Station. Dr. First is the principal investigator of an experiment called In Space 3. In the microgravity of Earth orbit, vials of fluid mixed with very small colloidal particles, about a millionth of a meter in diameter, are exposed to magnetic fields. Magnetism can be switched on and off again very rapidly. This jostles the particles, causing them to bump together and self-assemble into microscopic structures. These structures can be very difficult to predict, even using cutting-edge models running on supercomputers. Astronauts enjoy watching this process in action through microscopes. Because the samples are backlit by a green lamp, they sometimes call it the green blob experiment. First recently won an award from the American Astronautical Society for his work on In Space 3. Just by toggling a magnetic field, we're learning how to take many kinds of microscopic building blocks and get them to spontaneously form interesting structures. Recently, observers have seen the colloidal particles forming long, fibrous chains. First speculates that these could lead to materials that conduct heat or electricity in only one direction. The experiment has also yielded crystalline structures that the team is just beginning to investigate. The fluids underlying these tests are themselves very smart. They're called magnetorheological, or MR fluids, because they harden or change shape when they feel a magnetic field. If you own a sports or luxury car, you might have MR fluids in your shock absorbers. The stiffness of magnetic shocks can be electronically adjusted thousands of times per second, providing a remarkably smooth ride. Similar but more powerful devices have been installed at Japan's National Museum of Emerging Science and China's Dongting Lake Bridge. They're there to counteract vibrations caused by earthquakes and gusts of wind. Some researchers have speculated that MR fluids might one day flow through the actuators and hydraulic dampers of robots, moving artificial joints and limbs in lifelike fashion. Scientists and researchers are using these fluids as a laboratory for studying self-assembly. MR fluids are, by definition, responsive to the magnetic nudging that sets self-assembly in motion. Furthermore, in space, the particles don't sediment out due to gravity. We can study the full 3D evolution of the material. Varying the shape of the colloidal particles, the cadence of magnetic toggling, the temperature of the fluid, and other factors will allow researchers and astronauts to further explore the frontiers of self-assembly. Touch the surface of your smartphone again. That's just the beginning. As you can see, our International Space Station is an unprecedented research platform in space, allowing researchers and scientists to conduct experiments that can't be done anywhere else. This work off the Earth will lead to a better understanding of the fundamentals of combustion, surface tension, and colloids in the absence of gravity, benefiting us by helping us to make more efficient combustion engines, better portable medical diagnostics, stronger, lighter alloys, medicines with a longer shelf life, and buildings that are more resistant to earthquakes. Research on the International Space Station continues to improve life here on the Earth. Be sure to stay in touch and follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest research news, and don't forget to download our app on your mobile device. Until next time, we're working off the Earth for the Earth. We've got to come up with a better system, a better way to make sure that these pilots are getting the oxygen and the protection they need to go flying.
you're low on oxygen, basically sometimes get euphoric or you'll get sleepy or you're, you're kind of pass out. And obviously if you have to fly the airplane, it's not, it's not a good scenario. The Navy and the Air Force has been experiencing problems with oxygen levels and content and pilots blacking out. You know, you have aircraft data, you have some, you don't have a lot, but what you don't have is any instrumentation on the pilot and, and their breathing. And so what we were really focused on was really trying to identify the root cause in the pilot. Remember, physiological episodes happen in people, not aircraft. So if you don't have the pilot instrumented, then you're really not going to be able to help resolve the problems. For assignments, uh, I'll be in the jet. You guys will be in the control room. Jack will be talking on the radio. radio. Oh, okay. The use of this project is going to, going to go for a long time because it's going to establish a fundamental data set on how pilots breathe in, in a tactical environment. Master 1, uh, Richard, that mark. That date, that zero, Master 1, that mark in three, two, one, mark. High performance type aircraft like fighter jets, over the years they've become more and more advanced. They can fly with higher G's, they fly faster, they fly at higher angles of attack. With all those increases, physiological effects on pilots has increased dramatically. Every pilot's going to be different in how they react to something. They want to kind of baseline what you're like before and what you're like after. So how do we gather the data? How does it go through this process from the aircraft all the way through to arrive at the analyst's uh, desk and what do they do with it? And one of the first things we have to do is we have to look and see what kind of flight they're doing. If they're doing a Navy configuration flight or an Air Force configuration flight. We'll take spirometry basically looking at lung capacity at the time. We do that like an hour before the flight, just right after we strap into the cockpit, and then when we come back, we'll do that again in the cockpit, and then after we, we've been out for about an hour. The RAD-97 is monitoring their pulse, their oxygen saturation, their blood. It's also monitoring how fast they're breathing. It should be. Pilot wears a Vigilox system made by Cobble. The Vigilox system, it measures a lot of key parameters that are useful and important for understanding what the pilot is breathing in and breathing out. Put this side in first. In order to capture all the data that we want, the pilots are flying different profiles. Some are just high, high altitude flights where they're flying 40 to 50,000 feet. Uh, other ones are more aerobatic. It's where they're up there doing spins and turns and dives. And then can we correlate that type of flight and how it changes, you know, kind of your lung capacity or those kinds of things. So that's what the scientists are looking for. We embarked on this with the idea that we have a lot of complex test methods that we're developing. And at the end of this, one of our goals originally is we want to be able to develop test methods that are useful to the Air Force and to the Navy in the sense that they can be used in a repeatable, consistent way that provide really quality data that then we can compare our results with the Navy's results and the Air Force's results. So I think this will help make sure that the designs we have are set for what the pilot needs. Because if we don't really know what the pilot needs very well, we can't design to that. And previous systems, I think, just had a lot of margin to be able to accept different needs from a pilot. But, but now that we've gotten, you know, closer to designing those to basically just what they need, we really need to know what the pilots actually need in order to, to be safe.
It's NASA's next big rocket for um, deep space exploration. The SLS is a national capability that provides um, a unique access to space that America has not had in 40 years. A large launch vehicle like this um, really opens the door to destinations beyond. It's not limited by destination. It's only limited really by imagination. What we're focused on here at this center is the propulsion system. And uh, that consists of two solid rocket boosters and a core with some tanks that feed uh, some liquid rocket engines in the middle. And then the astronauts sit on the top in the Orion uh, uh, spacecraft. One of the things we recognized for SLS is we had to be affordable. So we had to do things differently, more efficiently, and smarter. We're all conscious about saving money and doing it uh, more affordable than we have in the past. But at the same time, we can't sacrifice reliability or safety. The system uses a um, significant amount of heritage hardware, which is things that we've evolved from the space shuttle program. The space shuttle had two kind of candle-looking things, which are the solid rockets. Those are kept and those are used on SLS. We've added a segment uh, to the four segment solid rocket boosters that we had on shuttle. That gives it more power, more thrust, and it helps this larger rocket get off the ground. What those boosters are for is just to get you going. They burn for a couple of minutes and then they fall to the ground. Then your liquid engines, you're up high enough, your liquid engines can carry your vehicle to as high as you want to go, and if you have additional stages, like we're going to have one, then you can go further out into space. Right now, the inventory that we've got uh, consists of 14 engines that have flown on shuttle. We've got one engine that was assembled and still needs green run testing or certification testing. We looked at all the spares. As we collected the spares, we determined that we could assemble a 16th engine. So we'll have 16 engines that we'll be able to use to fly. We are making tremendous progress. We've got all of our prime contractors on board. Um, we're testing engines, we're testing solid rocket boosters, our avionics systems. J2X has set, uh, recently set a record at Stennis. Uh, when we were testing, it was the first liquid oxygen engine to get to a full duration test in four tests. We were developing this booster under the Ares program, and, and we're moving that into the SLS. The motor itself has been through three development firings, which are full-scale motors tested out in Utah, um, um, and we've gotten a lot of good data, engineering data, from those tests. This is an adapter that goes between the bottom of the Ryan capsule and the top of the Space Launch System rocket that we're developing here at Marshall. It's been specifically designed to give strength to the adapter so that it can take the loads in flight and still be lightweight. This shape started out as a series of flat panels. Um, the isogrid pattern was machined into the surfaces. Then they were formed, it was called bump, in a process called bump forming, to make them into the shape that we need here. And we weld three of these segments together to form the cone that you see behind me. We just uh, you know, delivered the first crew module uh, to the ONC building at KSE. We started a lot of the uh, parts on to the outside of the uh, CM, and we've actually put it in what we call the bird cage, so we can locate all those parts, you know, within you know thousands of an inch to make sure that uh, everything is going together okay putting, you know, wiring inside of it, putting tubes for the, you know, for the propulsion system, putting valves and pumps, and so all of that happens in stages right there uh, in the ONC building. We have uh, on contract with USA, United Space Line, to build uh, our harness. They're set up shop in the ONC, and so their little shop delivers to, to the big shop. Thermal protection is very difficult in re-entry vehicles to, to test and to model. I mean, really, you have to, you have to fly it to really understand what's going to happen. 
We're building ceramic thermal insulation tiles for the back shell of the capsule. Uh, we're building thermal barriers for the capsule and we're building multi-layer insulation for that capsule. I'm the heat shield design lead. Designing and building the heat shield for the future Orion missions. The heat shield right now is in uh, our big 20 by 20 router. It's a five axis router, and uh, right now it's machining uh, the interior bowl, if you will, of the heat shield. To cut out that heat shield on the, on the router, it could take weeks of machine time uh, running multiple shifts. It's the biggest heat shield uh, ever constructed. The other component is the heat shield skeleton, so that's the piece of the titanium substructure, the backbone that makes up the, the carrier structure itself. Another unique thing is all the hand drilling that we're doing. So it's not automated by a router in this case, and it all has to be, be hand, hand drilled by technicians on the inside. 200 plus titanium parts all match drilled together. So we have a, a tool that puts all the pieces in the right spot, and then we drill and high lock them all together. MCC is transforming from a supporting space shuttle and space station to a platform that will support space station and MPCB or Orion. In order to adapt for the future, we need to go to a more modern system. KSC will still will operate the vehicle all the way up until launch. We'll operate the vehicle until splashdown and the recovery forces come in and take over after that. Fire Room 1 is the launch control room we're going to use for Orion SLS for EM-1 missions. We've been working with the Orion program to get the spacecraft data so we can, we can process it with our software in the firing room and we will be flight following that mission out of Fire Room 1. We refitted the room, we redid it, putting the sound suppression carpeting on the walls, making it kind of a more comfortable place to work. So we're aiming for about 50 people in Fire Room 1 for an EM-1 mission. We are actually using Fire Room 1 right now to test Pad B uh, subsystems. This part is going to be a, almost like a complete new pad because we will have refurbished each and every system that it's inside the pad. We're going to have the vehicle uh, launch from the mobile launcher and not only launch from the mobile launcher but have a tower that, that will have all the services attached to the vehicle. The tower is going to be on the mobile launcher. The vehicle will be assembled at the VAB. It's a return to a concept that we knew that worked very well during the Apollo years. When the mobile launch platform had a tower on it, we knew that the VAB was designed to accommodate a launch tower on a mobile launch platform. We have to make sure that the, v the VAB can remain adaptable and accommodate different vehicle architectures. And now we have a clean VAB uh, shell, per se, the, the infrastructure, so that we can accommodate the, the new hardware, the new vehicle access with uh, new platforms. And that is the first phase of what we're doing now. And once the vehicle is ready with all the connections, the only thing we got to do is move the vehicle to the pad, do the connections to the mobile launcher. And once we do those connections, we're ready to launch. There was a time where I had to explain what a crawler was. Um, if you didn't work out here at the Space Center or if you weren't in the Central Florida area, a lot of people just, uh, you know, somehow the, the vehicle got out to the pad. We knew what to expect from a, a load perspective with the new vehicle, the larger rocket, and things along those lines. And that goes from the crawler, lifted load, the hydraulics, also to the crawler way. Um, we're going to have to increase uh, the load capability for the crawler way itself uh, with the rock. What we've essentially done is keep all the same hydraulic components, but just in uh, increase the size and the diameter of the hydraulic cylinders. Last November, we actually took a, took a ride out with the completed crawler tube out to the pad and tested out the systems and uh, a couple punchless items, but everything worked great. The control system had been upgraded. The, uh, the, cab, the driver's cab consoles had all been replaced. The brakes had all been replaced. Uh, nearly every subsystem had some kind of work done to it. 
the traction support elements, uh, each of the four corners has 22 rollers that are about the size of a car, to be honest with you, and uh, we're changing out all of those and enlarging those as well. What I love doing is reminding the outside world, whether it's within our government or especially the media, that has a perception that we're in a lull, there's nothing going on, that the, you know the space program's shutting down, to kind of dispel that rumor and say, no, we're, we're, this is the, the far opposite for us. We are utilizing this inter-program time frame to make all the modifications and all the infrastructure changes that it will help bring that agency vision into reality. Many of us feel the country wants to go forward, and, and, and NASA has a big following, and every time I talk to people, they're excited about NASA. Enabling people to go beyond where they have ever gone before and look and discover things that they didn't even know existed is just, it's just a real honor. It's been a pleasure to be involved with this project, and I can't say enough for the team that's put this together. I'm privileged to work this program. I think most people who are working it today feel the same way. I can't believe they pay me for this job. It's just wonderful. It's great. Very rarely do you get the opportunity to kind of literally from the ground up put together a factory whose sole purpose is to go make history and do exciting things for not just NASA but for America and for the whole world. We're in the process of getting the factory ready for SLS production and in that process there's a series of new tools that we've been in, uh, installing the factory. Now we have not just put in new tooling, there's some legacy tooling that we're using. Most of the external tank buildings are being reused. We have a lot of construction going on for those, getting ready for a rocket that's uh, the same diameter but a little bit longer. Not only are we using the legacy knowledge, the lessons learned, we're also incorporating new technologies. The, the tool that today is in the vertical friction stir welding center. And its, its job is to produce the um, cylinders that make up the parts of the tank that we stack. And that is going to be the tool that joins every panel on every barrel for the, the rocket. This device will actually do the weld in a single pass and then also do inspection. So these are the large barrel sections of the, the core stage that will be the foundation or the beginning rocket that will actually take our crews beyond the moon and, and really propel us into space. Here at Marshall, we've designed the interface hardware in between the Orion capsule and that upper stage. The MSA, I think, is a great example of a couple things. One, it's actually a piece of hardware that we're flying on an early test, but we're also going to fly for the long term. So this is the same design that we'll use when Orion's on the SLS and we're actually flying people. Today, we've been taking the two unique pieces of hardware uh, that are supposed to have a common interface, basically lowering them together, bolting, and making sure that they fit. Well, we're going to test a lot of the key systems on Orion and also for SLS with the upper stage of the MSA that are going to be used when we uh, fly people into deep space. Most recently, we've been involved with NASA with the SLS development using our unique forming technology along with our other core processes in terms of machining, welding, heat treating, and inspection technologies. Really is a one-stop shop is what you, way you would describe it. Right behind me you have the uh, first cap, first uh, weld development cap, or I think you call it the weld confidence cap. The production order will start deliveries in 2014. Spacecraft also builds the domes for the upper stage Delta IV vehicle, which will be used for the EFT-1 flight, as well as the first two production flights of the SLS program. For the SLS PDR, our primary role is the overall communication and outreach support that we provide back to Todd May's office for SLS. We provide all of the communication support for that particular team, that program and project. Well, it's a preliminary design review, and uh, primarily it's a technical review to make sure that the design is acceptable and at the appropriate level of maturity. There's a lot of discussions, there's a lot of meetings across the board from technical, cost, schedule, 
performance data, safety, human factors. It's like a health check on the program. Um, those of us that are working on the program, uh, we've got our head down, we're, we're doing our pieces, um, and, and sometimes when you're working real close to things, you don't necessarily see everything. So there's so many moving parts and so many things going on at the agency, um, as well as the center, that to show people that we are moving in the right direction to pull together the complete story of where we are as a program. Watching at it from a higher level uh, headquarters viewpoint, it's just gratifying to see the, the accomplishments that the, that the teams have made and continue to make every day. For CT2, we're doing modifications not only to make it last another 20 years, but also to upgrade the load capacity. The main project we're working on right now is the roller replacement project, which is the roller assembly. It's actually the rollers, the shafts, the bearings that support the crawler. Actually, if you go there, you'll see trucks A and C jacked up and on uh, cribbing. And that's the first time in the career of the crawler it's ever actually been jacked off the ground. So the guys have easy access to the um, the rollers, roller assemblies, and they're in the process now of removing the old rollers, old shafts, and old parts. Um, once they've uh, done the line boring, that's when they'll start assembling the new rollers, and the new shafts, and the new bearings, and the new sleeves, and the new adapters, and new plates. So there's quite a bit of work, and that work will go well from August through October. So there's going to be a lot of trucks delivering a lot of steel uh, here at Kennedy. We started actually the new design for flame deflector as well as uh, refurbishment of the flame trench and that's because of the new requirements for SLS and uh, commercial vehicles. We've started the demolition of the flame deflector. We've got concerns of, you know, due to age and the debonding of the flame trench structure, this would possibly be a safety hazard for um, you know, our new program. And that's why we had to go in and do a new design and refurbish this flame deflector and flame trench. These pieces here, they're not just one program, it's not just one mission, it's part of a capability that will enable this country to be a leader in space, to continue to take people from the Earth well beyond low Earth orbit out into deep space. And this is the hardware that will do that over multiple decades in the future. So the work that's been accomplished so far is primarily structural type work, right? It's a lot of drilling, a lot of secondary structure installation, mechanical structures, the support structure. The next step is starting to install the subsystems. When we actually perform the welding on tubes for propulsion and the environmental controls and life support systems, um, those have to be at a higher level of cleanliness. When you look at the facility, um, there are these very large walls that are that are on the perimeter of the structure itself, and, and those are called HEPA filter walls. We can perform clean room work for the tubing um, concurrently uh, while on the outside doing more standard clean room. So our goal is next summer sometime uh, to turn the vehicle over, early summer, over to the ground operations organization so they can start their processing. Well, the service module is attached below the crew module and it has the prop tanks and the engine, radiators, solar panels. The service module all came in pieces. You know, there's 49 composite panels on the, on the SM. The actual structure itself is aluminum. That's the core skeleton where these composite panels were attached to. After it, the CM releases and the CM returns to Earth, the, the SM will just burn up with the, with the upper stage of the uh, Delta IV. We performed two primary tests so far. The proof pressure test, which is just the pressure vessel, and that is, that is put into the proof pressure cell. It, it's, it's pressurized and a relatively high pressure. We're testing how well the vehicle was built. And then the follow-on test is the static loads test 
where the vehicle goes through eight different loads test cases. And so the vehicle is put under, under pressure, it's put under tension, it's put under compression. The whole intent is to simulate similar conditions that the vehicle would experience, say, in flight, in launch, in, in, and also in landing and recovery. We, we usually get the abort motor first, and for this mission, the abort motor is inert, uh, being a nominal flight. We're going to have instrumentation on it to, again, understand more about the loads and environments that we expect to see in flight, but it will be an inert uh, propellant that's cast into the motor. This time, we got the jettison motor next, and that's the only live component of this vehicle. We do a, a nominal jettison, the jettison motor fires, the last separates from the CM, and the CM continues on its mission. You know, one of the challenges of any new system is understanding the loads uh, as you ascend up through the atmosphere and, and the dynamics, the acoustics, and uh, we'll be able to gather a lot of that information. The back shell, it looks, though, though it looks the same as what we flew on shuttle, it is different. We kind of took the best aspects and put them together to meet uh, Lockheed Martin's requirements for, for the Orion capsule. Two major things we're trying to accomplish here. One of them is to prevent micrometeorite damage when we're on orbit for long duration. The other, would, of course, is, is the reentry aspect. The skin that you see on the capsule, what you would see on orbit, sits on top of a composite substrate, what we call the back shell panel. That, that, that when combined together gives you the complete back shell. There's some sections that have some very complex geometry. So what we're going to do for the first time is take a substrate that's built by Lockheed Martin and put it together with the tiles that are manufactured by Jacobs and, and validate the fit up. Like any test vehicle, you're, you're heavily instrumented. We're gonna come back with a tremendous amount of data on how, how the system performed. This first flight test of Orion is really to, to understand how the heat shield performs and that heat shield being going to final manufacturing of Textron. Textron's had a long association with NASA and working in the uh, space area for space protection. Uh, the technology today has advanced tremendously. Our manufacturing technology has advanced, but ironically, we're still using a material that has proven itself the last 40 years. Mavcoat is a uh, very efficient ablator, and as an ablator, uh, what it does, it allows us to protect the capsule from the high heating that occurs during re-entry. There is no material, non-ablator material, that can handle that kind of heat. You have to shed away uh, the heat. Basically, what you're doing is you peel off the layers of the heat shield. You're taking heat with it. When we apply Avcoat to the heat shield, uh, we bond the honeycomb onto the carrier structure, and then we inject the Avcoat ablative material into the cells. The honeycomb acts as a, a crack arrestor and gives it rigidity and, and strength as a whole. We know we're on the critical path for the Orion program, and so our employees are literally working all hours, all days of the week to make sure that we get our schedule. We know there'll be more heat shields coming, and we're very excited about that. Our job is to make sure they're perfect. The development programs, I find, uh, uh, just awesome because this is where you're coming up with the new ideas, you're creating the, the new vehicles, you're, you're, you're pushing you're pushing the boundaries in essence. You can feel that we're going to go do this. The hardware is starting to come, the Orion hardware is getting ready for its first flight test down at the Kennedy Space Center. The excitement is here. We are really ready to get going. So we are far from being out of space. We are really getting ready to go into space. That's so rewarding to see our focus into what's next because this really is our future. I know the day that we fly this thing, there are going to be thousands of people that are going to be excited that are working on this and the NASA workforce and the contractor workforce. We're going to be proud of the work that this team has done and I think we're going to be proud of our country too. It's going to be a pretty exciting time. I'm ready to build a rocket and we are ready and we want to build it on time. Hi, I'm Dr. E, Ellen Stofan, and Dr. Z, Dr. Thomas Zerbukin, and I would like to answer some of your questions. Let's see. 
It says, my 11-year-old space enthusiast wants to know what does NASA want to accomplish on the moon when humans return there in the next few years? I really want to answer that question in two parts. The first one is, we want to create the capability not only to go to the moon, but going to Mars. Those technologies, together with the commercial and international partners that we work with, will bring us there in a way that we can turn around and move towards Mars. We've never done that, and we want to increase the sphere in which we can explore with humans. What an amazing thing. But there's a second part, and that is that we want to do science and exploration of the surface of the moon. There are interesting questions that we want to answer there about the age of the solar system, about the history of the Earth and its bombardment and so forth early in the Earth's history. We want to learn about water and many of the questions about this body that is our neighbor there in space. And those questions we want to answer with experiments that we're developing right now. Okay, I'll ask you a question. Did Mars or Venus host ancient watery environments conducive to early life? And is there evidence that life emerged? You know, that's one of the things that has really driven some of our exploration of those two bodies. For Mars, the answer is definitely yes. You know, we've long known that Mars has channels carved by water across its surface. But all of our spacecraft have helped us hone in on the fact that Mars probably had surface liquid water as much as an ocean's worth from about 3.9 or so billion years ago to about 3.5 billion years. During that time, the conditions existed in which life could have arisen, and we're still trying to figure out, did life actually evolve on Mars or not? And with our next mission to Mars that's going to be launched this summer, we're going to be looking into that very question of, can we find more evidence? Did something looking towards life actually evolve on Mars or not? So we have a lot of questions about that. Venus is an actually interesting story because back in the early 80s had a spacecraft that measured the isotopes of hydrogen in the atmosphere of Venus, which told us that Venus probably early in its history lost an ocean's worth of water. So it had a lot of water, but as Venus evolved, it lost that water. Some models suggest that Venus indeed could have had an ocean, but we want to go back to Venus and really measure the chemistry of the rocks on Venus because that's what's going to help us answer that question. Talking about places with potential life, let me ask one more question, which is, I'm interested if we ever go and send a real probe to Europa to see if there's really anything in that ocean under all that ice. One of the things we want to do with the Europa Clipper mission is actually go look at where we think there are plumes of liquid that are erupting from that subsurface ocean out into space. And if we can analyze some of those materials that are coming out of the interior of Europa look on the surface where the material from those erupting plumes would fall, we're hoping that we can understand more of the chemistry of that subsurface ocean. Eventually, obviously, what we would love to do is land on the surface of Europa where we could make better measurements and try to understand could there be life in Europa's subsurface ocean. And scientists and technologists have even come up with concepts for spacecraft that could land on the surface and maybe melt their way through the ice to go and explore that subsurface ocean. But those missions are probably a couple decades out. This is a fun question for right now. And in fact, I was just thinking of doing this today. How would sourdough starter thrive in space? Do you know that one? I'm actually interested what you came up with when you thought about that earlier today. It's interesting because I've gone out to classrooms before and done an experiment with yeast to help kids understand the idea that different conditions on different planets can affect life. And so we've done an experiment where we put yeast in hot vinegar and we put yeast in ice water that is super cold. We microwave it and then put it in water. And it's amazing. Actually, the yeast still is active. All those harsh conditions make it a little less active, so it bubbles a little less. But yeast actually only needs sugar and moisture and warmth to start activity. And so it doesn't really need oxygen. So I, I thought that was an interesting thing. I didn't realize it didn't need oxygen. I did think it needed oxygen. 
And you know what's amazing is how general these principles are applicable throughout the universe. And actually going on the space station, my where, where of course the astronauts have big cookies up there. It's kind of one of those exciting experiments. Uh, there's many others. Thanks so much. This has been really fun, and I can't wait to do our next episode of Easy, Easy Science. Science. The agency that landed on the moon launched the Hubble Space Telescope and took the first rover selfie? Yeah, that NASA. We also chase fires. This team is in the middle of a recovery operation. The California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection is using NASA satellite data to map the path of destruction after the 2018 campfire. NASA has the tallest fire towers, with our satellites looking down from space, catching images every day and every night. We're often the first to detect and then share information about fires, especially fires that are burning in remote locations. That's where we can come in and provide a much better picture. And so I have NASA MODIS and VIRS stuff, which we always use on Google Earth. But you can kind of see the streets here. This is a neighborhood totally burned down. A NASA rapid response grant allowed the team to study the impact of the campfire just four months after it was contained. NASA provides crucial tools for both first responders and fire recovery managers. But there are even bigger implications for understanding the future of fire. The information we collect from satellites helps us understand not just where and when fires are burning, but what kind of changes they're making to the ecosystems on the ground and our atmosphere up above. I'm Doug Morton, and I'm an Earth System Scientist here at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Doug is one of NASA's go-to scientists when it comes to making sense of how fires affect people and ecosystems. You need three things to make a fire. You need something to burn. You need climate conditions that allow that fire to start and grow large. And you need a source of ignition. Today, the source of ignition is almost always humans. We can use information about rainfall and climate to anticipate landscapes that might become flammable in the future. That kind of predictive power, how we harness our understanding of the Earth system, has really helped us move forward in terms of anticipating and minimizing the risk to landscapes that might be flammable next week or even next season. But the real work of science may be something that many people don't have a lot of visibility into. When we talk about taking a team of scientists and putting them into the field, that could mean weeks, months, or even years of collecting data. The first time I spent in the Amazon uh, was in the early parts of the 2000s, just at the peak of deforestation rates in Brazil. And I don't think anyone could make it to the end of that frontier landscape, standing at the edge of a road and looking in all directions and seeing towering columns of black smoke and not feel like there was an opportunity to be careful with our planet. Fires have been burning across the southern Amazon an area where I've been working for the last 20 years. And so people have looked to me to explain, is this normal? One of the things I can do as a NASA scientist is I can go back in time. Our data record allows us to literally compare activities that are happening every day with these same days and the same kinds of conditions in previous years. From space, we're mapping fires across the entire planet. And that often takes us to remote locations. And the best way to partner and understand those remote locations is with people who live and work in those communities. So that's what we did. This year, NASA is sending a blitz of missions into the field, and you're coming with us. Climate change is shepherding in a new era of fires that burn hotter and longer. And our pilots, our partners, our scientists and engineers, they've come prepared to meet that challenge.
Some of my days have been 14, 16, and 18 hours. We don't hesitate to meet challenging uh, uh, conditions. You know, you can tolerate a lot for a day or two. This mobile laboratory has been deployed for a very specific reason. The Shady Fire is burning nearby, and this team is gathering data that you can only get at night. Over the next several weeks, NASA and NOAA are teaming up in the field to study smoke from wildfires and agricultural burning. Here's what 24 hours looks like in the life of these fire chasers. The team's been keeping a close eye on the Shady Fire, burning just four hours northeast of the base of operations. After several days of watching the fire grow, the forecasting team decides to deploy the mobile laboratory and the NASA and NOAA planes. The ground crew and pilots are already preparing the plane by the time the forecasters give their daily briefing. The more we learn about smoke, the better we'll understand health. My name is Amber Soya, and my role here is to determine what fires we should target. Smoke is related to respiratory illnesses, heart attacks, and even death. For some of our scientists, Understanding pollution has defined the course of their life's work. I'm a physical chemist, but uh, I'm also from what 60 Minutes called the most polluted city in America, Anniston, Alabama. When the opportunity came along to do this type of work, I, I really resonated with it. Dr. Bruce Anderson is the Langley Aerosol Research Group lead and a seasoned veteran when it comes to doing field work in remote places. By 3 p.m., the NASA DC-8 and the mobile laboratory are about ready to go. Bruce and his team begin with a five-hour drive to reach the fire. We'll catch up with them later. While the ground crew, pilots, and safety techs prepare for what will likely be six hours of flying through smoke plume after smoke plume, the scientists ready their instruments to capture data from the notorious Shady Fire. 30 minutes into the flight and the team has already reached the fire. Here's where the work begins. These flights are rare opportunities for scientists, so not a moment is wasted. I think that studying fire and chemistry, it only comes together when you have a diverse team of scientists. As the sun starts to set, the plume is harder for the pilots to see. And around 10 p.m., the plane heads home after a successful flight. Smoke sinks lower to the ground at night and sometimes accumulates in valleys, which is exactly where Bruce and his team are waiting for it. We'll set out, drive up there, find a place to position the, the van, then uh, start cranking up instruments. It takes about a half an hour to an hour to get everything running and calibrated. It's a guaranteed bad night's sleep, but you know, you can tolerate a lot for a day or two. This team of five scientists will be up almost every half hour checking measurements, replacing filters, and at one point repositioning the van to capture emissions more effectively. It's a long cold night, but eventually it's dawn and time to head back to town. By 7.30, the forecasters have already been awake for at least two hours selecting which fires the science team should target that day, including a scheduled return to the Shady Fire. In about two hours, the plane will be bustling with scientists preparing their instruments for the day's flight. And the whole cycle will start all over again. feel like the work that I do, the knowledge that I'm trying to pull together is important for the human race, you know, for our country. This seems 
like an unlikely place for fires. In the winter, the landscape is still, but the warmer months can bring conditions that, combined with fire, can release dangerous amounts of carbon into the atmosphere, and in more ways than one. What happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic anymore. is a close NASA collaborator. He and his team are used to getting their hands dirty to collect crucial fire data. I'm wearing a hat right now from the Above Field Campaign, and what you see is a big A, and it stands for you know the trees tilting over with thawing permafrost. <laughs> Trees aren't the only thing getting warped by thawing permafrost. Buildings and even roads begin to buckle when the ground beneath them literally begins to liquefy. NASA's Above campaign is currently in the Northwest Territories to understand large-scale changes to permafrost. Permafrost is basically, you know, picture in your mind, frozen dirt. Now, if you thaw the permafrost out, it changes from solid like rock or concrete to mud. If you watched season one of NASA Explorers, then you know that permafrost stores huge amounts of carbon. As a matter of fact, twice as much as what's currently in the atmosphere today. Now, thankfully, permafrost thaws really slowly, and therefore releases carbon really slowly. But here's where it gets complicated. Fires in the high northern latitudes, permafrost regions are getting larger, they're getting more frequent, getting more intense. In the past, Permafrost has had a reliable layer of insulation, mostly moss. But if you have a fire, it burns off the vegetation. The insulation is essentially removed. To summarize, changing climate means more fires, more thawing, more carbon in the atmosphere, and that accelerates warming. Permafrost is one of those important factors that affects life on Earth, yet it isn't really in the public eye, unless you live on it. But for Kevin, understanding this phenomenon is the best way to make the biggest difference. So way back in the 80s when I was in college, my mom got cancer and was dying. And I remember the last time I saw her, we were sitting down and she was in bed very sick. And she asked me, what did I want to do? And until then, of course, I was a typical teenager in college, I had no clue. But then it crystallized in my mind that I wanted to save the planet, and that was the words that I used. And so I decided that my path for doing that was to go into spaceflight, you know, save the planet by leaving it, I suppose. But then, you know, circumstances changed, and then I started working on Earth observation. And it opened my eyes to what you can do with remote sensing and satellites, and what you can see and learn about the Earth from looking at it from space. And so I decided to go back to school, and you know, I rethought of what I talked to my mom about, and I decided to go back to school, and I become a scientist. The hours are long and the work is hard, but these explorers wouldn't have it any other way. This is really, you know, tough country. It's really rugged, uh, but it's also a very beautiful country. I think I can speak for nearly every scientist that I've worked with. They do this because they want to help. They want to provide the information and tools to, to solve problems. NASA is a big and capable organization, but Earth science is a, a subject far too big for one country, one agency to tackle all by itself. After nearly a decade of planning, this field campaign happened to be here just as an unusually dry season led to some of the most intense and large fires the region had experienced in the last five years. We came here to look at the transport of smoke and what the smoke does 
in the environment and particularly as it impacts clouds. And we had an amazingly intense smoke event that carried very high concentrations of smoke into a place called the Sulu Sea. You might be surprised to learn that fires affect cloud formation, and NASA is studying that dynamic relationship. NASA is a big and capable organization, but Earth science is a, a subject far too big for one country, one agency to tackle all by itself. And when you can't do it by yourself, you call up your colleagues halfway across the globe. Philippines to better understand how tiny particles from smoke and pollution affect cloud formation. The campaign is called the Cloud Aerosol and Monsoon Processes Philippines Experiment, Camp X. The two is silent. That's just a joke, but the acronym? That's serious. This project has implications for millions of people. Well, I'm the program scientist for Camp X, and while I'm here, I'm sort of the decision maker of last resort if, if something comes up. We caught up with Hal between meetings in the hangar. Along with Jeffrey Reed from the Naval Research Laboratory, he's responsible for overseeing this large collaborative effort in real time, making sure the team is meeting their scientific goals while also keeping researchers from institutions around the U.S. and the Philippines working together smoothly. A critical part of the process was the relationship built through time. That relationship enabled us to really work together and think about what would be the questions that would be relevant to us in the Philippines and in general to the region. I'm Gemma Teresa Narisma and I'm the Executive Director of the Manila Observatory. The Manila Observatory, along with NASA, the Naval Research Laboratory, and a handful of university partners are using two research planes and measurements from a ship to look at the properties of clouds to improve satellite measurements in the region. Satellites find it difficult to see on the northeast region, and regional climate models are having a hard time capturing these processes. That basically means planes, ships, and teams on the ground need to fill in the missing details. Which brings us back to the most intense fire season in five years. We were able to get the P3 into that smoke and make absolutely unique and important measurements. It's important because if we cannot get the historical observations in our model, then we're not so certain whether our climate projections are correct. When the planes aren't flying, the science teams and flight crews take turns visiting local schools, from elementary up through university. Elementary school students can understand remarkably complicated concepts. And so it's kind of fun to introduce, introduce them to things they may not have known or thought about before. And it's remarkable how quickly they pick up on it. At these schools, the scientists are treated like rock stars. We've had just an amazing response from the, from the Philippine students. Many autographs and more selfies than I can count. Some even said that they want to become meteorologists themselves to help carry on the study of our home planet and how it's changing. I feel hopeful. Uh, we're not getting any younger. And the number of atmospheric scientists in the Philippines, in the world, particularly in the Philippines, is quite small. And, and the kind of work that needs to be done to understand the different atmospheric processes in the region is quite a lot. We are so dependent on this Earth because we live here, we have to breathe here and find things to eat here. It's important that we understand it so that we don't inadvertently cause damage that could affect us all.
we're seeing is that areas that have been flammable are becoming more flammable, pushing those systems into either extreme conditions or a year-round fire season where fires are literally possible at any time. I think the choice to study fire generally is a bit of an occupational hazard. It's true. We're not necessarily looking at the verdant green parts of our planet. We're headed to the end of the road. We're looking at areas of rainforest that have been cleared and burned. Uh, we're capturing scorched landscapes. First in the American West, in the early part of summer, the start of the fire season. Then in high northern latitudes, Canada and Alaska. Then finally in the Philippines, as the summer became fall. In the past, you could count on the fire season eventually coming to an end. But we're now learning that that's not really the case anymore. What we're seeing is that areas that have been flammable are becoming more flammable pushing those systems into either extreme conditions or a year-round fire season where fires are literally possible at any time. We caught up with Dr. Doug Morton to find out the extent of the damage. Hotter and drier conditions, adding wind, you end up with fires that are moving faster and burning hotter than what we've seen before. Can we better understand, anticipate, and characterize the changes in our planet that come from those extreme fires? Actually, Yes, we can. Myself and my staff at the GIS Center uh, worked closely with colleagues at Goddard Space Flight Center to make this thing happen. This is Keith Weber, the wildfire rehabilitation expert that pioneered a new groundbreaking tool. The Rehabilitation Capability Convergence for Ecosystem Recovery includes a function that allows fire responders to triangulate their wildfire response. The tool can geolocate everything from burned areas to potential landslides to impacts on endangered species. But Recover really gained momentum after one fire in particular. I remember looking at our whiteboard that shows all the real high, um, high priority things we need to be doing. And that whiteboard was clear. And as I was walking out, I talked to some of my students and I said, I think the wildfire year is done. We got it wrapped up. Well, should have said that. Because the next day, one of our users in California, um, Wolsey fire started going. Um, it became much larger than I think they thought it would because of those big winds. And, it, you know, it, it really grew very rapidly. Well, at that point, we were working with that team on a daily basis, doing refreshes, as we call it, as the fire grew and grew and grew every day until we had that thing out. Keith's team is making a tangible difference by saving property, resources, and lives. Innovations like these represent a promising future. As we move from today's cutting-edge science into tomorrow's prediction, response, and understanding, the work we do today opens up an opportunity to do that so much better going forward. There are so many science topics that today are on the cutting edge of our understanding and what get me and my science colleagues motivated to go out into the field and keep working on these problems. Can we improve the way that we can forecast, for example, fire risk, not just for tomorrow, but for 10 days from now that might help managers, communities, prepare and respond to changing fire weather conditions. Like all of us, our NASA explorers and partners in exploration face the daily decision to either choose apathy or get to work. The future is uncertain, but we choose to meet the challenges of this new normal head on.
another power-packed spacewalk outside the space station, highlighting a pretty cool comet. And a key piece of Space Launch System hardware is on the move. A few of the stories to tell you about this week at NASA. Our Chris Cassidy and Bob Binkin were back outside the International Space Station on July 16th to outfit one of the station's power channels with new lithium-ion batteries and associated hardware. The spacewalk is one of the few remaining in a three-and-a-half-year effort to upgrade the station's power system. NASA photographer Bill Ingalls recently captured images of Comet Neowise in the early morning skies over Washington, D.C. The comet, which was discovered by and nicknamed after our Neowise spacecraft, has been visible at certain hours with the naked eye and has been spotted by several NASA spacecraft as well as astronauts aboard the space station. The fact that we can see it is really what makes it unique. It's quite rare for a comet to be bright enough that we can see it with the naked eye or even with just binoculars. Uh, the last time we had a comet that was this bright was Comet Hale Bob back in 1995 and 1996. Comet Neowise is expected to make its closest approach to Earth on July 22nd. On July 17th, teams at our Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, put the wheels in motion to transport the launch vehicle stage adapter for our Space Launch System rocket to our Kennedy Space Center in Florida in preparation for the first uncrewed Artemis mission around the moon and back. The adapter, which connects the upper and core stages of the rocket, is being transported aboard the agency's Pegasus barge. On July 16th, the joint European Space Agency NASA Solar Orbiter mission released the mission's first data, captured during the spacecraft's first close pass of the sun. On that flyby last month, Solar Orbiter captured the closest images ever taken of the sun and had all 10 of its instruments turned on together for the first time, including an American-led instrument designed to pinpoint coronal mass ejections. We are now targeting October 31st, 2021 for the launch of our James Webb Space Telescope from French Guiana due to impacts from the ongoing coronavirus pandemic as well as technical challenges. Engineers recently conducted the first full systems evaluation on Webb since the telescope was assembled into its final form. It's a critical software and electrical analysis on the entire observatory as a single fully connected vehicle. Webb is the largest and most technically complex space science telescope NASA has ever built. The Calypso satellite, a joint venture between NASA and the French space agency CNES, helped provide a unique view of the massive Saharan dust plume that crossed the North Atlantic Ocean in June into parts of the U.S. The animation includes data and imagery from Calypso, a space-based laser that measures clouds and small atmospheric particles, and from National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration satellites. That's what's up this week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, follow us on the web at nasa.gov slash twan. How do you make sense of something you can't see? This is the electromagnetic spectrum where light travels in waves. Without it, the world you know could not exist. The human eye can only see this very small part of the spectrum called visible light, but a whole new universe is revealed by looking through the infrared. Infrared light can't be seen, but it can be felt in the form of heat. Every object, whether hot or cold, gives off heat. Special thermal cameras use colors to show us if something is warm or cold. Some objects are hot enough to show visible light, and things that are too cold to be seen by the naked eye can let off in infrared, such as your body or this cup of coffee. IR light can be used in very practical ways. Longer IR waves can cook your dinner. Shorter IR waves that are used in your TV's remote control, and firemen use IR cameras to see through smoke to find people trapped in a fire. So how does this apply to a telescope? On top of showing us colder objects, infrared wavelengths can see through large amounts of gas and dust, lifting the veil to what lies on the other side. Spitzer sees objects like exoplanets or the Milky Way by looking at their infrared glow from the heat they give off. This gives us the ability to see what is beyond. And that's IR in a minute.
exploring the universe is a daunting task. There are often immense challenges that must be overcome before even setting out on a mission. The Ionospheric Connection Explorer, or ICON, has faced multiple barriers that have delayed its journey to study the frontier of space, the dynamic zone high in our atmosphere, where Earth's weather meets space weather. But before we can reap the benefits of its scientific research, ICON must launch successfully. The ICON team's can-do spirit will be repeatedly pushed to its limits while striving for a long-awaited and hard-earned T-0. A successful space launch requires flawless execution of a highly complex machine, and Pegasus ICON is no different. During previous attempts, we observed some anomalous readings. We worked through that with NASA and implemented corrective actions. This will ensure a highly successful mission. Perseverance is doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. It's a required virtue when the subject is spaceflight and the focus is a successful mission. Just like any rocket, you have your share of problems to you run into because this is rocket science after all. Issues arose, but dedication never wavered. The entire ICON team knew this was about more than just rocket science. It was about the payload, science that would benefit all of humanity. As with every NASA program, giving up is never an option. It has taken us months, hours, days to really um, resolve a lot of these issues with this integrated team. And thankfully, we were able to get through them, and here we are getting ready to launch. The ionosphere is not only the area through which radio communications and GPS signals travel, it's also the space where many critical satellites and spacecraft orbit, including the space station that houses our astronauts. But despite the importance of this region, it is not well known. That's why NASA and the University of California, Berkeley built ICON. The ionosphere itself, where ICON will be doing most of its work, is where the GPS signals travel through, it's where astronauts travel, and so it's very, very key for us to understand this region because it has profound effects on us here on Earth because of what space weather is doing to us, but it also gets profound effects of what our Earth weather is doing to the ionosphere. By studying how the ionosphere reacts to Earth's atmosphere, it will help scientists and meteorologists forecast the conditions in our space environment, reducing its negative effects on our technology. From 360 miles above Earth at a 27 degree inclination, ICON will sample ionospheric variations in the lower boundaries of space over the course of hours, days, seasons, and decades. Traveling at more than four miles per second, or about 30 times faster than a commercial airliner, this satellite will examine how the ionosphere reacts to our planet's weather. The ionosphere is highly variable, more variable than we ever expected. Now we think that the answer to understanding the conditions in the ionosphere and being able to predict those conditions relies on our ability to understand how weather below is forcing space weather above. So ICON's built to capture all the information that we think we need to understand the mechanisms and the process by which our lower atmosphere affects our upper atmosphere. ICON will be sent into orbit by a Northrop Grumman Pegasus XL air-launched rocket. The rocket has three solid propellant stages and can deploy satellites weighing up to 1,000 pounds into low Earth orbit. We selected the Pegasus XL launch vehicle. It provided an excellent combination of mission performance and flexibility for the mission design for a spacecraft of the mass of ICON. The launch of ICON will be anything but ordinary. It will be carried on the underbelly of Northrop Grumman's L-1011 Stargazer aircraft a launch pad far above the clouds in the sky. The one unique thing about Pegasus is that it's air launch. So the L-1011, which is the last flying plane of its kind, it is essentially our launch pad in the air. It's a mobile launch pad that flies up to about 40,000 feet, and that's where we launch the Pegasus from. With the tireless effort by the team to reach mission success, 
It is time for ICON to prepare for another launch attempt. There are no constraints on the For all involved, this is familiar territory, yet something feels different this time. It's taking a little extra time and extra care with the launch vehicle, but we're about there. Why I'm excited right now is that we're getting so close to launch, and it has taken a huge effort to get there. Vandenberg Air Force Base in California is bustling with activity. The excitement is palpable as ICON literally comes together. Pegasus stages 1, 2, and 3 are assembled. The aft, skirt, and fin installation are now complete. ICON's solar array illumination is tested. And finally, the spacecraft is mated to Pegasus. Once it's made into the rocket, there'll, there'll be a compatibility test between the rocket and the observatory. So the rocket will, have, will be the interface to communicate to ICON so we can command it. Once, uh, once we certify that, we will encapsulate it. Uh, we'll put it on a uh, transport platform, roll it out to the hot pad, and then integrate it to the L-1011. Now that processing and mating are complete, the ICON mission takes off from Vandenberg. Hours later, it arrives at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station Skid Strip in Florida. Important logistics must be coordinated with the 45th Space Wing prior to launch. Once in Florida, there is a week of processing and testing prior to launch day. Lieutenant Samantha Parr is in charge of making sure ICON launches into a safe environment. So I keep track of the weather, I keep track of our instrumentation, and I keep track of our surveillance, and I provide a recommendation to our launch decision authority, and he or she can make a determination on whether or not we're clear to launch. We are now at launch day. The team has been here before, and optimism is guarded. It's been a lot of work to get here. At this point, we kind of see the end, and uh, we're looking forward to a mission and putting the satellite uh, into orbit and seeing what that science does in the future. Anticipation builds to a fever pitch. All systems are now go for launch. actual time parameters for a launch of a, a Pegasus mission is much different than your standard uh, ground-based missile launch. That's tied to the fact that the Pegasus literally has a first stage by being on an airplane. The airplane's at 40,000 feet, it's moving close to 500 miles an hour. It's moving, you can't stop it, you can't slow it down, it is going and it's dynamic. The Stargazer jet takes off from the skid strip at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. L-1011 is airborne at this time. The L-1011 has now reached a cruising altitude of 40,000 feet and has begun flying in a racetrack pattern. We fly a pattern called the racetrack. It's an oval in the sky, and so the, the airplane takes off, flies through the launch point at a lower altitude as it's climbing to the point we're going to launch at, which is roughly 40,000 feet. We verify that all of our GPS are synchronized and ensure that we are going to put the launch vehicle in the correct heading so that we get the spacecraft into the correct orbit. LC Peg, go for fin pin retract. LPO, go for fin pin retract and fin sweep. LC, Senior Mifco, countdown L1011 is in the box. About 50 miles offshore of Daytona Beach, the Pegasus XL is released from the L1011. With the countdown, we hear drop on my mark. Three, two, two one, one, drop. drop. And we push a button in the cockpit. The hydraulic releases actually release the rocket. Pegasus away. The rocket drops for five seconds, the airplane climbs for five seconds, and at the end we have a fairly good safety margin. Five seconds later, the Pegasus rocket ignites. Stage one ignition has been confirmed. That's the minute that, that I consider T0 for me. Soon after Pegasus ignites, first stage booster burnout and separation occurs. Stage one separation confirmed. 
Stage two ignition has been confirmed and attitude is nominal. Followed by fairing separation and second stage separation. Fairing deployment has been confirmed. After third stage separation, the ICON satellite is deployed into its lower Earth orbit. Spacecraft separation is taken from launch vehicle. Thank you, old friend, for doing that, and uh, good luck, ICON. It is a monumental moment for the entire ICON team who banded together to overcome hurdle after hurdle. Powered by teamwork and unwavering dedication to its mission, ICON has overcome all obstacles in its path on the way to a successful T-Zero. Well, it's been quite a ride. It's been an incredible journey to get to this point and required the sacrifice of a very large team. We couldn't be more excited and honored to have launched the ICON spacecraft in orbit. Great job for the team. Congratulations, ICON. Status check to proceed with Trump on count. There is a moment at the start of every mission when everything comes together. A moment when years of preparation and planning are put to the test. Clear to proceed. There are no second chances. You have permission to Success or failure is just a heartbeat away. Range green. A spacecraft and its rocket on the pad, fully fueled and ready to launch. Status check. Go Delta. In that moment, a controlled explosion is released with such intense power, it can propel a spacecraft off the Earth and into space for the benefit of all. We call this moment T-Zero. This is its story. shed light on the mysteries of our closest star, the Sun. The Sun, the heart of our solar system, it's as familiar as anything we know. Although the sun has been studied for millennia, it still holds unsolved mysteries about its effects on our daily lives. To better understand the sun, NASA is preparing to launch a spacecraft called the Parker Solar Probe. It will lift off from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station near the agency's Kennedy Space Center, located in Florida. It's a mission of unprecedented opportunities that could revolutionize our understanding of our star and the sun's atmosphere, the corona, a longtime destination goal for scientists such as Dr. Nikki Fox. Going into the sun's corona for the first time, going up close and personal with our star to be able to answer some of the mysteries that live in this coronal region. Why is the sun's corona hotter than the surface of the sun? Why is there a solar wind? Why does this atmosphere, this corona, become so energized that it can move away from the sun at supersonic speeds and bathe all of the planets? And now that Parker has finally arrived on the space coast, we're one step closer to solving those mysteries. Delivered on an Air Force C-17, it's not every day this crew hauls a payload destined for the history books. Overall, the mission itself is relatively simple. I'd say the biggest challenge is probably the load portion. A little extra to it, too, because normally we're just hauling generic things, but not a $1.5 billion solar probe. And there's only one world-class program that specializes in missions of this caliber. NASA's Launch Services Program, a team that matches the industry's top-performing rockets with the cutting-edge spacecraft NASA is committed to launching. LSP is NASA's bridge to space. Basically, what we do is we link a spacecraft customer such as Parker Solar Probe up with a launch vehicle provider such as United Launch Alliance. And we provide them with a custom-built ride to space on a carefully selected launch vehicle. Engineers and scientists with Astrotech and the Applied Physics Lab teams will spend its last few months checking and testing every element and completing final assembly to be sure it is ready to leave Earth for its epic trip to the sun. Parker must be perfect before T-Zero arrives. Before we start integration with the launch vehicle, we have to do final integration of the spacecraft. That includes uh, attaching the magnetometer boom and magnetometers. We'll then also integrate the solar rays. And then finally, right before integration with the launch vehicle, we'll add the thermal protection system or thermal shield. The Parker Solar Pro will be the first mission to kiss the sun 
flying through the searing heat of the sun's corona, traveling closer to the surface than any other spacecraft before. And to do that, it will need to go faster than any other spacecraft in history. That's why, for the first time ever, NASA's Launch Services Program selected the United Launch Alliance Delta IV heavy rocket. Parker Solar Probe will be the fastest human-made object ever. We are traveling at an unbelievable 430,000 miles per hour. NASA selected Delta IV Heavy for the Parker Solar Probe mission because of the combined energy of the booster, Delta Quaranchine second stage, and the third stage, which means that uh, we have enough energy to go to the sun. I mean, if you look at the vehicle, it's huge. It's approximately 50 feet wide, 170 feet long, and about 190 thousand pounds. Going out and seeing the Delta IV Heavy on the pad is a truly awe-inspiring experience. Just seeing that amount of raw power right in front of you is just incredible. Three boosters, our second stage, and then we have a third stage. We're a tiny little spacecraft. We look like a little hood ornament on the top of the Delta IV. Throughout its seven-year mission, NASA's Parker Solar Probe will swoop through the sun's atmosphere, carrying more than scientific instruments on this historic journey to the center of our solar system. It will also hold a piece of humanity itself. Back in March 2018, the public was invited to submit their names. Over a million were loaded into a memory card and mounted on a plaque bearing a dedication to the mission's namesake. Dr. Eugene Parker was a heliophysicist ahead of his time. He proposed this mission back in 1958 after discovering the existence of the dangerous and unpredictable solar wind. The reason it has taken us 60 years to be able to fly this mission is not because we weren't interested. It really is because it has taken that long for technology to be developed to allow us to do this incredible mission. During the Parker Solar Probe's perilous dive into the sun's corona in the atmosphere, it will navigate dangers never before experienced by a NASA deep space mission, three million degree plasma, sporadic solar flares, and delayed communication with Earth. Traveling this close is only possible because of the spacecraft's protective heat shield, the single largest piece of hardware, and the most critical to mission success. One slight error in its performance could cause the probe to melt and the mission would be lost. Parker Solar Probe is actually going and touching the sun. When we actually get to our closest approach, the heat shield on Parker Solar Probe will be at about 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit on the front surface. The back surface is gonna be at about 600 degrees Fahrenheit, but then the spacecraft bus will just be operating at a normal room temperature almost. It's a little bit higher, about 85 degrees. The previous missions have been really important for solar science as we study from afar. And we can learn a lot from studying from afar. But the Parker Solar Probe is actually going and touching, almost kissing the sun, so we can learn so much more. The spacecraft is now ready for flight, but it can't get millions of miles to the sun unless it gets a boost from a specially made third stage by Northrop Grumman. The Northrop Grumman third stage team specifically designed and built uh, this third stage for the Parker Solar Probe mission. The Parker Solar Probe needs a third stage because even though the Delta IV Heavy is an incredibly powerful rocket, the third stage is what gets it the extra boost to get into its final orbit around Venus and to the Sun. Parker Solar Probe is the hardest trajectory that I've ever worked on uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, uh, we're flying on the Delta IV Heavy, which is the largest and most complex rocket that uh, Launch Services Program has ever been involved with. And in addition to that, we're flying a third stage that has its own guidance, navigation, and control system on board. So from a trajectory, GNNC standpoint, it's like flying two missions at once. Parker Solar Probe is what's called a heliocentric orbit, which means it's orbiting around the sun. And using a gravity assist, usually we use that to add energy to the spacecraft's orbit when we go out to places like Jupiter or Saturn or Pluto. In this case, we're going in the opposite direction. We're heading inside the orbit of Mercury. The uh, folks at Applied Physics Lab uh, have come up with a very unique trajectory where the spacecraft is going to use the uh, mass of Venus to slow themselves down. And not only are they doing that one time, they're actually going to do that seven times in a row 
uh, over a space of six years in order to get the spacecraft perihelion, because we're orbiting the sun, down below uh, 10 solar radii. So when we're in orbit around an object, whether it's the Earth or the sun, we go fastest when we're closest to that object and slowest when we get to the top of this orbit. And therefore, when we pass very close to the sun, which is the most massive object in our solar system, we are going approximately 430,000 miles per hour relative to the sun. This really is rocket science. During the early stages of launch, the Parker Solar Probe will be encapsulated in a large payload fairing. The Delta IV Heavy is a massive rocket designed to launch a school bus sized spacecraft. The last step at Astrotech is safely securing the 1,510 pound spacecraft in a fairing that, by comparison, makes the probe look small. To get to the sun, we actually need a lot of energy. Because of that, we need a very large ve launch vehicle. And in fact, we have the biggest launch vehicle we can get. And uh, because of that, this fairing that, that is associated with this launch vehicle is very large. But because we're a small spacecraft, we take up a very small amount of space uh, in, that spa in that fairing. And that's the reason why it looks like we're a very small spacecraft on a very large vehicle. But once that, the spacecraft is encapsulated, that's it. We no longer get to touch it. The encapsulated probe is now ready for a slow, steady ride to the launch pad at Cape Canaveral. It will be transported atop a K-Mag made for transporting special payloads. It can hold thousands of pounds, spin 360 degrees, and keep its payload level when traveling up inclines. Uh, one of the nice parts about the K-Mag that we have is it has very precise steering capabilities and it also has a lot of different steering capabilities. So it gives us a lot of capability to get into a precise location both for hoisting operations down in the hoistway um, as well as different mating operations in our horizontal integration facility. Now the ULA team will carefully lift the Parker Solar Pro safely nestled inside its payload fairing to mate it atop the massive Delta IV rocket. To keep the payload safe during the entire lifting operation, there's a special channel constructed in the tower itself known as the hoist way that allows the payload to be lifted without any influence from adverse weather or environmental conditions. The exciting part about today is it's when we finally get the customer out here, we get the spacecraft hoisted, and it's kind of, that's what it's all been about. A heavy mission by itself is always exciting, but then you add in the factor of having a NASA exploration mission, the mission to touch the sun. That, accompanied with the heavy, it's just an exciting launch for the public, a great exciting launch for ULA. It'll be a lot of fun to see, it'll be a lot of fun to track over the next several years as it gets into its final orbit around the sun. NASA's Launch Services Program has now brought together the payload and its ride to space. After taking different roads to the launch pad, finally the spacecraft and the vehicle are together. Goddard runs all of the Living with a Star missions and this is what's called a flagship mission. It's one of the most important things that our science does. So the anticipation of launch is just tremendous. We've, I've been working on this project for 10 years and now to see it actually ready to go is just a tremendous feeling. It's really hard to describe. Now, as T0 is just days away, it's up to ULA and LSB to make sure they're operating as one. In the hours before liftoff, the mobile service tower gantry rolls back, leaving the mighty Delta IV standing on its own, ready for launch. The final countdown to T0 is underway. As the NASA launch director, ultimately what I do is give the go or the no-go. That's a very simple statement, but there's a lot that goes behind that. But it's a culmination of a bunch of professionals that know their jobs, they know it well, and all I have to do is make sure all those pieces are in place. Then it's easy for me to make the decision to launch. Thousands of rockets have launched from Florida's Space Coast, but this is the first designed to fly to the sun. Big Delta IV heavy rocket is ready to roar to life with more than two million pounds of thrust to power the Parker Solar Probe on a trajectory of millions of miles to its destination. Receive a terminal count. First aid decision. Propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Go. Box. Go. Box director. You have permission to launch. Status check. Go Delta. Go PSP. Three, two, 
1-0. Liftoff of the mighty Delta IV heavy rocket with NASA's Parker Solar Probe. A daring mission to shed light on the mysteries of our closest star, the Sun. There are a few ways to think about the edge of the solar system. One is with the extent of the solar wind. This is the constant flow of charged particles gushing out of the sun at a million miles per hour and bathing the planets. The wind forms a giant protective bubble around our solar system known as the heliosphere. This huge region surfs through the Milky Way, shielding us from interstellar radiation and creating an environment that helps life on Earth to flourish. But its borders aren't fixed. Around 11 billion miles from Earth, far past the planets, solar wind pushes against interstellar space. Scientists have been monitoring this boundary over the past decade, and they're seeing it change with the sun's activity. Roughly every 11 years, the sun's magnetic field ramps up. This is known as the solar cycle, and at the peak, the sun's magnetic poles flip, north becomes south, and vice versa. This cycle causes the sun's activity to sway from calm to turbulent with an abundance of flares and eruptions, which in turn affects the solar wind. Changes from the sun can make the solar wind gust hard. When it does, the heliosphere expands like a balloon. Over the past solar cycle, scientists mapped what that looked like. To understand these maps, you need to know how we observe the edge of the solar system. Scientists use NASA's Interstellar Boundary Explorer, or IBEX, about the size of a bus tire and in the orbit around Earth. IBEX maps the heliosphere with a process similar to sonar, but instead of using sound to detect objects, it uses the echo of solar wind variations. For example, starting in 2014, there was a huge and prolonged increase in solar wind pressure. NASA spacecraft near Earth detected solar wind gusting 50% harder than previous years. After traveling outward for a year, solar wind hit the edge of the heliosphere. First, the termination shock, and then it entered the heliosheath that's encased by the heliopause. Solar wind particles spent another year or so in this region. Some collided with interstellar gases in the heliosheath and turned into energetic neutral atoms, or ENAs. ENAs travel in all directions, some even back toward Earth. And between 2017 and 2019, a few of the returning ENAs reached IBEX an echo of where the boundary is and what it looks like. If you cut the heliosphere and laid it out onto a flat surface, this is what you would see. This is the nose and this is the tail. The nose shows high ENA fluxes, which indicate a strong gust of wind and the heliosphere ballooning. From tracking this expansion, scientists found that the nose and tail were not symmetrical. If we compare the maps, ENAs from that big 2014 solar wind increase have returned from the nose, but they haven't returned from the tail yet, suggesting that the tail is much farther away from the sun than the nose. This indicates that the heliosphere looks more like a comet rather than a round bubble. Having a full solar cycle of observations of the heliosphere opens doors to understanding the only environment we so far know can support life. And there have been a few surprises. Beyond the heliosphere, near the nose, there was one region that took two years longer to respond to the 2014 increase of solar wind. Scientists think these ENAs bounced out of the heliopause and into interstellar space before heading back toward Earth. These are signs that we're still learning about the quirks of our heliosphere. But one thing's for sure, these characteristics could tell us about the key ingredients for life around a star.
Have you ever considered how big breakthroughs in science, engineering, and medicine occur? The popular misconception of how a breakthrough happens is perhaps a eureka moment while working on a project, and in that instant, the next big thing is born. Although that may happen sometimes, the truth is that most big breakthroughs are not eureka moments at all, but actually take years of painstaking work, trial and error, and rigorous testing before the finished product is ever realized. Researchers in the world of engineering and science almost always move in small, incremental steps slowly building the case for these new revelations until they are sure the research is ready to be shared with the world. Then, and only then, is when we in the general public hear about it. Although it may not be quite analogous, just think about the moon landing as an example of this phenomenon. Most of us are familiar with Neil Armstrong's famous words when he first stepped onto the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. For those watching it, that moment may forever be viewed as perhaps the most tremendous scientific and engineering breakthrough in the history of the world. Clearly, that event was enormously important for many reasons, but that first step on the moon was actually the culmination of millions of smaller incremental steps from tens of thousands of others that allowed it to take place. This basic idea is true for all scientific study. Researchers and engineers generally take an idea and meticulously study it to make sure that all bases are covered before new technology reaches the general public. NASA's environmentally responsible aviation project team members are following that same philosophy as well. This team has been working for years to find ways to reduce aircraft drag, aircraft weight, fuel consumption, engine emissions, and aircraft noise. In order to achieve these lofty goals, the team did, in fact, take incremental steps to make sure each project was viable. Now, toward the end of the ERA project, the team is ready to take the lessons learned from the smaller tests and begin putting all the pieces together, preparing to show the world the next big thing in aeronautics. NASA X has been at the forefront of the ERA program since its inception. This six-year endeavor has progressed from innovative ideas to multiple designs, wind tunnel tests, and actual flight hardware. And the aerospace industry has taken notice that these technologies are ready to dramatically improve aircraft efficiency. Part one of this episode of NASA X looks back at some of ERA's earlier tests to see how those early successes and failures paved the way to the larger, more advanced tests of today. And we will see what the future holds for many of the ideas and technologies that have been developed by some of NASA's best and brightest engineers and researchers. Responsible Aviation Project was first implemented, it was clear the stated goals would be hard to reach. The team was tasked to reduce aircraft drag by 8%, reduce aircraft weight by 10%, reduce fuel consumption by 15%, reduce emissions by 75%, and reduce overall aircraft noise by 75%, all by the year 2025. 
Compounding the difficulty of making such dramatic improvements was the fact that many in the aviation industry believed that the modern tube and wing-shaped aircraft had reached its maximum ceiling on efficiency. When NASA first undertook this challenge, they realized they would have to bring an A-team of NASA engineers from numerous NASA field centers, along with highly skilled teams from industry and academia, in an effort to find these new efficiencies. We've got new airframes, eight different technologies that we've worked in phase two, a myriad of 60-something technologies we worked in phase one and we looked at, and we will be delivering at the end of this year technologies that say we can meet all of those goals. So it is an unmitigated success, and every one of our partners in this is getting something out of it. Some of the major areas of study for the team included looking at engine redesigns, airframe redesigns, materials testing, and even developing new aircraft that integrate the wings into the aircraft body to increase efficiency. This unique design is called the HWB, or Hybrid Wing Body Aircraft. The HWB began its life as a series of computer models and then was upgraded to sophisticated wind tunnel models. Once the team was satisfied the HWB concept showed significant promise, it was upgraded to a flying scale model aircraft. 122 times the hybrid wing body models flew over the dry lake bed in California, where so many previous X-planes had flown before. And with each flight, the engineering data helped validate this unique type of aircraft design. Researchers feel confident that the strides they have made in this aircraft design will pay huge dividends in the future. Watching footage of early aircraft shows how far we've come in only a hundred years. As an example, most early planes were made out of wood and canvas, but as planes became more powerful and efficient, materials began to change. Today, we're aware that most planes are made out of lightweight aluminum skins, but the industry is moving toward the use of composite materials now as well. In fact, the Boeing 787 was the first all-composite airplane ever produced, and it took its first commercial flight on October 6, 2011. Although this plane is state-of-the-art, NASA's ERA planners believe that they can improve the strength of composites while making them safer as well. The idea they're investigating is called Perseus, or Poltruded Rod Stitch Efficient Unitized Structure. Early testing began with small pieces called coupons. They were developed to a point where researchers believed they could be tested on a larger scale. NASA's team built larger test sections and eventually brought them to this lab for stress testing. With this test, designed to bring the article to failure mode, the team applied pressure until the piece snapped. The data was used to further validate Perseus, and now the team has decided to build and break a nearly full-scale piece of Perseus material. NASA and Boeing have been working together for quite a few years developing lightweight structure for commercial transport aircraft. What we're seeing today is the final piece of a project called Damage Arresting Composites, where we're trying to develop a new structural concept that will be applicable to lightweight structures for commercial airplanes. And what you see here is a 30-foot long test article that we'll be testing at the NASA Langley Research Center uh, by applying the kinds of loading that it would feel if it were in a real airplane. But with a piece this large, a major hurdle lay in front of them. How to get the piece from California to Virginia for testing. Traditional methods like trucking and train travel would not work due to bridges, overpasses, and some road weight restrictions. The solution was to fly it across country, but no ordinary aircraft would do. Ultimately, the team enlisted the service of NASA Johnson's Super Guppy aircraft for transport across country. 
This Cold War era aircraft was specially designed with a hinged front loading system that could just barely accommodate NASA's cargo. It was not lost on team members that this old and slow beast of an aircraft was transporting a test article that will undoubtedly be used in many aircraft of the future. On a cold December night, the aircraft landed in Virginia for an early morning offload. Here is Dr. Faye Collier to explain what is next for this test. Today we're uh, uh, here at, at Langley Field unloading the um, uh, Perseus multi-bay Colts, multi-bay box uh, that will be tested in the Colts facility. So we've been working on uh, Perseus for about 10 years now, uh, partnered with the Air Force, partnered with, uh, with Boeing, uh, R&T. And uh, we started off with, with small coupon testing uh, to prove out the concept. We built uh, a small uh, box that we tested uh, a couple, three years ago to prove that the concept could take pressure and uh, would meet the design constraints. We went from there to uh, assembling this piece of 30-foot structure that we're going to test in the Langley Combined Loads Test System down the street here. So. Uh, a long effort that has gone into this uh, with, with NASA and Boeing, uh, culminating in the delivery of this 10,000 pound piece of aircraft structure. We'll stick it into the uh, facility, we'll, we'll mount it, it'll, it'll be uh, eventually pressurized uh, to various uh, pressure readings. Uh, the, the idea is to you know, twist and turn the part and to, to see if it'll sustain the design loads that would be needed if we were to build a, a real airplane out of this. This facility will prove to be a valuable tool for researchers. These types of tests will help in investigating damage tolerance and any repair techniques that may be applicable. One of the key test points that will be addressed in this round of testing will see how Perseus handles routine damage that might be expected, such as a technician dropping a hammer. Researchers need to understand how this new material will react if minor damage occurs. To do this, a unique test rig has been designed by hand. Here is Andrew Lovejoy to explain. So some of the things that could impact the plane are uh, rocks or debris that's on the runway when it's taking off or landing. Um, as I said, you could have uh, mechanics that could uh, hit it with a tool or a uh, vehicle driving by could, could hit it. And, and all of those types of things can cause damage. And on the exterior, you're more likely to have a higher energy because a vehicle hitting it or something being thrown up by the tire is going to be much higher velocity than, say, a tool drop. So barely visible impact, if you're doing walk-around inspection, it's a damage that you would barely be able to see. So if you're at that level, the aircraft has to be able to sustain the loads that it would normally see, even with that damage uh, in place. So you have to be able to analyze and then test to make sure that you can hold those loads. So what you have to do is uh, an impact test. So we're doing an impact test, um, and if you're going to impact at the top on something, you would just have a, a free-falling, you could have a free-falling weight that would come down and hit. And that's fairly straightforward because you have a mass and you have a height, so you can uh, have a straightforward calculation of the energy. If you wanted to hit on the side, we have spring-loaded. But for the multi-bay box, one of the things we're doing is hitting on the keel, which is the bottom. So we have to have an impact that's going upwards. Um, there's very limited space in Colts. Um, you can have an air-driven projectile. Uh, you can have a spring-loaded, but those, to me, are less controllable. So instead, came up with the uh, roller coaster impactor. So it's really a controlled drop. It comes down the track, and then it'll go up, and when it hits, it's going in a vertical direction. So in order to impact on the keel, we needed the impact weight to go up, and we didn't have any device to be able to do that. So from scratch, we designed and, and built the uh, roller coaster impact. The second main part is the track itself. The track itself is to control it and, and make it go where we want it to go. When it was rolling down, gravity is keeping it on the track. When it starts to go vertical, it wants to flop. So there's actually two pieces of track 
that will encapsulate this right before impact to guarantee that we're getting that vertical impact on the bottom of the keel. Numerous tests were performed in the Colts facility to check the box's ability to meet what engineers call the design limit load and the design ultimate load. In aerospace engineering, the term design limit load refers to the maximum load factor authorized in flight. It is extremely unlikely that an aircraft will ever reach this limit during its lifetime. The design ultimate load goes beyond that and is the amount of load applied which will make the component fail. In this case, the ultimate load factor is 1.5 times more than the limit load. With testing and data acquisition complete, researchers found the Perseus box performed beautifully under extremely stressful conditions. It actually performed above the expected design ultimate load factor, which means the box is even stronger than predicted. With that type of result, researchers feel there is an opportunity to lighten the box even more, potentially making future aircraft even more efficient. Although this stage of the testing is complete, the team has reams of data to look over and will continue working to make the aircraft of tomorrow stronger and more efficient than ever. has been around since the early 1900s. Currently, this design is state-of-the-art and almost magical in its operation, extending and retracting during takeoff and landing. But hinged flaps have drawbacks, such as high noise levels, and their design affects the flow over the wing, making them less efficient. NASA is currently working on improving specific aspects of wing design and has partnered with a small company out of Ann Arbor, Michigan called Flexus to combat these problems. Their innovative design has the potential to revolutionize flight by having the wings on aircraft act more like a bird's wing rather than the traditional flap system we have now. Here is Dr. Sridhar Koda, the inventor of the Flexus wing, to explain. So with the current flaps, when they're tucked in, you don't want to move those flaps because the flow will separate. So the aerospace community has known for a long time that if you have a seamless wing that can be morphed in flight uh, to maximize the performance, then you, you can get significant fuel efficiency. And uh, actually Wright Brothers did that for, for, uh, for, you know, for roll control. The idea to have aircraft wings morph is not a new idea. In fact, the Wright brothers' first designs used morphing wings to help with controlling flight. But as aircraft became heavier and began using stronger materials, aircraft designers were forced to stop using the morphing wing technique and use flaps and slats, which have been in use ever since. Designers have long known that reducing the use of flaps and going back to a morphing wing would be more efficient. But until now, no one was quite sure how to make it happen. While looking at this problem in the early 90s, Dr. Koda came up with an idea called compliant design that uses techniques that are borrowed more from nature than from traditional mechanical designs. Everything we engineer, if you look at our, look around the objects around you, anything that is strong is also very rigid. And when you have, when you want mechanical functionality in the design, you put multiple parts, springs, cams, gears, and make intricate mechanism that works beautifully. Whereas designs in nature are different. They are strong, but they are compliant. They are flexible. So you can see the trees bending in heavy winds, so they bend rather than break. And you can see countless uh, examples in nature where you get pretty intricate uh, mechanical motion without conventional joints. And in fact, 80% of uh, living creatures are invertebrates, and they do pretty well uh, with the locomotion and other mechanical uh, functionality without multiple joints and links. So the question is, how do we capture that where we want a monolithic structure that can that can do mechanical motions with our joints. So the idea is that how do we get this compliance, the flexibility distributed throughout the structure 
and how do you design structures like that? So I'll give you a simple example of how what I call the distributed compliance. And uh, you can see this here. So here, this is a can be a monolithic design, no joints. And when I apply force at these tabs, and you can see it moves, so you can get large deformation. But the way it's designed is you have very small stress in the structure, which means every section of the material shares the functionality, you know, shares the load, so the stresses are evenly distributed. That's how we have very small stress, very small strain. It works in a linear elastic strain region, so you get large deformation, and which means you can do this multiple times. You can do this millions of cycles and still not fail. Although the exact technique is still a trade secret, the Flexus team's design uses a proprietary algorithm in a way that minimizes the force it takes to morph the wing to a prescribed shape. This technique also has inherent mechanical advantages in that it is very stiff to external loads. Simply put, the design is incredibly strong, but does not need huge motors to morph the wing. To test this concept further, NASA's ERA team decided to place a Flexus wing on board an aircraft to test in flight. The team removed the traditional flaps from a Gulfstream aircraft and replaced them with a Flexus wing for the initial testing. Tom Rigney of NASA Armstrong explains. The reason it's important is because one of the contributors of noise, one of the largest contributors of noise for an aircraft, when it comes down to approach for landing or for takeoff, uh, there's a lot of noise that's generated by the spaces, gaps from existing uh, flaps that aren't in aircraft. And so what this does is it reduces that noise by eliminating those gaps and they have a smooth, continuous surface rather than having gaps. And it can reduce sound within up to four to six decibels, which is significant. This technology is, is really helping aviation, the, the whole aviation industry. It's just something similar to what we had with winglets. So winglets came on aircraft and made them much lighter and more, more efficient and more effective. And this is similar to winglets. We're going to be able to take an airplane and have wings act more like a bird. Instead of having just these boards that come down and all locked in place, we're going to actually have morphing and shaping wings just like a, a bird would do. And that makes the aircraft more effective in terms of flying, in terms of efficiency, fuel savings, and it's, it's, it's going to save hundreds of millions of dollars for the public for flying. It's also going to make planes lighter weight, which allow more for more luggage and other things to go on board. And it's more of a green type of technology, less carbon in the air for, for the world to have to, to deal with later. So this is going to be really helping out the environment as well as saving money. So that's, it's a really a great technology. The first tests of this design were very successful and met all of the stringent stretch goals that engineers set out to meet. This design shows tremendous promise, and future testing should continue to further validate the time and effort that the ERA team put into this technology. NASA, in cooperation with industry partners, is truly transforming the concept of how we fly. 2025 is right around the corner, and before you know it, many of the concepts the ERA team has studied will undoubtedly be used to make flying safer for all of us.
Three, two, one. Well, I've been lucky enough to spend uh, exactly one leap year on the space station, 366 days. So you can imagine that in 366 days you get to see the Earth quite a bit. Even though we are so busy on the space station, we do manage, we do try to look outside and glimpse what's flying below us at any chance we get. was a part of me, the, the dreamer, the, the, the little kid that started dreaming about this whole experience uh, and now, basically 40 years ago, that part of me was still there, unchanged for 30 or 40 years and just marveling incredulously at the beauty of it all. And I would see clouds and green and rivers and it would just completely fill my eyes. The difference in observing the world or the universe from inside the space station, looking through the windows or being outside is what I describe as the same level of interaction that you can have looking at a beautiful aquarium from the safety of a room. When you're outside and all you have is a helmet and maybe one and a half inch of plexiglass in front of your eyes. You can see details and colors and shades, the level of detail that you can capture and the way you experience that universe is going to be very, very different. You want and you feel that you have become part of it and you can develop that sense of belonging. I think that the first impact of, of the first flight was that I did, I did see and I did sense how fragile, how, how small the Earth is. We, we are used to think of the Earth as something so vast and big and we don't, we don't think that what we do, our, our daily life, can affect some, such a vast system. But from space, you get a sense that every, every individual, every living organism is somehow connected. Seeing the city lights at night where a place like Europe or the United States or Asia densely populated, everything is so interconnected and all those lights and all those lights are apparent. They, they are right in front of you all together and you think that you know, all, all we are doing somehow as, a, as an effect on everybody else. You come back from, a, from an experience like that thinking that that's what, what's happening and then you can see the effects, both the positive ones but mostly the negative ones, in a second flight and I think you, you have to acknowledge and grow an awareness and with that awareness comes the desire to, to share, share the experience and, and share that awareness it's understanding that uh, the science that's telling us how we are changing and influencing the world has solid mathematical and, and solid mathematical base. And then you see the effects of it and you just interiorize it. You make it your own experience. And I think that that's what happened. Is that, that's why astronauts um, develop that awareness of and the desire to help the environment somehow, in any way they can.
closeout crew is not special. There's thousands of people out here that have thousands of jobs. You know, and each one's equally important. The only unique thing about us is we have the last hands-on job before the bird flies. The closeout crew is the last to shake the gloved hands of space shuttle astronauts before they rock into orbit from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We close the vehicle out for flight, which means we take out anything that doesn't fly, we put in what needs to fly, uh, we put the astronauts in, strap them in, and we close the hatch for flight. The team is made up of NASA and United Space Alliance workers from Kennedy and the Johnson Space Center in Houston. The Orbiter Closeout Crew Chief coordinates launch day activities and communicates with the fire room via radio. He goes by the call sign OVCC. Two technicians are experts at the shuttle crew module side hatch and two insertion technicians specialize in helping the astronauts strap into their seats. An additional astronaut joins the closeout crew as the prime astronaut support person with a call sign ASP. A NASA quality representative rounds out the team. We've got three tents and three tents. Twenty people are certified to work with the closeout crew, but only a few serve at a time. So on launch day, we all come together to make one team. There's only seven people out of that 20 that would support a launch, come up here as a prime team. It all happens at the 195-foot level of the shuttle launch pad, where the orbiter access arm leads to the climate-controlled white room. The closeout crew reports to the launch pad shortly after the shuttle's external fuel tank is filled with propellant several hours before launch. The team sets up its own rescue gear and takes care of some pre-boarding housekeeping duties. Then the astronauts arrive, and suddenly the white room gets a whole lot more crowded. Okay, once the crew gets here, naturally I can't put all seven people in there, six or seven in the ship at one time. The countdown allows 50 minutes to get everyone strapped in with their gloves and helmets on. The astronauts need help putting on their parachute harness and communications gear before climbing aboard. After a round of communications checks, anything not needed for flight has to come out, including the closeout crew. All right. Got to go to close the hatch. So we go and close the hatch, pressurize the cabin, do some last minute things. It takes us roughly an hour after we close the hatch to get out of here. But before they go, the white room must be partially taken apart so it can swing back into position beside the shuttle if there's an emergency, even if the astronauts have already opened the hatch. You can see these billows behind me. We deflate those and this white room has hinges, and so we would swing one door out, swing this piece, comes this way. So there's a big gaping hole right here. When everything is cleaned up and strapped down, it's time for the closeout crew to leave the astronauts alone at the launch pad. They've got it down to a science, but with so many tasks involving so many pieces of shuttle and ground hardware, things don't always go according to plan from burned out light bulbs on cockpit switches to problems with the hatch, the closeout crew has seen it all and had to fix it fast. So they bring two boxes of tools to the white room with even more in their truck down by the elevator. You know, you can't always think of everything, but these guys are very good at improvising. When the shuttle is fully loaded and ready to fly, everyone in or near the vehicle is working in a hazardous area. The closeout crew and the astronauts practice escaping the launch pad in case there's ever an emergency. Everyone has to learn how to move from the white room to the slide wire baskets that would whisk them away from the pad down to a nearby bunker. In an emergency, a series of overhead sprinklers called the Firex system would activate and lights would come on, showing everyone on the 195-foot level the way out. So we have this painted yellow with black chevrons. We call it the yellow brick road that's because you basically can't see anything but your feet, so you follow the chevrons out to your primary egress route to the slide wire baskets. One of the benefits to being part of the closeout crew is working closely with the astronauts. It's a unique gift, I think, that uh, we get to know them personally. 
get to shake their hand right before they go in. Some of the astronauts that are on the closeout crew uh, actually fly. So, you know, one time supporting a mission, they'll be wearing a white uniform with us, and the next time they'll be wearing an orange uniform getting ready to fly themselves. As the program draws to a close, many space shuttle team members are making the most of the final flights. And that, of course, includes the closeout crew. And I'll probably just stand over there in the corner and soak it in, try and remember as much as I can, and hope that another program comes along and I get to do this again. Even astronauts need a place to stay before they rocket into space. The crews of the space shuttle launching from Kennedy Space Center in Florida, that place was the astronaut crew quarters, a set of bedrooms, offices, and facilities built into the center's operations and checkout building. Resembling a college dorm, the crew quarters doesn't scream technology in space as much as it whispers comfort and familiarity. And that's the idea. Give the astronauts a place to relax, eat, and sleep before they go to work in space on missions that will mark some of the most taxing times in their lives. My first impression when I arrived was, wow, I'm in astronaut crew quarters. I mean, you walk in, it was before it had been remodeled uh, on my first flight, and these are the rooms that the Apollo astronauts stayed in. There's nothing fancy about it, you know, it's not going to the Ritz-Carlton, it, it wasn't even a, you know, a Motel 6, it, but it was astronaut crew quarters, and that was, uh, that was really special. Jim and the astronauts were the first to stay in the crew quarters. All the Apollo astronauts slept here before going to the moon. The facility grew when the space shuttles began taking more and more people into space at a time. The aura of crew quarters grew with each landing and each new spaceflight achievement, even among the astronauts. A couple of the rooms were seen publicly on launch day, but most of it remained a mystery until the shuttle's retirement. Kennedy Space Center director Bob Cabana, a former astronaut who spent many nights in crew quarters preparing for his missions or helping others get ready for theirs, showed off some of the lesser known areas of the facility along with the spots that are familiar to space program enthusiasts. The, uh, the dining room, what you guys probably remember seeing all the time is, you know, the crew sitting at the table and they're all smiling and everybody's you know up and ready for launch and they're in their crew shirts and uh, you know they take general shots at everybody and then they move off and then the crew actually sits down and, and eats. The cooks at crew quarters have to accommodate a range of tastes keeping in mind that astronauts are often concerned about how their stomachs will behave once they get into weightlessness. Uh, I'll never forget my first flight we're sitting around the table and uh, one of my crew members who uh, is it's his first flight and after the cameras all left he's got steak and eggs and hash browns and coffee and he's pouring hot sauce on and uh, my commander looks over and says ah going for color and distance i see like the rest of the facilities and crew quarters the bedrooms are not extravagant but they work it's a very small room you got a desk a bed and a, and a shower and a uh, toilet in the uh, in the bathroom very sparse, uh, but uh, very functional. It's very quiet uh, It's an elevated uh, floor back here with sound insulation underneath sound insulation up above and so crews that are on weird schedules Can actually come in here and uh, and get some sleep But a quiet room doesn't always do the trick when a launch is waiting the next day It's not anxious. It's just you want to get often do it. In fact, one of the hardest things, some folks really like coming down to crew quarters and, and just relaxing a little bit before they fly. And I came down and it was like, ah, I want to launch. We're, we're here. Let's launch tomorrow. You know, but you're, you can't do that right away. A new conference room was built to accommodate the larger crews of the shuttle and International Space Station, including foreign crew members. This is where they go over all the flight data file, uh, get any changes, updates. They get the weather brief on the screens here. Uh, it's a place to come and relax. We have simulators that uh, simulate uh, robotic arm operations for both the uh, shuttle and station, as well as a simulator that ex lets you actually uh, land the, uh, the space shuttle. And it, it's a pretty good simulation. Space is a lousy place to get sick. So specially trained doctors and nurses along with exam rooms are on hand to make sure everyone stays well before heading into orbit.
pre and post launch, uh, there are examinations that have to be done. You got to see the dock. You know, if anybody got sick while they were in crew quarters, they go see the flight dock uh, and just make sure it's those last minute checks that everything's okay. And it's just a uh, their standard small exam rooms and a, a private place to meet with the doctor when you're here. A staff is on hand to take care of all the aspects of an astronaut crew's day, from housekeeping to scheduling. The people down here are family. Uh, they really get to know you. The folks that run crew quarters, that keep it clean, that cook for you. Uh, I mean, there are friends that I've made for life and have bonded with for my time down here. As much as the crew quarters is set up to mirror everyday life, there are rooms that are meant solely for the unique demands of going into space. All right, and of course you guys have seen this on, uh, on TV hundreds of times. This is the uh, suit room where the crew gets suited up to uh, actually go fly in space. Uh, you're tight with the, uh, the suit techs that are working with you, and it's that last, you know, hey, we're getting ready to go fly in space. This is really, uh, it's a big deal. It's kind of neat. There's also a launch day tradition that plays out in this room. Probably the, the biggest tradition is the uh, game of Fargo Possum. And Fargo Possum is low-handed poker. And the rule is you can't leave crew quarters and, uh, and go to launch until the commander wins the hand, has the lowest hand, and that sometimes takes a while. <laughs> All right, we're going to fly! <laughs> now suited for space and following several days at crew quarters, the astronauts get to take a walk through the corridor to the elevator that will take them to the waiting astrovan and out to the launch pad. Cabana served as the Flight Operations Director during a number of shuttle missions, watching over the astronauts as they prepared to head into orbit. His advice to flyers was pretty simple. Let it sink in. Mostly what I tell first-time flyers is, uh, when you get ready uh, and you're up in space and you have a free minute, uh, make a memory. Stick your nose up to a window and make a memory because uh, the eyes God gave you are so much better than any camera. And when you look at a camera picture when you get home, you're disappointed. It's just not as vibrant, it's not as real as it is when you just look out the window and make a memory. The space shuttle could get all the way to space on its own power whenever it launched from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. But when a shuttle orbiter travels from one place to another here on Earth, it needs a lift, a piggyback ride or ferry flight aboard the shuttle carrier aircraft. It's an unusual sight, a low-flying jumbo jet with a spaceship bolted onto its back. And it's uh, really amazing to see, first the orbiter in person, it's almost surreal. The shuttle carrier aircraft is actually a Boeing 747, modified to handle the weight and drag of the shuttle orbiter on its back. It's been supporting the space shuttle program ever since the approach and landing test during the late 1970s. In 1990, NASA added an additional modified 747 to its SCA fleet to make a total of two aircraft available for ferry flights. The shuttles began all their space careers with ferry flights when they were first delivered to Kennedy from the manufacturing plant in Palmdale, California. But most of the time, a ferry flight was needed to bring a shuttle back from Edwards Air Force Base in California, following a landing on the west coast due to poor weather in Florida. So, they built the 747, they built a very nice airplane, and it, it does what you want when you fly it. The only thing that's different is when you're carrying the orbiter, there is a noticeable vibration, and of course the speeds are quite a bit higher, but as far as the feel in the aircraft and the ease with which the aircraft flies, it is deceptively easy. After an end of mission landing at Edwards, it took the landing team about a week, weather permitting, to prepare it for its upcoming cross-country trip. Tail cone was installed to reduce aerodynamic drag and turbulence during the ferry flight. The spacecraft was lifted inside a large gantry-like device called the mate-demate device. The aircraft rolled underneath and the orbiter was lowered and bolted into place. The team simply reversed the process to remove the shuttle from the plane. Sometimes just getting the shuttle and aircraft ready for the trip could be a test in itself. 
NASA Flow Director Stephanie Stilson recalls the challenges the ferry flight team encountered in 2005 after Space Shuttle Discovery landed at Edwards at the end of the return to flight mission STS-114. And everybody thinks the desert, dry, no issues, no rain. Well, we had snow in the mountains, we had rain, we had lightning that actually struck the mate demate device, and we had locusts. So it was like everything that could possibly happen outside of our control happened. But once again, that just gave us a chance to show how we can react to changes and, and things that we're not expecting. But the toughest part of a ferry flight is keeping the shuttle safe from harmful weather or other conditions during flight. So, a Pathfinder aircraft flies 100 miles ahead of the attached pair, making sure the flight path is safe and dry. You don't want to bring it through any turbulence, no visible moisture, there's some temperature limitations, and essentially we're the, uh, the plane to make sure we don't bring the orbiter through there. So our job is to be very vigilant of uh, any changing weather conditions, and to make sure that the orbiter is uh, brought on a safe flight path. There were 87 ferry flights throughout the space shuttle program, including flights for testing, delivery, orbiter upgrades, and of course, end of mission landings. Today, the shuttles are being prepared at Kennedy to go on public display at sites across the country. Atlantis won't need an aircraft to move to its new home at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. But Discovery, Endeavor, and the Test Orbiter Enterprise will each take one last ride. Discovery will be flown to Dulles International Airport in Virginia and then moved to the nearby Smithsonian udvar Hazy Center. It will take the place of Enterprise, which will be flown from there to John F. Kennedy International Airport, then on to the Intrepid Air, Sea, and Space Museum in New York City. Endeavor will be flown to Los Angeles International Airport before making its way to the California Science Center in Los Angeles. The bulky combination of orbiter and aircraft is unmistakable and usually attracts attention from onlookers on the ground as it makes its way across the sky. NASA plans to keep one of the modified 747s for its Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy or SOFIA science program. But as the shuttles make their final ferry flights, space fans along the way may be able to catch a glimpse of the duo making one more pass overhead. Uh, and so that's a, a great thing to be able to do that. And then if we have any stops along the way, it's a chance for us to, to share the orbiter with the public in that area that most likely has never even seen a space shuttle that close. It takes hundreds of controllers to orchestrate a space shuttle launch. Their office on launch day is one of the most unique workplaces in the world, a firing room at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The firing room serves as the nerve center on launch day. AC safety, mission assurance. Okay, safety, mission assurance. Go, Mike. Thank you, Mark. Behind consoles, wearing headsets and checking off countdown milestones in thick binders, launch specialists monitor the space shuttle as it stands at the launch pad three miles away. From the firing room, they also send commands to the spacecraft, talk to the astronauts, and communicate with dozens of other teams, from rescuers near the launch pad to mission controllers in Houston. A successful countdown and launch requires the team to complete more than 1,600 steps in order. The checklist is contained in part of the eight-volume set of shuttle launch documentation. Covering almost 8,000 pages, the books also contain contingency plans for handling launch scrubs or emergencies. Range weather. Weather is green on all constraints. Winds are from 335 degrees, 18, 18, 25. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Keeping track of the countdown as a whole are the shuttle launch director and the NASA test directors, or NTDs. They sit in the front of the fire room at consoles on risers. The orbiter test conductors share the second row with the NTDs. In the back of the firing room, facing the two-story window looking out of the pads, are a series of horseshoe-shaped cabinets. System specialists sit there. They have a deep knowledge of the inner workings of the space shuttle. When a problem crops up, they are the ones who would bring it to the attention of the people in the front of the room. The specialists also would be called on to come up with solutions to allow a safe liftoff and present them to the launch team. 
NASA built space for four firing rooms on the upper floors of the Launch Control Center at Kennedy during the Apollo program. Each one is dominated by the angled panes of glass that let controllers inside see the spacecraft on the pad and during the first minutes of ascent. When the first space shuttle mission launched on April 12, 1981, controllers in firing room one had the primary responsibility for the liftoff. The firing room recently was renamed the Young Crippen Firing Room for that first crew. Firing rooms two and three also were equipped and staffed. Shuttle launches require two active firing rooms, one as the primary and one with senior engineering and management personnel teams. A third firing room is capable of stepping in. Firing room four, which had been a conference room during much of the shuttle program, was remodeled and opened in 2005 to give the launch team more room and modern computers. The computers are used to constantly monitor the shuttle's myriad of systems. Simply put, they can pick up minute changes in a system status before a human could detect it. Late in the launch countdown, the computers run the countdown completely through a set of software called the Ground Launch Sequencer. We're ready to go. Thank you very much, Scorch. Appreciate that. NTD, with that, you are clear to launch Atlanta. Copy. Clear to launch. The launch control team can intervene to hold a countdown if they see something they don't like. But otherwise, it's the software that retracts the orbiter access arm, the gaseous oxygen vent hood, and commands the space shuttle's three main engines to ignite. Roger, roll. Beautiful sight. Cape Cod, Massachusetts is known for its beautiful beaches. This scenic landscape is also home to one of the most frequent marine mammal stranding sites in the world. Scientists know very little about what causes these animals to strand. What has been proven is that a quick and efficient response in these moments is a matter of life and death. If we can get there quickly and provide supportive care, they have a much better prognosis in terms of survival. Katie Moore works on the front lines as the Deputy Vice President of Conservation and Animal Welfare at the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Through Katie's fine-tuned rescue efforts, she has increased the survival rate from 14 to 75 percent. But the question remains, could it be possible to predict rather than react to these events. If we can develop an algorithm that pieces together the different variables that may be causing mass strandings or driving mass strandings, then we have the ability to then prevent them. We can have teams that are out on the shore looking for animals in those hot spots, knowing that all those variables have come together and this is the likely point in time where we're likely to see it. But we can also have teams ready to respond so that if they do strand, we're there that much faster and more animals will survive the event. In Cape Cod, the annual number of stranded animals ranges from less than 10 to over 200. Some of the most affected species include pilot whales and white-sided dolphins, creatures that are typically found in deeper water rather than along the coast. The ongoing search for answers began 400 miles away at the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management in Sterling, Virginia. There, fellow marine biologist Desiree Reeb had some initial thoughts on triggers for these events. For the large proportion of these strandings, the animals are across the ages, um, in pretty good health, and there's no really immediate evidence as to why they actually strand. Geomagnetic perception, or the ability to navigate using Earth's magnetic field, is a feature thought to exist in marine mammals. Could changes in the magnetic field confuse the animals? All the way down to the sea floor, sensors like magnetometers can detect changes in Earth's magnetic field called geomagnetic pulses, or storms. One cause of such changes is activity from the sun, known as space weather. Geomagnetic 
perception is one of the theories. And I thought, well, hmm, if a magnetometer can pick it up, maybe the animals actually can pick it up. Dr. Reeb brought her hypothesis to Antti Polkinen, research astrophysicist from the Heliophysics Department at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. The coolest thing was that we realized that nobody had really taken a cold, hard data science analysis look at the problems. By combining Katie's records on marine mammal strandings in Cape Cod and Auntie's records of the changes in Earth's magnetic field, the team of researchers had a starting point. What we were trying to look at here was if there was a potential driver or, or relationship or correlation between the occurrence of mass strandings and any solar activity. The data that we have correlated or analyzed so far is information about the local geomagnetic conditions. We have long data records from geophysical observatories of the local geomagnetic field variations and marine mammal strandings. When the team analyzed all the data, they found that measurements from the same time period, or random time periods, produced similar results, meaning that there is no obvious relationship between geomagnetic changes and strandings in Cape Cod. If space weather wasn't the trigger, what could be? The, the easy fix correlation between a geomagnetic pulse and, oh, a stranding, doesn't seem to be very evident, but what it does show is that there are multiple variables involved in this equation, and that the geomagnetic storms could just be one very small part of it, significant still, but it looks like there are multiple oceanographic and environmental elements. The scientists considered what other variables may exist in the air or water that could change animal behavior. Tides or winds could be disruptive, Ocean color, measurements of the water's chemical and particle content, could reflect changes in the food chain. Perhaps sea surface temperature was a factor too. With the help of data from NASA Earth Science missions, they could also explore these possibilities. Me personally, it's been simply you know, driving also an additional motivation in doing something about this. With more data on hand, it was time to expand the team. They recruited statisticians and the expertise of NASA Earth Science data analyst and oceanographer, Erdem Karakulu. A data set, no matter, no matter its shape or, or content, always has a story to tell. Trying to figure out um, how different data are connected, I think, require a, a, a wide diversity of skills and, and uh, background knowledge. For example, I'll be explaining how a mass stranding occurs and how we respond to try and understand why I'm presenting the data in a certain way. And my colleagues from NASA will, will look at me and ask questions that I wouldn't think to ask because I take for granted my understanding. And they're coming at it from a totally new angle with no background. The group hopes to combine these data sets in a way that reveals a pattern, allowing them to predict the likelihood and location of mass strandings before they happen. We've really just sort of slowly peeled the first layer of this onion back. And I think that there's so many more layers that still need to be addressed and looked at. And I hope that we can actually find additional collaborators, additional funding partners, to really bring all the data that's really available to really give this the study and the scrutiny that it deserves. And we are also going to make all these data sets available to the entire scientific community so that we can utilize the entire scientific community to take attack and, and, and you know, uh, uh, approach this problem. The project's legacy rests not only in a predictive tool, but also as an example for collaborative research moving forward. I think that there will be other things that to take and run with, uh, get new ideas, maybe add more data. And I'm hoping also that it will be a, a model for how um, uh, projects can then be open to um, the wider public. Just follow you guys that way. With the potential for an even broader collaboration ahead, Katie's rescue team is optimistic that they will gain a deeper understanding of strandings and ultimately save more lives. The ability to release animals after they've stranded is tremendous. When we do that, I mean, that's the best feeling in the world after all of that hard work. Those questions that seem unanswerable, if you give them time and support and effort and put people on them, we can do amazing things.
Welcome to NASA EDGE, an inside and outside look at all things NASA. We're joined by Michelle Monk and Steve Gaddis. How are you guys doing? Great. And we have a, a very important topic today, and that's going to be EDL, or Entry, Descent, and Landing. Now, Michelle, you're the Principal Technologist for EDL. Yes. What is Entry, Descent, and Landing? Entry, Descent, and Landing is how we get a spacecraft from the top of an atmosphere to a planetary surface. So the entry part refers to you know the atmospheric flight, most of it, and then we have Descent and Landing, which is usually propulsive and get us down on the surface safely. We do D and L um, at places that don't have atmospheres like the moon or you know asteroids, but usually we talk about EDL when we talk about atmospheres. So Michelle, what is your role as principal technologist for EDL? I look across all the missions that NASA has coming up that will use entry, descent, and landing on any planet, and I look at the technologies we're going to need for those missions, and I bring them forward to the mission directorate uh, for starting funding. So you have uh, a need in the EDL world, in the community. You're, you're coming up with the technologies that are needed for, for future missions. Right. Uh, and so you take some of those technologies that maybe are less mature, hand them off to you, right. and then you mature those technologies. Design, develop, test, and evaluate. Is that, is that a pretty easy task, trying to figure out not at all. <laughs> Not at all. I have to look at both the human missions that are coming up, so you know, sending humans to Mars. Right. I have to look at the scientific missions that are coming up and all the destinations the scientists want to go to, and I have to kind of rank those and prioritize them and figure out, you know, where they are in terms of maturity and what the best infusion point will be. When is the first mission that can use that technology? And then I have to figure out what is the best program within STMD for the investment. Is it better to have a university work on it or a small business or is it better for a game-changing program element? And, and your job is really hard because we're going to be talking about a suite of EDL projects over the next two shows because there's so much content in EDL. We can't, we can't do this in the one show. Absolutely. So this will be part one of, uh, of two parts. So how do you manage all that? Well, uh, one is it's hard but it's also fun. Okay. And we've got excellent technologists leading every one of these activities so we all work together and we all know that we need these technologies so we're motivated to see them be successful. We're a very passionate community. Yes. Uh, I, I've seen that in all the, all the interviews that we've done, there's, you guys are definitely passionate. Now the first one that we're going to be talking about is ESM or Entry Systems Modeling. What is that about? So that's the first part of it where they're, they're, they develop these models and simulations to understand how the technology works and how it will be beneficial at a system level. It's very cross cut against all the projects and the plan is to take that data and then infuse it into the projects. You know, Blair had a chance to go out to NASA Ames Research Center to talk to Mike Barnhart who is the integrated EDL systems lead. Let's check it out. Mike, tell me a little bit about Entry Systems Modeling Project. What is it? So the Entry Systems Modeling Project is tasked with developing a lot of these technologies that are coming from lower technology readiness level, things like academia, and trying to bring them up to a level so that we're ready to help them. So in this particular situation, we're talking about EDL projects, and so you're actually helping them raise their technology readiness level? That's right. So any of these things, you know, Orion, Mars 2020, Mars Insight, Anybody that's flying anywhere in the solar system and they need to enter an atmosphere, you have to go through an entry, descent, and landing phase. And we don't have all those problems solved. We don't have all those technologies built. 
And so we're continually trying to improve on our existing technologies and also renew with new ideas. And that's the real purpose of the Enter Systems Modeling Project. How do we get the data we need to improve the EDL process across these missions? Right, so there's a lot of different things that we can do. We have ground facilities, which we rely on a lot. So we have arc jets that we do for material characterization and developing models for material response. We have our shock tubes, which we use to develop radiation models. We have wind tunnels that we use to build aerodynamic models, the dynamic motion of a body as it's flying, that sort of thing. We need to know all that in order to have a successful entry into a planetary atmosphere. So that's the simplest thing that we have access to every day. And then we also have, you know, some amount of flight data. So there was the Orion EFT-1 flight last year, which was very successful, and we can use that to take our models and look at our predictions and then try and back out, you know, exactly how well are we doing, quantify, you know, how well are we predicting them. You've used a lot of data from the Apollo era. Are you able to use data from things like MSL and more recent missions to help? Because I know we have limited data on entry. Yeah, so, you know, MSL is a really great example because we flew Medley on MSL and that allowed us to get some of the only data that we've had on entry at Mars. So heating data, pressure data, which we use to reconstruct the aerodynamics is fantastic tool for us, but there's a lot of challenges there as well. So it's really, you know, it takes a village. <laughs> you need to have your computational models because they're the only thing that's going to access the true flight space that we have here on the ground. We have ground facilities that simulate parts of the flight space. And then 